The Big Fisherman by Lloyd C. Douglas. The Big Fisherman. Chapter 1. It was a calm, early summer noon in the southern mountains of Arabia. Sheltering the king's well-guarded domain, a mile above it and a dozen miles east of the Dead Sea, motionless masses of neighborly white clouds hung suspended from a remote blue ceiling. There had been an unusually heavy snowfall in the winter, not only upon the king's land but throughout the country. It was going to be a prosperous season for everybody. Intertribal jangling and discontent would be reduced to a minimum. Arabia anticipated a relatively peaceful summer. Viewed from the main entrance to the king's encampment the undulating plateau was a rich pasture on which a thousand newly shorn sheep, indifferent to the rough nuzzling of their hungry lambs, grazed greedily as if some instinct warned that there might be a famine next season. Nor was a famine improbable, for the distribution of snow was unpredictable. Almost never were two consecutive winters partial to the same area. This accounted for the nomadic habits of the people. They held no permanent property, built no permanent homes. They lived in tents, and, with their flocks, followed the snow and the grass. All but the king, whose encampment was a fixed establishment. When the king had a dry season the tribes replenished his purse. And few ever complained about this assessment, for the crown in Arabia was more than an ornament worn on state occasions. The king was indispensable in this country. He earned his wages and his honors. It required a strong and courageous man to deal equitably with these restless, reckless, competitive tribesmen who were distinguished throughout the East for the brevity of their tempers and the dexterity of their knives. It had been a long time since Arabia had been governed by a ruler with the moral and physical strength of King Aretas. Everyone respected his relentless administration of justice to the rich and poor alike. There was no favoritism. They all admired his firmness, feared his frown, and, for the most part, obeyed his decrees. Of course it would have been foolish to say that the Arabian people were sentimentally devoted to Aretas. In his difficult position he could not bid for their affection, he wanted only their obedience, prompt obedience and plenty of it. But there were a few who did sincerely love the taciturn, sober-faced, cold-blooded Aretas. First of all there was his motherless daughter Arnon, upon whom he bestowed a tenderness that would have amazed the predatory sheiks who had often been stilled to sullen silence under his hot chastisements. And there was battle-scarred old Kadar, who had taught him to ride when he was a mere lad of ten, who had watched him draw a man's bow to full tension when he was in his early teens and had followed him worshipfully into all his hazardous adventures as prince and king. And there were his twelve counselors who, in varying degrees, shared his confidence. Especially there was Ildaran, chief of the king's council. And young Zendi, Ildaran's eldest son who, everyone surmised, would presently marry the princess Arnon, with whom he was reputed to be much in love. Surely the wedding would be soon, they thought, for the princess had recently celebrated her sixteenth birthday. The tribesmen, who rarely agreed about anything, were unanimous in their approval of this alliance. Not only was Arnon popular for her beauty and Zendi for his almost foolhardy courage, but, taking a long view of their marriage, there might come a day when Zendi would be their ruler, for if an Arabian king was without male issue the throne passed to the house of the chief counselor. Ildaran was nearing sixty. If anything were to happen to Aretas, which was not inconceivable, considering how dangerously he lived, the gallant young Zendi might succeed him. This would be generally acceptable. All Arabia looked forward to the royal wedding. It would be a great occasion. It would last for a week. There would be games, races and feasting. In the shade of a clump of willows sheltering a walled spring, not far from the royal encampment, Arnon was awaiting the return of her father, who had ridden early to the camp of Ildaran, seven miles east. She had joined him at breakfast, shortly after dawn, finding him moody and silent. Is anything amiss, my father? Arnon had ventured to ask. The king's reply was long delayed. Slowly lifting his eyes he had stared preoccupiedly at the tent wall beyond her. Nothing you would know about, he had said, as from a distance. Arnon had not pressed her query. Her father had made short work of his breakfast. At the tent door he had turned to say, I am consulting with Ildaran. I shall return by midday. For a long time Arnon had sat alone, wondering what had happened. Perhaps it had something to do with the message her father had received yesterday. Of course there was nothing strange about the arrival of a courier with a message. It happened nearly every day. But this courier, she had seen him riding away, was apparently from afar. He was attended by half a dozen servants with a well-laden pack train. The donkeys had seemed cruelly overburdened. 
After the courier had departed, the king had retired to his own quarters. It was quite obvious that he did not want to be disturbed. Arnon strolled restlessly about under the willows, her thoughts busily at work on the riddle. Presently her wide-set black eyes lighted as she saw her father coming up the well-worn trail, at full gallop, on his white stallion. She knew what to do. Emerging from the shade, Arnon stood beside the bridle path with her shapely arms held high. Aretas leaned far to the left, the stallion suddenly slackening speed and sweeping his arm about the girl's slim waist, swung her lightly over the horse's shoulder and into the saddle. Arnon laughed softly and pressed her cheek against her father's short, graying beard. No words were exchanged for a little while. You have something very serious on your mind, haven't you, father? murmured Arnon. He drew the stallion down to an easy canter. I have had a strange message from Herod, the king of the Jews, said Aretas, slowing the impatient horse to a walk. Herod wants me to meet him for a private conference a fortnight hence, in the city of Petra. How fine for you, father! exclaimed Arnon. You've always said you were going to visit that beautiful city. Quickly noting her father's lack of enthusiasm, she inquired, But you're going, aren't you? Yes, it sounds important. Is it not a long journey from Jerusalem to Petra? I wonder why the Jewish king wishes the conference held there? Perhaps it is something that concerns Petra, too. There was an interval of silence before Arnon spoke again. Is this not the first message you have ever had from the king of the Jews? It is indeed. The first that has crossed our border for. Aretas paused to reflect. A hundred years? Guessed Arnon. A thousand years. Said Aretas. Many, many more than a thousand. What do you make of it, father? What does the Jewish king want of us? Aretas shook his head. They were arriving at the encampment now. Guards stepped out to meet them. Arnon was released from her father's arms and slipped lightly to the ground. Dismounting, the king beckoned to old Kadar, as his horse was led away. You will fit out an expedition to Petra. We are leaving on the third day of the week. The counselors will accompany us, and a guard of twenty riders. We may be tented at Petra for one day, or ten, it is not yet determined. The counselors will have had their instructions from Ildaren. You will attend to all the other arrangements. The festival tents? inquired Kadar, implying that his sharp old eyes had observed the royal insignia on the accoutrements of yesterday's courier. No, replied Aretas. We will take only the equipment we commonly use when we visit the tribesmen. Kadar bowed his gray head, his seamed face showing disappointment. He wanted to say that if the event was of high importance the king should make a better show of his royalty. He was turning away when Aretas spoke again, quite brusquely. And, Kadar, though you may have conjectured about the nature of our errand in Petra, if anyone should ask you what is afoot you will reply that you do not know. And that will be the truth. Retiring to his private quarters, the king resumed his contemplation of the conundrum. What ma o to ur of emergency could have induced the proud and pompous Herod to ignore the age-old enmity between their nations? For fifteen centuries, notwithstanding they were neighbors according to the map, their frontiers facing across an erratic little river that a boy could wade in midsummer, the Arabs and the Jews had been implacable foes. This ancient feud had not been rooted in racial incompatibility, though there was plenty of that too. The antipathy had derived from a definite incident that had occurred long ago, so very long ago that nobody knew how much of the story might be mythical. But, let the tale be half fact, half fiction, it accounted for the bitter hatred of these people. According to the saga chanted about the Arabian campfires by wandering minstrels, a wise and wealthy migrant had ventured from Chaldea to the plains of Mamre. It was a long story, but the minstrels never omitted their elaborate tribute to Chaldea as a land of seers and sages, oracles and astrologers. In Chaldea men dreamed prophetically and were entrusted with celestial secrets. Abraham, distinguished above them all for his learning, had received divine instructions to make a far journey southward and found a new nation. But the prophecy was in danger of lacking fulfillment, for the years were passing and the founder of the new nation was childless. Sarah, his aging wife, was barren. To solve this problem, the perplexed idealist had won the consent of his wife to permit his alliance with a beautiful young native in their employ. A son was born to them. They named him Ishmael. He was a handsome, headstrong, adventurous child, passionately devoted to his desert-born mother, whom he closely resembled. Sarah, naturally enough, did not like him. 
Abraham admired the boy's vitality and courage, but Ishmael was quite a handful for the old man, whose hours of pious meditation were becoming increasingly brief and confused. To further complicate this domestic dilemma, Sarah surprised everybody by producing a son of her own. They named him Isaac. He was not a rugged child. His eyesight was defective, so defective that in his later life he had gone stone blind. He was no match for his athletic half-brother. For a little while they all tried to be polite and conciliatory, but the inevitable conflict presently flared to alarming dimensions. Sarah no longer made any effort to control her bitter hatred for young Hagar and her tempestuous son. These impostors, she shouted, shrilly, must go. Today. Now. With appropriate misgivings Abraham conducted Hagar and their indignant boy to the rim of his claim, gave the bewildered girl a loaf of bread and a jug of water and pointed south toward the mountains. Not a word was spoken. Abraham turned and plodded slowly toward his little colony of tents. Hagar did not look back. When the vagabond minstrel sang the old story which, as the ages passed, lost nothing of the magical in the telling, they declared that Ishmael grew to full manhood that day. This may have been a slight exaggeration, though enough had happened to hasten his maturity. He swore to his mother that from now and henceforth forever he and his seed would be at enmity with everyone else descended from his father's house. Seeking refuge among the savage tribes of itinerant shepherds and camel breeders in the southern mountains, Ishmael quickly became their acknowledged leader, fighting his way to power with an audacity and ruthlessness that commanded their admiration and obedience. It was no small matter to bind so many discordant elements into something resembling a nation, but before Hagar's forceful and fearless son was thirty the hard-riding, fierce-fighting savages of the desert were boasting that they were Ishmaelites. The name was respected and feared, by rulers and robbers alike, all the way from the Jordan to the Mediterranean, all the way from Damascus to Gaza. As time went on, the wild new nation became known as Arabia, meaning men in ambush. The descendants of Isaac, and his more resourceful but less scrupulous son Jacob, after many misfortunes and migrations, including a long, humiliating period of enslavement in Egypt, fought their way back into their promised land, their western boundary on the world's busiest sea, their eastern rim within a slingshot of the domain controlled by the men in ambush. If some stupid stranger inquired, why do the Jews and Arabs hate each other so bitterly? He was told, it is written in the sacred prophecies of both nations that they are destined to be at enmity forever. It was commonly understood, therefore, that when the posterity of Father Abraham's two families met they neither smiled nor saluted. They never broke bread together, never gave aid, no matter how serious the emergency. They conducted their necessary business briefly and gruffly, and, having brought it to a conclusion, turned away and spat noisily on the ground. It was not often that they fought, but it was said that on such rare occasions the catamounts crept out into the open to learn new techniques of tooth and claw. Often the contentious children of Abraham quarreled, screaming, gesticulating, and reviling, for both of their languages, stemming from a common origin, were rich with invective and ingenious in the contrivance of exquisite insults. Neither nation had ever sent an ambassador to the other's court. Officially, neither had ever acknowledged the other's existence. Not meaning, however, that there was no commerce at all between these mutually contemptuous men. Racial antipathies had not deterred the ardent traders of both nations from venturing across the Jordan to engage in an undercover barter that would have amazed and enraged the ordinary rank and file of their respective kinsmen. Jewish merchants, far travelers by nature, quietly forded the river with pack trains bearing imports from many distant lands, and did not lack for wealthy Arabian customers when they appeared with foreign fabrics of silk and velvet, fine linens, gold ornaments, precious stones, medicinal herbs, spices, and other exotics. It was customary, on these occasions, for the negotiations to be conducted with all the sullen impoliteness that the everlasting feud demanded, but the expensive goods did change ownership, and the pack asses skipped home, under a young moon, freed of their burdens. Had either the Jews or the Arabians been gifted with a sense of humor, all this might have seemed funny. During the last score of years something resembling a commercial truce had permitted a group of Arabian camel breeders to bring their incomparably beautiful and expensive animals to the celebrated stock show and auction held annually on the disused drill ground near Jerusalem during the Jewish Feast of Pentecost. Indeed, it was the lure of the Arabian superb camels that had lately made this Pentecostal stock show notable throughout the East. Rich Romans, ever competing with one another in the lavishness of their gaudy turnouts in the proud processions of the imperial city, 
would send their stewards to purchase the finest of these majestic creatures, regardless of cost. The Jews, well aware that this uniquely attractive camel market was responsible for bringing desirable patrons from afar, tried to forget, for this one day of the year, that the coveted camels were Arabian. And the Arabs who owned the camels pretended they didn't realize, on this one day of the year, that they were doing business in the land of Israel. They growled and scowled and spat, but they bought the camels. This camel business, profitable alike to the merchants of Jerusalem and the stock breeders of Arabia, had come to a dramatic end a year ago. A most unfortunate incident had occurred. The auction, last summer, had attracted an unusually large assembly of well-to-do foreigners. They had come from everywhere, Romans, Egyptians, Damascenes, Cyprians, Greeks from Petra and Ascalon. The bidding was reckless and the Arabian camels were bringing unprecedented figures. By custom, the least valuable of the herd were offered first, and so it was that as the afternoon wore on, the excitement increased. In many of the later contests, the spellbound crowd, whose majority had long since been priced out of the market, held its breath in amazement. The finest beast of the lot was not offered until all the others had been bought. This tall, tawny, pompous three-year-old was clearly the pick of the herd. When, at last, the haughty creature was led forward, two well-groomed men, who had taken no part in the previous sales, shouldered their way through the pack from different directions, and showed a serious interest. Not many men in the crowd recognized either of them, but Demos, the suave Greek auctioneer, knew who they were, and was suddenly weak in the knees. The clean-shaven, middle-aged Roman, with the cloth of gold bandeau on his brow and the black eagle on the breast of his tunic, was a purchasing agent for Legate Varus, commander-in-chief of the empire's armies in the west. The lean, austere, gray-bearded Jew, in the long black robe, was Joel, the representative of the immensely wealthy Simeon Maccabee, whose political power and jury was responsible for Herod's strong position on the Judean throne, for the Maccabee family paid the bulk of the tribute which Rome exacted of the province, and Herod was their man. Commander Varus, who was distinguished chiefly for his high opinion of himself, had become accustomed to getting what he wanted. Simeon the Maccabee entertained a similar feeling about his own desires. It would be a very awkward situation if the representatives of these eminent men staged a battle in which one of them would be defeated. Wars had risen out of incidents more trivial. Demos hastily consulted the Arabians, explaining the gravity of the impasse, and suggested that they withdraw the camel from the sale. Disappointed but comprehending, they consented. The prize camel was led away, and Demos announced that the Arabs had decided, at the last moment, to keep the handsome king of their herd for the continued improvement of their own stock. This left the sons of Ishmael in a very bad spot indeed. The crowd jeered. There was some stone throwing. The little party of unpopular Arabians were in no position to defend themselves, and they beat an inglorious retreat. Upon their return home, the whole matter was laid before King Aretas, who decided, promptly and firmly, that the Arabs were not again to participate in any of the Jews' affairs. That had been a year ago. This summer the camel breeders had let it be known that they were marketing their valuable herd in Damascus. The announcement carried fast and far, and as a result the stock show at Jerusalem, on the day of Pentecost, was poorly attended by the people previously counted on to ensure its prestige. As King Aretta sat in council with wise old Ildaren, advising him of Herod's incredible request for a parley at Petra, the latter had said, after a considerable silence between them, perhaps he wishes to have our camels brought again to his Pentecostal fair. Aretta shook his head slowly. No, my good Ildaren. It's something more important than camels. There was no city anywhere quite like Petra. Nobody knew its origin or its age, a thousand years, perhaps. It was known to have sheltered at least four successive civilizations, and had borne as many names. For the past three centuries it had belonged to a wealthy colony of fugitive Greeks, who had expensively bestowed upon it an incomparable beauty. It was Athens minus the slums and the smells. Petra was more than a city, for it embraced not only an exquisitely contrived municipality, distinguished for the architecture of its baths, theaters, forums, temples, and stately residences, but a broad, enveloping valley whose green meadows and fertile fields were nourished by innumerable gushing springs. Nature had also made provision for the defense of this self-contained little city-state by encircling it with a ring of precipitous stone mountains, converting it into a natural fortress. Petra could be entered only through two gateways, on the west, 
where a deep-worn camel trail began its ambling toward distant Gaza and the coast road north to Damascus, and on the south, leading to the Red Sea. These approaches were made through narrow, high-walled defiles which a handful of guards could, and often did, defend against bands of reckless marauders. It had been a long time since the city had had to repulse a serious invasion, never, indeed, since its occupation by the Greeks. Naturally, it had been, through the ages, a much coveted stronghold, populated and repopulated with rich traders of various tints and tongues, whose dynasties successively fattened and fell, each of them leaving monuments and tombs which their victors wrecked to make room for the more extravagant memorials of their own. According to what passed for history in Arabia, which had never gone to much bother about keeping records, the most recent invasion of this territory had been made by their own tribesmen, some 500 years ago, who had thought it their turn to enter and sack the rich old city, then in the hands of a decadent generation of Nabataeans. At small cost to themselves, the Arabs had driven out all the inhabitants who were left from a ruthless slaughter, had carried off everything of any value, and then had wondered what to do with their new acquisition, for they were nomads and had no use for cities. After an interval of a couple of centuries, during which only the bats and hyenas were in residence, one Andracos, fleeing for refuge from a Roman invasion with a large company of well-to-do Athenians, offered King Retar of Arabia a great price for the deserted city. Much gratified to have, as neighbors, a new kind of people, who had seen much too much of warfare and might be expected to behave themselves, Retar promised the Greeks that they would never be molested by the Arabians, and published a decree warning his own people that Petra was not to be violated. This injunction they had scrupulously obeyed, not only because King Retar was held in high regard but because the penalty for annoying Petra was a public stoning. Arabia had kept the peace pact, and, with this comforting guarantee of security, Petra had built the most beautiful city in the world. As for the current relations of Petra and Arabia, it could hardly be said that they had any at all. In the opinion of the Arabs, the Greeks were a queer lot of people who spent their time carving figures out of stone, painting pictures, and reading old scrolls written long ago by men as idle as themselves. Such preoccupations, however unprofitable, were harmless enough, and if the citizens of Petra wanted to fritter away their lives in this manner, it was agreeable with realistic and illiterate Arabia. All that Petra knew about the Arabs was that they raised and rode the most beautiful and high-spirited horses to be found anywhere on earth, that their magnificent camels, too expensive for draft duty, were bred for showy parades in which they marched accoutred with silver ornaments, that the long-fibred wool of the high mountains was eagerly sought by the most famous weavers of Caesarea, Corinth, and Rome, and that their interest in anything artistic was completely non-existent. Aside from the fact that the bodily temperature of the Greeks and Arabs was maintained at approximately the same level, they had nothing in common and regarded each other with a condescension not unmixed with pity. Upon the accession of Aretas to the Arabian throne, a venerable cedar chest covered with the spliced white pelts of two long-haired goats, a richly caparisoned deputation from Petra had come to pay neighborly respects. For all parties concerned it was a pleasant visit. The pundits from Petra were shown every available hospitality. Their gift to the young king was a richly illuminated scroll containing Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War, and, to show his appreciation, Aretas sent the aged governor of Petra home on a tall, sleek, snobbish camel named Retar, in honor of the Arabian king who had had such amicable dealings with the Greeks in an earlier day. When, some weeks after the coronation, it was amusingly reported to Aretas that Retar had proved unmanageable, he replied, that makes us even. Chief Counselor Ildaran, who had something of an instinct for statesmanship and was canny enough to take a long view of international relations, had sometimes urged Aretas to pay a visit to Petra. The time may come, Sire, Ildaran had said, when it might be to our advantage to have had a closer acquaintance with these people. Very well, Ildaran, Aretas had replied. Sometime we will do that. But the young king had plenty of pressing problems on his hands. He had never found time to visit Petra, nor had he any inclination to place himself at a disadvantage in the company of men whose manner of life and thought was so foreign to his own. One day Ildaran, still nourishing the hope for a closer friendship with the Greeks, remarked that Herod and his sons were said to be frequent visitors in Petra. That makes me even less eager to go there, Aretas had replied almost gruffly. If the king of the Jews has found favor with the governor of Petra, all the more reason why we should keep our distance. It was high noon when the Arabian cavalcade by a circuitous route reached the southern gateway into Petra. 
A brightly uniformed detachment met the expected guests at the pass and conducted them through the fortified defile. After a three-mile ride on a well-kept road, flanked by green pastures, orchards, and widely spaced villas of exquisite architecture, the visitors climbed a long hill, reining in at the summit to face a breathtaking view of the white marble city. There they dismounted to rest their horses. Aretas and Ildaren sauntered a little way apart and for some moments silently surveyed the beautiful panorama below them. King Herod's encampment, easily identifiable, had already been set up in a spacious park at the center of the city. It monopolized at least three quarters of the park. The colorful tents and gay banners moved Aretas to mutter that it was a more gaudy show than he had expected of the ever dolorous Jews. That is the Roman touch, sire, observed Ildaren. Herod does not forget how he came by his kingship. I, rumbled Aretas. It was a lucky day for that Idumean upstart when his foolhardy father stopped the Egyptian arrow intended for Cassius. I have often wondered, sire, drawled old Ildaren, whether Cassius might have been so generous with his gratitude had he known how much wealth these Idumeans would acquire in Judea. It's never too late for the empire to rectify a mistake of generosity, said Aretas. True, but there's no hurry. Herod took over a Jerusalem built of sun-baked brick and is refashioning it in granite and marble. Old Augustus should be willing to let him do that, at the Jews' expense. Besides, continued Ildaren, Judea pays an exorbitant tribute. Why should the emperor send an army in to kill the goose that lays gold eggs? Even so, Herod's knights must be troubled by bad dreams. Shall we proceed into the city, Ildaren? The old counselor did not assent promptly. His brow was furrowed. Pointing toward the Jews' encampment with his riding whip, he remarked, Herod has occupied all but a corner of the park, sire. Doubtless he expects us to content ourselves with what remains of it. Such an idea would become him, I dare say. Let us not give him that satisfaction, growled Aretas. We will pitch our tents where we are, on this hilltop. Agreed? Ildaren nodded approval. Beckoning to Zendi, the popular young captain of the royal guard, Aretas gave the order. Noting the sudden disappointment in Zendi's face, he added, After our camp is in order, you and your men are at liberty to ride down into the city. There was a spontaneous murmur of pleasure from the tough young cavalryman, which prompted the king to announce sternly, You will remember that we are guests here. Zendi, you are to hold your men. Strictly to account for their behavior. And, one thing more, there is to be no quarreling with the Jews. Zendi raised his hand for permission to speak. Should the Jews attack us, your majesty, what shall I tell my men to do? King Aretas swung into his saddle before replying. In that case, Zendi, he said, with a shrug of his shoulder, your men will know what to do, without being told. There was a concerted shout of laughter. Even Aretas, who rarely smiled, pulled a reluctant grin as he rode away in the lead of his amused counselors. Ildaren, riding beside him now, resumed their conversation about Herod. Of course, sire, he cannot help realizing the instability of his provincial throne. He proves his apprehension by the frequency of his journeys to visit the emperor, and the fact that his sons spend most of their time in Rome. The Jews probably object to that, surmised Aretas. Naturally, sire, but Herod is in greater need of the emperor's favor than the good opinion of the Jews, who would despise him, no matter what he did, or left undone. All that flamboyant display of Roman trinkets represents Herod's fear, rather than his admiration, of Augustus. On the level now and four abreast, the Arabians quickened their speed and swept through the suburbs of Petra, presently drawing up before the stately palace of Sosthenes, the governor, where Aretas and his council were ceremoniously received. Sosthenes seemed flustered. I trust your majesty may find ample room in the park for your encampment, he said, with an apologetic smile which Aretas made no sign of interpreting. It was evident that the taciturn king of Arabia, whatever he might think of the king of the Jews, was not disposed to exhibit his feelings for the entertainment of this smooth-tongued Greek. And if there is not sufficient camping space in the park, continued. Sosthenes uneasily, we will see to it that your retinue does not lack for hospitality. We have already encamped, my lord, said Aretas, on the high plateau south of the city. Our people prefer the open spaces. Will you advise King Herod that Arabia is at his service? He awaits you, your majesty. Sosthenes' tone indicated his relief that an awkward situation had been nicely disposed of. If it is agreeable, your conference will be held here in our council chamber. With a deep bow, 
He led the way to a high-domed, marble-walled room, luxuriously furnished with huge upholstered divans arranged in two semicircles fronting a massive teakwood table, at either end of which stood a tall-backed, gold-covered, throne-like chair. The Arabians had not long to wait. Attended by a dozen venerable members of the Jewish Sanhedrin, Herod strutted in. Stiff bows and crisp amenities were exchanged. The kings took their places in the tall chairs. The counselors and the Sanhedrin sat. Facing each other, with calm, steady-eyed curiosity, the rulers of Judea and Arabia presented a striking contrast in costume, bearing, and physique. Herod was urbane, suave, quite the man of large affairs. He was sixty and paunchy, and there were pendulous pouches under his experienced eyes. It was apparent that the paunch and the pouches were decorations one in courageous combat with nourishing food and rich beverages. His abundant thatch of graying hair, close-cropped after the Roman manner, glistened with scented ungents. His beard was short and well-groomed, a compromise between the patriarchal whiskers of Jerusalem and the cleanly shaped gels of Rome. His robe was of fine-spun white linen, trimmed with purple at the throat, cuffs, and skirt hem. Herod had the self-assured posture of a man who had been everywhere and always with the right people, who had seen everything and always from a reserved seat. Aretas was carelessly dressed in a brown, travel-worn cashmere burnous, the skirt of which was parted revealing his brown goatskin riding breeches and thong-laced boots. The only touch of color on his clothing was the ancient crest of the Ishmaelites, an oval patch of blue silk appliqued to the left breast of his burnous. In this field of blue were the well-known devices seen on Arabia's banners, a slim, gold-embroidered moon crescent, half-circling a silver star, and pierced, in the form of an X, by a white sword and a shepherd's crook, the distinctive symbol of Arabian royalty. Aretas did not relax in his chair but sat rigidly erect with the air of a man accustomed to brief parleys, laconic statements, swift agreements, and an unceremonious adjournment. In his early fifties, Arabia's king was lean as a leopard, tough as a bowstring, and as tanned as an old saddle. The hood of his burnous had been pushed back from his deep-seamed forehead, showing a tousled mop of grizzled hair. He too wore a short beard, but nobody had trimmed it that morning, much less anointed it with fragrant oils. There was nothing of smooth statesmanship in the face or bearing of this Arabian. Except for the royal crest, he was not accoutred like a king, nor did he have the manner of one accustomed to the adroit thrust and parry of diplomacy. Yet there were the deep-set black eyes to be reckoned with, eyes inured to long vistas and well-versed in the lore of the sky. Having spent most of his life indoors, Herod, cannily competent in studying the minds and moods of similarly sheltered men, peered into the fathomless eyes of Aretas, and the carefully rehearsed speech he had obviously meant to make seemed to need revision. Your Excellency, began Herod, measuring his words, we invited you here to discuss a matter of grave concern to both our nations. He paused for some response, at least a slight lifting of the Arabian's brows. But the face of Aretas was impassive, giving no sign of surprise or curiosity. We have recently returned from Rome with disturbing news, continued Herod. Plans are rapidly taking shape for a Roman invasion into the northeast that will sweep this coast so bare of everything valuable that when it is ended the very vultures will die of starvation. Neither of us, and you may be sure that we will both be involved in this tragedy, can hope to withstand such an attack, but, firmly resolved to unite in a defense of our countries, we might exhibit enough force to dissuade Tiberius. Tiberius? broke in Aretas. Is Tiberius not leading the army in the west? Not at present, replied Herod, pleased to be able to instruct his conferee from the hinterland. Tiberius had been recalled to Rome some months ago, to be co-regent with Augustus. The Western army, in charge of the subjugation of the German tribes and the occupation of all Gaul, was given to Varus, who had now been completely overwhelmed, put to utter rout, destroyed. It is the worst defeat that the empire has ever experienced. Never again will the Romans cross the Rhine. If they are to recover their lost prestige, at home and abroad, they must extend their power in the east and the north. And our countries are on the highway to Damascus. Aretas frowned studiously, but made no reply, though the Jew gave him plenty of time for a rejoinder. Perhaps, mused Herod, the remote Arabian does not fully realize the predicament of the Romans and their necessity to strike a blow or invite disaster. He decided to post Aretas on some recent history that might have escaped him. The speech lasted for a full half hour, Aretas listening without commenting. Augustus, Herod went on, had made a great emperor, no doubt of that. 
In spite of the fact that he never had had any health, at all, he had done much for Rome. But now he was old, and so all that everybody knew about it. The reins of government had been slipping rapidly through his rheumatic fingers. He had lost his grip on the Senate. The rabble was restless. Of course the trouble was largely fiscal. Gone were the days when, in need of money to finance a fortnight's free feasting for Rome's improvident thousands, an expedition could be sent to raid Sicily or Crete or Cyprus or Macedonia, returning with valuable slaves, grain, lumber, leather, and gold. True, the provinces could still be sacked and pillaged, again and again, but the Romans had less and less to show for it. You remember, don't you, your excellency, how Augustus was so hard up, a few years ago, that he required every man, in all the provinces tributary to Rome, to pay a poll tax. Herod snorted with disgust. It was a paltry thing to do, the act of a miser or a bankrupt. The provinces were already taxed to the limit of their endurance. And then this bewildered old emperor childishly decides to screw a poll tax out of the hungry provincials. He sought to clothe the ridiculous affair with dignity by pretending the main idea was to take a census, every man was commanded to report on a certain day, in the place of his birth, wherever that was, and have himself enumerated. But that never fooled anybody. Augustus didn't care how many people were controlled from Rome. All he was interested in was their wretched little five farthings. Some of our poor people had to travel so much as a week's journey to obey the edict. I had forgotten, said Aretas. It did not affect my people. The emperor would hardly chase an Arabian through the mountains for five farthings. I'm not so sure that he wouldn't, remarked Herod, with a shrug. He will, this time. Tiberius will want your sheep and cattle and camels, and your daughters too. There is only one way out for us, your excellency. Let us make a treaty, and stand together. Tiberius will think twice before he risks another defeat. Do you imagine, sire, asked Aretas, that Tiberius could be made to believe that the Jews and Arabs had concluded an alliance after many centuries of hatred? I had thought of that. Herod hitched at his big chair, which did not move an inch, and leaned forward, lowering his voice to a confidential tone. I too had thought of that. Tiberius will need sound proof that our alliance is genuine. Have you something to suggest? inquired Aretas. A tangible unity. I am told that you have a marriageable daughter. I have an unmarried son. Aretas winced and shook his head. My daughter, he muttered, would not like that. Nor would my son, said Herod, with equal candor. But for what reason are princes and princesses fated and sheltered, for what reason are they given ices cooled with snow brought from the mountains by swift runners with lungs on fire, and to what end do courtiers bow before them, if not that when the day comes on which they must subordinate their own desires for the good of their country, they shall pay their debt cheerfully and in full? Perhaps this may apply to your son, my lord, but not to my daughter. She has lived simply, even frugally, as becomes an Arabian of whatever position. Arnon has had no ices in summer. Be that as it may, said Herod crisply. Ices or no ices, your daughter loves her country, I think. She would sacrifice much rather than see Arabia laid waste. Nor would she suffer hardship at the hands of my son, Antipas. He is a noble young fellow, gracious, kind, wealthy. They might even come to love each other, though that, of course, is unimportant. It would not be unimportant to my daughter, said Aretas. Besides, she is already in love with a young man of our own people. Herod stroked his chin with the backs of his plump fingers and meditated. Has her betrothal been announced? No, admitted Aretas. That is good, nodded Herod. He clapped his hands and an aide appeared. We will dine, he said. Aretas was not hungry, but it would have been impolitic to say so. The counselors were in session all night. Aretas set forth their dilemma, expressing it as his opinion that Herod knew what he was talking about and had not exaggerated the threatened disaster. Dumas made bold to say, I had rather be enslaved by the Romans than allied to the Jews. As for you, yourself, yes, said Tama, but how about your wife and daughters? The Romans are shameless butchers. But how can we be certain that there is to be an invasion? Scoffed Dumas. This fellow Sosthenes would be directly in the path of it, and he doesn't appear to be much upset. Well, he will be, muttered Tama, when Herod tells him how much is expected of him, in gold. Ah, so that's why we're meeting in Petra, is it? queried Adbiel. It's a good enough reason, said Tama wearily. No, it's quite useless to debate this matter. 
We've been over all the ground, and there's no way out. An alliance of the Jews and Arabians is quite as distasteful to Herod as it is to us. He knows the danger or he would never have made this proposal. We may be sure of that. It is asking too much of our princess, said Adbiel. She will have a wretched life with this young Jewish scamp. Doubtless, agreed Nefish, but at least she will live. I think she would prefer to die, muttered Adbiel. But that is not the point, said Mishma. If the princess marries Antipas she will be saving her country. When this is explained to her, she will consent. There was a long interval of moody silence, broken by Jator, who ventured to raise the question that was on everyone's mind, what would young Zendi think of all this? Ildaren was prompt with a reply. My son will be deeply grieved, he said slowly, but he too loves Arabia. Aretas nodded his head, without looking up. Is there anything further to be said? He asked, and when no one spoke, he rose, walked toward the door, and dispatched the fateful message to Herod. The council adjourned, but not to sleep. Breakfast was disposed of shortly before dawn. The tents were quickly packed. By the time the Jews in the park were astir, the Arabian campsite on the hill was deserted. The journey home was swift, and for the most part silent. At dusk on the evening of the fourth day of hard travel they separated gloomily. Arnon was anxiously waiting at the entrance to the encampment. Arez dismounted slowly, heavily, a haggard old man. Father! exclaimed Arnon. What has happened to distress you so? Are you hurt? Aretas took her by the hand, as if she were a little child, and silently led her into the tent. When they were seated together on a divan, Arnon summoned a servant and ordered supper to be brought for her father, but Aretas shook his head. Drawing her close, he gazed sadly into her wide, frightened eyes and blurted out the story. Arabia had made an alliance with the Jews. It was the only way of escaping a Roman invasion that would utterly destroy both countries. But, if you have made the alliance and have saved our country, said Arnon hopefully, why are you so downhearted? Because, the alliance provides for a royal marriage of Arabia and Judea. Arnon gave a little gasp and her face paled. Does that mean me? She asked weakly. Can you do this, my child, for Arabia? Closing her eyes, Arnon drew a long, shuddering breath, and slowly relaxed into her father's arms. After an agonizing moment, she straightened and looked up bravely into his deep-lined face. For Arabia, yes, my father, she said, barely above a whisper. They sat in silence for a little while. Arnon patted him tenderly on the cheek. Swallowing convulsively in a dry throat, she murmured, May I go now, father? Aretas released her and she walked toward the door of her room with the short groping steps of the blind. He watched her with brooding sorrow. He would gladly have given his life to save her this painful martyrdom. If it was necessary for the Arabs and the Jews to guarantee the genuineness of their alliance by arranging an international marriage it was equally important that the wedding occur without delay, for Tiberius could not afford to wait very long after the catastrophe to Roman arms in the West before attempting elsewhere a recovery of the empire's ailing prestige. Nor was this royal wedding an event that might be conducted quietly. It must be distinguished for its pomp and flamboyant extravagance. The full military power of Judea and Arabia was to be put on exhibition so that Tiberius, when appraised of it, would realize that these passionate little nations had resolved not only to stand together but had the strength to make their unity formidable. Of course the responsibility for this impressive spectacle would fall more heavily upon Herod than Aretas, for the Arabians were inexperienced in showmanship. At this game Herod was skilled. He had a natural talent for it and his long acquaintance with Roman pageantry had made him fully conversant with its tactics. The big show would be held in Jerusalem immediately after the wedding in Arabia. With amazing speed Herod assembled his widely scattered troops, secured the financial backing of the wealthy guilds, and even won the timid support of Annas, the high priest, who never liked to take sides in a political issue until sure which way the cat was going to jump. The skeletonized legion of Roman soldiers stationed in Jerusalem, ostensibly for police duty but really to keep the restless Jews in remembrance of their provincial status, merely joked about Herod's bombastic show, until the habitually sequestered Jewish troops began mobilizing in surprising numbers on the unkempt and disused drill grounds in the Kidron Valley. Fully accoutred, they were marching boldly through the city, en route from Joppa, Caesarea, Hebron, Jericho, and remote Capernaum and Galilee. That, complained young legate Julian to his centurions, was what ailed the Jews, they never knew when they were whipped. 
The Sanhedrin made deep bows to the empire's representatives, and retired to plot. Every evening at sunset the faithful appeared at the wailing wall to howl hopelessly over their subjugation, and strolled back to their cellars to sharpen their knives and spin tougher bowstrings. Apprehensive of a dangerous incident, and anxious to head it off by polite appeasement, for he had been sent to Jerusalem to keep the peace at all costs, Julian went to Herod. Why all these military maneuvers? Herod smiled innocently. There was to be a wedding, he said. His son Antipas was marrying the young princess of Arabia. Yes, yes, Julian knew all about that, and said it would be quite agreeable to the empire, he thought, if a detachment of Jewish patrolmen marched in the wedding procession, but... A detachment? Broke in Herod disappointedly. Well, a legion, then, conceded Julian, if that would better please your excellency, but we see no occasion for a parade of catapults weighing two thousand pounds. Is that customary, at a wedding? It would be an interesting novelty, reflected Herod, in a tone of childish wistfulness. Many of our people will be surprised to know that we have catapults. Our people will be surprised too, exclaimed Julian. And if a large display is made of such heavy weapons, your excellency may soon have a more serious use for them. Herod smiled enigmatically, patted a yawn and drummed absently on the table with his knuckles. Julian duly accepted his dismissal and rose to go. In any case, pursued Herod, they are good catapults, and they are ours, and they are here. It would be no easy matter to bring as large ones, or as many, from Rome. Slightly stunned by this unexpected impudence, Julian stammered, I am aware of that, sire. And so is Tiberius, added Herod recklessly. Meaning that your excellency would like me to inform the emperor? As you please, Julian. You will anyway, you know. This raw arrogance was something new to the legate, whom Herod had always treated with a suave, if insincere deference. It was evident that the crafty Jew intended to gamble this time for very high stakes. The emperor may suspect that this wedding is primarily a display of defensive armor. How quick you are, Julian, drawled Herod, now candidly contemptuous. You are wasted as a mere peace officer. You should be a consul, at the very least. He rose and bowed ceremoniously. Forgive us if we have to let you go now. We have another appointment, and you, doubtless, have business of your own. As the troubled young legate made his inglorious exit from the spacious gold and blue audience chamber, Prince Antipas lounged in through the king's private entrance. Herod glanced up, nodded amiably, and resumed his writing. His face expressed satisfaction with his favorite son, something of pride too, for Antipas, not always so docile, was showing himself surprisingly cooperative in this affair of the Arabian nuptials. Not meaning that he was enthusiastic, which would have been too much to expect, but quietly acquiescent. Of Herod's three sons by his much-loved Mariamne, Antipas was his pet. Antipas was respectful, courteous, good to look upon, of better than average height, with a handsome face, an athletic figure, and the confident carriage of a soldier. The firm discipline of the Roman military academy was stamped on him. At twenty-five, his slow, agnostic smile gave more than a hint of the fashionable cynicism which characterized the indolent crew of rich men's sons who gambled all day at the baths and banqueted all night in the best possible places. Antipas was already an experienced man of the world. As for his other sons by Mariamne, Herod had had but little occasion for pride in them. Archelaus, the eldest, was a contentious fellow, forever getting himself into embarrassing brawls. Philip, the youngest, whom the family invariably referred to as poor Philip, was so listless and impractical that he even had much difficulty in holding the government job his eminent father had found for him in Rome at the cost of much coaxing, and a bit of bribery. And, as if poor Philip were not sufficiently weighted with handicaps, he had allowed himself to be led into an unhappy marriage by Herodias, a cousin twice removed, who was his senior by ten years and a century older in experience. A widow, Herodias had brought along a pert young daughter, Salome, whose adventures were common talk. Herod could not be proud of poor Philip. But Antipas, here was a son worthy of all the costly investments that had been made in him. Noting that his father was occupied or pretended to be, the well-favored prince strolled across to the high bank of cases which lined the eastern wall, drew out a new, heavily gilded scroll, read the title, and chuckled audibly. Herod regarded him with interest. Did the old man give you this? inquired Antipas, amused. If you were referring to the aged Emperor Augustus, reproved Herod, he did. 
gave it to you, personally? Nagged Antipas. Herod hitched uneasily in his chair, as if to admit that the ostentatious scroll was one of a large number presented to consuls, prefects, governors, provincial kings, and senators too, perhaps. I'll wager a hundred shekels that your majesty hasn't read a line of it. Taunted Antipas, and, when his father had shrugged, added, you'd better, sire. This is Virgil's new eulogy to Augustus, extolling his brave deeds. He calls it the Aeneid. We shall have to peruse it, consented Herod absently. Indeed you will, sire. Antipas made pretense of seriousness. You may have to take an examination on it some time. He flipped the gaudy. Scroll back into the case, sauntered to the king's dais, flung himself into a chair, and yawned. Herod put down his stylus and smiled benevolently. And how are you amusing yourself, my son? We hope the time does not hang too heavily on your hands while you wait for your marriage. Not heavily at all, sire. Your majesty will recall that Salome, who is very good company, returned with us on our ship, for a visit. Specifically, she came to represent poor Philip's family at the wedding, amended Herod. Otherwise she would not have been tolerated, much less invited, you may be sure of that. He lowered his voice, discarded his kingship, and impulsively became a father. If I were in your place, Antipas, I should arrange not to be seen in public with a little trollop. My niece, sire. Antipas feigned indignation, but his ironical smirk showed through. Niece? Nonsense. Growled Herod. Since when did poor Philip's notorious stepdaughter become your niece? Technically she is my niece, sire, and your majesty's granddaughter. Does that not entitle her to some courteous consideration? Not from you. The women of the court can attend to Salome's wants. The queen will arrange for her entertainment. But mother does not care for her, said Antipas sadly. Not much wonder, muttered Herod. But, however that may be, you are to have nothing further to do with her. The fact that your half-witted brother married her mother does not obligate you in the least. Your association with this Salome will do you no good, especially now that your heart is in Arabia. Is it? Instantly Antipas realized that he had overtaxed his royal parents' patience. He had been sweetly wheedled into returning to wed the Arabian princess. It had required a deal of coaxing. At first he had loudly protested, and his father had promised him an immediate cash payment of his patrimony. He had shaken his head sorrowfully, and his father had conferred on him the Tetrarchy of Galilee. Finally he had yielded to the king's importunate pressure. It had placed him in an advantageous position, and he had been trading on it sharply, with all the inconsiderate tyranny of a spoiled invalid. His father's dark frown warned him now that his impudence had reached a limit. It had better be. Rasped Herod hotly. This is a serious business. And you are a fool not to realize it. He rose and paced to and fro, with mounting rage. You should be in Arabia at this moment, as I counseled you, making friends with these aliens. I tell you they are no more eager for this wedding than you are. And if you treat it too lightly you may get a dagger between your ribs, bloodletting is a mere pastime with these Arabians. They never forget an injury or an insult. The king was breathing heavily as he strode toward the door. Don't say I did not warn you. He shouted. Arnon was given but little time to brood over coming events. Preparations for the marriage proceeded with breathtaking speed. Everyday couriers arrived from Jerusalem to inquire of the princess, or, more correctly, to report to the princess, what were her wishes in respect to details which, in the opinion of an Arabian, were childishly trivial, but apparently important enough to warrant a laborious journey from the Jewish capital. The vanguard of servants and equipment began to appear in increasing numbers. Long caravans toiled up the tortuous trail from the valley floor, widening the bridle path to a hard-beaten road. Skilled Arabian seamstresses and weavers worked in feverish haste on the wedding garments for the princess and her attendants. Tactfully, mercifully, Aretas had dispatched Zendi to faraway Corinth on an errand no less important than the conclusion of a pending deal to lease another large parcel of land in the north to war-weary Greeks. It was a relief to Arnon when Zendi, pressed for time, called to say farewell, both of them glad that the leave-taking was done in the presence of their fathers. Arnon couldn't have borne it, she knew, if they had had their final moment in seclusion. Poor Zendi. He had been so. Determined to deal manfully with his sorrow that he had hardly raised his eyes to hers when they parted. The thousand sheep were led to another pasture, and on their grazing ground an awe-inspiring tented city rose. 
Soldiers in colorful uniforms made camp with such dexterity and precision that Arnon was forced to admire their skill. They did not squat in small huddles, an Arabian custom, to discuss what procedures were best. They knew exactly what to do. This, thought Arnon, was probably the way everything went in the outside world beyond her untamed but beloved mountains. Though firmly loyal to Arabia and its haphazard way of doing things, she felt a tug of excitement over being made a part of that competent society whose urbane representatives were now demonstrating their disciplined self-assurance. Now delegations of wealthy Arabian sheiks swept by on their sleek horses and entered the tents their servants had prepared on the broad plateau, each contingent accompanied by entertainers, minstrels, magicians, field athletes, acrobats, and comedians. Then came the awaited day of King Herod's arrival with Prince Antipas, their tall camels resplendent with costly housings and trappings of gold and silver. Proudly, haughtily, the impressive caravan swung past the encampment of King Aretas and came to rest a few hundred yards away. With fluttering heart, Arnon watched her father and the counselors greet the party from Jerusalem. It was a dizzying spectacle. King Herod was undeniably a distinguished personage and the prince was tall and handsome. And there was the high priest, guest Nefti, Arnon's lifetime nurse, who was holding the tent panel open to see. Doubtless he had come, added Nefti, to conduct the wedding. I had not realized it was to be a Jewish wedding, said Arnon. The Jews like ceremonies, declared Nefti. And we don't? asked Arnon childishly. Ours is more simple. If you were marrying Zendi, don't, Nefti. murmured Arnon. You promised me? I am sorry, princess. I only meant to explain that you would have taken his hand, in the presence of the counselors, and promise to obey and serve him all the days of your life. And will I not be asked to obey and serve Prince Antipas? Of course, but it will take longer, I suppose. The Jews are like that. Nefti closed the leather panel as the girl turned aside soberly. Her intuition read Arnon's thoughts. These strange people from afar were of immense interest, but they were of another world. I had hoped that Queen Mariamne might come, said Arnon. You saw no women in the party, Nefti? No, the whole event was to be a man's affair, a political transaction, in which one woman would be included because she was necessary. Gladly would they have done without her, reflected Arnon, if that were possible. The wedding was a confirmation of an international alliance. The treaty had been formally written on a sheet of papyrus, duly signed, and now it must be ratified. Arnon was but so much sealing wax stamped on an official document. Suddenly she was overwhelmed with a sense of heart-sickening loneliness. That evening there was a banquet attended by the kings, the prince, the high priest, several ranking members of the Sanhedrin, and the Arabian counselors. After an hour's feasting on the part of the men, Arnon was brought in to be introduced. She felt and looked very small and helpless. Antipas stepped forward to greet her. He took both her hands in his and smiled down into her timidly upraised eyes. It was an experienced smile that skillfully appraised and evidently approved. For a moment the silence in the tent grew oppressive as they waited for an opinion from the beautiful young princess. Presently she gave a shy, tremulous smile, and the suspense lifted. They all breathed freely again, and, with the exception of Aretas, exchanged glances of relief and satisfaction. Herod drained his goblet and smacked his lips. It was good wine. And, what was still better, by this time tomorrow the alliance would be an attested fact and he would be ready, if need be, to confront Tiberius. Chapter 2 Now that the month of Tishri had come and the trees were taking on rich colors, Arnon's homesickness became almost insupportable. Jerusalem was slowly strangling her. But for the understanding sympathy and tenderness of Queen Mariamne, she would have died or gone mad. Nature had not intended that Arnon should be surrounded by walls because their own people were of necessity nomadic they had built no cities. Indeed, the Arabians were contemptuous of cities, considering them pestilent prisons, stultifying to both body and spirit. Every morning, in the far away and long ago, Arnon had risen at dawn to breathe deeply of the invigorating mountain breeze and rejoice in the peace of a silence broken only by the distant tinkle of camel bells. But here in Jerusalem she felt stifled, caged. Late in the morning she would struggle back to consciousness, finding herself hungry for clean, bracing air. The beautifully wrought antique tapestries which curtained her luxurious bed gave off a sickening odor of mold and the exquisite mosaics leaked the sour stench of disintegrating plaster. Added to the tomb-like atmosphere of her spacious bedchamber was a conglomeration of city smells seeping in from the outside, 
smells of old and decaying things, old walls, old towers, old markets, old stables, old cobbled streets. There were plenty of distasteful sights, sounds, and scents in this ancient city, but the worst thing of all was the stagnant, fetid air. Every day now, our non woke nauseated, though the servants, who found nothing wrong with the air, graciously assured the foreign princess that her morning sickness was due to her condition, always adding, piously, for which the Lord God of Israel be praised. On this tenth day of Tishri, Arnon tugged herself loose from a nostalgic dream of riding swiftly beside her father in a noisy mountain storm, galloping, galloping hard, quite out of breath, with big splashes of warm rain pelting them. Half suffocated and drenched with perspiration, she gazed up dully into the smiling eyes of the queen. Mary Amne was the most beautiful woman Arnon had ever seen. She was in her early fifties, but seemed much younger, for by her abstemiousness she had retained a youthful figure. She had all the traditional dignity of a queen, but none of the arrogance. Arnon had known from the first moment of their meeting that she was going to like Mary Amne. The queen had no daughter and Arnon had never known a mother. Their friendship was instant and mutual. But in spite of the affection she felt for her charming mother-in-law, Arnon had extended no confidences. Her father had warned her to guard her tongue in the presence of these people. Spies are always friendly, and free to share their secrets with you. Sometimes it had been difficult to observe this reticence, her intuition assuring her that Mary Omne's devotion to her was sincere. How are you, my child? asked the queen gently. Very warm, mumbled Arnon, and a bit sick, as usual. I shall feel better when I've had something cold to drink. You are pearly, your majesty. Have you had your breakfast? Summoning a servant to bring the princess a goblet of cold pomegranate juice, Mary Omne sat down on the edge of the bed. I am not to have breakfast this morning, my dear. This is a fast day. All day? Arnon's eyes widened incredulously. Until evening. Then there will be a bountiful feast. You are not expected to do any fasting, but we will want you to attend the banquet. Arnon sat up in bed, pushed her tousled black hair out of her eyes, and inquired what this fast was about. It is the Day of Atonement, explained Mary Amne. Of all our special occasions this one means the most. It really begins the day before, with all the faithful Jews going about making things right with one another, doing neglected duties, paying their debts, returning things borrowed, and asking forgiveness for wrongs done and hot words spoken. Damaged friendships are mended, estrangements are cleared up. And then today, with clean hands and a right spirit, everyone brings a gift to the temple and receives a blessing. Arnon's eyes shone. It is very beautiful. She whispered. May I do it? Too? It would be a relief, to go to the temple and be blessed. She bowed her head dejectedly. My heart has been so bitter. Slowly she raised tear filled eyes. Your Majesty, I have been very unhappy. Mary Omne slipped an arm around her compassionately. Arnon, dear, would you like to call me mother instead of your Majesty? Don't do it if, if it takes an effort, she added, but it would please me. With that, Arnon's tears overflowed and she sobbed like a little child. I should like to, she murmured brokenly. You have been so good to me. I want you to be my mother. That's the way I think of you. Mary Omne drew her closer. Tell me, Arnon, she said softly, has the prince been unkind to you? Arnon indecisively shook her head, but the pent-up tears ran unchecked. When she could speak she said, no, he has not mistreated me, mother. I see very little of him, you know. But the prince is a busy man. He can't be spending all his time entertaining me. Men are always busy, my dear. The queen's usually placid voice showed a trace of asperity. There are the games at Gap and a new Greek play at Ascalon, and other important engagements. She paused for a moment. Dropping her tone of raillery, she went on, Our Antipas is really a sweet boy. He wouldn't intentionally hurt a fly. But he is selfish and spoiled. How could it be otherwise? Too much money, too much leisure and too many people wanting to win his favor, added Arnon. Sometimes I have thought, said Mary Omne soberly, that a baby prince should be left on the doorstep of an honest, frugal, hard-working family and brought up as their son until he is about. Twenty? Suggested Arnon, when the queen had seemed at a loss for the right figure. Forty. Amended Mary Omne. Then he should be brought to the throne, knowing what his people need. As it stands, there is nobody in the kingdom quite so ignorant of his duties as the ruler himself. He lives in a different world. After an interval of silence she asked, abruptly, is anything else wrong, dear? 
Almost everything, confessed Arnon. Everything but you. It may be my own fault. I cannot be myself here. In my own country I am happy and free. I love to ride. The shepherds wave a hand and smile as I pass by and I wave my hand and smile too. We are friends. Their wives and daughters weave gay scarves for me and I visit them when they are sick. Often I stop at their tents and play with the little children. That is as it should be, approved Mariamne. And they are not in awe of you, as the king's daughter? They call me princess, but when we play they do not throw the game away to humor me. Maybe that is what ails a royal family, they are allowed to win all the games. Here in Jerusalem I am a princess, always, every hour, a princess. I am unused to these stiff ceremonies, people bowing worshipfully, and backing out of the room. I have to change my costumes half a dozen times a day, and none of them is comfortable. Everything is strange, and I am becoming a stranger even to myself. Her voice broke completely. Please, may I not go home, just for a little while? There was a long delay before Mariamne replied. I wish you might, Arnon. Doubtless the king would consent if it were not for this military alliance. If it should come to the ears of the emperor. I understand, said Arnon weakly. Let us think no more about it. And, I should like to go with you to the temple. Is the prince going with us? Mariamne frowned and shook her head. Antipas set off early this morning for the north. You know he has been made the ruler of Galilee? Yes, mother. He did not tell me, but I heard a friend congratulate him on it, at our wedding. Are we to live in Galilee? Part of the time, perhaps, said Mariamne uncertainly. Antipas is a restless fellow. He does not like to stay long in one place. The king is building a Galilean embassy here in the city. Antipas will spend a couple of months every year in Jerusalem, attending to provincial business. He loves Rome, and I dare say he will want to be there occasionally. At the moment he is infatuated with the idea of building a beautiful villa on the western shore of the Lake Genesaret in Galilee. Arnon brightened. That would be lovely. She exclaimed. I have heard so much of that beautiful Sea of Galilee. Perhaps there would be sailing. Mariamne did not share Arnon's sudden enthusiasm. I doubt whether the prince would be interested in sailing. There are some warm springs on the western shore. Antipas, who loves bathing, will build commodious bathhouses in connection with his villa. I think he hopes to induce a few of his wealthy Roman friends to build villas there. Arnon's interest gradually faded. Instinctively she gathered that the queen had thought it time for her to know what manner of life she should anticipate. But perhaps Antipas had not included her in all, or any, of his plans. If he had expected her to live with him in Galilee, he might have inquired what sort of home she would like. Has the prince planned the villa? She asked. Mariamne stirred uneasily, reluctant to discuss the matter. Perhaps, she said. He spent all last week in Petra inspecting a few of the beautiful marble villas built by wealthy Athenians. He may have told you. He tells me nothing, said Arnon. Mariamne sighed deeply and rose to her feet. If you wish to go with us to the temple, dear, you should be ready at noon. Your maid will tell you what you are to wear. His Majesty expects to leave the palace promptly at midday. It has been announced. I hope I shall be prepared for the blessing, said Arnon wistfully. I am much in need of it. Is there anything I should do? I'm afraid I do not owe anything that should be paid back, and I have spoken no hot words, though I have had them in my mind, which is probably just as bad. Perhaps if my husband were here I might ask him to forgive me for all the unkind things I have thought about him. The queen drew a slow, sober smile and shook her head. In that case, she said quietly, it is just as well that he isn't here. It was traditionally considered a misfortune in royal households if a titled infant was a girl. The father of the hapless child was expected to be grumpy and the mother was ashamed of herself. But nobody seemed much upset over the sex of Princess Arnon's baby, certainly not Arnon herself, whose experience with one prince had not made her eager to produce another. Antipas was up in Galilee when it happened. But for a handful of servants, he had been spending his time alone. The new villa on which more than 200 skilled stonemasons had been engaged for five months, had risen a few feet above the massive foundation. One could easily imagine its oncoming beauty, even in the bewildering clutter of construction. The great oval pool, to be related to the house by a series of graceful arcades, had been completed, all but the mosaic lining, a tedious business, to be postponed until the prince should be absent for a season. The marble flagging that bounded the pool, the exquisitely sculptured balustrades, and the commodious dressing rooms were quite finished. 
Antipas had given much attention to the architecture and appointments of these sumptuous rooms, furnishing them so lavishly that he was using them for his living quarters. The pool had in every way surpassed his expectations. The warm water, reputed to be of invigorating quality, poured generously from stone lions' mouths in a steady flow that promised to be endless. It was a great privilege, reflected Antipas, to be the ruler of the province of Galilee. True, he had not yet become acquainted with any of his subjects, nor had he given a moment's thought to his executive duties, whatever they might be. He knew very little about the Galileans, except what everybody knew, that they were a stolid, inoffensive, pious people, who minded their own small business and had no ambitions to make their country known abroad. They grew their own grain, wine, flax, and wool. They fished in the Lake Gennesaret. Their men were adept at fashioning articles of household furniture, sometimes showing themselves to be excellent craftsmen. Their women wove serviceable fabrics for domestic uses. Their lives were self-contained and, in consequence, narrowly circumscribed. They almost never traveled beyond their own communities, except on the occasion of the annual Passover, when considerable numbers of them made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, where a week was spent in the performance of religious rites. Customarily they took along some of the products of their lathes and looms, which they offered for sale at the bazaars. They wore no distinctive costume, but were readily identified in the city by their accent and colloquialisms. They were a bit self-conscious and shy in the presence of urbane strangers, aware that they were considered outlanders. Antipas felt that the task of governing these simple-hearted country folk would not be arduous. Doubtless their trivial disagreements would be quietly settled among themselves, and, as for possible entanglements with the other provinces, the Galileans, exporting and importing nothing of any value, would not be likely to invoke judicial aid. He had little or nothing to do, his wealth would enable him to live in luxury. Whenever he wearied of his lethargy, he could easily trek to Caesarea and sail for Rome. Life in Galilee was still a novelty. Antipas had fallen in love with the entrancing view to be had from the eastern portico of the pool. At his command the servants habitually roused him early to see the dawn. Come in. It was a glorious pageant, with the steep banks of cumulus clouds transformed into symmetrical garlands of gold as the sun illumined them from behind the distant mountain range, while the beautiful Lake Gennesaret, which everybody, except the natives, called the Sea of Galilee, reflected the deep blue of a further sky. Then would come the dramatic moment when the sun itself would mount regally into the open, stripping the clouds of their gold and arraying them with silver. The slanting sails of the little fishing boats would flash brightly. The tall tower of the Roman fort, a mile to the north, and the squat dome of the Jewish synagogue, a mile further in the heart of Capernaum, would be flatteringly highlighted. The untidy clutter of fishermen's shacks and wharves on the lake shore would seem less ugly than picturesque. And the ruler of Galilee, suffused with a sense of well-being, would send for his breakfast. Only one thing was lacking, congenial company. And on this eighteenth day of Adar that want was supplied. The arrival of Mark Verus was not a surprise, though Antipas had not expected him so soon. He had promised to come in midsummer. Attended by half a dozen servants from home and a packed train of baggage which had been disembarked at Caesarea, Mark had turned up in the late afternoon, warm, dusty, and noisy with his approval of all these impressive building operations. Antipas hugged him with fervor, then picked him up and threw him headlong into the pool, where he wriggled himself out of most of his clothing, his host following along the ledge with a pike staff, fishing out the discarded garments as they accumulated in the water. Presently, refreshed and clad, Mark joined his friend, who, sprawled at full length on an ornamented lectus, was in conversation with the butler concerning the arrival of a courier from Jerusalem. Make him comfortable, the prince was saying, and tell him we will see him in an hour or two. He says it is urgent, sire. Nothing is urgent, in Tiberius, drawled Antipas. Tiberius? queried Mark lazily, from the adjacent loggia. Name of your new villa? Name of my new city, declared Antipas. One of the most beautiful cities in all the world. All of it, every building in it, great and small, to be of white marble. You're planning to build your villa of white marble, aren't you? Apparently, chuckled Mark, though I hadn't thought much about it. Are you ready now for a tankard of wine? I've been ready this half hour. Antipas clapped his hands and the wine arrived. They drank earnestly and their tongues were loosened. Mark was besought for the latest news of Rome. He shook his head dirly. Rome had quite lost her charm, many changes, and all of them for the worse. 
He did not bother to explain that his eminent father's disastrous defeat at the hands of the barbarous Germanic tribes had done the Varus family no good socially, Antipas could, and did, form his own conclusions about that. Mark would be glad enough, he went on, to change his residence. Rome was filling up with vulgar upstarts, rich nobodies busy with business, a strange crowd now at all court festivities. Old Augustus had his faults, to be sure, but he had some dignity. Tiberius had brought in an entirely new breed of favorites. He had made Rome the dullest place on earth. He hated games, considered them a waste of public funds. He was going in for all manner of economies, as if the empire was on the verge of bankruptcy. Well, it is, isn't it? mumbled Antipas. Mark agreed that it was, and always had been, but it still contrived to carry on. This new Tiberian dynasty, he continued, is going to strip the city of everything that made her name famous. All that we hear about now is the importance of making the land more productive and the common people more contented. Sounds sensible, said Antipas. That's what hails it, muttered Mark. How can there be any pleasure in a country that has resolved to be, sensible? Is Tiberius still thinking of a northern invasion? He probably never entertained such a thought, scoffed Mark. I'm surprised your father was ever taken in by that rumor. The emperor is working night and day to rebuild his western army. Indeed. I had supposed there was nothing left of it, remarked Antipas ineptly. To cover his unintentional rudeness he added quickly, so, we no longer have anything to fear? That is good, if you're sure you know. I've had it on the best of authority. You might have been spared that matrimonial alliance with Arabia. By the way, Mark's eyes twinkled mischievously, how has that little treaty worked out? Is she pretty? Antipas frowned slightly, shrugged the impertinence away, appended his goblet, sat up, blinked thoughtfully, and began slowly counting his fingers. Beckoning to the butler he said, tell the courier we will see him now. Presently he was thrusting his jeweled dagger through the wax sheath of a heavily gilded scroll. In silence and without betraying any sign of interest, for he was aware of Mark's lively curiosity, he read the formal message from his mother. Signaling the courier, waiting at a little distance, he said casually, After you have rested, you may return to Jerusalem. Convey our regards to their majesties and our good wishes to the princess Arnon, for her health and happiness. And you may say, he added, as an afterthought, that the child's name is Esther. Why do you want her called Esther? asked Mark with childish impudence, when the courier had bowed himself away. Because she was born on the 15th of Adar, a feast day in honor of Queen Esther. Never heard of her. What's she queen of? Persia, a century and a half ago. Jews? Of course. Why of course? Persia is not a Jewish country. Antipas dismissed this query with a negligent gesture, adding that he was not an authority on Persian history, but Esther, a very beautiful Jewess, had once been queen of Persia. And did Mark want to bet anything on it? Is your baby a Jewess? Hectored Mark. Half Arabian, isn't she? That will not matter much, you aunt Antipas. She will be brought up as a Jewess. In my poor judgment, declared Mark, suddenly serious, it's going to be an awkward situation for her, all her life. A very unfortunate combination, half Arab, half Jew. Not so bad as you think, said Antipas reassuringly. Both nations will want to claim her. You know better than that, said Mark. Neither nation will accept her, much less claim her. My guess is that your Esther is going to be a very unhappy little girl. Well, muttered Antipas, it's too late to fret about that now. He held up his goblet for refilling. Of course, you've no idea how beautiful this pool will be when the lining is in. I'll show you the designs after dinner. They are absolutely incomparable. Again it was Tishri. The summer was over and the grass was tipped with white in the mornings. Verus had left for Rome, gratified with the prince's assurance that he would be joining him in a couple of months, after he had paid his respects to his family. Arriving home, Antipas had spent a leisurely hour refreshing himself after the tedious journey. Strolling into the queen's apartment as casually as if he had taken leave of his mother an hour ago, he eased himself into a deeply cushioned chair and waited for her appearance. Antipas Mariamne threw her arms about him, hugging him hungrily. You have stayed away so long. We wondered if we were ever to see you again. She held him at arm's length. You were brown as a peasant. He patted her on the cheek. Beautiful as ever. He declared. How do you do it? They sat down together on the divan, Mariamne gently caressing his tan forearm. You've seen Arnon? She inquired anxiously. Not yet. 
Noting his mother's frown, he added, Naturally, I wanted to see you first. Mariamne accepted the tribute with a wisp of a smile, but grew serious again, shaking her head slowly. I think I should tell you, my dear, that your neglect of Arnon has all but broken her heart. You might at least have written her a friendly letter, about the baby. Sorry, muttered Antipas. I've been very busy. The villa, you know. I must tell you all about it. You see, when I first thought of it. The villa can wait, said Mariamne crisply. In the name of common decency, you should go at once to see your princess, and this beautiful child, Farah. Come, I shall go with you if that will make it any easier. She rose and tugged him to his feet. Why do you call the child Farah? inquired Antipas testily. I named her Esther. You may call her Esther if you like. Mariamne's tone was frankly indignant. But Arnon has named her Farah. Against my wishes? Of course. Why should Arnon pay any heed to your wishes after the way you have treated her? She is my wife. Oh, is she? I thought you had forgotten. Mariamne was angry now, and her words came hot and fast. I don't want to upset you, my son, the first hour you are home, but not everyone has forgotten that you married the princess of Arabia. King Aretas remembers. Your father has had a message from him. He will tell you. Antipas searched his mother's eyes and swallowed noisily. You mean, the Arabian is hostile? Your father will tell you, said Mariamne. Come. Better do what you can to make amends to Arnon. No. Growled Antipas. I shall not be applying for any Arabian's pardon, not even Arnon's. And if this sullen shepherd, who calls himself a king, has the effrontery to dictate to a prince of Israel. Mariamne held up a hand warningly. It is quite apparent, she decided, that you are in no mood to visit Arnon. Go at once to your father and learn where you stand, in this unfortunate business. I shall tell the princess that you are here and eager to see her, but that the king has summoned you to an urgent conference. And, let me say one thing more, she added, as Antipas moved toward the door, it will be much to your advantage if you conduct yourself respectfully in your audience with your father. No strutting, no levity, no assumption that you are a petted favorite of the king. Angry, is he? Angry is a very mild word for it. And, don't bother to tell him what you have been building in Galilee. The king has other plans for Galilee. It was not a happy interview. To begin with, Antipas was halted, politely enough, but halted, at the door of his father's audience room, the chamberlain announcing firmly that the king was engaged. But he will see me, rasped Antipas. Go and tell him. His majesty has been notified that you are here, your highness. He bids you wait until you are summoned. Antipas turned to go. Say to his majesty that I shall return when he is less busy he said indifferently. If I may venture a suggestion, murmured the obsequious Chamberlain, the prince would be well advised to remain here until he is called. Something of warning in the old man's tone checked Antipas' impulsive decision to leave. Indignantly he glanced about for a chair to fling himself into, but to his surprise and annoyance there were no chairs in the corridor. He was about to order one brought to him, but the Chamberlain had already slipped back into the room, closing the door behind him. Antipas paced up and down, fuming. He had never been treated like this before. Once he made up his mind to go, stalked as far as the great door that gave onto the terrace, but thought better of it, and returned. It was a whole hour before the Chamberlain reappeared to say that His Majesty would see His Highness now. Forcing a filial smile, Antipas entered, bowed, and said, My greetings, sire. I hope I find you well. Sit down. Barked the king. Antipas' expression sobered and he sat rigidly at attention. It was immediately evident that the king had carefully composed the speech upon which he launched with icy restraint. He had tried, he said quietly, to be an indulgent father. It was not easy for a king, hard-pressed with cares of state, to give his children the firm discipline necessary to the production of a strong character. He had paid his sons the compliment of believing that, with their superb advantages, they would develop strength, dignity, integrity. But he had been bitterly disappointed, he went on dejectedly. Where was there a father in all this realm who had less cause for satisfaction in his sons? There was Philip, the weakling, the cuckold. Herod's voice shook with contempt. And there was this insufferable braggart and brawler, Archelaus. What had he ever done, the king asked himself, to have deserved an affliction like Archelaus? Only last week, he went on, with rising heat, your impotent brother came to advise us that we were too old to continue our rule, that we had toiled too long, too diligently, that we should retire and confer on him the regency. 
Think of that. The regency, of all Judea. To be conferred upon a loud-mouthed, contentious fellow who can't even get along harmoniously with his own lazy drinking companions. Antipas smiled a little reminiscently. Feeling himself to be presently in need of mercy, he thought it opportune to put in a defensive word for his elder brother. Herod, noting that the prince wanted to speak, paused to listen. Archelaus was indeed overreaching himself, sire, but is it so unthinkable that he should be made regent of Judea? He is the heir to this throne, is he not? That, snapped Herod, is none of your business. We are just now about to come to your business. And so, after this considerable delay, they had come to the prince's business, and a bad business it was, too. Antipas, had he the normal instinct of a six-year-old waif, would have known, declared the king, what a dangerous position he had accepted when he consented to be the son-in-law of an Arabian king. Antipas feebly protested that the honor had been forced upon him, but Herod wasn't entertaining any mitigating circumstances. You have treated this Arabian girl shamefully. What a fool you are, to think that these savages in Arabia who, for all their uncouth manners, have their pride, would let you heap indignities upon the only child of their king. Now you have it to settle for, and in full, mind you. I have had word from Aretas. His message is brief but clear. His daughter is to be brought home to Arabia. Antipas raised his head and brightened perceptibly. He drew a long, comforting sigh. His father, observing his relief, rose from his chair and stabbed a finger in the air. Mind you, he shouted, the princess is to be taken home to Arabia, not sent home. And you, your brightness, will accompany her. Aretas insists upon that. His much cherished daughter, he says, has suffered enough at the hands of this court. She is not to be returned like some article of rejected merchandise. Those were his words. Her husband is to bring her home in a manner befitting their station, and show her the honors she, and her countrymen, have a right to expect. But, spluttered Antipas, why does he want me to play this farce? He probably despises me. Indeed he does, yelled Herod. And not probably. And why shouldn't he? They will kill me if I appear over there, muttered Antipas. They will kill you if you don't. How long must I stay? Until you have fully restored our non damaged pride, until you have satisfied Aretas and his council that you respect their princess as your wife. There was a long silence. I had expected to leave for Rome, protested Antipas. I have business there. That may be, snorted Herod. But you have no business in Rome that can compare in urgency with the business you have in Arabia. How about my obligations in Galilee? You are to forget all about Galilee. Meaning that you have deposed me, sire? For the present, yes. We will take care of all Galilean matters. Whether you ever find yourself in Galilee again is a question you may answer for yourself. You may go now. Make peace with your princess. And prepare to take her home without delay. Antipas noisily exhaled a self-piteous sigh, slapped his palms down hard on the arms of his chair, and rose to his feet. This, sire, he muttered, is the unhappiest day of my life. So far as you have gone, assisted the king. See to it now that you do not encounter unhappier days. Make things right with your princess. Tell her how you have longed to return to her, but that a revolt among the people of your province, he broke off annoyed to find his son attentively listening for further light on this extemporaneous alibi. Contrive your own lie, he went on impatiently, but make it good. Arnon will try to believe you, but she lacks a great deal of being such a fool as her husband. A revolt, eh? Reflected Antipas. A dangerous uprising, and you had to stay there, and deal with it. Herod grew thoughtful and continued, to himself, I shall say that to Aretas. He may doubt the truth of it. But a poor excuse in a case so desperate is better than none. When a man's pride is injured, almost any medicine is welcome. May I take my leave now, your majesty? Asked Antipas, with elaborate humility, hopeful that his father might relent and smile a little. Indeed you may, your highness, mocked Herod, with a profound bow. What an ass you are. The return to Arabia was not as difficult as Antipas had feared. He was regarded with deference. It was obvious that his shameful neglect of the princess had been a well-kept secret. On the surface Arnon had been treated kindly in Jerusalem. King Aretas received his son-in-law graciously enough, though without any ostentatious amiability, an attitude readily explained by his habitual reticence. The counselors, promptly assembling to pay their respects, were forced to concede to one another, for none of them knew how badly their princess had fared but Ildaran and Tama, 
that if Antipas were not a Jew he would be almost likable. It isn't his fault that he's a Jew, remarked Adbiel. No, agreed Mishma, but it is a great misfortune. Arnon had wondered whether there might be some constraint in her meeting with Sendi, but when he called with his pretty wife Rena, Duma's daughter, the air was instantly cleared for them all by little Fata. Rena, presently to bear a child, had taken Arnon's uncommonly beautiful baby into her arms, while the others, for various reasons, beamed happily over her unselfconscious display of maternal tenderness. They all laughed merrily when Farah laid a small pink palm against Rena's cheek, and smiled. Antipas, who had a talent for making friends easily, was delighted with his daughter's charming response to Rena's caresses. What an adorable child! declared Zendi. I never saw her take to anyone so quickly, said Arnon. I'm quite jealous of you, Rena. Beautiful women, commented Antipas, do not have to be jealous of one another. Arnon's eyes had brightened at that. There was no doubt now that the prince was proving to be a good husband. Even Aretas, standing by, seemed gratified. They are beautiful, he put in unexpectedly, for he was not given to compliments, all three of them. And so, the return of Antipas to Arabia was made much easier for him than he had expected or deserved. The baby Farah had paved his way. The Arabians came from near and far to see this endearing child whose extraordinary beauty was on everybody's tongue. Grim old shepherds, who had bitterly resented Arnon's marriage to a Jew, came to see if her baby was really as lovely as the rumor, and found the prince so obviously devoted to his family that they went away to report favorably. He may be a Jew, they said, but he is doing well by the princess. The ranking Arabians of his own age, suspicious and cold at first, gradually thawed toward Antipas. He was no match for the Mizan. Equestrian, but he was by no means inexperienced in the saddle. Respect for him increased almost to friendliness when, invited to join a party on a wolf hunt, he had appeared on a nervous, fidgety, unpredictable filly whose wet flanks showed that she had stoutly disputed his authority. Aretas had told him to select his own horse that morning. Old Kadar had been instructed to assist him. The prince had looked them over carefully. I'll take this young bay mare, Kadar, said Antipas. Kadar had drawn a long face. She needs quite a bit of handling, sire, he said. I dare say, drawled Antipas. She probably wants exercise, and so do I. Privileged by his age to speak his mind candidly, Kadar chuckled a little, deep in his throat, and replied, Well, you'll both get it, I think. When the young blades, waiting for him on a little knoll, saw him coming at an easy canter, they exchanged knowing grins. Approaching, Antipas dismounted. The girth is a bit tight, he remarked, loosening it with a practiced hand. It annoys her, I think. Everybody laughed companionably. It doesn't take much to annoy that filly, said Zendi. Have any trouble with her, sir? Nothing to speak of, said Antipas. He patted the perspiring mare on her neck and gently tousled her forelock. You'll be a good girl now, won't you? He murmured kindly. The filly tossed her head, but apparently thinking better of it, rubbed her muzzle across his arm. They all laughed again. Antipas was getting along very nicely with the Arabians. Winter closed in. It was rather hard to bear. The days were short and cold and uneventful. Sometimes Antipas would talk to Arnon about Rome, and she would listen with wide-eyed interest, thinking to please him. When the first hardy little Edelweiss peeped through the melting snow, he suggested that they plan a trip to Rome, not to stay very long. He knew she would enjoy the voyage, he said, and she would be interested in seeing this greatest of all the cities in the world. Arnon demurred at first. She would like to go, but there was little Farah. We will take her along, said Antipas. That would be difficult, said Arnon. Then leave her here, said Antipas, she has an excellent nurse and we will soon be back. Do think it over, he implored, adding wistfully, I am really a city bred man, my dear, and it has been a long time since I have been on a paved street. He has done very well, Arnon, said her father, when she consulted him for advice. Much better than we had thought. Perhaps you should humor him. I'm not very happy in a big city, said Arnon. And your husband is not very happy in the open country, said Aretas. Better meet him halfway in this matter. Otherwise he may grow restless here. She nodded her head. It was good counsel. Antipas would grow restless here. She did not add that Antipas was already so restless that it was making him moody and detached. No one could have been more graciously attentive than was Antipas on their long voyage from the port city of Gaza to Rome. The early summer weather was perfect for sailing, 
the little ship had better accommodations than most and the ports of call were of fascinating interest. Arnon could not be quite sure whether the prince's good humor and high spirits represented his desire to make her contented or could be accounted for by a boyish anticipation of a return to his enchanted city. She gave him the benefit of the doubt and enjoyed the comfortable journey. Antipas spent long hours, on lazy afternoons under the gay deck canopy, discoursing on the life he had lived in Rome and the friends to whom he would introduce her. But the more he talked, the less confidence she had in her capacity to find pleasure in the pursuits of such people as he described. Did they ride? She asked. No, there really was no safe and quiet place to ride unless one lived on an estate in the country. But, couldn't they do that? Inquired Arnon. Antipas had whimsically wrinkled his nose, he had had quite enough of country life for the present. But, wouldn't it be frightfully noisy in the city? Doubtless, but Antipas didn't object to the sound of traffic, it made him feel alive. One day she asked about the language of Rome. Latin, wasn't it? Perhaps Antipas would teach her. No, Antipas had replied, they did not speak Latin, that is, it was spoken only by the lower classes. Everybody who is anybody, he went on, has had private tutors, and these men are invariably Greeks, Greek slaves. The better people are taught by slaves? My dear, our Greek slaves are the most intelligent men in the world. We Romans do not pretend to match them in learning. We Romans? laughed Arnon. You are not a Roman, are you? Antipas had glanced about, before replying in a guarded tone, I am Jewish by race, but Rome is my city. Rearranging Arnon's pillows for her better comfort, he reverted to the language question. You will pick up the Greek quickly, I think. You may speak with an odd accent at first. Most foreigners do. That is to be expected. But the Romans will find it charming. It always amuses them. Arnon smiled uncertainly. Of course she knew that she would be considered a foreigner, but the word made her lonely. And she would speak queerly, and it would amuse them. Doubtless they would treat her as a child learning to talk. She wouldn't like that. Some women were at their very best, playing they were six, prattling baby talk, but Arnon had been taught to despise such silly affectations. Now she would be forced to do the baby role, for which she felt temperamentally unfitted. She frowned thoughtfully. If she had been at a disadvantage in Jerusalem, where at least she could talk like an adult, how would she feel in Rome? It worried her so much that she asked the question of Antipas who, summoned from his daydreaming, replied absently, you will not feel strange, after a day or two. But she did. The great, garish, clamorous city bewildered her. The elaborate house to which Antipas brought her was conducted in a manner utterly unfamiliar. She had such difficulty in making the servants understand her wishes that she soon gave up trying to be the mistress of her home and allowed a score or more of slaves to run the establishment as they pleased. Often they were drunk, always they were lazy, it was suspected that the butler was dishonest. The meals were late and indifferently served. The rooms were untidy. Antipas coolly remarked that he had never lived less comfortably. He did not say it was Arnon's fault, but whose else could it be? Their first social evening out was at the home of Mark Verus. Antipas had reminded Claudia that his Arabian princess would be having language difficulties which might make her seem ill at ease, and would Claudia limit the number of her guests to a very small company who could be depended on to understand Arnon's predicament. So Claudia had invited only twenty. The first person to be introduced was Arnon's sister-in-law, Herodias, who spread a wide, red mouth, nodded gaily to her new relative, as if they had known each other since childhood, and threw her long, slim, jingling arms around Antipas' neck, drawing him to her in a daring embrace. Lagging behind Herodias was a sheepishly grinning, baldish man whom Arnon readily guessed was poor Philip. He advanced shyly and spoke in Aramaic. Thrice welcome, Princess Arnon, to this overestimated city. I am Philip, the pampered husband of that lady who is so firmly attached to my brother. We are, as you see, a devoted family. Arnon smiled at this persiflage, but couldn't help feeling shocked over Philip's indifference to his wife's sluttish behavior. They must be very warm friends, she said, trying to be casual. Claudia had turned away to greet arriving guests. Herodias had eased her grip on Antipas and was whispering earnestly into his ear. Mark Verus, flushed and lusty, approached to say, in Greek, so, at last, we have the lovely Princess of Arabia with us. Arnon smiled, only half understanding. Her Greek isn't very nimble yet, Mark, said Philip. Know any Aramaic? Mark said very little, and proceeded to prove it by discoursing, in extravagant terms, of the new villa in Galilee. Arnon, 
who knew less about the villa than Mark knew about Aramaic, could only say that she hoped to see it, someday. Mark's intuition suggesting that this topic might profitably be dropped now, he offered her his arm and led her, with a proprietorial swagger, among the groups of guests, introducing her to faces rather than names. Arnon had a feeling that no one knew who she was or cared very much. They smirked, nodded, and continued their loud-pitched conversations in which three or four women seemed endeavoring to talk one another down. Arnon was stunned by the confusion. She had never been in a place so astoundingly noisy or so appallingly rude. Mark Veris continued to drag her about in a manner that made it difficult to maintain any dignity at all, as if he were exhibiting a blooded colt, pinioning her arm tightly under his, while he gaily shouted greetings to new arrivals. Arnon turned about to look for Antipas, but he was lost in the crowd, probably had forgotten her. Presently an elaborate dinner was served, the guests lounging languidly on an elbow in the deep upholstery of divans drawn close together about a long table. Mark, seated next to Arnon, was most attentive, embarrassingly attentive, finding frequent occasion to bend over her in an effort to serve her plate personally with some delicacy. She instinctively drew away from these intimate contacts, and Mark's ardor, after a few unmistakable rebuffs, suddenly cooled. Turning from her, he attempted to attract the attention of Herodias on the other side, but finding her wholly preoccupied with Antipas, he laboriously resumed his attention to the Arabian princess, scolding her gently for her abstinence. Arnon tried to explain that it was not a custom among her people to drink intoxicants. Sometimes, she said, their men had a glass of wine, but it was not considered suitable for an Arabian woman to drink at all. Philip, who was seated next to her, overheard the conversation and leaned forward to remark that one was expected to drink deeply at Roman banquets. It annoys half-drunken people, he went on drolly, to talk to anybody who remains sober. It embarrasses them. That's why Varus presses you to imbibe, Princess Arnon. He means it well enough. He's your host, and he wants you to be a social success. Mark listened with a frown, but made no comment. And I won't be a success, unless I'm a little bit drunk? inquired Arnon. Well, drawled Philip, with a chuckle, that's one way of saying it, but I never heard it put so briefly and clearly before. He caught Mark's eye and was rewarded with a scowl and a shrug. I'm afraid I am not going to like it very well, in Rome, murmured Arnon. It was some time before Philip commented on that. Regarding her soberly, he said, no, you couldn't. My brother should not have brought you here. You are of a texture much too fine to be soiled with this degradation. For an instant Arnon searched Philip's eyes, suspecting that he was taunting her, but found him seriously sincere. Perhaps you two would be happier, somewhere else, she said. Anywhere else, he replied. After a few weeks of earnest but unsuccessful endeavors to accommodate herself to the mores of Rome, Arnon gave up trying and begged Antipas to excuse her from further attendance at banquets. And am I to spend my evenings at home, then? He demanded testily. Is it your idea that I should live the life of a hermit in a cave? There was only one reasonable answer to that. Arnon assured him that he was quite free to go alone, whenever and wherever he pleased, which he did. It was not long before they were seeing very little of each other, making no effort to repair their estrangement. One evening in early autumn when Arnon was about to sit down to a solitary dinner, Philip surprised her by calling. She insisted upon his dining with her, and he seemed glad to accept. She found it easy to talk with Philip, whose reticence everybody mistook for stupidity. It was not long before the conversation was becoming quite personal, by mutual consent, for they were both lonely. Arnon's life in Rome, Philip was saying, must have turned out to be very tiresome. Tiresome, said Arnon, wasn't the word she would have used, but it was at least that. Sometimes, declared Philip dreamily, I can hardly endure it. I have often thought of running away, to Sicily, perhaps. To live alone, he seemed talking to himself now, with eyes half closed, in the country, in a little house, on a green hillside, with fruits and flowers to cultivate, trees, grass, sunsets, and a friendly dog or two. But would you be happy, without your family? asked Arnon, when he had ended. I have no family, he muttered. Herodias is never at home. I do not ask where she spends her time. Why don't you? ventured Arnon. She is your wife. For the same reason that you do not ask Antipas where he spends his time, said Philip. He chuckled unpleasantly. I dare say that if we inquired of their present whereabouts we would find them in the same place. You mean, they are often together? They are always together. And if I were you, Arnon, 
I should leave for Arabia at once, before this scandal humiliates you, and your people. Arnon's heart beat hard and her throat hurt. I think that was why you came to see me tonight, she said weakly. You thought it was high time for me to know. Philip nodded, without meeting her eyes. Everyone else knows, he said. Why shouldn't you? Next morning the unavoidable interview between Antipas and Arnon terminated their unhappy alliance. To his considerable relief, the prince's scandalous behavior was not discussed. Arnon simply stated that Rome was no place for an Arabian princess to hope for happiness, and Antipas cheerfully agreed that her return to her own people was the only solution to their problem. He would arrange for it without delay. A well-appointed pleasure barge was chartered, stocked with everything that might make the long voyage comfortable. A score of trusted men, experienced in handling caravans, were engaged to safeguard the overland journey from the port at Gaza. On the day before the sailing, Antipas tried to turn the conversation toward the probable attitude of King Aretas. Reassuring Arnon on the wisdom of her decision to return home, he added pleasantly, and how pleased your father will be to have you come back to him. I'm sure he has been lonely without you. Arnon frowned, pursed her lips, and stared squarely into his uneasy eyes. He shifted his position and made a pretense of casualness. Slowly lowering her head, she continued to search his face from under her long lashes. She gave him a slow, enigmatic smile. My father will welcome his daughter's return to his tent, she said, measuring her words. But Aretas, the king of Arabia, may not be pleased when he learns that the princess of Arabia has been put to shame by an alien enemy. Meaning that he will seek revenge? Antipas was serious now and his voice was unsteady. Prince Antipas is not well versed in Arabian history, replied Arnon, if he thinks that this indignity might be easily overlooked. The implied warning disposed of the prince's suavity and self-assurance. He paced the floor, flushed and angry. Let the king of Arabia do what he will, he shouted. Doubtless the princess will put the worst possible construction on her difficulties. She will not tell the king that she made no effort to fulfill her obligations to her husband. He paused in his march and regarded her sternly. I have not injured you. On the contrary, you are abandoning me. And I may as well tell you now that when your ship has sailed tomorrow I shall execute a bill of divorcement, on the grounds of desertion. Arnon suddenly sat erect. Her eyes lighted. Do you really mean that? She exclaimed. Accept my thanks, Antipas, for this gracious favor. Stunned by this unexpected blow to his vanity, he studied her eyes soberly. No, she was not ironical. She meant it sincerely. He had hesitated to hand her this crushing news, and now it was evident that she was delighted to receive it. He bowed stiffly and walked toward the door, where he turned for a final word. You will find on the barge a young, well-born Greek slave, whom I bought yesterday at considerable cost. She is your personal property. I hope you will take her with you. She reads, writes, and speaks Greek fluently. In addition to her other duties, perhaps she will teach my little daughter a more graceful language than the crude imitation of Aramaic that is spoken in Arabia. Arnand flushed a little. Whether our language is crude or not, she retorted, depends on who speaks it. And, I want no parting gift from you. As you like, said Antipas indifferently. The Greek slave will be on the barge, and she is your property. If you do not want her, pitch her overboard. The prince did not appear when the ship sailed. Arnon had not expected him, and was not disappointed. At the last minute before the hawsers were hauled aboard, Philip arrived in a surprisingly happy mood. He led her a little way apart on the afterdeck for a final word. This is a good day for you, he said gaily, and for me too. You are going home to people who love you, freed from everything that has made your life unpleasant. And you? queried Arnon. I too am free. Herodias has informed me that she and my brother want to be married, and would I divorce her? Would I? I do not often move with so much alacrity. And I am sailing in a week, for Sicily. How fortunate you are, Philip, said Arnon. I do hope you will be contented there. I shall often think of you, in your garden. She lowered her voice. The prince may have told you that he is divorcing me. Philip nodded. I was gratified and a bit surprised that Antipas found the courage to tell you himself. My brother has always disliked to admit that he is a scoundrel. After farewells were said and the ship had cast off, Arnon was conducted to her commodious cabin, where an uncommonly bright and pretty young woman, of nearly her own age, was unpacking her boxes. She had quite forgotten about the slave. The girl made a deep curtsy, with eyes timidly averted, and continued with her task. I am told that you belong to me, 
said Arnon kindly. What is your name? I own, your highness, said the girl, with another obsequious curtsy. You may address me as Princess Arnon and you need not curtsy. Are you a good sailor? I do not know, Princess Arnon. But this is not your first voyage? No, Princess Arnon. I was brought to Rome from Piraeus in a slave ship when I was only ten, but we were crowded down deep in the hold, where it was always dark and there was no air. I was very sick, all the time. Perhaps I may do better if... If you are allowed to breathe, assisted Arnon. We will see to that. She smiled reassuringly, and the girl's eyes softened. It will be a long voyage, she added. I am taking you to Arabia. I am glad, Princess Arnon, murmured Ione. You are not sorry to leave Rome? You will not be homesick? I have no home, Princess Arnon. I am glad to leave Rome. I shall be happy in Arabia. But you were never in Arabia, said Arnon, amused. No, Princess Arnon, said Ione, but I know I shall be happy, if you are there. The caravan wearily drew up before the king's encampment at sunset. Old Kadar was much moved as he helped Arnon out of the cramped camel housing, lifting her down as if she were still a little girl. Word spread rapidly that the princess had come home. Nefti met her at the door and tenderly placed the baby Farah in her arms. Arnon's eyes were misty as she looked down into the child's smiling face. The servants gathered about, making soft little murmurs of fond delight. The princess inquired for her father. The king should be here soon, said Kadar. They buried the good chief Ildar in this afternoon. As the twilight came on, Aretas arrived, sober and moody over the loss of his great friend. Arnon's presence comforted him, but he was impatient to learn why she had been brought back by strangers. She tried to spare him, tried to take most of the blame, tried to temper his rising anger, but he demanded the full truth, and she told him everything. Aretas did not eat or sleep that night. Next morning, well-mounted couriers were dispatched in all directions with messages to the counselors tersely telling the story. The counselors, in turn, sent word to their tribal sheiks that an expedition would move at once upon Jerusalem. A mobilization of cavalry was ordered, the concentration to occur on the east bank of the Jordan near the village of Jeshimot. By the fifth day 2,000 armed horsemen were assembled. The violent rage that had swept Aretas was not apparent now. That fire, still dangerously hot, had been banked. When the king spoke to his impatient troops he was composed. Arabia had suffered a great humiliation at the hands of the Jews. A swift and savage blow was to be struck at Herod, seeing that the despicable Prince Antipas was out of reach. The Arabians needed no urging. They were so eager to proceed that the counselors postponed the election of a successor to Ildaran. Indeed, it was with much difficulty that Aretas detained the vanguard until the contingents from far distances had arrived. Young Zendi would have taken a score of his reckless neighbors on ahead of the others had not Aretas spoken to him sharply. You may be the ruler of these brave men, someday, he said, and it is not too soon to let them know that you have not only a courageous heart but a cool head. When the eagerly awaited order was shouted on that eventful morning they bounded away to the west, forded the river, scrambled up the bank into Judea, galloped four abreast across the plain, through the startled villages, over the highways, into the palm-bordered avenue that bisected suburban Bethany. They dashed down the long hill from whose top the turrets and spires of Jerusalem shone brightly in the noonday sun. Still for abreast, they rode through the massive open gates, a score of bewildered guards and revenue officers scattering before them. They proceeded at full gallop through the narrow, winding, crowded streets, indifferent to the shouts and screams of the panic-driven crowds that scurried for safety in doorways and alleys. Now they had reached Herod's imposing palace, the Insula, where they drew rein. Lining up in precise ranks that filled the spacious plaza fronting the huge marble insula, they dismounted from their wet horses and stood waiting while Aretas and the councillors rode up the broad white steps and across the stone-floored terrace and up another flight of steps toward the impressive bronze doors. A thousand Roman legionaries stood guard, but had received no order to obstruct the mounted Arabians. Perhaps the legate was stunned out of his wits by the sheer impudence of these grim horsemen who had dared to ride up to the very doors of the insula. It struck Aretas strangely that so large a force guarded the king's palace. Surely he had had no word that the Arabians were making an invasion, or, if he had ordered out his troops to repel an attack, why were they standing there motionless? Aretas shouted to the legate, who approached respectfully. Take me to Herod. He demanded. King Herod is dead, sire. Have a care, shouted Zendi. It is dangerous to lie to the king of Arabia. I have told you the truth, sire, 
reiterated the legate calmly. King Herod died of a shock early this morning. He gestured toward his troops. This is a guard of honor. Open those doors, commanded Aretas. I came to see Herod and I mean to see him, alive or dead. After a brief parley, Legate Julian gave the order. The great bronze door slowly swung open. The mounted detachment moved forward. But, sire, protested the legate, I hope you are not going to ride your horses into the insula. Surely you would show more respect for the king of the Jews. Stand aside, growled Aretas. I am not here to show respect. They rode into the marble lined palace, down the broad corridor, inquired of a frightened sentry where Herod's body was to be found, and, upon learning that it was in the council chamber, proceeded to ride into the high domed, beautifully appointed room. In the center, on a bier, reposed the king of the Jews. The military guard, numbering a score, stood their ground. Forming a circle about the corpse, the Arabian sat for a long moment in silence. Aretas pointed his riding whip toward the waxen face. It is clear we cannot take revenge on that, he said calmly. And we have no cause to hew the Roman legion to pieces. And there is no Jewish army to fight. Aretas dismounted and the counselors followed his example. With bridle reins in hand, they stood in a circle around the bier and held a conference. All were agreed that there was nothing further to do in Jerusalem. Duma, dissatisfied, suggested that they hang Herod's body to a tree in the courtyard. Mishma, who was expected to be appointed chief of the counselors, objected to this on the ground that it wouldn't be dignified. It would be as dignified, said Duma, as what we are doing now. For Mishma's bay mare had taken a step forward and was inquisitively sniffing the gray feet of the late king. Everybody chuckled. Even Aratus grinned. They mounted their horses, rode out of the council chamber and down the corridor and out into the warm sunshine. A report was made to the cavalrymen. They were instructed to be at ease and do what they liked until sunset. Disappointed and disgruntled, they rode back into the business zone, and, after the manner of idling soldiers, made a nuisance of themselves in the shops and markets. No serious damage was done. One indignant old goldsmith remarked, Kindly leave your horses outside. You are welcome, but we have no accommodation for horses. The Arabians thought this was funny and laughed heartily at the joke as they rode about through his bazaar, examining the expensive merchandise. Pleased that the Arabs did not loot his store, the goldsmith cheerfully answered all their questions. How do you happen to be doing business today? They asked. We've had no order to close up, replied the old merchant. You know that King Herod is dead, don't you? Of course. Sick very long? Hadn't you heard? Heard he was dead, that's all. There's more to it than that. Prince Archelaus arrived from Rome last night, and he and the king quarreled. Somehow the prince was stabbed, accidentally, they say, and the king had a stroke, and died. The Arabians stopped browsing about the shop and surrounded the goldsmith inquisitively. Was the prince badly hurt? Yes, he was said to be dying. As the afternoon wore on some of the cavalrymen managed to find some wine, which gave them renewed interest in their mission of vengeance. They rode their horses into the lobby of the temple, tore down several exquisitely wrought tapestries from the walls, and set fire to the high priest's palace. But as for revenge, no one was satisfied. That could come later, when they had access to Antipas. He was the ruler of Galilee and would eventually return to his domain. Some day, they declared, a few picked men of Arabia would pay him a visit. At dusk they set off in the moonlight for their homeland. Next morning, as if the expedition had not already acquainted itself with a sufficient number of unusual incidents, the king's white stallion misjudged the width of a cross-country wall and pitched his rider violently to the ground. They hurriedly dismounted and gathered about him. Aretas was dead. Improvising a litter made of young saplings, they slowly bore the body toward home. That evening they camped on the plain near Jeshimot. After their supper, eaten in silence, the troops assembled to hear Mishma confer the kingship of Arabia upon Zendi, the son of Ildaran. Chapter 3 To the satisfaction of Arabia, young Zendi dealt quite generously with Princess Arnon. This he could well afford to do, for he had inherited from his father Ildaran large flocks of sheep, herds of cattle, and enough camels to outfit a dozen caravans on their regular journeys to the sea. It was his right as the new king to take over the entire domain controlled by Aretas but he immediately asked the counselors to cede a tract of the king's land to the princess for the pasturage of livestock bequeathed by her father. In view of the sympathy which the Arabians felt for their unhappy princess, this warm-hearted display of kindness greatly advantaged the boyish monarch as he entered upon his duties. 
and it was clear that he would stand in need of his country's loyalty, for but little snow had fallen during the previous winter and the competition for grazing grounds would demand firm and wise control when the midsummer sun had made the problem serious. By this magnanimous act, Zendi had made a good beginning. Even Mishma, who had come so nearly being the new king himself, expressed his belief that Arabia was in competent hands and gave the son of Ildir and his full support. With the approval of the councillors, Arnon's establishment was set up on a broad plateau two miles south of the king's encampment, and it seemed very much like home, for she was entitled to all the furniture and household retainers belonging to her father. At Zendi's gracious suggestion, the royal ensign fluttered at her imposing entrance door and its replica was embroidered on her apparel. And far as to wear the royal crest on her clothing too, Zendi had added, much to Arnon's delight. So many internal problems were distressing the king, the councillors, and the tribal chieftains as this trying summer wore on, that the question of an immediate avenging of Arnon was abandoned. Affairs in Arabia were quite difficult enough without the added risk and responsibility of setting forth on a punitive errand requiring their best men and much valuable time. Word had drifted in that Prince Antipas and his disreputable wife had taken up permanent residence in Galilee. Very good, said Arabia. We will know where to find him. Let him be patient and wait our convenience. A few of the more hot-headed young blades, still disgruntled over the recent fiasco in Jerusalem, demurred at this postponement, maintaining that the honor of Arabia was at stake and that any delay to deal out retribution might be interpreted by the Jews as a sign of indifference, or worse. To suit the indignation of their reckless sons and nephews, the councillors prepared an imposing statement of intent to right this wrong, which any impatient young Arabian might sign, and act upon, whenever he wished. In the king's main tent, where all state business was conducted and council meetings were held, there was a massive oak table elaborately carved with devices relating to the interests of herders and shepherds. This venerated table had long served as the equivalent of a throne. Nobody remembered the name of the craftsman who had built it for he had been dead at least three centuries, but it had been in uninterrupted use as a symbol of executive authority ever since the reign of the fabulous Terra, whose deeds of strength and skill had inspired the minstrels for many generations. On this table were laid documents of high importance, petitions to and edicts of the councillors and decrees of the king. After much deliberation, the councillors drew up a formal vow, impressively lettered in colors, stating that the undersigned hereby pledged himself to avenge the princess Arnon by destroying Antipas the Tetrarch of Galilee and Perea. The Avenger was to choose his own time and manner of fulfilling his vow. It was his responsibility to decide whether he would perform it clandestinely and alone or with the voluntary assistance of others. But once he had pledged to do it, the task was in his hands and Arabia would expect him to keep his promise, whatever the cost. The heavy sheet of papyrus was ceremoniously placed upon the table and the word went forth that it was there, with a stylus and ink horn. Beside it, for any man to sign who felt urged to do so. But the blazing sun continued to scorch the grass, and every man was fully occupied with the desperate search for a pasture to save what remained of his decimated flocks. Everybody agreed that the contemptible Antipas must be put to death, but he would have to wait for it until Arabia saw better times. To Arnon, this tardiness to wreak vengeance upon Antipas was of small concern. It would be a dangerous business and whoever attempted it would almost certainly lose his life for the stronghold in Galilee would be well guarded by the man who doubtless lived in fear of a reprisal. Quite enough unhappiness had already resulted from Arabia's pact with the Jews. She said that to Zendi, upon learning of the vow that the councillors had prepared. I do not want to be responsible for any more trouble, protested Arnon. Why not let the matter rest? And Zendi had agreed that her suggestion was sensible enough, but added that all Arabia would sleep more comfortably when Antipas slept without prospect of waking. There were some encouraging rains that autumn, much too late to benefit the burned pasture lands, but giving promise of better fare next season. The winter, however, was bitterly cold and the snow alarmingly scanty. The Arabian shepherd was not without his superstitions, nor was this fascination for the supernatural limited to the custody of lonely men who guarded their flocks in outlying regions, where fears and dreads were personalized. Almost everybody felt that an unusual epidemic of misfortunes hinted at retribution. And while the more intelligent disclaimed any interest in such witcheries, even the best of them might be heard to remark, though pretending not to mean it, that someone or something must have laid a curse upon Arabia. For the following summer was the worst season that the oldest could remember, and in the fall there were but few caravans carrying hides and wool to the port of Gaza. The young camels they would have brought to market in Petra, Jericho, and Joppa were too lean and shabby. For a profitable sale. 
There was very little surplus of grain to seed the livestock through the approaching winter. The air was tense with complaint and constraint. Somebody was to blame. The trouble all seemed to stem from Arabia's alliance with the Jews. Everyone was able to recall now how he himself had predicted, at the time, that no good could come of it. Of course no one held it against Arnon, for clearly she had suffered from it far more than anybody. And it would be cruel foolishness to frown upon the hapless child who symbolized that unfortunate union. But, even so, the visits of Arnon's friends became less and less frequent. She did not fret about it at first, realizing that everyone was weighted with worries at home, and in no mood for sociability. Curiously enough, there was better pasture on Arnon's land than anywhere else for many miles. Her neighbors did not openly begrudge the princess this bit of prosperity, but it did seem strange. One day a sheik remarked half humorously that wherever you found a Jew located you might expect to see fat sheep. A Jew? queried the friend who rode beside him. What Jew? Had you not noticed Princess Arnon's pasture? The princess is not a Jew, retorted his friend. No, but her child is. It was all but incredible, the speed with which this idle quip raced across the brown face of Arabia until it was repeated in the coldest tents of the hungry highlands. But there were a few whose unswerving loyalty to the princess made them all the more eager to show her friendly attentions as this unfavorable sentiment developed. Zendi and Rena rode over every few days to make sure of Arnon's welfare. Although she was now a princess only by courtesy, Zendi endeavored to keep her informed of movements in the kingdom, as if she still had a right to know. One day he talked of the unfortunate expedition to Jerusalem, and reported that Emperor Tiberius had decided not to appoint another Jew as a ruler of Judea. Henceforth the chief executive would be a Roman. The new appointee was already located in Jerusalem. He had been elevated from the prefecture of Crete. His name was Pontius Pilate. Doubtless he would get along with the Jews. He was said to be a tactful conciliator. Will this affect the position of Antipas, in Galilee? Arnon wanted to know. Probably not, surmised Zendi. The tribute Rome receives from poor little Galilee isn't worth what it costs to collect it. Antipas could afford to pay their taxes himself and doubtless would do so gladly enough, just to preserve the title of Tetrarch. Sometimes Zendi and Rena gave Arnon an opportunity to speak of the growing aloofness toward her but she appeared not to be aware of it, and the painful subject was not discussed. Frequently Mishma's pretty daughter-in-law Kitra came to spend the afternoon, bringing her four-year-old son Voldi, who had promptly taken a fancy to little Farah. The warm friendship of Kitra and Arnon, begun in childhood, had ripened to a comforting intimacy, nourished perhaps by the fact that Princess Arnon was no longer of the king's household, while Kitra had missed being in that position by the mere accident of a delayed appointment of her father-in-law Mishma as chief of the councillors and, as such, the immediate successor to Aretas. They spent long afternoons together, happily watching their children's absorption in one another, for Farah had had no other playmates and Voldi had never taken such an interest in another child. Sometimes the two young mothers would wonder whether this tender little friendship might continue as their children grew up, though they admitted that it wasn't customary. After three consecutive winters of such hardships as Arabia had never known, succeeded by scorched summers presaging further endurance of famine for both men and beasts, the snow fell in abundance. It fell endlessly and everywhere, on the mountains, in the valleys, covering great tracts of arid desert that had not seen any moisture for a score of years. It snowed and thawed and snowed again until the wadis were in flood. Spring came early, the sun was bright, all Arabia was a green pasture. Men who had become so deeply depressed over their losses that they had actually debated whether, for the country's sake, it might not be advisable to carry Princess Arnon's child back to Jerusalem where she belongs, were now glad that they had done no such thing, and some of them felt sheepish over having shared in these conversations. It was hardly to be expected that such good fortune could happen again, but it did. Not only during the next winter, but the winter following, heavy snows blanketed the entire nation, and in the succeeding autumns long, Heavily laden caravans trekked down the mountains and rounded the southern shore of the Dead Sea, and slowly marched to the Old Salt Trail from Engedi to Gaza. Not infrequently some gratified shepherd, with silver jingling in his pouch, would remark that the young daughter of Princess Arnon, far from being a menace to Arabia, was bringing Jewish prosperity to the nation, to which his neighbor would reply, I always said you were a lot of fools for hating that pretty child. But, you said yourself that she ought to be put out of the country. If I did, that doesn't make you any less a fool for saying so. Everybody who had seen little Farah agreed now that she was the most beautiful child in Arabia, which was unquestionably true. She had the full, 
wide set eyes and round face of a Jewess, and a much fairer complexion than her attractive mother. Her slim, lithe body was distinctly Arabian, as was her interest in outdoor life. She had been lifted into a small saddle when she was barely five, the worshipful old Kadar walking alongside the pony. It was not long before she protested against such attendance. One morning when she was no more than six she appeared alone at the king's encampment, to the consternation of the household. Zendi himself rode home beside her to make sure she arrived safely. Arnon, quite complacent, met them at the door. You shouldn't let her do that, reproved Zendi. She isn't old enough. The pony is, said Arnon. He wouldn't let her get into trouble. He follows her about like a dog. But ponies are treacherous, Arnon. I should much sooner trust a horse. That is quite true, sire. I shall let her ride one of the horses. She had spoken half playfully, but added, in a suddenly serious tone, Don't forget, Zendi, that my little daughter is every inch an Arabian. You were taught to ride almost as soon as you were able to walk, and so was I. This incident, trivial enough in itself, was reported to the counselors, who received it, and its implications, with smiles and nods of approval. The child was unfortunately afflicted with alien blood but it was clear that she was predominantly Arabian and deserved recognition as one of their own people. By the time the story was well circulated, losing nothing in its travels, Little Far was an accomplished rider, skillful and unafraid. And the rumor wasn't far from the truth. But if Arabia had an imaginary picture of this growing child as a reckless rowdy, leaping half-broken racehorses over high hedges and deep wadis with the firm hands and pliant knees of an experienced cavalryman, there was another side of Farah's life which nobody saw but her own family, and King Zendi. Thanks to Ion, Farah was receiving a liberal education. To all appearances, the beloved and indispensable Ion had fully adjusted herself to her Arabian environment, but it was a sorrow to her never to hear or speak a word of her native Greek. When little Farah was learning to talk, Ion amused herself by teaching her Greek words for familiar objects. When she handed the baby her porridge plate, she would say, Pinnacos. And Farah, ever eager to please I own, would lisp, Pinnacles, and because I own seemed so delighted, she proudly repeated the word, over and over. The little porridge plate was always Pinnacles after that, and the little cup was always Potterian and the napkin was Sudarian. Arnon too enjoyed the game. Teach her to say I love you, I own. Taking the child on her lap, I own said softly, Farah, I love you. Philo say. Philo say. I love you. Philo say repeated Farah dutifully, happily. Say that to your mother, Farah. Arnon reached out her arms and little Farah cuddled close to her. I love you, whispered Arnon. Philo say, said Farah. As the days went by, the intrusion of Greek words into their conversation was no longer a novelty that made them laugh merrily. Common nouns needed action. Words multiplied into sentences. Table talk was conducted in Greek. After supper, on winter evenings, Ion taught Faro to write it. Happy to see her child profitably entertained, Arnon joined in these exercises, though she never acquired the effortless fluency with which Faro handled the strange language. By the time she was nine the little girl spoke Greek by preference. One day, King Sendi called to inquire about their welfare and overheard Faro in the adjoining room talking to Ion. He broke off what he was saying, and listened, and then grinned incredulously. How long has this been going on? He inquired. Ever since she was a tiny tot, said Arnon. It's Ion's doing. I suppose there's no harm in it? Harm? Of course not. I wish I knew some Greek myself. But, you do, don't you, Zendi? A mere smattering, picked up on my journey to Corinth. I often have errands in Petra. It would be much to my advantage if I could speak their language. Arnon laughed a little as she said, perhaps Farah could help you. To her surprise, Zendi did not see anything funny about this. He frowned thoughtfully. It just occurs to me, he said, that we have, in our cabinet of curiosities, a scroll that the people of Petra presented to your father at his coronation. I shall bring it over. Maybe Farah might like to see it. The next afternoon he brought the scroll. Ion was invited in to look at it. She gasped with happy surprise. What a treasure. Unconsciously ignoring the king. She breathlessly explained the subject of the scroll to Farah in a long sentence utterly incomprehensible to their important guest. And Far clapped her hands with delight. I would give much for that knowledge, said Zendi soberly. It's easy, sire, said Farah. When he left, shortly afterward, Farah walked beside him in the paddock. He took her small hand. 
The old master of the stables led forward a beautiful roan gelding. Farah's eyes shone. How do you like my new horse, Farah? asked the king as he gathered up the reins. Prosphily, murmured Farah reverentially, patting the gelding's glossy shoulder. Prosphily hippos. What did you say? demanded the king. Lovely, said Farah. Lovely horse. Zendi chuckled and swung himself into the saddle. Kai Megalios hippicos, ventured Farah coyly. And what does that mean? The king wanted to know. Farah shrugged a pretty shoulder, gave an enigmatic smile, and made a graceful curtsy. Zendi waved a hand and rode away. It was evident that Farah's final remark, whatever it meant, was complimentary. After that the tribesmen were often amused to see their king cantering alongside Princess Arnon's pretty child, evidently engaged in serious conversation. One day, after a visit to Petra, Zendi presented his young preceptress with an armful of scrolls which he had bought. Ione, on her knees, laid them out in a row on the rug and caressed them with worshipful hands, murmuring, Thou Masia! Thou Masia! To have such a rich library, it was indeed wonderful. Marvelous! As for Farah's early knowledge of her origin, she had been contented with the explanation that her father was a prince who had been required to leave them that he might perform his duties as the ruler of a faraway country. Now that she was asking for a little more information, Arnon would talk of the great cities in which she had lived with Farah's father, carefully avoiding any mention of her unhappiness. Will my father ever visit us? Farah had asked wistfully. He would find it difficult, Arnon had replied, and this was the exact truth. Great rulers, she went on, have many cares. But, does he not care, at all, for us? A ruler's life, my dear, is not his own. His only concern is for the welfare of his country. Arnon despised herself for what, in this case, was a ridiculous lie, but felt that it was an easy way out of a painful discussion. The time would come soon enough, she knew, when the whole matter would have to be faced, but she hoped to postpone it as long as possible. Farah was beginning to be aware of her loneliness and singularity. She was nearing ten and growing very restless. She needed companions of her own age. It had been a long time since Kitra had brought Boldy along when she came to visit. One day Farah ventured to inquire how he was. Oh, that boy! exclaimed Kitra, busying herself with her needlework. He thinks he is quite a man now. Growing so fast, tall as I am. You know how boys of that age are, Farah. They don't want to play with girls. All they think about is their horses, and hunting dogs, and archery, and fencing. Her eyes slid past far to Arnon. You may be glad Farah is a girl. I never have a peaceful moment when Voldy is riding that unruly horse of his. Farah rides too, said Arnon quietly. Yes, I know, said Kidra. And Farah rides very well indeed. Then the talk veered off to another topic and Farah strolled away to her own room. She languidly took up the little tapestry on which she had been investing oddments of unoccupied time. Ione joined her. They sat in silence for a while, Ione exasperatingly tranquil, Farah recklessly stabbing her needle into the stiff fabric. Don't you ever feel penned in, Ione? The tapestry sailed across the room and landed on the bed. How does it feel to be a slave? Farah went on savagely, as if she meant to offend. If I were a slave, I'd run away. Why don't you? Where would I run to? asked Ione, blinking back the tears, for Farah's rudeness had hurt. You could go home, gruffly. But, this is my home, dear, same as it is yours. Nonsense! muttered Farah. You can't be contented here any more than I can. This place stifles me. Sometimes I think I'll jump out of my skin. Your mother would be very sorry, Farah, if she heard you say such things, reproved Ione. Well, she won't, declared Farah. But, suddenly dejected. I had to say it to somebody. Please forgive me. Of course, murmured I own, quick to understand. It's natural for children of your age to be restless. You're growing so fast that the encampment isn't big enough to hold you. You will get over that when you are older. Far across the room, flung herself down on her bed, and lacing her fingers behind her head, stared at the blue ceiling. Wouldn't you like to see something besides sheep? She mumbled, mostly to herself and go to some place where they talked about other things than the price of camels, and how are we going to find enough grass? Wouldn't you like to live in a great house, in a great city? No, dear, replied Ione, when some rejoinder seemed necessary. I have done that. I'm quite satisfied to be here, where I am, in these beautiful mountains. Maybe I should be satisfied too, admitted Farah. I wish I was like other people. 
There's something wrong with me, I own, she exclaimed impulsively. I'm different. And I hate it. It was not until she was eleven that Farah learned how and why she was different. She came by accident upon the soul-sickening truth about her father's perfidy and her mother's incurable unhappiness and her own defenseless position as a half-breed. She had ridden with Arnon, that midsummer afternoon, to the king's encampment. Zendi was absent on a tour of the eastern tribes. Rena and Arnon lounged in the queen's suite while Farah and the spoiled young prince Duran strolled about indifferently inspecting the kennels and stables. Tiring of this entertainment and agreeing that the sun was too hot, the children returned to the spacious living quarters, where Duran, eager to impress his guest, led the way into the huge, high-vaulted tent which was set apart for the exclusive use of the king and his counselors. With a boyish swagger, Duran stalked about, explaining the various appointments. Having casually seated himself in the king's massive chair, he invited Farah to do the same. He wouldn't think, he said, of letting anyone else sit there. Farah smiled prettily to show her appreciation. Thus encouraged, Duran led her around the ancient table, declaiming what he knew about the symbolic carvings, and, in a hushed voice, called her attention to the impressive documents which lay awaiting official action. Farah, who had come to have deep respect for ancient crafts and historical writings, gave full attention to the table and its important freight. You mustn't touch anything, cautioned Duran. Farah shook her head and continued to survey the awesome documents with fascination. Presently she came upon a slightly faded, multicolored sheet of papyrus which she read, with widening eyes and mounting comprehension. Duran, a little younger but much taller, stood at her shoulder, staring in bewilderment at her flushed cheek. She turned abruptly toward him, searching his face, but he gave no sign of knowing or caring what tiresome thing she had been reading. When they arrived home shortly before sunset, Far followed Arnon into her bedroom, impulsively reported what she had seen in the king's tent, and entreated her mother to tell her everything, which she did. Everything. The alliance, the marriage, the lonely days in Jerusalem, the humiliating days in Rome. All the pent-up wretchedness of Arnon's ruined life poured forth, accompanied by a flood of tears. When the sad, sordid story was finished, the unhappy princess dried her eyes and was surprised to find that Farah, instead of sharing her mother's grief, was standing there dry-eyed, with her childish mouth firmed into a straight line and her brows contracted into an expression of bitter hatred. And why has no one hunted him down, and punished him? She demanded indignantly. It's much too late for that, said Arnon. When it happened our country was in great distress. No one could be spared. And now that we have such great prosperity, no one remembers. She sighed deeply, and went on, perhaps it is just as well. Galilee is a long way off. The prince is well protected. Let us try to forget all about it, dear. Farah shook her head slowly. I shall remember, always. She muttered. That winter was long and severe. Arnon fell ill with a fever and relentless fits of coughing. Farah through these anxious days had no other concern but for her mother. Ion tried unsuccessfully to renew her interest in the classics, in her modeling, in her drawing. Do persuade the unhappy child to get out and take some exercise. Begged Arnon. She is so unlike herself, I own. It worries me too, Princess Arnon. Something has come over her. She is fretting because I am ill, said Arnon. Of course, Princess Arnon, agreed I own obligingly, but you will be better when spring comes again. And spring did come again, and Arnon improved enough to be able to sit in the sunshine and walk in the garden, but Farah's depression was unrelieved. All her natural gaiety was gone. One afternoon when Rena came to call, she found Arnon and Farah together in the garden. Almost immediately, Farah excused herself and strolled away. Rena followed her with troubled eyes. She is growing taller, but, Arnon, Farah does not look well. Is something worrying her? Farah has been fretting all winter about me, said Arnon. She is a most dutiful child. But now that you are getting well. I have thought of that, Rena. She should be happy again. I wish we could think of something that might divert her. She has no interest in anything. She will have a birthday soon, remember Drenna. How about having a party? Her face lighted. Would you let me have a party for Farah? I know Zendi would be glad. We will make quite a day of it, with the counselors and their wives and all the children and grandchildren, and races and games and plenty to eat. It is like you, dear Rena, to want to do such a kindness, said Arnon. I hope you will not go to too much trouble. Zendi will approve, I know, said Rena. It's high time we gave that sweet child some attention. We have neglected her too long. 
it should mean something to the people that Farah's grandfathers were kings. So, on the 15th of Adar, which turned out to be the fairest day of that early summer, the king and queen celebrated Farah's 12th anniversary with a party that greatly exceeded Rena's original plan, not only in the entertainment provided but in the number of guests. For, having decided to do it, Zendi included all the sheikhs and tribal leaders with their families. Farah had been dismayed upon learning of the project in her honor and so seriously objected that she was all but an open revolt, until Zendi himself explained that as a child of royal blood she was not only entitled to certain favors but was expected to receive them graciously. And when Farah continued to frown disapprovingly, Zendi's patience gave out and he informed her that whether she wanted it or not there was going to be a birthday party for her at the king's encampment on the 15th day of Adar, and that, whether she wanted to or not, she was going to be there bright and early. Late in the night, after the party was over and everyone had gone home, Zendi told Rena what he had said, so impatiently, to Farah when she had begged him not to celebrate her birthday. If I had had the slightest idea of what was troubling the child, he confided, I should have yielded to her wishes. As it stands now our celebration of her birthday has been of no advantage to her. Indeed, it has done her harm. Everyone will think she is queer, if not definitely out of her mind. The almost incredible thing that happened was reserved for the banquet in the evening, attended only by the royal household, the councillors and their wives, and a few distinguished guests from Petra, where Zendi was becoming favorably known. Nothing unusual had marked the happy events of the day. There had been exciting contests of strength and skill, acrobatic performances, wrestling, fencing, foot races. Magicians had done baffling tricks. Minstrels had sung. There were horse races that would have done credit to the famed elliptical track in Rome's mighty Colosseum. And there were equestrian exhibitions staged by various groups of reckless young Arabs, some of the contestants hardly more than children. As was to be expected, there were a few bad spills, some broken bones and ruined horses. The final event was a breathtaking hurdle race ridden by youths in their middle teens. The hurdles were high and the race was dangerous. Of the twelve horses that started, three finished. Obliged by the circumstances to sit with the dignitaries in the royal stand, Farah turned to her mother as the perspiring young victor rode up to salute the king, and whispered, Who is that boy? Before Arnon could reply, Kitra, seated immediately behind them, leaned forward to say, with a proud but nervous little laugh, Why, don't you remember him, Farah? That's Boldy. You used to play together. Farah turned to her with a smile and a nod of remembrance. He is a wonderful writer, she murmured in the husky timbre tone that her voice had acquired. Queen Rena, overhearing, said, We will ask him to come up, Farah, and renew acquaintance. Farah bit her lip and flushed a little. Meeting Arnon's eyes, she frowned and shook her head almost imperceptibly. Arnon smiled, pursed her lips, and nodded, as if to say, We mustn't object to that, it's quite the thing to do. Presently Voldy, dismounting, came up into the royal enclosure, bowed deeply to the king and queen and made his way toward his mother. They gave him a seat beside Farah. She searched his brown, freckled face with wide, sober eyes. Then her full lips parted in a smile of candid admiration. He colored a little through the tan, under this frank inspection, and slowly met her smile with the bewildered expression of one who has just come upon a valuable discovery. Rena, keenly observant, turned her head toward Kitra and whispered, Isn't that sweet? Kitra nodded and smiled briefly but there was a trace of anxiety in her eyes. Rena caught it, and thought she understood. You grew up, didn't you? murmured Farah, in her peculiarly low-pitched voice that made everything she said sound confidential. So did you, stammered Voldy. I shouldn't have known you. That was really great riding, Voldy, said Farah fervently. You ride too, don't you? Not like that. Want to take a ride with me, some day? If you think it wouldn't be tiresome, to ride very carefully. Their mothers and the queen, shamelessly eavesdropping, laughed at Voldy's expense, but he was too fascinated to notice their amusement. Tomorrow afternoon? He asked. Farah nodded slowly, smiled a little, then suddenly retreated from the enraptured eyes. You promised to spend the day with your grandfather, Voldy, put in Kidra. I'll tell him. Voldy rose to go. Tomorrow afternoon, Farah. They all, except Farah, followed the tall boy with their eyes and saw him pause to say something to his grandfather who soberly made a show of concealing his pride in the youngster's obvious affection for him. Happy days for good old Mishma, remarked the queen. Yes, said Kitra absently. Noting the remote tone of Kitra's uninterested response, 
Arnon involuntarily turned her head to seek a reason for it, but Keitra did not meet her inquiring eyes. The little byplay was quite lost on Farah, whose attention pursued Voldy as he strode down the steps and mounted his tired horse. In the evening oxen were roasted over deep pits of glowing coals, and everybody feasted in the open but the royal hosts and their important guests. Farah was the only young person present at the king's banquet. There had been some debate whether to invite a few of the younger ones of Farah's age, but it was difficult to discriminate among them and the room would not accommodate them all. After the elaborate dinner was served, brief speeches were made in honor of Farah, whom they all addressed as princess. No one of the eulogistic counselors made any reference to the royal blood contributed by Judea, but memories were refreshed concerning the wisdom and courage of Grand Cyreddus, who was already well on the way to an exalted rating among Arabia's legendary heroes. Throughout the ordeal, for it was nothing less than that, Farah sat between her mother and King Zendi, attentive and sober-faced, as became a young girl unused to so much adult acclaim. She seemed to be listening to everything that was said though close observers noticed that her expression remained unchanged when Chief Counselor Mishma was reminded of an amusing incident and everyone else laughed. Apparently Farah had not heard it. It was evident that she had something on her mind. When the speeches of felicitation were ended and nothing remained to be said except a word of adjournment, Zendi turned with a paternal smile toward his young guest of honor. Now, Princess Farah, he said kindly, it is your turn. You may make a bow, or make a speech, or sing a song. They all applauded the king's half-playful suggestion, but stopped suddenly when Farah rose to her feet. Arnon, seated beside her, glanced up apprehensively as if to inquire, What is my child planning to do? Farah did not smile or speak. Slowly leaving her place she walked with determined steps to the massive table. The audience leaned forward and held its breath, wondering what was about to happen. Moving around the table until she faced the king, Farah made a deep bow. Then, to the amazement of everyone, she whipped a little dagger from her belt and deftly drew a red streak diagonally across her left forearm. Bending over the long neglected, unsigned vow of vengeance, she took up the stylus, dipped it in her blood, and wrote Farah. For a moment they all sat stunned to silence. Then Ren arose and hurried to Farah's side. Arnon, much shaken, quickly joined the queen and together they led the bleeding princess out to attend to her wound. Farah's face was pale but her eyes were bright and a proud little smile trembled on her lips. Zandi rose, instantly claiming the full attention of his silent, bewildered guests. Some brave young blood has been shed here tonight, he said solemnly. You may be assured that Arabia will not permit this gallant child ever to risk her life in an attempt to keep her vow, but her courageous act, done in all sincerity, is proudly appreciated by her country. I, mumbled old Mishma. I, I, responded many voices. There was a long moment of silence before Zendi signified with a gesture that they were now free to disperse. The people stirred, uneasily questing one another's baffled eyes. Mishma, standing at the king's elbow, suggested that the unprecedented event should be kept a secret. That would be most desirable, Mishma, if we could, agreed Zendi. But it cannot be done. It is possible to pledge three people, or five, to keep a secret, but not fifty. Perhaps it is better to let them all talk until they have tired of it and then it will be forgotten. After all, she is only a child. And so it was told throughout the whole kingdom of Arabia that Princess Arnon's young daughter had vowed to assassinate her Jewish father. The first reaction was that of sheer admiration mixed with amiable amusement. The little girl had shown great courage. She might be part Jew, but she was all Arab. Of course her vow, considered practically, was ridiculous. When she grew a little older, her recollection of it would be embarrassing, no doubt. And after a few weeks of free discussion, the strange incident, as Zendi had predicted, was forgotten. Young Voldy, completely infatuated and not caring who knew it, spent more and more time at Arnon's encampment, to the mounting anxiety of his parents, for he was a popular, well-favored youth, giving promise of a bright future. With his exceptional talents for making friends and the reputation he had already won as a fearless sportsman, it was not too much to hope that his country might someday confer honors upon him he might easily win an appointment to the king's council. But it seemed doubtful to Ursin and Keitra that their idolized son could fulfill these high expectations if embarrassed by an alliance with a young woman of alien blood, especially Jewish blood. Whatever might be her beauty, courage, and charm, Farah would be a heavy liability. Nor was Foldy insensitive to his parents' uneasiness. He was deeply devoted to them and their anxiety distressed him. There were no stormy scenes. 
Perhaps it might have been easier for him to ignore their wishes if they had angered him with stern admonitions, if Urson had lashed out at him with bitter scorn or if his mother had become noisily hysterical. The unhappy situation was hardly mentioned among them, but it was ever present in their thoughts. Urson seldom laughed now. And when Voldy, setting forth in the morning to spend the day with the adorable young daughter of Antipas the scoundrel, turned in his saddle to wave a hand to Kedra, standing before the doorway, trying to smile through her welling tears, he felt like an ingrate. And he had other misgivings. He was seeing very little of his companions. Until recently he had spent most of his time with his hard-riding young cronies. Indeed, he had been the acknowledged leader of this adventurous crew. What were they thinking about him? What were they saying about him, as they sat around their evening campfire in the mountains after a long day's chase for wild game? It would be a sore affliction if his friends were to chatter contemptuously of his demoralizing lovesickness. He resolved to free himself of this dread. One morning, having had word of their plans for a three-day stag hunt, Voldy arrived early at the accustomed rendezvous, fully equipped for the excursion. There was a bit of embarrassment at first, but the constraint quickly lifted. Voldy was one of them again. Intent upon restoring himself to their good opinion, he led them for hours in the maddest ride they had ever taken, leaping deep gullies cut by mountain streams, hurtling fallen timber, plunging through tangled underbrush. Challenged by his recklessness, they did their utmost to follow. Young Musef, the elder son of Counselor Tema, kept hard on his leader's heels and brought down the largest stag of the three killed that day. Volia counted for the others. Most of the party were outdistanced and came straggling into camp in the late afternoon, weary beyond any words to tell of it. A campfire was built beside a noisy mountain stream. The stags were hung up and dressed. Musef flung himself down on the aromatic pine. Needles that carpeted the ground, and when Voldy sat down beside him, regarding him with a teasing grin, Musef opened one eye and muttered, My brother, you have lost your mind. The last to arrive in camp was young Prince Duran, King Zendi's arrogant son, attended by four members of the hunt who had reluctantly tarried with him when the pace had grown too hot. The prince had bagged a little dough. No one ventured to rebuke him, but the general silence expressed the party's opinion. Duran was quite aware of his companion's disfavor, aware too that had he been anyone else than the heir to the throne he would have been appropriately chastised. He cared nothing for their unspoken disapproval. His manner said that if the king's son wished to kill a baby doe, who had a right to oppose him. After supper there were some acrobatics, a wrestling match, and a fencing bout with wooden broadswords. It was proposed that they have a duel with daggers. How about you and Musef, Voldy? A voice inquired. I'm too tired said Musef. Besides, I'm no match for Voldy. We will take him on, shouted the prince, getting to his feet. All eyes, and they were sullen eyes, turned in his direction. They covertly scorned the pompous youngster, hated his poor sportsmanship, loathed his insolent we. It wouldn't be fair, prince, said Voldy, trying to make his tone sound respectful. I am older than you, and I have had more practice. But not lately, sneered Duran. Or do you play with daggers when you visit your Jewish friend? All breathing around the campfire was suspended. Voldy flushed and frowned. I do not wish to fence with you, Prince Duran, he said. As we thought. Crowed Duran. That's what comes of consorting with soft aliens. He took a step forward and drew his dagger. Stand up and fight, fellow. Voldy slowly rose, and observed, as had several of the others, that the blade of Duran's dagger flashed brightly in the firelight. You were not intending to fight me with steel, I hope. He said sharply. A concerted murmur of disapproval instantly backed him up. It was a shameful abuse of royal privilege. Every youth in the party knew the prince was not vulnerable to any injury. It would be worth any man's liberty, if not his life, to hurt this boy. Bewildered by his predicament Voldy stood with his thumbs under his belt, making no move to defend himself. Young Duran, crouching, advanced with short steps. You'd better draw. Voldy, he growled, or admit you're a coward. Apparently it was the wrong word even for the king's son to use. Voldy lunged forward, drove his right elbow into the prince's midriff, clutched the wildly flailing forearm in a vice-like grip, twisted the dagger out of Duran's hand, and tossed it into the fire. Panting with rage, the prince again hurled himself at Voldy who, disregarding the impotent fists, slapped the youngster full in the face. You'll pay for that! squeaked Duran. Gentle if disgusted hands led the infuriated prince to his tent for repairs to his royal pride and bleeding lips. Voldy resumed a seat on the ground, a little way apart from the others, 
and sat with bent head and slumped shoulders. I'm sorry, he mumbled dejectedly, shaking his head. It was a critical moment for all of them. No one cared to risk being quoted as having said, good work, Boldy. Just what he deserved. What else could you have done? At length Musef scrambled to his feet, threw another pine stick on the fire, dusted his hands, and, sauntering over to Boldy, companionably sat down beside him. Young Raboth, the lean, hawk-nosed nephew of Counselor Dumas, crossed from the other side of the silent circle, made a big business of poking the fire, and, as he passed Boldy, gave him a friendly pat on the shoulder. The rest of them breathed more freely and exchanged grins. Duran did not reappear that night, and left for home early the next morning. Boldy made no mention of the unpleasant affair at home, but for many days he waited, in considerable trepidation, a summons to present himself at the king's encampment, for it seemed almost certain that Duran would have made a bad report of the incident. But apparently the episode was to be overlooked. Either the prince had decided to hold his tongue or the king, having heard his son's story, had drawn his own conclusions and had thought it prudent to let the matter drop. But the true story unquestionably had got to the ears of the council, for a week later, Voldy was invited to spend the day with his revered grandfather Mishma. He went with anxiety pounding in his heart, for he was devoted to the old man and would be grieved at his displeasure. But it turned out to be a happy visit. Nothing was said about the unfortunate incident in the woods. When Voldy left for home, Mishma followed him out to the paddock and ceremoniously presented him with a beautiful, high-spirited, black gelding. With one arm on the superb young animal's neck and the other hugging his grandfather, Voldy shouted his delight. The eminent counselor stroked his white beard complacently and a twinkle shone in his eye. This frisky colt's name, he said, is Darik, after King Darik of old. He was called Darik the Just, was he not, sire? Asked Baldi. Right. Because he was always fair in his judgments, said Mishma. It is told of him that King Darik was of a quick temper and knew better than most men how to handle a blade but he never drew his sword against a weaker adversary, no matter what the provocation. The old man laid his thin hand on the gelding's velvet muzzle. This horse, he reflected, will require some managing, but he is of good character. See to it, my son, that he behaves himself. Voldy's visits to Fara continued. They rode together almost every day throughout the summer, and when the early winter came, with blustery weather driving them indoors, Arnon, observing their restlessness and Lack of occupation, proposed that Voldy join them in their lately neglected studies. He consented to it with well-simulated interest. He had no particular ambition to learn, but any pastime was agreeable that would give him an excuse for hovering close to Farah. Ion was delighted with his progress. He had an aptitude for Greek, she declared, he had a feel for it, would soon be speaking it like a native. This was an exaggeration, but it encouraged Voldy to do his best. Moreover, he was able to tell his mother that the long winter afternoons in Princess Arnon's home were profitably spent. Keitra would smile indulgently, but it was plain to see that she was troubled. And Farah too was troubled about Boldy's adoration, her intuition, and the widening intervals between Keitra's visits, informing her that he was getting into trouble at home because of her. Once she almost decided to tell Boldy frankly that he mustn't come to see her anymore, but her courage failed, for she loved him devotedly. Sometime, no matter how severely it hurt, he must be told, but Farah postponed the day of their sorrow. As the seasons came and went, Farah took on a maturity beyond her years. The circumstances of her life had made her thoughtful even as a child, now, with her sixteenth birthday in sight, she had the mind of an adult. The conviction had grown within her that she was fated to be a person unwanted, viewed with suspicion, an alien. The Jews would spurn her for being an Arabian, the Arabians would ignore her for being a Jew. What hailed the world that grown men and women should treat one another so? Once she had put the question to Ione, who had replied, with a sigh, it was always that way, my dear, from the beginning. It's a lonely world, for some people, said Farah. I know how you feel, sympathized Ione. I have been lonely too. Yes, but you have a nationality, Ione. You are far away from your own country, but you do have a country. It isn't as if you were a mixture of two countries that hated each other. Me, I am nobody. Do not be depressed, Farah, entreated Ione. There are many who love you, who will always love you. No girl in the world ever had such a devoted lover as Boldy. I know, murmured Farah, but, he shouldn't. Her voice trembled. I mustn't let him. He can't marry me. It would ruin him. Ione, what am I going to do? 
Shortly before sunset the Princess Arnon, long ailing of infirmities associated with a broken heart, slipped away so quietly that for some little time they weren't quite sure. It was Farah who first realized that it was all over. Since noon she had been crouching beside the bed with her forehead pressed against her mother's thin arm, now raising up tearfully to peer into the unresponsive face, then dejectedly slumping down again to wait. At mid-afternoon old Kadar noisily rolled up the leather panels on the northern and eastern exposures of the octagonal tent, just as he would have done at this hour on any other fair summer day. Kadar had seen plenty of death in his fourscore years and it no longer upset him. Indeed, he was almost too casual in its presence today, strutting his old bones about with something of a proprietorial swagger as if he and death had a private understanding. All day long the female servants, a dozen or more, had tiptoed in by twos and threes to stand helplessly at a respectful distance from the bed, regarding their dying mistress with compassionate eyes, and had tiptoed out again as if remembering some neglected duty. Nothing remained to be done for Arnon, or, if so, there was old Nefti who had nursed both princesses from babyhood, and the faithful Ion, hovering close, and a bit jealous of each other. The whole mind of the household at present was concentrated on Farah and her probable plans for the future. Of course she would now marry Voldy whose constant attentions during the past few years had been unceasing and whose intentions were unmistakable. It was generally taken for granted that Farah had decided not to marry until her responsibility to her mother had ended. And that responsibility had increased as Arnon's strength declined, for the unhappy princess had developed an immense capacity for absorbing all manner of trivial but incessant personal services. Hand me the small pillow, please. No, the other one, dear, the blue one. Thanks. Farah, but I believe I'd rather have my shawl. It's out in the pergola, I think. Would you mind getting it, darling? I know I'm a dreadful bother. And so she was, but it had never seemed to annoy Farah, who stayed on duty day and night. Obviously she couldn't bring much happiness to Voldy until she was free. It wouldn't be long now. But where would they live? This was the question that troubled the servants, especially the older ones. Arnon's land had been ceded to her only for her lifetime. It was inconceivable that Boldy, as far as husband, would press a claim to it, or that the king could consent to such favoritism. Boldy would be as nomadic as all others of equal rating. The fact that his father Urson was the son of Mishma, who was chief of the councillors was the heir apparent to the throne, was of no immediate consequence. Arnon's land would revert to the king's domain. Boldy and Farah would follow the snow in the pasture. And the older servants, long accustomed to soft living, might be considered too frail for such a rigorous life. Indeed, as they huddled in little groups, waiting, watching, they wondered whether Farah herself was likely to be happy as a nomad. She had never taken any interest in their herds and flocks. She had shown much friendly concern for the shepherds and their families, but cared nothing for the business that provided her own living. Of course, there was no use trying to understand Farah. They had never known what to make of this alien who had become more of an enigma as she matured. She was as mysterious as she was beautiful. Doubtless that could be explained by her racial heritages. It was an odd combination, Arab and Jew. True, it was an arrestingly lovely blend, viewed objectively. Arabian women were taller than Jewesses and more sinewy. At 16, Farah's figure was slim, supple, almost boyish, in short, Arabian. Her face was an interesting study in racial conflict. The old antipathy was written there as on a map. The high finely sculptured nose, with a slightly flaring, mobile, haughty nostrils, had been Arnon's gift. The childishly rounded chin and throat were Mariamne's. It was a readily responsive face, well disciplined in repose, but of swift reactions to any stirring event. She was capable of flashing Arabian rages like sudden summer storms in the mountains, but it was well worth anyone's patience and forbearance to wait for the penitent smile Farah had inherited from long generations of highly emotional people who believed in atonements and were never ashamed of their tears. Arnon's last day wore on, and when the declining sun had been nicked by the glowing tip of Arcturus, twenty miles away, old Kadar rolled up the western tent panels also, admitting a jasmine-scented breeze. Rousing, Farah lifted her eyes to the breathtaking panorama of rolling hills in the foreground descending to the green valley of Ain with the majestic Arcturus in the far distance, and, beyond the southern slope of the mountain, the dazzling white shoreline of the Dead Sea. Noting that Farah had been momentarily diverted from her vigil, Ion drew closer to whisper that Voldy had come. Did she want to see him? Farah shook her head. Tell Voldy not to wait, she murmured, and, as Ion moved away, she added, 
Tell him I cannot come now. He will understand. Far's heavy eyes slowly returned to her mother's drawn face. She laid her cheek against Arnon's breast and listened, and listened. Old Nefty took a step forward and held up an outspread hand for silence, though no place had ever been so quiet. At length Farah straightened and kissed her mother on the forehead, very gently, so as not to waken her. Then she came slowly to her feet. Her eyes were tearless now and her proud face was composed. Lightly touching old Nefty's shoulder in a brief caress and making a weary little gesture of appreciation toward the others, she left the tent. Voldy was waiting in the garden. Rising, he held out his arms and far and nestled her head against his breast. He could feel the silent, convulsive sobs and drew her closer. She is gone? He asked. Far nodded warily, dejectedly. I will take care of you, dear, murmured Voldy. Let us not speak of that now, said Farah, gently releasing herself from his embrace. There are many things to do, I suppose. Will you ride over to the king's encampment, and tell them? Of course, and then may I come back? Voldy, I am so very tired. Perhaps tomorrow. He took her in his arms again and kissed her, but her response was apathetic. After Voldy had ridden away, Ion joined Farah, who had remained in the garden, seated in her mother's favorite chair. What do we do now, Ion? She asked weakly. I know so little about it. The men will come tonight, dear, and attend to the burial. And, am I to have anything to do with that? No, you will not be expected to go along. Nefty and I will dress her for the burial. Ion reached out her hand. Come now, and take some rest. You are quite exhausted. I shall bring you something nourishing to drink. Late in the evening, King Zendi himself arrived accompanied by a dozen neighbors. After a consoling word with Farah, he left her, saying that he and the queen would see her tomorrow. Farah lay on her bed, with eyes closed and a pillow pressed hard over her head so that she might not hear the sounds of retiring hoofbeats. When she roused, everything was quiet. The full moon shone brightly through the tent door. Ion slipped in very quietly. Farah sat up, patted the bed, and Ion obediently sat down beside her. I want you to do something for me, Ion said Farah, hardly above a whisper, and I want you to promise me you will never, never tell. Ion's voice trembled a little as she promptly consented. Farah faced her with sober eyes. I want you to hold up your hand, Ion, and swear by your gods that you will do for me what I ask of you, and never reveal it to anyone. Ion hesitated and began to cry. I wish I knew, dear, she said, brokenly. I hope this isn't something you shouldn't do. Let me be the judge of that. Farah's tone was severe. Will you do as I say, and keep my secret? Ion protestingly put up a trembling hand and said, Yes, Farah, I will do as you wish, and never tell. Rising impetuously, Farah went to a small table where she kept her needlework, returning with a pair of scissors which she handed to the bewildered slave. You are to cut off my hair. Farah wound her fingers about her heavy braid, at the back of her neck. There. See, Ion? Just above my hand. I am to be a boy. Cut it like Voldy's. Ion was whimpering like a child. You promised. Farah shook her roughly by the shoulder. Don't sit there crying. Do as I say, and do it quickly. Still gasping incoherent protests, Ion committed the crime. When it was accomplished, Farah retired to the alcove and presently returned to exhibit herself in the conventional garb of a well-to-do young Arabian, the burnous patterned after Voldy's best. How do I look? She demanded. Where did you get it? asked Tyone in a strained voice. Made it, said Farah, a long time ago. But why? What are you going to do? I am going very far away, I own, to keep a vow, declared Farah. Now, see to it that you keep yours. The alarming news broke early in the morning. Old Kadar rode to the king's encampment with the appalling report that Farah had disappeared. During the night. The fractious bay filly that she had insisted on stabling in a separate paddock was gone. Zendi sent word to a score of young cavalrymen, informing them of what had happened. In his opinion, Farah, beside herself with grief and unable to sleep, had gone for a reckless ride in the moonlight. Perhaps she had met with an accident. They set off in all directions. Voldy dashed away at a gallop along their favorite bridle path skirting the rim of the plateau. At places where the trail was narrow and the descent precipitous, he dismounted and led his tired horse slowly, searching for ominous signs. When the late afternoon came, his hopes were fading. He was no longer meeting anxious friends engaged in the quest, 
for he was many miles beyond the furthest point he had ever traveled. Slowly he retraced his course as the twilight settled down. At intervals, where the path was dangerous, he stopped and listened into the deep silence, and despairingly called, Farah, Farah. Chapter 4 Sadie, the Bay Philly, was independent and impertinent but sure-footed. Old Kadar, increasingly prudent at 80, distrusted her, but Farah, better understanding the filly's caprices, knew that while Sadie was mischievous she was not malicious. For the first five miles of a gradual descent, Farah did not spare her. Time was precious. At any moment old Nefti, though strongly admonished to take her rest, might come in and find the bed empty. Immediately the household would be roused and a search would begin forthwith. At first Sadie, in need of exercise, wanted to play, changing her gait without warning from canter to lope and pretending to be frightened at every huge white boulder and pale gray clump of sage standing in the bright moonlight, but Farah's spurs soon dissuaded her from the belief that this was a romp. After a while the grade leveled off for a few miles before taking the sharp zigzags toward the valley floor. Here Farah dismounted and led Sadie until she began to toss her head impatiently, for she always objected to being led and less quite exhausted. Occasionally they passed a weaver's hut, no lights visible, everyone asleep except the little huddle of goats that stirred and lifted a few heads inquisitively. The night was still. Far thought it strange that she was not lonely. Even her bereavement, not yet of seven hours duration, seemed to have occurred long ago, as indeed it had, for that incurable sorrow had set in when Arnon's waning strength presaged the inevitable end. It was strange too, thought Farah, that she felt no apprehensions about the grim and hazardous mission on which she had set forth. She made the experiment of saying to herself that this was a very serious business, a man's business, that undoubtedly would cause her much trouble long before she reached her well-fortified objective in Galilee. In short, that she was riding toward almost certain disaster as fast as Sadie's slim legs could carry her. But this re-examination of her purpose did nothing to discompose her, doubtless because she had so long and earnestly planned this audacious undertaking that it had become the sole aim of her life. And there was dear Boldy. What a deal of anxiety she had caused him. How much more kind it would have been, reflected Farah, if she had told him firmly that she could never marry him, and, if pressed for the reason, she could have said that she did not love him. But Boldy would have known it wasn't true, for she had given him too many guarantees of her affection. However, Boldy would not fret very long. A girl might in similar circumstances, but a man would quickly forget. How fortunate men were in their ability to pull their love up by the roots and transplant it so successfully that it grew again without the loss of a leaf or a petal. There was really no need for her to worry about Boldy. Only one anxiety disturbed her. What success would she have in masquerading as a young man? Of course there was no other alternative. It was quite inconceivable that a 16-year-old girl could travel alone from southern Arabia to northern Galilee without risking some very unpleasant, if not positively dangerous, experiences, but this effort to pose as a young man would be a very risky business. A few facts were in Farah's favor. Her natural speaking voice was low-pitched and throaty, it might easily be mistaken by a stranger for the voice of a boy in his mid-teens. Two, the loose-fitting Bernouse ignored the curves of her girlish figure. But, even so, it would require much courage and self-confidence to maintain her role if suddenly projected into the company of men. It had not yet occurred to her that it would be quite as difficult to deceive another woman. This dilemma had cost far many an anxious hour. She had privately practiced being a bold and bumptious youth, accustomed to rough talk and capable of serving a large helping of convincing profanity. She had stalked up and down her bedchamber with long, stiff-legged strides, jerking her head arrogantly from side to side as she scowled crossly into her mirrors, and growling gutturally. Once the absurdity of it had momentarily overcome her, and she had laughed at her reflection in the highly polished metal plate that hung by her door, but had instantly sobered at the sight of a pair of girlish dimples in this young man's cheeks, and resolved that she would do no more smiling. At the first signs of dawn far across the southern extremity of the fertile valley of Ain and moved on into the arid valley of Zerd, which skirted the eastern shore of the Dead Sea. It was a desolate expanse of parched and blistered land, utterly without vegetation, birds, rodents, or reptiles. There were even no insects, with which most deserts abound. The Dead Sea had been aptly named. Sadie clearly shared her rider's hope that they might soon be out of this forsaken country, and quickened her pace, far straining her eyes for a glimpse of the ancient village of Accra, which, she knew, maintained a precarious existence on a bit of oasis at the southernmost dip of the Dead Sea. The sun was already hot when she sighted it, 
a clump of palms in Cyprus, a straggling group of shabby cottages surrounding a large brown tent. This would be the con where travelers and their pack trains were accommodated. At the door of the tent, Far dismounted from the perspiring filly, handed the reins to a taciturn old Arabian, and with long steps and an experimental swagger followed along to the corral, where she gruffly gave instructions how her mount was to be rubbed down and properly watered. And when the testy ostler growled that he knew how to take care of a horse, Far shouted untruthfully that if he did he was the first old man she had ever seen who knew or cared whether a hot horse was safely watered, and that she proposed to stand by him until he had done it. A wizened old woman glumly prepared a bad breakfast of stale eggs and staler bread. Feeling that she had need of practice and maleness in the presence of women, Farah complained bitterly about the food and reviled the old woman in what she felt might be the customary terms for a man to use on such occasions. Then she demanded a bed, and denounced the old woman as a foul and dirty slattern when she saw the untidy cubicle provided for her. This execration she attempted in Greek, aware that her vocabulary of vituperation in that language, learned of the gentle Ione, would need some polishing. After two hours of deep sleep Farah was on her way again, after paying her hosts twice what they asked and swearing manfully that the place wasn't fit for a goat to live in, to which contemptuous accusation the old man and his slovenly wife, grateful for their unexpected windfall, respectfully agreed. Farah smiled complacently as Sadie bounded away over the northbound trail, her fears about her ability to be a man having been somewhat alleviated. Late afternoon, after a sultry, monotonous ride along the blinding white seashore, she entered the town of Engedi, eastern terminus of the Old Salt Trail from the port of Gaza. It was an incredibly ugly place, its small, box-shaped houses built of sun-baked brick, suffocating a narrow, dusty street. At the principal inn, a little further on, the stable yard of which was crowded with camels, donkeys, and their grimy attendants, Farah asked courteously for food and a bed for the night. Instantly she realized that she had made a mistake when the surly proprietor showed her a filthy pallet in a room containing half a dozen similar cots. Backing disgustedly out of the room, she opened her accumulated treasures of Arabian profanity and made it known to the master of the inn that she wasn't in the habit of sleeping in rabbit hutches, dog kennels, or pig's ties. Thus advised, the innkeeper deferentially led the way to a private room where the bed, if not comfortable, was less dirty than the one she had rejected. Farah gave this incident much earnest thought. It was obviously a mistake to ask for anything politely. The public considered politeness a sign of weakness. It had a very low opinion of gentle speech. To wait patiently and take your turn or to accept unprotestingly whatever was offered you meant only that you were accustomed to being pushed aside, that you knew you could not defend your rights. It was a thoroughly abominable world, decided Farah, but if it was that kind of world she would try to meet it on its own terms. Contracting her brows into a sullen frown and puffing her lips arrogantly, she marched heavily up and down the bare, creaking floor. In this belligerent mood she returned, with long steps, to the common room and flung herself into a dilapidated chair. Crossing her legs she sat impatiently flicking her high-laced boot with a finely crafted riding whip, a gift of oldies. Well-dressed, good-looking men of affairs came and went, occasionally nodding to one another. Almost everybody knew everybody else. Farah honestly wished she were a man. They all seemed so effortlessly sure of themselves. She admired their self-sufficiency, tried to make herself think she was one of them. For the most part her presence in the big, dingy room went unnoticed. Sometimes a young man, passing by, would toss an impersonal glance in her direction and move on without giving her a second look. This was good, and Farah breathed more comfortably. Immediately to the left of her, in the row of battered chairs backed against the wall, sat two men engaged in earnest conversation. They spoke in Greek, though it was evident that they were Romans. Farah had never seen any Romans, but she had been told how they looked. The man in the nearest chair was probably forty. It was plain that he was a person of some consequence. Like his friend, who was many years his senior, he was smooth-faced and his graying hair was close-cropped. His face was deeply tanned, except for a narrow strip of white on his upper forehead which Abando had protected from the sun. His sand-colored tunic, trimmed in red, was of fine texture, his belt, dagger sheath, and two old leather sandals, strapped almost to the knee, showed expensive workmanship. Farah surmised that they both were directors of caravans, probably belonging to the same company. Another survey of them revealed that the younger man had a small V-shaped notch in the top of his ear. So, he was a slave. But apparently his servitude didn't bother him much. I hope he is still there next week when we return the distinguished-looking slave was saying. I should like to hear him again. 
but it is doubtful whether he will be at large by that time. The legionaries will have taken him in, for, as you have said, it was very inflammatory talk. But, by the gods, Alice, it was all true, what he was saying. Yes, yes, agreed Alice, the world is bad enough to deserve a drubbing, and it always was. But, the fellow is crazy as a beetle, Tim. The older man turned his full face and far saw a long scar across his cheek, relic of a savage fight long ago, she thought. That's where we differ, Alice, countered Tim. What the hermit was preaching showed him to be indiscreet, foolhardy, but no merely crazy man could collect a crowd like that and keep them standing for hours in the broiling sun listening with wide eyes and open mouths, and they say he has been doing it day after day. Oh, you know how people are, said Alice indifferently. This half-starved fanatic, living on dreams and desert bugs, climbs up on a big rock and begins to yell that the world is due for punishment. Naturally the rabble, with nothing better to do, gathers around to watch his antics and shudder at his predictions. Alice shifted his position in the creaking chair and continued to extemporize. People like to be scared, Tim. Their empty lives are without stimulating sensations and they enjoy feeling the cold shivers run down their backs, especially when their instinct tells them it's all a lot of damned nonsense. There was quite a pause here, and Farah, who had been intently eavesdropping, leaned forward a little, hoping that Alice hadn't said the last word. Presently Tim remarked soberly, I wonder if it is, just damned nonsense. Poof! scoffed Alice. The fellow is crazy as a beetle. He rose, stretched, yawned. And so are you, he added. I'll see you at supper. I must have another look at that lame camel. Just a minute, Alice. Tim patted the arm of the adjoining chair and his scar-faced friend sat down again with an indulgent grin. You have been talking of that throng at Hebron as if it were composed entirely of ignorant and lousy nobodies who would as gladly stand all day watching a caged monkey scratch itself. But that doesn't account for it. There were at least a dozen well-dressed, intelligent men in the crowd giving serious attention to everything the hermit said. Alice dismissed this with a negligent flick of his hand. Local citizens, no doubt, he explained, annoyed by the fellow's presence in their town, and waiting for him to start a brawl, so that they could lock him up as a disturber of the peace. But some of them had come from afar, Alice. I asked a bright-looking camel boy if he wanted a job and he loftily replied that he was in the employ of an eminent lawyer, Ben Judah, a member of the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. What's this Sanhedrin? demanded Alice scornfully. The Jews' lawmaking body. I thought Rome made their laws. Just the laws on taxes. The Sanhedrin attends to the rest of it. You surely have a strange talent, observed Alice, for collecting useless information. What else do you know about Jewish laws? Only that there are far too many of them. Why? A Jew can be arrested for dragging a chair across his dooryard on the Sabbath. It might dig a little furrow in the ground, and that would be plowing. I think you made that up, Timmy, chuckled Alice. But, be that as it may, perhaps this wise Ben Judah, in the course of a journey, turned aside to listen to the prattle of this fool, just as we did, out of curiosity. Possibly, but it is much more likely that some influential people are spying on this hermit. He himself is a Jew, and he is talking to his own countrymen. Surely the temple can't afford to let this fellow go on, gathering up a bigger crowd every day, shouting that the world is so bad it needs to be cleansed. That's the temple's exclusive business, to see that the world, or at least the Jewish world, which is all that matters in this country, behaves itself. These learned lawyers and rabbis surely cannot permit a fiery prophet to march across Judea, informing thousands of people that their land is filthy with graft, greed, and injustice, all the way from top to bottom, and that his God who is also theirs, means to take the whole job of renovation out of the hands of the recognized authorities, and attend to it personally. Alice grinned at this long speech and again rose to his feet. Perhaps you're right, he drawled. In that case, they will probably toss the hermit into a dungeon, and forget about him. And so will the people. If a man dies a bloody death as a martyr to some new idea, the people remember, and build him a monument, but if he gets pitched into prison, poof. Let him rot. Alice dusted his hands and sauntered away. After a while the handsome man with the deep crow's feet at the corners of his eyes and the notch on his ear turned his head slowly toward Farah and coolly looked her over. Which way are you headed, young man? He inquired in Aramaic, signifying that he considered her a Jew. I am going west, sir, replied Farah in Greek, as far as Gaza. Ever been there? asked Tim, and when Farah had shaken her head, he remarked, very fine place. 
to lose your shirt and have your throat cut. Let me warn you to ride straight down the middle of the street and have nothing to do with any of the inhabitants. Do not eat their food or drink their water or believe their lies. I gather that you do not care much for Gaza, commented Farah. I shall take your advice. The first large city to the west is Hebron, is it not? Is that any better? Much. Hebron has been sound asleep for 2,000 years, so there's nothing very lively about it, but at least it won't rob you or poison your food or murder you in your bed. Timri crossed his long legs and gave Far a candid stare. How do you happen to speak Greek, young man? You don't live in Greece, do you? Nor do you, sir, said Farah with equal bluntness, yet you speak Greek. I am a Greek, declared Tim proudly. You are a Jew, are you not? I am not, replied Farah. I am an Arabian. Tim studied her face with interest, pursed his lips, and nodded. My mistake, he muttered. No offense, I hope. Not at all, sir. I have no quarrel with the Jewish people. Tim laughed quietly and said that he never thought he would hear an Arabian say that. But it is not so long, sir, far a risk saying, since the Jews and Arabians were in alliance. What an alliance! scoffed Tim. Of course you know all about that wretched marriage. One thing I never could understand, I know many Arabians, find fellows who love nothing better than a good fight. Why haven't they ripped the bowels out of that Jewish rascal who humiliated your princess? Surely it can't be that they have forgotten, or do not care. Unable to think of an appropriate answer to that, Farah abruptly changed the subject by saying, I could not help overhearing your talk about a prophet you met who said the world was to be punished for its misdeeds. Does he propose to attend to this chastisement? No, not he, said Tim. The fellow was careful to say that he himself was only a courier, announcing the early arrival of a divine person whom he depicted as a mighty avenger, a divinity to be sent from heaven with an axe in his hand. The rotten old growth we have called civilization was to be cut down so that something healthy and fruitful might grow. Coming soon? asked Farah. You would think, from his talk, that the prophet expected the avenger by next week, at the latest. If he had said it would occur a hundred years from now, his prediction would have been less risky. And less interesting, added Farah. Don't you think the prophet might be there, at Hebron, tomorrow? Unless he has moved further toward the hills. He was at least half a mile north of the road when we sighted the crowd. Apparently he does not study the people's convenience. They say he goes where he likes and the multitude follows. If you are interested I suggest that you inquire along the way as you approach Hebron. Almost anyone will tell you. The air is full of him over there. Tim rose to move away, and Farah also came to her feet. Am I right in surmising that you are inclined to believe what he said? She asked seriously. Tim tugged at his lip, debating a reply. I don't know rightly what I do think about it, he answered, measuring his words. The Jews are a singular people. They have always had their prophets, and many of their predictions have proved true, even to the dating of important events and the outcome of far distant wars. You'd better hear this man John for yourself. He may be greatly mistaken, but he is no fool. Your friend says the man is crazy as a beetle, said Farah. My friend, drawled Tim, is a typical Greek who became a typical Roman. He doesn't believe in anything he can't eat or wear or buy or sell or ride. In spite of Sadie's strong objections to leaving the broad highway, Farah turned off at the unmistakable spot where an improvised road, fully 50 yards wide, led northward through a stubble field. The tilled ground had been trampled soft and the going was slow. The deserted trail moved on across the field, across another less traveled highway, through another harvested field, over a bridge that spanned a little stream. It curved to miss a grove of cypress climbed a hill, traversed a pasture, forded a creek, and went on, and on. After five miles of monotonous riding, Farah sighted a village. At the crossroads a stone said the place was Tekoa. The trail had bypassed the little town, but Farah rode into it. Perhaps someone could inform her how far she must go to find the prophet. The village was quite abandoned. The small bazaars and markets on the principal street were closed. Further on, in the residential section, a frail old woman bent over the ledge of a community well, tugging at the handle of the windlass. Farah drew up alongside, dismounted, and lent a hand. The dripping chain brought up a large wooden bucket which a pulled to anchorage on top of the low wall. The ragged old woman, breathing heavily, gave Farah a toothless smile and offered a rusty iron dipper. It is good, said Farah. She filled the dipper for her hostess, emptied the bucket into the stone trough beside the well, and slipped off the filly's bridle. 
Sadie is thirsty too, she added, lowering the bucket again. Never knew of a horse named Sadie, remarked the old woman. Where do you come from, young master? Arabia. But you are an Israelite, I think. No, we are both Arabians, Sadie and I. The old woman tightened her shrunken lips and scowled. How do you happen to ask a drink of me? She demanded crossly. Because you seemed friendly, and, besides, I was thirsty, replied Farah, unruffled by the woman's surliness. I shall gladly pay you for the water. We don't sell water. Here is a little gift, then. Farah offered her a shekel. The beady old eyes brightened at the sight of so much money, but the white head shook vigorously. Farah laid the shekel on the ledge of the well. The old woman turned and spat unprettily on the ground. Suppressing her amusement, Farah said, I am looking for a Jewish prophet. His name is John. Many people are following him, and I wish to hear him. I think he has passed this way. Do you know where he has gone? He is a son of Satan, shrilled the old woman. A blasphemer. Curse be all the infidels who listen to his revilings of Israel. Farah, who had been toying with her coin pouch, unwound its thong and asked quietly, do you know where he is? For a moment the old woman maintained a sullen silence while Farah poured a few silver coins into her own palm. Pouring them back into the pouch, she vaulted into the saddle and gathered up the bridle reins. The wrinkled old jaw was quivering. Obviously her poverty and her piety were in combat. Impetuously she pointed toward the northeast. They said he was heading for the river, she shouted, and all Judea is following him. Everybody in Tekoa has joined the infidels. Tears ran down the leathery cheeks. My own son, and my daughter and her husband, and their children, they too have gone mad, like the others. Honestly sorry for the pitiable old creature, who was now weeping aloud, Farah asked quietly, but what has this man been saying, to distress you so? He scorns our ancient faith, sobbed the old woman, scrubbing her cavernous eyes with the skirt of her faded apron. He sits out there in the desert for years, doing no work, helping nobody, never attending the synagogue never bringing a gift to the altar, and now he comes forth railing at the religion of his fathers. He has a new religion then? asked Farah. An angel is about to appear, he says, who will show us what to do, as if we were heathen who knew no god. Your priests are probably annoyed by such talk, surmised Farah. Annoyed. The old woman slowly nodded her head and drew an unpleasant grin. You wait. They will soon silence his blasphemies. God is not mocked. Farah opened her pouch and poured silver into the wrinkled hand. The old woman clutched the money, scowled, and made an unsuccessful effort to spit. Sadie, who had been pawing the ground impatiently, was pleased to be on their way at a brisk trot. Half an hour before sunset she found them, acres of them it seemed, seated singly or in pairs or by families in a close nibbled sheep pasture on the high-banked shore of the Jordan. They were busy with their supper, which they had been foresighted enough to bring with them. Farah stopped a little way apart from the area where most of the pack animals were tethered, hung Sadie's bridle on the pommel of the saddle, loosed the girths, adjusted a stout halter, buckled on a well-filled feed bag, and staked out the tired filly for a hard-earned rest. Strolling forward among the groups of people, she sat down near a good-looking family, father, mother, two half-grown boys, and a pretty girl of her own age. The girl turned her head toward Farah and smiled shyly. Her father instantly muttered an inaudible command and his daughter, with some reluctance, left her place and wedged in between her parents. Farah was amused. She unwrapped her parcel of food and made a leisurely survey of the great multitude. It was a strangely quiet crowd. There was a low, inarticulate rumble of subdued conversation, but all faces were sober, pensive, and there was no laughter to be heard anywhere. A gentle but insistent, one-sided argument was in progress nearby. The mother of the adjacent family was pleading earnestly with her husband. Yielding to her importunity he nodded at length, and their well-favored daughter rose to resume the place where she had sat before. Her long black hair, unbound, was spread out covering her shoulders and back, and she seemed troubled about it. Turning to Farah with a smile she offered her a sweet roll, which was accepted gratefully. My hair looks untidy, said the girl. It's wet. I was baptized. It's beautiful, said Farah gallantly. How did you say it got wet? The great prophet was baptizing this afternoon. I'm afraid I don't know, confessed Farah. What does that mean, baptizing? This is my first time here. The prophet leads us into the river and pushes us down under the water. That washes away our sins, and we are clean. And very wet, I suppose, 
remarked Farah sympathetically. The girl's full lips parted in a slow, reluctant smile that displayed the tips of beautiful teeth. Unable to think of an appropriate rejoinder to this dry drollery on a solemn occasion, she suddenly sobered and nodded her head. Nothing further was said for a while, Farah regretting that she had spoken flippantly, the pretty Jewess, her face averted, apparently wishing she knew how to explain the cleansing she had had in the Jordan. I cannot think that you have been so very sinful, ventured Farah gently. We are all sinful, murmured the girl in a lugubrious imitation of experienced piety. Yes, I suppose so, admitted Farah with a companionable sigh. Don't you think the prophet is finished, for the day? Oh no, he will speak again when the people have had their supper. It should not be long now. The young Jewess tipped her head toward the groups who were rising and stirring about. The girl's plump mother, now that her family had been fed, wrapped up what was left, and, scrambling to her feet, came over and sat down beside her daughter. She and Fari exchanged amiable smiles. I am glad you made friends with our Ruth, she leaned forward to say. There are so few young people here of her own age. Hundreds of us older ones and swarms of small children, but it seems that our young people nowadays, she broke off abruptly in response to an imploring look from her daughter, but immediately continued, they don't seem to know that they have souls to save from the wrath to come. Ruth turned her head slowly toward Farah, with an expression that apologized for her zealous mother. Quite at a loss for a suitable comment, Farah mumbled, probably not, quickly aware that it was the wrong thing to have said, for it showed a deplorable unconcern. The woman's eyes were alive with reproach. Young man, she said severely, may I ask whether you have come to seek salvation? I came to see and hear the prophet, replied Farah. But not your own soul's salvation? demanded the woman. The prophet is interested only in his own countrymen, I think, said Farah. Of course. But you are an Israelite, are you not? I am an Arabian. Then you have no right to be here at all. But, mother, pleaded Ruth. Never mind. You come with me. Rising, the indignant Jewess drew her embarrassed daughter to her feet. Goodbye. Ruth turned to say softly. Farah, who had risen, bowed and said with her lips rather than her voice, I'm sorry. Striding through the milling crowd she observed that the people well forward were seating themselves compactly in rows. Finding an unoccupied spot, she sat down to wait. Presently a murmur of expectation swept the great audience. The prophet John, who had evidently been resting by the river's brink, appeared over the top of the embankment. He was indeed a striking figure, tall, lean, lithe, bronzed. His heavy, tousled hair indicated an immense latent vitality. His massive head was held high above broad, bony shoulders. The craggy face was bearded, the forehead deep-lined, the dark eyes deep-set. He had the bearing of a man who had thought much and suffered. The crowd was very still. Stretching forth his long brown arms, the prophet began to speak in a tone and mood of quiet entreaty. Farah found herself yielding at once to the strange compulsion of his vibrant voice. It was as one speaking from a great distance, from another age, from another world. God had been patient long, long. Of old he had planted a garden of delicious fruits and scented flowers for the delight of the human creatures he had made. It was a spacious garden, watered by cool springs and graceful rivers, along whose green banks were to be found much gold and many precious stones. On the hillsides jutted various metals which man's ingenuity might fashion into plows, pruning hooks and other implements of husbandry. Great quarries bulged with Enduring granite and delicately tinted marbles with which man might build temples and monuments. There were tall forests filled with all manner of trees from which might be hewn boats and shelters. Innumerable beasts pastured in the valleys, some to provide food, some to bear burdens. And had God's fortunate children been content to preserve and bequeath their rich heritage, their posterity might still be living comfortably and at peace in a garden. Here the voice of the prophet rose to a little higher pitch as he proceeded to relate how this paradise was permitted to grow rank with weeds and brambles. For, from the very beginning, God's children cared nothing about the garden. The first man flouted God's instructions. The elder of his two sons slew his brother and fled to the jungle. Restless and dissatisfied, humanity abandoned their paradise and began to roam, everywhere, without food, clothing, shelter, or destination hoping only to escape the reproving eyes of their disappointed father. Sometimes, after long and aimless wandering, a group or tribe would settle in a fertile valley and till the soil. Another nomadic tribe, jealous of their neighbor's small prosperities, would come upon them with spears and swords and stones, killing the workers together with their old and helpless ones and their little children. 
Their father had endowed them with inventive minds, so that they might make better and better tools, but their most ingenious inventions were not better tools but deadlier weapons. Stone was not quarried for the building of temples and monuments, but for great fortifications. Iron was not molded into implements of husbandry but into instruments of war. Everywhere there was fear, hardship, hunger, pillage, rapine, and slaughter spread over the face of the world until there was no peace at all, anywhere at all, and a man was not safe even in the home of his brother. But, John was continuing with mounting heat, throughout all these dreadful ages of hatred and oppression, God had waited, waited patiently, anxiously for the world's great ones to become aware of the poverty of their ill-gained wealth, and the empty sham of their vaunted power, and the shabbiness of their royal raiment, and the stink of starvation in their pilfered food. Now and again some brave voice would be raised in warning, but it would soon be stilled. Many were the messengers, sent of God, who were beaten, imprisoned and slain, fed to wild beasts, sawn asunder. As a child, Farah had heard the legends about the world's creation, the disobedience of Adam, the wickedness of his posterity, and the great flood that had drowned them all, except one family. But the ancient tales, as John recited them, seemed fresh and frightening. For now his voice was at storm. God's patience was exhausted. He finally gave up hope of seeing his incorrigible children develop any beauty, any grace, any goodness, any peace. He determined to wash the world clean of them, thoroughly clean of them, and their filth and their spore and the ravages of their hands until not a trace or a track or a trail of them remained. He told one peace-abiding old man to build a boat for his household, and the rain began to fall. The rain kept on coming, and coming, day after day after day. It poured as no rain had ever poured before. Farah had listened, quite unmoved, when the wandering minstrels had sung of the fable drain, but today the graphic picture of that appalling disaster made her draw her burnous tightly about her shoulders. The story made her flesh creep, as she heard the hoarse cries and strangled gasps of the doomed, clutching at one another in the swirl of rising waters, while the livid sky roared and the tempest screamed and the lightning stabbed relentlessly at the tossing debris. And then, there was a sudden calm. The waters stilled and subsided. The sun was shining again not upon a garden this time, but upon a stripped, deserted world of ruined cities leveled to the ground, and of empty thrones half buried in the mud. Now men could begin anew and try to build a better world. But it was without any success, and without any promise. John's voice took on a tone of deep sadness, and of shame too, as he reported how these men, wading out of the ooze and slime, began again to plot against one another as before. Prophets came and went reminding the people of the great calamity that had befallen their fathers and predicting more trouble if they did not now obey God's command for peace. But the stronger ones ignored them and those who sought the favor of the stronger ones laughed at them, and even the weak, who were set upon daily and robbed of their very rags, they too mocked the prophets and threw stones. Here John paused for a long time, and bowed his head. The odd multitude sat transfixed, far-eyed, holding its breath, though well it knew what was coming. So, now, in these latter days, he went on sadly, measuring his phrases, it is our fate to witness another outpouring of God's wrath. It is not a flood this time, but a purge of the world's wickedness. You will ask, when is it coming? And I shall answer, it is not coming, it is here. And do I hear you say, it is not my fault that the world is wicked, it is the empire that enslaves and robs and kills, am I to be punished for the crimes of Caesar? Then I must answer you that every one of us is guilty. John's words came fast now, fast and scathing. Do not blame all injustice, all cruelty, all meanness on Caesar's empire. For each one of you is a little empire filled with lust and greed and hate. It is easy enough to condemn the government, which is, indeed, a rapacious thing that God will cleanse and cleanse until its bones show through. Easy enough to denounce the temple for its well-fed lethargy, it deserves and will receive just punishment. But if any peace is to bless this sick world, Salvation must first come to you, to you, the lonely shepherd in the hills, to you, the farmer at the plow, to you, the carpenter at the bench, to you, the housewife at the loom, to you, rabbi, to you, lawyer, to you, scribe, to you, magistrate. For, except you repent, you shall perish. It is so decreed. God has again spoken. There is one near at hand to rid the world of its iniquities. Indeed, he is now here. Suddenly a black-robed, distinguished-looking man of middle age, at the far end of the second row, arose from the small group of similarly well-groomed company surrounding him and called out in a loud voice that turned all eyes his way. Meaning you, baptizer? Are you, then, 
this avenger who will wreak God's wrath upon Caesar, and the high priest, and upon us all? No, I am not he, answered John humbly. I am but his courier, unworthy to stoop down and buckle his sandal straps. I am but a voice, crying in the desert. I am commanded to say, make the way straight for the oncoming of the anointed one. Level the road. Lift up the valleys where the poor despair. Pair down the mountain tops where the powerful have sat in their arrogance and pride. Level the road for him in your own hearts. Here the impassioned voice lashed out like the crack of a bullwhip. Do not be content with saying that the world might find justice and peace if the Greeks stopped hating the Egyptians and the Romans stopped robbing the Greeks. Look to yourselves. Let the Macedonian merchant stop hating the Syrian camel driver. Let the Jew stop hating the Arab. Let the Pharisees and Sadducees stop hating one another. Let the poor farmer with two cows and an ass and twenty chickens stop his sneering at the poor farmer with only two goats and ten chickens. Let the woman with the fine cloak for Sabbath and the wedding feast stop her haughtiness toward the woman with only a weekday cloak and no wedding garment. Another man of the little company of critics now stood up in his place and said, Does this adventure come with a sword, to make peace? Not with a sword, said John, but nonetheless with a power so mighty that the whole world will be shaken by it. He comes with an axe and a flail. The axe will be laid at the roots of all the trees. Every tree that bears fruit will be spared, but every tree that is barren and an encumbrance to the ground will be cut down and burned. His flail will thresh the harvest of your deeds. He will save the grain, but the chaff will be blown away. It was some moments before the crowd realized that the prophet had made an end of speaking, for he stood in silence before the people, with his head bowed in weariness, or perhaps, far a thought, in silent prayer. At length he lifted his head, turned slowly, and walked away toward the neighboring hill to the north. Their eyes followed him until he disappeared among the scraggy olive trees. Wordlessly and without looking at one another, they rose and moved toward the campsites they had chosen in the broad pasture field. Dazed and bewildered, Farah followed the slow-moving crowd. She found herself abreast of the family she had met at supper. The pretty girl, Ruth, gave her a sidelong glance and smiled. Her mother, alert to her daughter's behavior, scowled and muttered intentionally loud enough for Farah to hear. Any more of that and I shall tell your father. Having brought no camping equipment except a pair of camel hair rugs, Farah slept for the first time in her life under the open sky. She retired early, for there was little else to do. A half-grown boy had been given a few pennies for bringing water to Sadie, after which Farah had removed the saddle and bridle, carrying them to a grassy spot near a cypress tree. During the slow twilight the people quietly pitched their simple camps and by the time the stars appeared in full splendor the pasture field was still. Occasionally a tired baby cried, a dog barked, there was a brief argument among the pack asses, but the people were quiet. Far wondered whether they slept or reflected soberly on the strange words they had heard. The distinguished men from the city, what were they thinking? Ruth's mother, did she say to herself that at least she was innocent of any fault? And what would this peace-loving prophet think if he knew that one of his interested auditors was on her way to kill her own father? It was a long time before her mental confusion gave way to her bodily fatigue. She went to sleep wondering whether Arabia, too, would be warned of what was coming. And would anyone speak to the Romans about it? Surely the world was larger than Judea. Even before dawn there was a stir of activity. Farah rubbed the sleep out of her eyes, sat up and combed her boyish hair, drew the red bandeau down over her forehead, rolled up her rugs, and set off to see how Sadie had fared. Sadie was gone. There was the stake to which she had been tethered, but Sadie was nowhere to be seen. Doubtless she had contrived to tug loose and wander away. She might even be well started for home. Intelligent horses were known to do that. After fruitless inquiries of the men and boys who were attending to their beasts, Farah decided to climb the hill for a wider view. As she reached the summit, her heart beating hard with the exertion and alarm, she shaded her eyes and carefully surveyed the plain below, every rod of it from the faraway north to the congested encampment, but there was no sight of Sadie. She suddenly felt so weak and faint that she laid a hand against the trunk of a tree for support against the westerly morning breeze. She started at the sound of a voice immediately behind her. What are you looking for, daughter? Farah turned slowly to confront the prophet, who was regarding her with sober eyes. My horse, she replied unsteadily, returning to her search of the valley. She must have wandered away in the night. May have been stolen suggested John, advancing to stand beside her. Surely no one, among these people, would steal, said Farah. There is no place in this greedy world, my daughter, where men do not steal. There it was again, my daughter. 
Farah hoped she had misunderstood, the first time, but there was no doubt about it now. Somehow he knew. But she must listen, for he was speaking quietly, almost as if to himself. They steal. They steal anything, everything, anywhere, everywhere, anything from a horse to a halter, anywhere from a scroll in the synagogue to a vase in the graveyard. They steal on the farm, in the marketplace, on the highway, at the inn, at the goldsmiths, at the rag pickers, in the gambling house, and in the temple. There is no limit to it. They steal from babes and pennies from dead men's eyes. They steal from bankers and beggars. Where do you live, young woman, that you should be incredulous of theft? I am from Arabia, said Farah. John chuckled briefly, but without smiling. You must have lived a sheltered life, he said dryly. Your people have taken no prizes for honesty. Perhaps you are not very well acquainted with your countrymen. Have you always lived in Arabia? I detect an accent on your tongue, though I must say your Aramaic is correct. How do you happen to speak it? And you look Jewish, as much Jewish as Arabian. Tell me, daughter, why are you wearing a man's burnous, and why that shorn hair? Farah's knees were giving way now, and she sat down. The Prophet seated himself on a small boulder nearby. Slowly turning her face toward him, she encountered a searching gaze that compelled frankness. I am on an errand, sir, that could not be safely performed by a young woman. I told you that I am an Arabian because I prefer to think of myself that way, but it is only half true. My mother was an Arabian. My father is a Jew. Your mother is dead? Only three days ago. Far turned her eyes toward the valley. And that sent you on your errand, I think, and your errand takes you to Judea, and your father is a Jew. Perhaps you go to notify him of your mother's death. Ye yes, stammered Farah, hoping the answer might suffice. There was a considerable silence before John spoke. So it is something else besides telling your father. Has he not lived with your mother in Arabia? Not for many years. How did they happen to marry? It's quite a long story, sir. I have no wish to detain you. She looked again into his inquiring eyes. Must I tell you? She asked in a voice that seemed a little frightened. Not if you don't want to, said John kindly, but perhaps it might help, if you confided in someone you could trust. I am on my way to find my father, said Farah. He lives in Galilee, at the city of Tiberias. Then he must be in the employ of the Tetrarch, surmised John. There is little else in Tiberias but the great establishment of Antipas. Farah nodded and turned her eyes away. Tardily and in a barely audible, reluctant voice she said, Antipas is my father. John seemed a person not easily surprised, but he impulsively rose to his feet and exclaimed, You don't mean it. He searched her face, and apparently satisfied that she was telling the truth, he said, Of course I know the story. Everyone does. You have no cause to be proud of your father. I am quite aware of that, sir, agreed Farah. But, surely, after the cruel and shameful treatment he gave the princess of Arabia, you are not going to Tiberias to live with this. I have vowed to avenge my mother, interrupted Farah huskily. You mean, you would kill your father? If I can. But you can't, exclaimed John. In the first place, it's quite impossible. The place is fortified like a besieged city. I was born a Galilean, and my friends have told me that the Tetrarch lives like a fugitive, heavily guarded by night and day. You would only lose your life to no purpose at all. And, even if you succeeded, which is inconceivable, your crime would haunt you all your days. No good ever comes of revenge. I heard you say yesterday that there was one arriving now to avenge God, said Farah. Is no good to come of that? John did not have an answer ready. After some delay, he said, that is a far different matter, my daughter. Vengeance is permitted only to God. He will repay. But I mustn't. Farah's tone was satirical. It's all right for God to seek vengeance, but it is wrong for me to do it. I'm supposed to have a finer moral character? That remark, reproved John, does you small credit, daughter. It is irreverent. But practical, defended Farah. And excusable, I suppose, reflected John. You probably had no religious training, in Arabia. Why not? Farah demanded. The Jews and Arabians worship the same God, do we not? Abraham is our common father, is that not so? Any further discussion of this matter seeming fraught with more heat than light, John nodded absently. Perhaps you may see the anointed one in Galilee, he said. I wish you might be able to talk with him. He lives in the town of Nazareth. He is a carpenter. 
Disguised as a carpenter? Wondered Farah. Same as I am disguised as a boy? No, he really is a carpenter, and a very good one, whereas you are only pretending to be a boy. And not doing so well at it, she broke in, with a pensive smile. However, she added, you are the first one to discover. You mean, I am the first one to tell you. John paced back and forth, frowning thoughtfully. But this is no light matter, he went on. You have vowed a vow. I shall not be the one to induce you to break it. A vow is a vow. You are intent upon going to Tiberias. Very well. Go first to Nazareth, it is not far from there. Tell your story to the carpenter, Jesus. Abide by his counsel. You will make no mistake if you do as he tells you. I must leave you now. Since your horse is gone, you will. Proceed on foot, I suppose. Follow the Jordan. It is much shorter than by the travel roads and it will be safer for you. Pointing to an angling path down the northern slope of the hill, he said, May God be with you, daughter, and keep you safe from any harm. He extended a big, bony hand, and she confidently gave him her small one. Turning it about for inspection, he smiled. It is not a boy's hand. You must be very careful. I can't advise you, now that your hair is shorn, to dress as a girl should, but, he repeated gently, you must be careful. Those riding boots, that fine burnous. You should get into less conspicuous clothing, peasant's clothes, as soon as possible. You could be thrown into prison for this, you know. That would be unpleasant, said Farah. They say that prisons are very uncomfortable. I have never been in one, said John, but I expect to be, at almost any hour now. The authorities will arrest me as a disturber of the peace. But there is no peace, said Farah. No, there is no peace, agreed John soberly. Is it the temple that would silence you? Yes, but the temple has no authority to imprison me. Who, then? The provincial government, and as I am a Galilean I shall be taken before Antipas. Then, we may meet again, in prison. Farah smiled grimly. John shook his shaggy head in reproof of her ill-timed levity. It is quite clear that you do not realize the utter hopelessness of your undertaking, my child, he said sadly. I do not expect ever to see you again. Farewell. Until we meet, persisted Farah. Halfway down the long hill, she turned and looked back. John was still standing where she had left him. She waved a hand and he extended his arm, as if to give her his final blessing. Chapter 5 It was early morning on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. Enough remained of an unusually hot summer to strip the fishermen to the waist, but intimations of autumn were in the smoky haze that overcast the distant mountains, obscured the dome of the new synagogue in Capernaum, and dulled the sheen of the Tetrarch's marble palace. The ugly huddle of weather-beaten shacks and wharves where the fishermen kept their tackle and dried their nets had come alive to the day's work. Browned, bushy, barefooted men and youth scampered about on the docks loading flat bottom dories with equipment for the larger craft which rocked indolently in the quiet cove, tugging in unison at their anchor chains. Fully a score of these boats, of all shapes, sizes, ages, and degrees of dirtiness and disrepair, were congregated in the bay, waiting for their skippers and crews to haul up the much-mended sails and wallow forth to what they hoped might be promising fishing grounds. Haughtily apart from the clutter of nondescript old tubs, and conspicuous for their trimness, lay a fleet of three blue-hulled schooners moored side by side and so closely lashed together from midship to stern that their freshly painted gunnels would have chafed but for the heavy hemp and pads that cushioned them. Built for stability, they were broad in the beam and sat low in the water, and they were of identical design, though the central ship, the Abigail, carried three masts and was somewhat larger than her two masted companions, the Sarah and the Rachel. Tethered loosely about their prows bobbed half a dozen empty dories. On the closely yoked after decks the combined crews, totaling thirty and ranging in age from sixteen to sixty, sat cross-legged a few feet apart, forming a circle around a huge net that plainly needed extensive repairs. Alone on the broad tiller seat of the Abigail a gigantic, hairy, deeply tanned Galilean of thirty-five, as busy with his all as were his employees, occasionally looked up to survey their work, and sometimes they met his eyes as if to inquire whether he was satisfied with what they were doing. They all worked skillfully, swiftly, and in silence, though their faces did not indicate that they were hard-driven. It was obvious that the relation of the master and his men was cordial, indeed, it was better than cordial, for there was evident in their diligence a desire to please. Especially was this loyalty noticeable in the attitude of the younger ones, who seemed proud of their employment, as they had reason to be, 
for it was a testimonial to a man's seamanship if he was signed on to sail under Simon the son of Jonas. Among the Galileans the name of Simon was so common that it had to be tagged for better identification. Every Simon bore a special designation, Simon the Tanner, Simon the Weaver, Simon the Clubfoot, Simon the Juggler, Simon the Little, Simon the Scribe, Simon the Sot, Simon the Bald, Simon the Son of Jonas. Doubtless if the skipper's sire had been less distinguished, an appellation appropriate to his characteristics would have been promptly contrived for him by the community. In that case he might have become known early in his youth as Simon the Brawler, or Simon the Scoffer. But to the neighbors and relatives who had known him since childhood he was Simon the son of Jonas, and, they were likely to add, not much of a credit to the good old man, for nobody was more fanatically devoted to the synagogue than Jonas, and nobody had less use for it than his tough and burly son Simon. It was inevitable, however, that the huge, noisy, quick-tempered, lamentably irreverent son of Jonas should become known by a more colorful name. All up and down the western shore, throughout Capernaum, Magdala, Bethsaida, and the hamlets between, and at the Roman fort, and among the servants in the great villa of the Tetrarch, and on the lake, and in the country round about, Simon the son of Jonas was referred to as the big fisherman. From early boyhood the sacrilegious and belligerent Simon had been a growing affliction to his parents. True, he obeyed the laws, specializing in a scrupulous observance of the fifth commandment, which in this case was not easy for the religious duties of Jonas, his diligent attention to all the fasts and feasts, his frequent pilgrimages to Jerusalem, and his unctuous exhortations on the streets and in the marketplace left him but little time for any gainful employment, and had it not been for the industry of Simon and his elder brother, Andrew, their parents would have lived on meager fare. As for the docile bachelor Andrew, his idea of keeping the fifth commandment had required his regular attendance at the services of the synagogue and a strict observance of the stated fasts, but it had laid no such burden on Simon, whose conception of honoring his father and mother did not go any further than being kind and respectful to them and seeing to it that they were well fed and clothed. By the time he was twelve Simon heartily despised the synagogue and everything it represented, because, he felt, it had made a loafer and a tiresome bore of an otherwise fine man. By a practice of great restraint, he never disclosed his private contempt for his father's sanctimoniousness. Sometimes it was difficult to exhibit a proper respect when, on business in the markets, he would come upon Jonas parading the aisles, scroll in hand, solemnly haranguing the customers, who rarely paused to give heed and more often grinned and winked at one another as he passed by. But if Simon's attitude toward his father was circumspect, he found a measure of relief for his pent-up feelings by a forthright excoriation of religion when in the company of his young contemporaries. He was still beardless when all the friends and acquaintances of the family referred to him as an infidel, and an uncommonly noisy one. Jonas knew it and deplored it with tears, and prayed aloud in the public places for his wayward son, but ate with relish the provender that the incorrigible skeptic brought home. Beginning as a mere roustabout and chore boy on a dirty trawler, his wages paid in low-grade mud suckers, which he peddled from door to door among the very poor, Simon had gradually made himself useful enough to be in a bargaining position among the fleet owners for he was strong as an ox and fearless to the point of foolhardiness. In weather that tied up most of the ships in the cove at Tiberias, for the little sea could be dangerously rough on short notice, Simon would be eager to go out and do battle with the waves, and the catch, taken in such circumstances, fetched higher prices for lack of competition. And so it was that before he was twenty-three Simon owned a half share in a fairly good fishing smack. At twenty-eight he owned it fully and had taken on a crew of four and now he was master of the most prosperous and best-known fleet on the lake. As his self-made success increased, the big fisherman's character reflected both his earlier frustrations and his current achievements, not always to his credit. Conscious of having missed almost everything that lent enchantment to a normal childhood, he was inclined to be contemptuous of youngsters who wasted their time at play when they might be making themselves useful. He had never been to school, could hardly read and rarely tried to write anything more than his own name. In consequence of this illiteracy, he scoffed at education and considered the professional scrivener an object of ridicule. Physical weakness he viewed with smiling condescension. As for his loyalties and enthusiasms, Simon, though stridently irreligious, possessed a passionate love of his race. Not to be a Jew was equivalent to not being anybody at all. In his regard all nations except Israel were of one ignominious category. If they were in any way different, their distinctions were trivial. Never having traveled more than 25 miles from home, 
and privately sensitive about his provincialism, he had accumulated quite a lot of prejudices about the world beyond Little Galilee. He spoke derisively of people who lived in cities, even Jewish cities. The Greeks foolishly pretended to be better scholars than the Romans, when the fact was that they were only lazier than the Romans and idled their time away on such fripperies as stone statues and the spinning of arguments concerning theories on which one man's guess was as good as another's, with nothing to come of it, no matter who was right. The Romans had proved themselves better fighters than their weaker neighbors, but so were dogs better fighters than canes, when it came to that. The Egyptians were in decay and thought only of building tombs to house their bones. And Arabia had never been anything but a murderous horde of liars, cheats, and robbers. Israel was not only the chosen race but the human race. The rest of the people were no better than animals. Simon could and did discourse on this subject by the hour. He was an Israelite indeed. And he was loyal to his comrades. From boyhood he had shown an extraordinary talent for making friends among all classes of people. He had an instinctive love of common justice and fair play, though he was not always himself a cheerful loser. He liked practical jokes but preferred not to be the object of them, and, sometimes, when finding himself at a momentary disadvantage, the big fisherman would display a childish petulance that seemed amusingly incongruous when exhibited by a man of his heroic stature. In short, success had turned Simon's head a little. Having come up through many tribulations into a conspicuous prosperity, he was intolerant of other men's failures to achieve. He liked to be complimented upon his accomplishments and was not reluctant to speak pleasantly of them himself. But, for all his vanity, his intolerance, and his wide assortment of showy weaknesses, his employees idolized him, worked long hours for him, applauded his strength, laughed immoderately at his clumsy witticisms, and, when off duty, imitated his swagger. By the time the big fisherman had won his prowess as a fleet owner, Saintly old Jonas and his mousy wife Rachel had been summoned from their cottage in Capernaum to an abode elsewhere, leaving him free to marry young Abigail of Bethsaida, who lived with her widowed mother Hannah. Andrew, who rarely offered any unsolicited advice to his more resourceful brother, perhaps because he was an employee, had gently cautioned Simon against this marriage, for Abigail, though winsome and pretty, had no health at all. Doubtless it was her very flower-like fragility that had attracted the big brawny fellow whose latent talent for tenderness had never been given a chance to develop. He had been very considerate of Abigail. As she slowly faded, the common solicitude and sorrow shared by Simon and Hannah greatly endeared them to one another, and when his girl wife died he continued to live with his much-cherished mother-in-law in her commodious home on a quiet, shady corner in the northern suburbs of Bethsaida. Andrew joined them, though, unwilling to burn his bridges until satisfied that this arrangement was mutually agreeable. He kept the old family residence in Capernaum intact and often went there to tend the flowers. Now that the shadow was lifted from the small household in Bethsaida, it took on an unaccustomed brightness, for Hannah was gifted with a quiet drollery and an inexhaustible good humor refreshing to the brothers who had found so little to amuse them in their parental home. Andrew, sober and taciturn, allowed many a quip to pass unnoticed, though he could be depended upon to give an amiable, bewildered smile. Simon's big, booming laugh on an open-windowed summer evening, could be heard a long way off. Near neighbors often wondered, rather testily, what manner of entertainment could produce such hilarity. It was the general opinion of the conservatives in that part of the town that the big fishermen had added little to the gentility of Bethsaida. But though they regarded Simon with scant respect, there was one thing about him that stirred their curiosity, and their envy too. He seemed to be on friendly terms with David, the wealthy, haughty Sadducee. Up the cross street which bounded Hannah's property on the north side and rose gently for a quarter mile to the east, lay the spacious grounds and imposing old mansion of the eminent Zadok family, now reduced in numbers to a pair of unmarried, middle-aged aristocrats and a score of elderly servants. Old Zadok, the departed grandfather of David and Deborah, had held himself aloof from the town, nor had Bethsaida made any effort to intrude upon his lofty isolation, for he was a Sadducee, the only Sadducee in all that region and if he wanted to live in seclusion Bethsaida was willing he should do so, the Sadducees being of a cynical, supercilious sect that affected a social superiority. Nor was that all that ailed old Zadok and the Sadducees, in the opinion of Bethsaida. It was a known fact that he hated the government of Galilee and had been heard to speak scornfully of Antipas the Tetrarch. It was a wonder he hadn't got into trouble about that. Of course he paid exorbitant taxes. Rich men who paid large taxes might be able to speak their minds more recklessly than poor people, who for the same indiscretion could be clapped in jail. 
maybe it was better not to have much to do with the Zadoks or any other Sadducee. Just why David had retained his residence at the old palace on the hill was a mystery, for until his recent retirement he was seldom at home. Maybe it was the commanding view of the lake that had held him and brought him back for his summers. Surely it was inconvenient for him to have lived there during his active life, for his law practice was in Caesarea and the only local client he served was Jairus, whose large estate lay in the foothills above Capernaum. Now David, it seemed, was home to stay, and on fair days it was his habit to stroll slowly down the hill, with bent head, apparently in deep meditation. Persons meeting him did not venture to speak, nor did he lift his eyes. Doubtless he was too busy with his own thoughts to take any account of them. It was not surprising, therefore, that Hannah's neighbors should have been amazed the first time David stopped beside her white picket fence to engage the big fisherman in what seemed to be a serious, man-to-man -man conversation. And this happened again and again, usually of a late afternoon when Simon had returned from his work. Sometimes Hannah joined them, presumably at David's suggestion. It was all very mysterious. But while this friendship between Simon the uncouth and David the refined was incomprehensible to the Bethsedans, whose social status was approximately level, it was not so unaccountable as it seemed, for though aristocracy might shudder at the thought of contamination with persons a notch or two lower in the social scale, it was willing to unbend pleasantly for those who, everybody knew, had no rating at all, and would not be expecting an invitation to dinner. In this case, however, there was still better reason for the friendship of the lawyer and the fisherman. The seed of it had been sown many years before, when Simon, a self-conscious, ragged, immensely overgrown youngster, had regularly delivered fish at the Zadok's kitchen door. David, his senior by a decade, occasionally encountered him on a garden path and stopped to feel his bulging muscles in about the same careless manner with which he tousled the ears of his dog, and Simon would grin and mumble yes, sir to David's playful comments on the astounding number of his freckles and the prodigious size of his bare feet. And then David had gone away to school in Athens, absent for five years. Returning, he had joined an eminent law firm in Caesarea, then rapidly becoming a metropolis, and was seen only rarely, briefly, in Bethsaida. At wide-spaced intervals Simon passed him. David would nod and smile, absently. Even after arriving at something like dignity in his lowly occupation, Simon had continued personally to deliver choice fish to a few important patrons, to the Tetrarch's palace of course, and to the Zadok mansion, and, for a while, to Jairus' beautiful villa, though latterly he had given that up, it was too far. Now that David, slightly stooped and gray, had come home for good, Simon often saw him sauntering about on the grounds. One day they met. Without any preliminary greeting, David said, still peddling fish, eh? Surely you should have found a better job by now. Simon was offended, but kept his temper. I do have a better job, sir. I do not peddle fish. True, I still select them carefully for you and bring them myself to your house, and to the Tetrarch, but I could easily send them. If Simon had thought to flatter his customer by mentioning that the house of Zadok and the villa of the Tetrarch were somehow of the same standing in his esteem, he was quickly set right about that. David's lip curled unpleasantly. So, that abominable drunkard eats fish, eh? He muttered. I had supposed he lived exclusively on beverages. Simon didn't care to risk a comment on this seditious speech, but he nodded perfunctorily, and David, dismissing the subject with a flick of his fingers, said, You are doing well, then. Perhaps you own a market. Simon's lips twitched with a grin that hinted at something better than a market. No, sir. I'm still a fisherman, but I own my ships and have a score and ten men in my employ. That is very good, commented David. I am glad you have prospered. I dare say you have a home and family. Simon explained briefly about that, and David was respectfully sympathetic. After a little pause, he remarked, perhaps you have some office in the synagogue, now that you have done so well in business. No, sir, replied Simon almost bluntly. I have no time for the synagogue. You mean, you are not religious? inquired David, surprised. Well, sir. Simon shifted his weight, deliberating a reply. I believe in the God of our fathers, who made the world, and gives us our life, and the sunshine, rain and harvests. I do not believe that he takes any notice of our small doings, or cares whether we roast calves and lambs in his honor. Very well spoken, said David soberly. You are thoughtful. I bid you good day. That brief conversation had marked the beginning of an acquaintance that was ripening to a friendship. There were frequent talks thereafter, 
Simon encouraged to speak his mind freely and David nodding his approval. Even when Simon had ventured quite beyond his depth and it was obvious that he didn't know what he was talking about, David, in need of diversion, would slowly nod his head and smile. Then came the visits at the fence, which brought all that section of Beth Saida to the window. And one afternoon David consented to come into the yard and sit down with Simon in the shade of the tall cypress, and Hannah brought them cups of pomegranate juice. The early morning haze had lifted now. The sun had scented the old tarred ropes and softened the pitch in the deck seams. The sailors worked in silence, deftly spreading open the frayed cords of the net and weaving into them the new twine. Simon straightened his back, scratched his bushy head with his awl, and shaded his sweating brow for keener observation of the dory that was slowly approaching from the docks. His face lighted up. Other eyes followed his inquisitively. Who's that with John? mumbled Andrew. I don't recognize him, said Simon. Some youngster wanting a job maybe. Looks like a tramp, thought James. That would be John, all over, remarked old Zebedee, from the adjacent deck of the Rachel, always bringing home a lost dog to feed. Well, he might do worse, rumbled Simon deep in his throat. Go forward, Thad, and toss him a rope. Work on the net was resumed without much enthusiasm, all of them curious to see what sort of passenger John had picked up. But, whoever the stranger was, the big fisherman would doubtless approve of his coming aboard. Anything that Johnny did was agreeable with Simon. Every member of the crew took that for granted. Sometimes newcomers to the fleet were a bit annoyed over the skipper's partiality toward this absent-minded youth, but they soon accepted it without jealousy, for nobody could help liking him. Johnny was shamelessly lazy. On warm afternoons when everybody else was diligently fishing, Johnny could be found lying flat on his back staring up into the sky. If Simon teasingly queried for a report on what he saw in the white clouds today he would raise his arm and dreamily finger a pattern of a dome, a tower, a bridge, a city, or perhaps a winged angel. You were not much good as a fisherman, Johnny, Simon would say, but it's worth something to see pictures in the sky. It is doubtful, however, whether Simon would have tolerated any such indolence had that been the boy's only distinction. In emergencies he was amazingly industrious, resourceful, and courageous. In fair weather, when the sails were hoisted or reefed, the crew had to step over him while he indifferently viewed their labors through half-closed eyes. Let there be a storm, Johnny astonished them with his seamanship. If a raveled rope fell to pulley high on the mainmast in the midst of a howling gale, everybody knew that the drenched sailor inching his way up the swaying rat lines was Johnny the Dreamer. Perhaps Simon loved the boy for his reckless bravery, perhaps for his visions in the white clouds, perhaps for both of these disparate talents but whatever may have been the grounds of his affection it was sincere and ever on display. Nor was it a one-sided devotion. Simon was Johnny's hero. It was a relationship that gave something of fragrance to an occupation much in need of it. Now John and his unrecognized companion, a ragged youth of his own age, were climbing over the forward rail. Waving a hand, he led the diffident stranger into the little galley in the forecastle, Feeding him, no doubt, guessed Andrew. He certainly looked hungry. Johnny missed his calling, said Simon. He should have been a public almoner. It would have increased the taxes, remarked old Zebedee. The boy has no regard for money. No, Johnny will never be rich, said Simon, but he will always have friends. And they will have him to bury some time, muttered Zebedee. You wouldn't expect him to bury himself, said Simon. They all chuckled a little at this, but gave full attention as John appeared from the galley and came slowly aft their curiosity about his movements whetted by the fact that he had been absent since noon yesterday. Stepping with the carefulness of a cat he walked across the big net and sat down beside Simon, who edged over to make room. They all put down their work and waited for explanations. Camel boy, said John, tipping his head toward the galley. Hasn't had anything to eat for a couple of days, very tired. I found him sitting on the dock. He looked as if he had been crying, face all smeared and dirty. He said he had run away from a caravan bound for Damascus on the coast road, because they beat and starved him. You showed him where to wash, and gave him some food? Inquired Simon. He took up the net again as a hint to the crew, and they bent over their work. John nodded, and smiled. I never saw anyone eat before, he remarked to Simon, not like this boy. The poor chap must be hollow all the way to his heels. Did you question him? Asked Simon. No, I thought I'd let you do that. He may be from the south. He speaks Aramaic, the Judean kind, only down south further, maybe. Well, we'll see, rumbled Simon absently. 
Leaning closer, he asked in a low voice, Did you go out there, yesterday, as you intended? John nodded dreamily, averting his eyes, then shook his head. Well? snapped Simon, with a sudden impatience that widened his audience. Did you go, or didn't you? Again John nodded, slowly lifted cloudy eyes, entreatingly shook his head, and tapped his hand gently on the big fisherman's knee, as if begging that his story might be deferred until he could tell it in private. But this signal for secrecy, now that the crew had become interested in the pantomime, nettled Simon. And did you find this cracked carpenter who has turned vintner, and makes wine out of water? The crews of the three ships were leaning forward now, wide-eyed with curiosity and frankly amused at the discomfiture of the skipper's pet. And when John still remained silent, crestfallen, Simon went on with his ridicule. I suppose the carpenter urged all the poor farmers and shepherds to band together and storm the Roman fort with flails and pitchforks. This brought a laugh. Everybody had heard Simon's savagely expressed opinions of the rumors afloat concerning the carpenter from Nazareth, and it would be prudent to share his contempt. The big fisherman appreciated this loyal acceptance of his views and gave his men another occasion for a guffaw. Turning toward John, he said. Perhaps you saw the carpenter turn a field of rocks into a pasture full of fat sheep. Speak up, lad. You were bent on going out to see the carpenter, and I gave you the day off. Tell us, now, what did you make of him? I, I don't know, said John thickly. He compressed his lips and shook his bent head. Presently he straightened, faced Simon with an expression of utter bafflement, and repeated lamely, I don't know, sir. It's all very strange. HMM, so I gather, muttered Simon. And what was so strange about it? the man or his talk or his tricks? Can't you tell us? Or are we too stupid to understand? Please give me time, Simon. John seemed to be speaking from a distance. The whole thing is mysterious. I can't think straight today. Let me tell you about it, a little later. He lowered his tone until it was inaudible to any but Simon, and added, but I won't expect you to believe it. Humphrey. Grunted Simon. At this juncture the tension was eased. The emaciated camel boy, in a tattered and grimy brown tunic and trousers, easily recognized as the garb of a caravan lackey, ambled slowly toward them. Uncertain what to do with himself, he halted and leaned against a capstan. Simon beckoned to him and the net was relaxed for his crossing. Obedient to the master's invitation, he sat down on what was left of the tiller seat. The crew looked him over without visible prejudice. Did you have something to eat, son? The big fisherman's voice was friendly. The newcomer nodded gratefully and said in a husky tone inaudible to any but the master and John, You are very kind, sir. That was John's doing, chuckled Simon, apparently anxious to set himself right with his offended favorite, who sat demurely reflecting on the ridicule he had suffered. Johnny attends to the feeding of visitors. So, you're lost, maybe. Well, don't worry too much. You look as if you needed a rest. Where have you been sleeping lately, in haystacks? No, sir under the hedges along the roadside. They don't want you sleeping in their haystacks. They can't be much blamed for that, commented Simon. Tramps are always breaking down their berry bushes and grapevines, and frightening the cattle. What's your name, boy? Joseph. I suppose they call you Joe. Why yes, sir. That, and a lot of other things lately. Simon acknowledged this grim little pleasantry with an appreciative grin. Evidently the ragged waif was not stupid. Where are you from, Joe? He asked, kindly. Far south, sir, near the Dead Sea. Idumea, maybe? The boy nodded tardily, his reluctance being quite understandable, for no one had ever been heard to boast that he was a native of Idumea. Simon's lips tightened involuntarily and he regarded the youngster with a frown, but instantly relented as he looked into the drooping eyes. I suppose you know, son, that we Jews don't have much to do with Ida means. But I do means are Jews, sir, meekly protested the boy. Simon sniffed and shrugged. Several centuries ago, he remarked crisply. Your people haven't been very good Jews, not for a long time. King Herod came from Idumea, sir, ventured the boy softly. Well, drawled Simon, that doesn't improve Idumea's reputation very much. The sailors laughed a bit nervously. Old Zebedee cackled loudly. I always say, he shrilled. It's cheaper to feed an Idamine and let him go on his way. Then, maybe, he won't steal from you. The old man grimaced for his immediate neighbors, feeling that he had scored a point. I never stole anything in my life, 
retorted the stranger, without turning to see where the insult had originated. I believe you, Joe, declared John. Yeah, railed his father, you'd believe anything, anybody. That's your trouble. You're too easily taken in. I believe you too, my boy, said Simon, so pointedly that old Zebedee suddenly busied himself with his all. Then, turning to John, the big fisherman inquired in a low tone. Many people out there? Where was it? Up on the hill, on the road to Cana. John's voice was guarded. It was apparent that he had no intention of explaining to the whole company if he could avoid it. There were about a hundred people, perhaps more. It had grown very quiet. All work had stopped. Everyone was candidly eavesdropping. Simon observed it, and grinned. May as well speak out, Johnny. They're all interested. We're talking about the carpenter, boys. Johnny went out to see him, yesterday. Go. Ahead, Johnny. Tell us all about it. The men were pleased to be included in the conversation. They pocketed their awls. Some rested their elbows on their knees and cupped their chins in their hands. Even the weary young tramp showed a sudden interest at the mention of a carpenter whose doings had excited public curiosity. John was hesitant to begin, studied his slim, brown fingers as if he had never seen them before, and moistened his dry lips. To fill in this awkward pause, Simon announced, I gave John leave yesterday to go out into the country and see what this hullabaloo amounted to. There have been all manner of wild tales, and it's high time somebody came forward with the truth. Yeah. Yelled Zebedee. That yarn about his turning water into wine, over at Cana. You can't find anybody who will stand up and say he saw it himself. It's always the cousin of a brother-in-law who saw it, and he lives over in Samaria somewhere. Simon turned about and faced the old man with a scowl. If that is all you have to say for the present, Zebedee, we will give your son a chance to talk. There was now no way out for John, except to tell the story. He lifted his head and began his strange narrative. Learning that he had left Cana and was headed in this direction, I went out, hoping to meet him. On the hill I came upon quite a multitude of people gathered about him. Many of them had followed him from Cana, and apparently the others had joined the crowd along the way. What did he look like? Broke in James. It was late afternoon when I arrived, continued John, with a brief little gesture that postponed a reply to his brother's query. I tried to question a few on the edge of the crowd, but they gave no heed. They were all closely packed together, pushing in on him until he had hardly room to stand. I thought it was quite rude of them, though I soon found myself wanting to do the same thing. He paused reminiscently, shook his head, and muttered, it was all very strange. Simon hitched about impatiently. Get on with it, Johnny. What was the fellow saying? He wasn't what you'd call a big man, continued John, with a glance toward his brother. Simon would overtop him by a good six inches. The big fisherman squared his shoulders and listened more complacently. But not meaning that he was frail, amended John. His skin was much whiter than ours, though he wore nothing on his head and the sun was hot enough to burn him. He seemed very warm, and tired. His brown hair was curly and the sweat had coiled some tight little rings of it on his forehead, softening his face until it might have looked boyish if it hadn't been for his short beard. Even with the beard he looked much younger than he talked. His eyes. John broke off here and fumbled with the old net while his audience waited in silence. Presently he gave a deep sigh, shook his head, and went on, in a monotone of reminiscence. He didn't talk in a loud voice, not like a teacher or a preacher. You know what I mean, the way the scribes talk to people, as if they were reciting something to the woods or the moon, but not to anybody in particular. The carpenter didn't seem to be speaking to the crowd as a crowd, but to each person, as if they were alone together, apart. That was the first thing I noticed about his talk. I couldn't help feeling that he had singled me out and was speaking directly to me. Maybe that was why I wanted to get closer. I suppose that was why everyone crowded in, wanting to get closer. Very well. Very well. Prodded Simon. You wanted to get closer. Now, what did he say? That's what we're all waiting for, John, shouted old Zebedee. He was talking about freedom, and happiness. Our country was never going to be free he said. We should make up our minds to that. He said that if we were ever to have any happiness at all we must accept this bondage as something we couldn't alter, and plan to find our happiness within ourselves, seeing that our land would be subjugated, as long as we lived, and longer. Wants us to be contented with our slavery, does he? Called Alpheus from the Sarah. No, it isn't that he approves of our slavery, John went on, unruffled by the interruption. 
he said that all men everywhere are governed by conditions that curb their freedom, and doesn't believe in government, eh? commented Andrew dryly. The Tetrarch will soon cure him of that. What does he know about all men everywhere, this carpenter from Nazareth? scoffed Simon. He didn't say that he was against the government, answered John, weary but patient. He said that every man could find freedom for himself, regardless of the laws. Freedom for his spirit. The richest gifts, he said, are beyond the control of any oppressor, property which nobody can carry away or withhold from us. Such as what? sniffed Simon, in a tone of raillery that made the sailors laugh. Dawn, said John diffidently, knowing they would laugh again. Dawn, and the sunset, the mountains, the songs of birds, and, his voice fell to an almost inaudible murmur as he queried their grinning faces, and the warm rain, and morning dew on the grass, and wild poppies growing on the hill slopes. Wild poppies? broke in Thaddeus from across the old net. Wild poppies? Songs of birds? Dew on the grass? Why didn't someone ask him how to make these things up into a porridge to feed the family? This was so good, and they all enjoyed it so much that Thad, embarrassed by his own wit, yawned widely to show that his sally didn't really amount to anything and he could be funnier than that if the occasion arose. It pleased him particularly to hear the big fisherman's roaring laugh. John accepted the general merriment with no sign of irritation. It was what he had expected. The carpenter talked about that, Thad, he said quietly, when the hilarity had subsided. He thinks that most people spend too much time making things up into porridge, fretting about porridge, thinking that nothing is any good unless it can be made up into porridge, spending their lives worrying for fear they might be short of food next winter, and in their old age. Worrying, until they have no happiness at all. He said the birds did not worry, and yet they were fed. Yeah. Yelled Zebedee, but they've got to scratch for it. There was a gale of laughter. Old Zebedee was a pest, but this joke was excellent. The applause delighted him, and he repeated his witticism again and again for his nearest neighbors. Yes, they've got to scratch for it, he. Ha! Huh? Scratch for it. That about the birds, said Simon, sounds just like my old father. He never worried about where the next meal was coming from. The men chuckled discreetly. Zebedee, to show that he knew more than any of the younger ones about the pious improvidence of Jonas, laughed himself into a noisy fit of coughing. Andrew effectively shut off this racket by scowling at him, as if to say that if Simon wanted to jest a little about their righteous but unemployed father, that was his business, but there was no occasion for any comment from Zebedee, whose back always hurt him when there was anything to do. Feeling now that his audience was neither sympathetic nor particularly interested in what he had been saying, John dug deep into his pocket, fetched up an awl, drew the edge of the old net across his knees and set to work. Aren't you going to tell us anything more? asked Simon. Not at present, said John remotely. I'd much rather not talk about it now. It's too serious. It isn't at all a laughing matter. But, please, Johnny. Entreated James. We will be quiet. Glancing about the circle, with his sober eyes coming to rest on his father's smirk, he added, My brother has an important story to tell if we will let him. I, for one, would like to hear it. Slowly pocketing his all and giving James a grateful smile, John continued with his strange narrative, and the men listened. How to find happiness, that was the thing. Few of us would ever be wealthy, no matter how hard we tried, no matter how greedily we grabbed things out of other people's hands. And the possessions we got, whether by fair means or foul, would turn out to be encumbrances. We would always have to be on the lookout for thieves. We would be afraid to leave home, even if we left a watchman, for he might be dishonest. We would sleep with one eye open and we would be suspicious of strangers. And it was not only the threat of theft that would keep us disquieted. Our possessions would be menaced by moths, and rust. Surely he didn't object to our having a bed and a couple of stools to sit on and a roof over our heads, commented Alpheus. First of all, John went on, undiverted, we must stop fretting and complaining about our national servitude. Instead of flying into a rage when some gruff legionary imposes on us, we should quietly obey his orders, however unjust. If the soldier encounters one of us on the highway and hands us his pack to carry for a mile, let us take it and carry it for him, a mile, two miles. There was some subdued grumbling here, but nobody spoke up. Old Zebedee vigorously shook his gray head and made a sour grimace. Simon clenched a big fist and waggled it experimentally. The dirty camel boy yawned. This led him to talk about the bearing of burdens, pursued John. That was the best way to find happiness. 
bearing burdens for others, whether they were friends or foes. If enemies, they regard you more mercifully, if friends, they love you for it. I don't believe that. Objected Thaddeus. Toadying to enemies doesn't make them a bit easier on you. They get the idea that you are afraid, and then they do lay it on. Many of the fishermen nodded their agreement. John did not pause to take note of this general disapproval. He said the way to find your happiness and peace is in helping other people carry their heavy packs, whatever they are. Here John paused so long that they thought he was through. They shifted their position for better comfort, and a few of them made as if to resume their work on the net. Simon stretched, yawned prodigiously, and rubbed his eyes with his big knuckles. And that was all there was to it? He queried. Nothing very exciting about such talk. You say the crowd listened? Yes, we listened. We listened with our mouths open, so our breathing would not interfere with our hearing. As I told you, there is something peculiar about the carpenter's voice. He doesn't talk as other men do. Nobody, ever, talked, like that. But he didn't do anything, out of the ordinary? James wanted to know. I had decided not to say anything about that, at least, not now, faltered John. Because, I know you won't believe it. They all came promptly to attention and were very quiet. It was while he was talking about our finding happiness by bearing burdens. There was a man standing only a few feet away from me who had a paralyzed arm, or something had ailed it so that it was much shorter and thinner than the other. But for this bad right arm, he was a pretty husky fellow. I had noticed him petting his short arm as if he was proud of it and wanted people to see it. All of a sudden, he broke into the carpenter's speech, and held up this poor thing of an arm, hoisting it up by his good hand, and he shouted out, How about me, sir? You can see that I cannot bear burdens. Here John stopped, closed his eyes, and shook his head like an emerging diver. No, no, I cannot tell you. He muttered thickly. You will not believe it. If any one of you were to tell me this, I'm sure I wouldn't believe a word of it. Say on, Johnny. Commanded Simon. What happened? The fellow's arm. John's voice trembled. It was well, I tell you. It was sound. It was as long as the other. The fishermen stiffened their backs and stared at young John as if he were a stranger. Simon broke the silence. No, John, no. He muttered. We can't have any of that, you know. Old Zebedee scrambled to his feet, pointed a shaky finger at his son, and shouted, That's the first time I ever heard you lie. James, habitually tolerant of his father's incessant airing of his views, now surprised them all by rising to face the noisy old man with a stern rebuke. My brother is not a liar, sir. He exclaimed. Johnny may have misunderstood what he saw, but I will not sit here silently and hear him reviled as a liar, not even by his father. It's a long, hard climb, up that hill, put in Andrew, and yesterday was a hot day. I, nodded Alpheus, to his immediate neighbors. The boy must have been a bit out of his head. No, Johnny, mumbled Simon, that's much too much. Such things don't happen. John hung his head, not as if he resented their disbelief, but regretful that he had consented to tell the story. Suddenly the murmurs ceased as Simon held up a hand for silence. Well, Johnny, you may as well go on with it, he said roughly. You can see that you've nothing to lose. Nobody believes you, but we'd better have the rest of it, if there is any more. Did this fortunate fellow, with the healed arm, thank the carpenter, and maybe hand him a shekel? The people were stunned. Muttered John, without looking up. A woman standing next to the man fainted and crumpled up on the ground. The man himself was panting hard, making queer little squeaks in his throat. You couldn't tell whether he was trying to laugh or cry. Everybody was quiet, and pale. I felt a little sick in my stomach, the way you feel at the sight of a bleeding wound, only, I think. The shock of seeing a deformed arm suddenly made well is worse than seeing a bad accident. While we were all standing there, gaping at the arm, the carpenter said, Now, my friend, you can bear burdens. See to it that you do, or a worse thing might come upon you. John's voice was unsteady as he finished his story. After an interval of silence, he rose slowly and faced the company with sober eyes. I know that you do not believe what I have told you, he declared, but may God strike me dead if it is not the truth blasphemy, yelled old Zebedee. I am not saying you lied, Johnny, said Simon, but I do think you have been seeing things, like the strange animals you find in the clouds. It's no harm to imagine things in the sky, but this is different. I only hope you aren't losing your mind. Tell us truly now, were you out there at all? 
Did you really see this carpenter? I think you dreamed it, all of it, while you were asleep under a tree. This brought on nervous laughter. Run along, Johnny, said Simon, as if to a mere toddler. You've done enough for one day. Go somewhere and rest your dizzy head. Flushed with humiliation, John moved slowly across the net and walked with uncertain steps toward the bow. James watched him with troubled eyes. I think I shall go too, he said. Maybe you'd better ask permission, advised his father. You may go, James, growled Simon. Talk your flighty brother out of this nonsense and bring him back when he's cured of it. My brother may not want to come back, said James, after the shameful treatment he has had. He may do as he likes about that, snapped Simon hotly. The fleet can get along without him. And you needn't come back, either, if you're so easily offended. Hear that? shouted Zebedee. You'll be losing your job if you aren't careful. James made no reply, but followed his brother. A moment later the silent sailors heard the clatter of oars in Adori's rollocks. Craning there. Next, they saw the little boat making toward the beach. Simon stood to watch it, frowning darkly. He turned about and faced Andrew. I'll not go out today, he said. Finish with the net, and take the fleet over to the south shore where we fished yesterday. Andrew followed him as he stalked forward, overtaking him amidships. What do you want done with this young tramp? He inquired. Simon gave a wry smile and stroked his jaw. Now that Johnny had turned out to be an ungrateful fool, he would teach him a lesson by giving his flouted friendship to this ragged waif. Johnny would come creeping back tomorrow to find that he had lost his place as the skipper's pet. He beckoned to Joe, who came promptly to his side. Come with me, son, he said, kindly. You shall have a clean bed to sleep in tonight. Old Zebedee had wriggled forward and stood by, rubbing his wrinkled hands. I'm sorry my boys acted that way, he whimpered. You'd do well to mind your own business, growled Simon. There had been almost no conversation between them as they trudged along on the well-beaten highway to suburban Bethsaida. The sun was high now, and hot. A few steps in advance of his young companion, the big fisherman marched steadily with long strides, moodily preoccupied and quite oblivious of the sandal patter behind him. These shorter footsteps were erratic, for the camel boy frequently turned about to survey the huge marble palace of the Tetrarch, sometimes walking backwards for a dozen steps and shading his eyes for better vision. They were entering the residential district now where well-kept houses sat back from the dusty street, partly hidden by tall acacias, cypress, and olive trees. A corner was turned to the left. At the next corner Simon slowed, encouraging the camel boy to come abreast of him. Opening a small wicket gate, he led the way toward a commodious grey brick cottage. The dooryard was shady. A pleasant-faced woman of middle age was raking leaves. What brings you home so early, Simon? She inquired with a side glance at the disheveled stranger. Anything the matter? You sit down here on the stoop, son, said Simon. I want a word with you, Hannah. The Idomene tramp was gratified by this tentative hospitality, and sank down wearily on the step, legs aching from trying to keep up with the long steps of the Galilean giant. The woman had put down the rake and they had entered the house. The skipper would confer with this Hannah, who was probably his mother, though she seemed too young for that and she would shake her head and say, No, please, Simon, not an I mean. And he looks so terribly dirty. He's probably lousy too. After what seemed a very long time, they came out on the little porch where Joe sat. It was a relief to see a cordial smile on the woman's face. My mother-in-law, Hannah, has consented to let you rest here with us for a day or two, seeing how very tired you are, said Simon. Turning to Hannah, he added, I may not be home for supper. Perhaps you should have a bite to eat before you go. I'm not hungry. Without a farewell word Simon walked rapidly to the gate and down the street as if his errand might be of some urgency. Hannah sat down on the step, a little way apart from her guest, caught up a wisp of graying hair that had fallen over her temple, and, after soberly searching the tired, long-lashed eyes, smiled a little. Your name is Joe, she said pleasantly. And you are from away down in Edumia. Joe nodded but offered no further facts about himself. We do not see many Idomines up here, said Hannah. In fact, I never saw one before. Joe sighed deeply, but had nothing to say about it, Yumia. You would probably enjoy a bath, said Hannah. Oh, breathed the dirty boy. Would I? Then, come with me. Hannah rose and led the way into the cool, well-furnished house. That bedroom straight ahead of you, Joe. I shall bring you a tub of water. 
You will find towels in the room. Please let me do that, insisted Joe. Show me where it is, and I will help myself. Hannah darted an inquiring glance into the waif's eyes. She had not expected any graciousness on the part of this young vagabond. Showing him a large wooden tub in the storeroom off the kitchen, and pointing to the cistern, she returned to her leaf raking. Presently she retraced her steps and tapped at the bedroom door. If you will hand me your soiled clothes, I will wash them, and hang them out in the sun to dry. The splashing ceased and there was quite an interval of silence. At length the boy made a flustered reply. Oh, but I didn't expect you to do that. Surely you are not intending to put those dirty garments on again? Hannah's voice rose in indignation. They have got to be cleaned, for our sake if not yours. Open that door now, a little way, and hand them to me. After some silence and delay, the door was reluctantly opened wide enough to accommodate a small, brown, wet hand holding a shabby jacket and a pair of coarse trousers, clothing worn only by the poorest of peasants. Hannah took them gingerly with her fingertips and made a wry face. Didn't you have anything on under these dreadful rags? She inquired. Why yes, stammered Joe, but, please, I can wash them myself. Don't be foolish, snapped Hannah. I won't have those filthy things in my house, not another minute. Let me have them. And when there was no immediate response, she called sternly, I'm waiting. Again the door opened slightly, grudgingly, and the damp hand delivered two badly rumpled undergarments which Hannah grabbed. Impatiently. Averting her face, she carried them to the back door and pitched them out on the grass. She was more than disgusted with the task she had set for herself. She had been foolish to take this dirty tramp into her house. Simon had no right to ask her to do it. Then something attracted her attention. She stepped out on the ground and inspected the undergarments with wide-eyed curiosity. They were dainty and exquisitely made of the finest, sheerest linen she had ever seen. Unquestionably they were a woman's clothing. This Joe was a thief then. She might have known it. She sat down on the grass and fingered the gauzy material. Where could this tramp have come upon such articles? What opportunity would he have had to steal clothing of this value? And, imagine a camel boy wanting to wear a woman's clothes. Now an utterly preposterous idea arrived to confuse the problem. Could this Jill be a girl? Hannah recalled her wonderment at the extraordinarily long, curling lashes when she had looked into the boy's weary eyes. And the small, slim hand. But, even assuming that the youngster was masquerading, that didn't explain this expensive underwear. She held up the shirt, woven of costly linen. On the left breast there was embroidered a peculiar device. Hannah studied it with mystification. The emblems in the blue oval meant something, she was sure of that. There was a new moon, done in gold thread, circling about a silver star, and crossing through the slim moon and the star, a white sword and a shepherd's crook. Suddenly Hannah resolved to make an experiment that might solve the mystery. She returned to the bedroom door and listened. It was very quiet in there now. Joe, she called. Yes. The voice was sleepy, or was it frightened? I've found out something about you. There was no reply. Joe, you're a girl. Why yes, weakly, wearily, I know. Well, Hannah's voice was unsteady, after you've rested, look in the closet for some clothing. Her tone had softened. In the chest you will find undergarments, not nearly so fine as yours, but serviceable. They belong to my daughter, who died. And when there was no reply, she added, or would you prefer to go on pretending you're a boy? The answer was muffled and inaudible. Perhaps you might enjoy being a girl again, persisted Hannah gently, just for a day or two while you're here. I wouldn't tell on you. Yes, please, murmured the girl brokenly. She was crying. And so was Hannah. After she had washed the clothes, and it had taken more time than such a task should have called for in any other circumstance, Hannah hung them out to dry. It had gratified her to find that while the rough outer garments were badly soiled, the dainty underwear, though wrinkled, was fairly clean. Apparently these garments had been recently washed, perhaps in some forest brook. Although consumed by curiosity to learn the girl's story, Hannah had no thought of disturbing her now, she was utterly spent and would probably sleep for hours. There was still much leaf raking to be done, and it seemed that the leaves which needed immediate attention were close to the north fence. Incidentally, David would be strolling by before long, as was his custom. David was learned and widely traveled. He would be almost sure to know what these strange symbols meant. Should she ask him? More than an hour had passed, with Hannah becoming very warm and weary, before the eminent Sadducee appeared, sedately marching down the hill. He paused, 
laid a hand on the fence, and offered the usual greeting. The conversation did not flow freely. Yes, Hannah agreed, it was indeed a warm day for this time of the year. But she had enjoyed the exercise, and the leaves must be gathered up before it rained. No, Simon wasn't there and might not be home until late. When it appeared that nothing remained to be said, David bowed soberly and was taking his leave. Hannah advanced a step and halted him with a diffident query. She had come upon a bit of linen, she said, that bore some strange tokens. It was blue and oval in shape, and in the center there was the figure of a new moon and a star. David, smiling condescendingly, broke in with surprise that she did not recognize the well-known star and crescent of Arabia. But that wasn't quite all, continued Hannah. Crossing through this moon and star there was a sword and a shepherd's crook. Impossible, muttered David. Where did you find this? Hannah was visibly embarrassed and her heart raced. She had not reckoned on a question that would demand fuller explanation and her expression showed that she now regretted having introduced the subject. Her confusion spurred the lawyer's curiosity. He stepped closer and soberly searched her eyes. This morning a hungry and ragged camel boy appeared on one of Simon's ships, began Hannah nervously, and Simon, you know, sir, how big-hearted he is, took pity on the young fellow and brought him home, to rest and be properly fed for a day or two. I made him take a bath, and, while he was doing that, I washed his clothing. These strange figures were embroidered on one of his garments. I should like to see it, said David. It's still wet, sir, from the washing, said Hannah. David impatiently assured her that it wouldn't matter at all if the garment was wet. He wanted to see it, and he wanted to see it now. So Hannah brought it and handed it over. This is a woman's raiment, said David. Hannah dropped her eyes, and nodded. You will keep it a secret, sir? won't you? she entreated. I gave her my word I wouldn't tell. I should have no motive for betraying you, Hannah. He handed back the garment. It is better that no one be told, about this insignia. Not even Simon? When he discovers that his wife is a girl, he will ask many questions. She has consented to wear my daughter's clothing while she is here. Let Simon think whatever he likes about the girl's having disguised herself. She may or may not confide. If I were you, I should not press her for her story. David was again on the point of moving away, but paused to inquire, is she Jewish in appearance? Yes, sir. She told Simon she was from Idumea. That's Jewish, is it not? Idumea? Nonsense. Snorted David. Had she been from Idumea she wouldn't have wanted to bathe. No, indeed. That shirt did not originate in Idumea. I shall see you again tomorrow. I bid you good day. He turned slowly and was retracing his steps toward home, with bent head, and hands clasped behind him. After he had gone a little way, he suddenly straightened, turned about, and came back. You say the girl looks Jewish. Think hard now. If someone were to tell you she is part Jewish, and part Arabian, what would you say? David's eyes invaded Hannah's earnestly. I wouldn't know, sir, she replied, shaking her head. I don't know how the Arabians look. The girl is a little taller than most Jewish women of her age, and more slender, too. What, would you say, is her age, Hannah? Sixteen, perhaps, or seventeen, maybe. David made no comment on that, but stood silently, thoughtfully, counting his fingers. Having finished the addition, he nodded to himself, drew an enigmatic smile, and withdrew. I bid you good day, Hannah, he said absently. For a long time the bewildered woman stood watching the venerable Sadducee's deliberate march up the hill. It was evident that David had been deeply impressed. Hannah hoped she wasn't getting into trouble. She wished she could feel free to confide the whole matter to Simon. But if the girl was, as David seemed to suspect, of Arabian blood, Simon would undoubtedly be angry and turn her out. He hated the Arabians. On the other hand, if he weren't told and found out later, he would have good cause for being enraged over the deception. Any way you looked at it, the situation was disturbing. Hannah was not experienced in dissembling. After standing there irresolutely until her legs were weary she returned to the house. The door of the guest's bedroom was now open. The girl, in a simple white dress of Abigail's, was sitting on the edge of the bed, combing her cropped hair. Hannah smiled, but her eyes brimmed with tears. The girl instinctively guessed why. I'm afraid it makes you sad, she said softly, to see a stranger in this keepsake dress. I am sorry. Hannah brightened and dabbed at the tears. It was just for a moment, my dear. I am glad to see my Abigail's clothing put to some good use. She was a beautiful child. 
and, impulsively, so are you. What shall we call you, now that your name isn't Cho? There was a momentary pause before the girl replied, you may call me Esther. Though that is not your name, either, commented Hannah, disappointed, and hurt. I am told that Esther was the name my father chose for me, said the girl, eager to make amends. Shall I suppose, then, persisted Hannah, that others in your family preferred another name for you, and that their wishes prevailed? Esther nodded, absently, diligently preoccupied with her calming. Hannah waited uneasily in the doorway for a fuller confidence, and when the girl responded only with a childish little smile of entreaty, she turned away with an impatient gesture that said, Oh, very well, then, if it's such a secret. Presently the dishes clattered in the kitchen as if they too were annoyed. It was clear that Hannah was offended by her guest's reticence. Esther felt very uncomfortable. She had a momentary impulse to follow the friendly woman and make a full disclosure of everything. On second thoughts she decided that too much was at stake. Having inflicted upon Hannah the thankless job of looking after the ragged young Edamine, an impetuosity that had already caused him some appropriate misgivings, Simon hurried away as if late for an important engagement, though the fact was that he had no plans for the day. He had never been so restless in his life. As he neared the highway, his long stride shortened and slowed to an indecisive saunter, and at the corner, he looked both ways, gnawing his bearded underlip. Daily habits suggested that he return to the fleet, but the idea was rejected. Simon had no relish for reappearing among his men so soon after the quarrel with Zebedee's boys, an affair which, he now felt, might easily have been avoided. Besides, Andrew would probably have sailed by this time. And, as for the Tetrarch's fish, doubtless one of the crew had been sent to deliver them, seeing the skipper had said he would not return today. With no plausible errands in the direction of Tiberius, Simon turned the other way and walked slowly toward the sleepy little business zone of Bethsaida, for no reason at all except to keep in motion. He couldn't stand there on the corner any longer. Salutations were offered along the road, to which he responded grumpily, in no mood for neighborly conversation. Not for a long time had Simon been in this part of the town, but nothing had changed. Nothing ever changed in Bethsaida. Old Seth still sat where Simon had seen him last on the stone flagging before the open door of his pottery shop, hugging his thin knees tight against his bearded chin. Don't see you down this way very often, shrilled the old man, unexpectedly stirring from his torpor. It was an invitation to tarry and talk, but Simon merely grunted and ambled on. At the wide doorway of the blacksmith's shop he paused only long enough to agree with sooty-faced, leather apron Ben Abel that it was a hot day. Ben Abel clanked down his hammer, advanced to the door and further deposed that we need a drain. Simon nodded and moved away. On the broad steps of the synagogue lounged a beggar whom he distastefully recognized by the bulky and filthy bandage on a perennially sore arm. The loathsome creature straightened, grinned, and began to unwrap his odorous merchandise. Wrinkling his nose, Simon signed that he didn't want to see it, and dropped three copper pennies in the battered cup. No use going out there now, advised the beggar. Everybody that's going today has gone a good two hours ago time you get there, it will be all over. What will be all over? demanded Simon gruffly. The carpenter. That's where you're going, isn't it? What gave you that foolish idea? Oh, I can tell, snickered the beggar. Some of them try to pretend they're going somewhere else, but I can spot them. Take yourself now. I know you. You're the big fisherman, that doesn't hold with the synagogue and curses religion. But what business brings you out here, on your way up the hill? You're not carrying any fish and there's none to be had where you're going. You want to have a look at this carpenter, same as everybody else. Hey! Hey! If you're so interested in this miracle-working carpenter, growled Simon, why don't you show him that stinking arm? Maybe he would heal it for you. But perhaps you don't want it healed. The fellow is a fraud and a blasphemer. The beggar rattled his cup and made a wry face. Three pennies. And the big fisherman owns three ships. It isn't enough to buy a measure of leeks. Simon muttered a curse and strode angrily away, the beggar calling after him, It won't do you any good to climb that long hill, I tell you. He'll be gone. You'll be meeting all the other fools on their way back. The big fisherman had left the town behind him now and the highway was stiffly rising. He had been walking rapidly, stomping along still angry over his encounter with the impudent beggar. The dirty, insolent beast should be locked up as a public nuisance. However, he was a canny fellow, you had to say that much for him. He knew where Simon was bound for, even when Simon hadn't clearly decided on it himself. 
The impertinence of the filthy rascal. Simon had a notion to turn about and retrace his steps, just to show the beggar he had been wrong in his surmise, but then he might think that Simon had decided to take his advice. Simon wasn't in the habit of taking advice from beggars, or anyone else, for that matter. The afternoon was hot and the big fisherman was not accustomed to climbing steep grades. He sat down in the shade of a wayside tree to rest and get his breath. He must be growing old. Sooner or later, men did grow old. Their muscles got flabby, and their lungs and their hearts, yes, and their heads, too. An old man got more and more testy, surly, quarrelsome, cantankerous, like an old dog, like old Zebedee, who was always saying the wrong thing, making himself ridiculous. Fortunately for Simon, he wasn't that old yet. He didn't pick quarrels. No man should be blamed for defending his beliefs. Well, what had happened had happened, it was too late to do anything about that now. Johnny had walked out in a huff and wasn't likely to make the first move toward a reconciliation, and, naturally, the willful boy wouldn't expect his boss to hunt him up, and coax him to come back. There'd be no living with the youngster after that, he'd think he was an admiral or something. No, the only sure cure for Johnny's folly was the exposure of this carpenter as an unscrupulous mountebank. Simon rose, wincing, and plodded on, every step in effort. The carpenter must be pretty sure of himself, expecting people to climb a mountain to find him. The sun was all but setting when Simon's aching legs brought him over the shoulder of the plateau. There he paused uncertainly, amazed at the size of the crowd. Johnny had guessed there might have been as many as a hundred out here yesterday. There were more than that today. He sauntered slowly forward toward the closely packed, silent, attentive multitude, wishing he might make himself invisible. It would be very annoying if he were recognized and a rumor spread that he had been seen there. It would be useless to explain his reason for coming. What if Johnny should see him? Simon walked slowly, softly, and stood at the rear of the crowd. No one paid the slightest attention to him. He felt somewhat less uneasy. And presently he left off thinking about himself at all. Having come here to criticize and, if possible, to discover some trickery, the big fisherman had approached with a scowl. He was angry at this carpenter for creating so much hubbub and for trying to deceive a lot of weak-minded people, but, in all honesty, the fellow did not look like an itinerant showman. It wasn't the impudent face of a juggler, nor was it the brazen voice of a street hawker with some nostrum to sell. Johnny had been right about the man's voice. It was calm, deliberate, conversational, as if addressed to a single individual, a personal friend. You had to listen closely or you wouldn't hear, certainly not from where Simon stood, though it was to be observed that even the people in the forward rows tipped up their good ear. It was not a harangue. And the man was not exerting himself to compel attention. It was indeed a voice such as you had never heard in a public address, it singled you out. You. Yes, Simon, you. He edged in closer against the backs of his neighbors. A head taller than most, he had no trouble seeing the carpenter clearly. The man was tired. Surely the people should be able to see that. They had crowded in on him until he had hardly standing room, nor could he retreat for the great rock immediately behind him. What the carpenter needed, reflected Simon, was somebody to keep the crowd off him. This heedless pack of curiosity seekers were suffocating him, wearing him out. One would think he might have found at least one friend to stand by and protect him. Perhaps he didn't want any close friends. Maybe you couldn't get acquainted with him, even if you wanted to. But that conjecture was not in tune with the tone of the voice that appealed to your spirit of neighborliness, if not, indeed, to your comradeship. Johnny was right, there was something very strange about the man. Not much wonder the boy had stammered, and groped for words. Simon's animosity had cooled now. He had come hopeful of hearing something revolutionary, something seditious, something that would get the carpenter into trouble. He intended to be on the alert for it, and if he heard anything incriminating, he would be willing to testify when the matter came to court, as it surely would. The rabbis would see to that. They too were eager to show him up as a seditionist. Simon hadn't given any thought to this phase of the problem, and it now annoyed him to foresee that he might presently be on the side of the rabbis. No, he didn't want to have anything to do with it personally. Let the patrols and the priests attend to it. The extreme weariness of the carpenter made a bid for Simon's sympathy. If it weren't for making a spectacle of himself, he would like to get down into that front row and use his elbows. He wouldn't be above cracking a couple of heads together. Simon had often done that in a general brawl, suddenly grabbed two handfuls of hair, and whack. It was always effective. Yes, 
he would enjoy nothing better than a chance to teach these yokels better manners. The soft voice was talking now about the Day of Atonement. Simon wouldn't be interested, wondered what the carpenter could find to say on such a dull subject, surely the multitude wouldn't have climbed the long hill to listen to that. The farmer in front of him twisted his head around, looked up fretfully, and lifted a cramped shoulder. Simon had unwittingly crowded in on the fellow until he couldn't stand straight. This hour look suggested that some people should mind their manners and stop pushing, even if they were big as Goliath and knew they could impose on smaller folks. Simon moved back a step and tramped on a squirming toe. He had quite forgotten that tomorrow was the Day of Atonement. And today, too, if you obeyed the scriptures. It was a two-day affair. On the first day you went about paying debts, returning things borrowed, and making up with people you had injured, though almost nobody ever did anything about that. On the second day, if you were religious, you went to the synagogue with such an offering as you could afford, ranging in value from a pair of pigeons to a fat steer, and received a blessing. Time was when his father had talked of nothing else for a fortnight preceding the Day of Atonement, but it had been many a year since Simon had so much as made the motions of honoring it. He always dismissed the cruise on the big day, the real day, the day of the synagogue ceremonies. That was common practice. You gave your employees the day off, they could do what they pleased with it. It never had been customary to dismiss your help on the first day, the day you were to go about making things right with people you had defrauded or otherwise offended. As for himself, he usually spent the Day of Atonement mending ropes and oiling pulleys. Sometimes respectable people, marching soberly toward the synagogue in their Sabbath garb, would regard him with reproach when they met him on the highway in his workaday clothes. Now the carpenter was going to flog the old straw, for surely there was nothing new to be said about the Day of Atonement. We would be told how important it was to go to the synagogue and have our sins forgiven, not forgetting to take the yearling lamb along. Simon came to attention. The carpenter was talking about the first day of the atonement event. That was the important day. That was today. What had you done about it? How about the quarrels you had had, since last atonement day? Were you and old Naaman still refusing to speak to one another because of that trouble over the line fence? Had you gone to see the old man today? If not, you would only be wasting your mutton tomorrow. How about that feud with the Ben Gileads? You remember, the chickens that got into your garden and caused such a rumpus that everybody in the neighborhood took sides. And cursed one another and threw stones. Is that old quarrel still smoldering? Did. You do anything about that today? The sun is setting. Are you going to do anything about that before you sleep tonight? If not, there's no sense in taking your pigeons to the synagogue tomorrow nor will the lamb do you any good, and you'd better sell the steer for whatever it will fetch, or slaughter it and eat it. Forgiveness and peace are to be had, but not bartered for beef. Simon liked that. It was sensible. Not much use asking for pardon and peace if an old friend has something against you, especially if the quarrel was your own fault. The carpenter was talking about peace of mind, considered as property. You could toil all summer in the fields and fill your barn with grain. That was property, too. Only the barn might take fire or the rats destroy the wheat. Peace was the kind of property that wouldn't burn, and you didn't have to set a watchman over it to see that it wasn't stolen. Make things right with your offended brother, then go to the synagogue with your fat lamb, and be blessed. There was some restlessness in the multitude now. What the carpenter was saying was reasonable enough, thought Simon, but it would just go in one ear and out the other. You couldn't change human nature very much. Take Johnny, for instance. He was probably in this crowd and listening to this good counsel. But, do you suppose the stubborn youngster would take it to heart, and apologize? Of course he wouldn't. It wasn't much wonder that the carpenter looked lonely. If he really practiced what he taught, people would think him a queer one. Friendship with a man would be embarrassing. The carpenter had stopped speaking now and there was a perceptible stir in the crowd. It shifted its weight to the other leg, straightened its back, and stretched its neck for a better view. A tall, Broad-shouldered, bearded man stood forward from the pack and faced the carpenter. He had a small boy in his arms. Whatever happened then, it was done so quickly that Simon could only guess that the child had received some attention, for the man who carried him turned away, apparently satisfied, and was making his escape through. The craning multitude. There was much jostling, the crowd swarming about the man, blocking his way. The little boy was crying shrilly. Simon impulsively went into action. Reviewing it later on his way home, he could not decide whether he had elbowed his way savagely into the mob because of his indignation at the people's rudeness, and a desire to rush to the man's defense, or to satisfy his own curiosity, 
But, whatever inspired him to plunge through the crowd, he made a success of it, thrusting his shoulder and a knee, tugging at collars, elbowing ribs, pulling hair, tramping on feet, until he had mowed a swath to the defenseless man in the center of the congestion. Stand back! He shouted. Make way there! Planting the heels of his open hands on the nearest chins, Simon cleared a path. Presently he and the rescued were out in the open, and almost alone, for the crowd seemed reluctant to follow. The child's frightened cries had subsided to convulsive sobs. Thank you, friend, murmured the exhausted man. He lowered the boy to the ground. No, no, grandfather, pleaded the little fellow. It hurts. Lift me up. What's the matter with him? asked Simon. A crooked foot. Born that way. I heard of this Jesus and hoped he might heal the child. I carried him, all the way from Sephora's. That's a long tramp. Simon peered down at the foot. Apparently it hasn't done the lad any good. Are you a believer in this man? Inquired just as soberly. No, I'm not. We've been hearing many strange stories about him, over in Tiberias. I came out to see. My name is Simon. Mine is Justice, Barsaba's Justice. Now, Jonathan, see if you can't stand on the lame foot. Grandfather will not let you fall. Try it, my boy. The child clung for a moment, but consented to be put down, whining with fear. He took an uncertain step. It hurts. He whimpered. Justice gathered him up in his arms. Let's have a look at it, suggested Simon kindly. They inspected the foot. It's hard to tell, muttered Justice. It was bent over, like this. Seems straighter, don't you think, Simon? Simon felt both feet. They are about alike, I should say. But why can't he stand on it? Perhaps it's the rough ground, said Justice, still hopeful. He never stood squarely on that foot before. It's tender as a baby's. Besides, the lads frightened. The crowd was dispersing now, many pausing to gape at the child. Simon glanced toward the rock where the carpenter stood. He was gone. Well, I'll be on my way, friend Simon, Justice was saying, I hope we may meet again. You've a long journey ahead of you, Justice, carrying the lad. Perhaps I should go with you, part way. You are kind, but there will be moonlight presently. The boy is not heavy. I shall stop for the night with friends in Cana. Simon was reluctant to see Justice leave. He walked beside him to the southern brow of the hill, where they paused. I wish I knew, about the boy's foot. What do you think, Justice? Has it been healed or hasn't it? I don't know, mumbled Justice. Maybe it's too early to tell. I only hope so. Yes, so do I, Justice. It would be a great blessing to the child. At that, Justice turned to face Simon with a sober stare. Do you, honestly, hope that? Why, of course. Declared Simon. What a question. Who could wish it otherwise? Because, muttered Justice, if this village carpenter can change the laws of nature, nothing will ever be the same again, not for any of us. Do you realize that, Simon? Nothing you ever thought about anything will be true, not anymore, ever. Having no ready rejoinder to this surprising speech, Simon said he supposed it would affect one's views somewhat. They bade each other farewell, and Justice, shifting his burden to his other arm, made off down the road, where he was promptly joined by many people who had tarried to wait his coming. He was a peculiar fellow, thought Simon as he walked away toward the other rim of the plateau, evidently had given a bit of careful thought to this business of miracles, not only was inclined to be skeptical about it, but wasn't sure he wanted to believe it. If it was true, nothing would ever be the same again, not for anybody. If a man could go about straightening crooked feet and restoring paralyzed arms, everything would be topsy-turvy. On his way down the hill the big fisherman's long legs and urgent thoughts overtook and passed everybody. He recognized no one. But as he moved aside to pass one group that had slowed to discuss whether they had seen a miracle or not, the voices were abruptly hushed and he heard his name spoken in a half whisper. It annoyed him more than a little. He had as good a right to be out here as anyone. What business was it of theirs? But, let them gabble. He didn't care. To hell with them. Simon was angry now, angry at himself, out here on this fool's errand. Miracles? Rubbish. He had seen quite enough of this carpenter. It was high time to put all this nonsense out of his head. Careless of his footing he stumbled along through the pale moonlight, finally reaching the valley. His legs were lame and his feet were hot and sore. He was exhausted in body and mind. It was to be hoped that Hannah had retired. 
Simon was in no mood for talking. Hannah, if awake, would be anxious to know where he had been. She wouldn't ask a direct question, but she would probably have it out of him somehow. Beth Saida, at last. He sat down wearily on the stoop and took off his dusty sandals. Tiptoeing softly through the silent house and out through the kitchen door, he found a basin by the cistern and washed his blistered feet. Hannah appeared and handed him a towel, for which he thanked her briefly. In a tone of finality he bade her good night and retraced his steps down the hall to his own room. I'll have a surprise for you, at breakfast, whispered Hannah. Honey cakes, I suppose, muttered Simon apathetically. Anything to detain him, and make him talk, he thought. Want to guess again? Pestered Hannah sweetly. No, not tonight, Hannah. I am very tired. And because he didn't care to risk any further conversation with her, he closed his door, not noisily enough to give offense, he hoped, but with sufficient emphasis to accent his desire to be let alone. It turned out to be a bad night for Simon. He tried to sleep, but his busy brain shuttled to and fro from one dilemma to another. Life had been suddenly stripped of all its brightness. Everything was in confusion. There was Johnny, to whom he was as devoted as he might have been to a son, Johnny had found another master, the carpenter. If it hadn't been for this carpenter, everything would have continued to be in order, the way it ought to be. The more he thought about it, the more sure he was that his first impression of the rumors had been correct. The fellow, for all his gentle voice, was a deceiver, enticing people to follow him about and listen to his prattle, pretending to heal diseases, advising them to own nothing, and live like the birds. He deserved to be exposed. This man justice, he knew it was a fraud. Oh yes, the poor man had pretended to be hopeful, but you could see he had lost faith in it. Simon turned the pillow over, dug his big fist into it, buried his face in it, and returned to Johnny. The boy never had been worth anything as a fisherman. He was worse than no help at all, a bad influence on other lazy men. If Simon hadn't liked him so much, he wouldn't have signed him on, not even if he had worked for nothing, and brought his own dinner. Rolling over on his back, Simon stared wide-eyed into the darkness and reviewed every unpleasant detail of yesterday's quarrel. The boy had behaved badly. Doubtless there was some weakness in his character that might account for it. Surely he hadn't inherited his disposition from old Zebedee, who couldn't see beyond the end of his leaky nose and talked so incessantly that he never had time to think. We might as well discharge the old boar, would have done it long ago if it hadn't been for the boys. Of course Johnny hadn't inherited anything from his silly mother. Mothers didn't bequeath any of their traits to their children, everybody knew that. But Naomi could have had an unhealthy influence on him. She was forever nagging the lad to find a job where he could earn more pay, lamenting that he hadn't trained to be a scrivener, which, she thought, would give the family a better social standing. Zebedee had been a fool to marry Naomi, almost old enough to be her grandfather. Well, he was getting paid off for wanting a young wife. Naomi had the old codger saddled and bridled, made him do most of the housework, beat him with a broom, according to reports. Maybe that was why Zebedee was such a nuisance on shipboard, had no chance to express himself at home. No, Johnny hadn't learned any stargazing from Naomi. All she thought about was how to make her menfolk earn more money, the greedy little devil. More than once she had embarrassed the boys by waylaying Simon, in their presence, with a whimpering plea that they be paid better wages. Johnny was a queer one, no doubt about that. He loved to look at the waves, the bigger they rolled the better he liked them. He saw pictures in the clouds and a brilliant sunset would set him off into ecstasies. Maybe that was what had drawn him to this carpenter. Sunsets. Wild poppies. Bah. Lilies wear good clothes without having to spin and weave, better clothes than kings wear. Why should anybody work? The birds don't work. If you meet a soldier, carry his pack. Grin, and like it. Johnny would love that kind of talk. Simon wished he had said to Johnny, how about making an arrangement for all of the people to work part of the time, so that everybody can get better acquainted. With the poppies, and the birds, and the sunsets, and the dew on the grass? But there was that paralyzed arm. Johnny wouldn't lie. Why, if that tale were true, everything in your life goes overboard. If the carpenter has enough wisdom, and power, to do a thing like that, then whatever he says must be true. If he tells you to take counsel of the poppies and the birds, you'd better do it. Yes, and if he tells you that the right way to walk is on your hands instead of your feet, you'll have to do it, for the carpenter will know best. But it was all nonsense. In a few days the legionaries would have the fellow in jail, and the deluded people could get back to work. Then Johnny would want his job again. Well, 
if the boy came, in the right state of mind, admitting he had been a fool to go out and listen to the carpenter in the first place, Simon would be willing to forgive him. Chapter 6 After a wretched night of tossing about, of laboriously taking the puzzle to pieces and reassembling it in patterns equally perplexing, and of fantastic dreams, in one of which Johnny, pretending lameness, limped up to the carpenter and had himself healed, Simon roused dully and prepared for breakfast. His head ached and he was very much out of sorts. His place alone was laid at the table, which meant that Andrew had eaten and gone and that Hannah too had breakfasted. As for the Idamine ragamuffin, Simon hadn't given him a thought since leaving him yesterday in Hannah's care. Doubtless the youngster was well on his way by this time. Seating himself, Simon folded his huge, hairy arms and rested them on the table. He knew that Hannah was aware of his arrival in the little dining room, for he could hear her gentle voice in the kitchen monotonously reciting the shepherd's psalm, by which measure she habitually timed the boiling of his eggs precisely to his liking. Presently he heard the door swing open behind him. That would be Hannah bringing him the eggs and a platter of wheaten bread and a large mug of spiced pomegranate juice. He did not look up. By that sign Hannah would know that he didn't want to talk and would slip quietly out again to wait until he summoned her. She already knew, of course, that he was disturbed about something. She was ever quick to perceive his moods, much too quick, indeed. Their close comradeship made it difficult for him to withhold confidences from her. Now that the bread and butter plate had been put down before him, and the small earthenware bowl containing the eggs, Simon stared hard at the hand that served him. It was not Hannah's hand, it was younger and smaller. He slowly turned his head and gazed up into a stranger's face, his mouth sagging open in bewilderment. Whoever she was, the girl was beautiful the most beautiful he had ever seen. She smiled down into the big fisherman's dumbfounded eyes, a mischievous little smile that she seemed to be controlling with some difficulty. Are you surprised, sir? She asked, in a throaty tone that he remembered having heard before. For a moment Simon continued to stare at her, unsmiling and speechless. He shook his big, shaggy head. Something queer had happened to the world. Miracles could be had now for a penny a dozen. Cripples walked. Water became wine. Dirty and ragged camel boys were transformed into comely young women. He lowered his eyes, blinked rapidly, and rubbed his fingers through his hair. Hannah came in from the kitchen, beaming. Joe turned out to be a girl, she said unnecessarily. Simon nodded, and gazed at his mother-in-law as if he had never seen her before. Her name is Esther, explained Hannah, rather wistfully, as if hoping that Simon might overlook the girl's deception, and, when he had offered no comment, she said. The dress is Abigail's. You don't object to Esther's wearing it? Sit down, both of you, commanded Simon huskily, and tell me whether I am losing my mind. This was said with such sober sincerity that Hannah laughed until she had to pat the tears from her eyes. Esther smiled shyly. There is a great deal about it, Simon, that Esther hasn't had time to tell me, Hannah glanced at her encouragingly, as if to say that she expected to have the full story out of her by nightfall, at the latest but this much she wants us to know, her home was broken up by the loss of her parents, and now she is on her way to find her uncle, who lives somewhere in Galilee, not far from the lake, she thinks. It would have been unsafe for a young woman to travel alone in a strange country, so she cut off her hair, put on a boy's clothing, and, well, here she is. You were lucky not to have got into trouble, commented Simon, munching his bread. Risky business, I'd say. Anybody would know at a glance that you're a girl. She fooled you, said Hannah. I didn't look at her closely, retorted Simon. I had other things on my mind. Haven't you any relatives, down there in Nidumea, who might have objected? Maybe you ran away. Yes, sir, the girl admitted. They would have detained me. I ran away. Simon devoted himself to his breakfast, frowning thoughtfully. Her story sounds reasonable enough, said Hannah. So did her other story, muttered Simon ungraciously. You think this uncle of yours lives in this vicinity, eh? What's his name? Joseph, sir. We have a number of Josephs hereabouts. What is your uncle's occupation? He is a stone cutter. Think he will be able to support you, on a stone cutter's wages? They are not very well paid. My uncle is not a common laborer, ventured Esther. He is skilled. In that case, said Simon, he is probably in the employ of the Tetrarch. They are rebuilding the stables at the palace. Stables. Esther's tone indicated that her uncle Joseph was not likely to be at work on a stable, not even the tetrarchs. Stone stables. Explained Simon. White marble stables. 
The Tetrarch's Arabian horses live in mansions, while most of his subjects live in hovels, and they eat good food while the little children of Galilee often go to bed hungry. The Tetrarch's stables are beautiful, ornamented with statues. But your uncle would not be found at work on such carvings. No? Esther's uplifted brows wondered why her uncle wasn't competent enough to do sculpturing. He is a Jew, isn't he? demanded Simon, and when Esther had nodded he said gruffly, you should know that the children of Israel are not permitted to make graven images. I thought that rule applied to the carving of idols, said Esther. Apparently you I mean Jews do not know the commandments. High time you learned them. Hear the law, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness, of anything. Anything, that is in heaven above, or in the earth beneath, or in the water that is under the earth. Simon pushed back his chair still glowering over Uncle Joseph's defection and his attractive niece's ignorance. However, he added, as he moved toward the door, I have an errand at the palace this morning. I shall make inquiries. Perhaps you would like to go with me. Let her rest here today, Simon, urged Hannah. Tomorrow will do as well. The big fisherman paused in the doorway to remark testily that he wouldn't be going to the palace tomorrow, that if Esther wanted to find her uncle she might as well be about it without further delay, and Esther, thus advised that she had worn out her welcome so far as Simon was concerned, promptly consented to accompany him. His frown cleared momentarily, but deepened again as he noted Hannah's expression of disapproval. For some reason she didn't want the girl to go. Simon shrugged and petulantly mumbled something that meant he didn't care a damn whether she ever found her uncle. Embarrassed by his asperity, Esther was tardy with a reply, and Simon, tugging on his cap, left the house without a farewell word to either of them. After the outer door had banged, Hannah remarked gently that Simon seemed to be upset about something. Me, perhaps? inquired Esther. I don't think so, said Hannah. You have done nothing to annoy him, my dear. I never saw him, quite like this, before. Perhaps it has something to do with the fleet. I feel sure that Andrew knows, but it's hard to get anything out of Andrew. I never knew anyone who could keep his mouth shut as long, and tight, as Andrew. He was unusually quiet this morning, didn't say where he was going, perhaps to potter about the old house in Capernaum, for the fleet won't be going out today. It's a holiday. Esther offered no help in Hannah's dilemma. It occurred to her that Simon's quarrel with Johnny might account for his disaffection, but that was none of her business and she decided not to mention it. After a moment's indecision, she rose and announced that she would go, at once, and try to overtake Simon. He has been very kind, and I have offended him she said. Let me go with you, said Hannah, as far as the highway. Even before they reached the gate it was evident that some unusual excitement had stirred the neighborhood. People were pouring out of their doorways and walking rapidly toward the corner where the quiet street met the broad thoroughfare. Already a sizable company had collected there, intent upon a procession approaching from the direction of Tiberias. They quickened their steps. Observing David standing austerely apart from the others, but apparently waiting for whatever had brought them out, Hannah moved toward him to inquire while Esther sauntered on into the swelling crowd. The Tetrarch, explained David absently, his eyes following Esther with undisguised interest. Of course, remembered Hannah. The days have been so like summer, I hadn't realized it was time for their voyage. So, that's the girl, eh? rumbled David. A most attractive young creature. Bring her here, Hannah, I want to meet her. You won't give me away, sir, pleaded Hannah and when David had reassured her, she followed Esther into the craning pack and told her to come and meet a good friend of Simon's. The girl only half heard. She was standing on tiptoe, completely fascinated by the slowly advancing cavalcade. Hannah took her arm. I suppose you know what this is about. The Tetrarch and his household journey to Rome every year at this season, to spend the winter. And when Esther had nodded abstractedly, without taking her eyes off the road, Hannah urged there will be plenty of time to see them. Come, please, and meet Master David. Esther turned reluctantly and followed. I told him I would bring you, Hannah explained. David is our friend, but he is an eminent man, a lawyer, very learned, widely traveled. At that, Esther's steps lagged. But why should a man of such importance want to meet me? She protested. And why does he stare so? All old men stare, said Hannah. They can't see very well. They don't have to be old, retorted Esther, to stare. Hannah thought this amusing and they were both smiling when Esther was presented. She curtsied, but dodged the intrusive eyes. David bowed gravely, 
To Hannah's mystification and the girl's anxiety. Welcome to beautiful Galilee, my child, he said in a tone of studied formality. It would be a pleasure to see more of you if our good Hannah consents. We must not detain you now. You are eager to have a glimpse of our beloved ruler and his charming family. There was such forthright malice in his sneer that Esther darted an inquiry into his crafty eyes. Was he inviting her to share his contempt for the Tetrarch? Momentarily confused she fought her way out of the little dilemma by asking to be excused, and drifted quickly away to merge into the waiting crowd. David turned to Hannah and lifted an inquisitive eyebrow. She has told me a little more, obliged Hannah. Her mother died recently, leaving her without a home. She is searching for an uncle, a sculptor, who, she thinks, lives near the lake. What has become of her father? Dead, I suppose. She didn't say. Is this uncle presumed to be an idumine? I think so. Well, I don't, growled David. They do not produce sculptors in Idumia. I'll wager there isn't a chisel to be found in all that country. Their favorite tool is the dagger. Has she offered any information about the device you found on her clothing? No? I thought not. And you didn't inquire, that was right. They moved closer to the highway where Esther was sighted in the front row of the spectators, the tall Sadducee observing that the girl was utterly absorbed in the approaching cavalcade, the vanguard of which was now only a few yards distant. Hannah noted that David's interest was not concentrated on the garish spectacle but devoted entirely to her mysterious guest. The procession was led by a company of gaudily uniformed cavalry from the Roman fort at Capernaum. They rode four abreast, their mounts jingling with polished trappings. After the military escort had passed there was an open interval of a full hundred yards before the second unit came on, led by a distinguished figure on a superb white horse unmistakably of Arabian origin. The man was richly clad in a black tunic trimmed in red, red riding breeches, and glossy black boots. He rode alone. His gray hair was close-cropped and circled with a silver fillet. Esther gazed hard at the haughty, dissipated face, at the white set bulging eyes that negligently drifted over the crowd with a bored unconcern. Now the roving eyes swept the upturned faces of the area where Esther stood, transfixed, with a dry throat and pounding heart. An instant later they returned to her, the finely sculptured brows lifted a little in a mere wisp of a smile, compounded of surprise, insolence, admiration, and amusement, twitched the tetrarch's lips. Esther's wide eyes gave no response. She was frightened. There was a considerable interval before the luxurious litters were carried by. There were three of them, single file, each borne by eight stalwart slaves, Greeks, Esther thought. The curtains of the first of the litters were tightly drawn. It bore Herodias, no doubt. The second was open, and the lounging occupant, a heavily jeweled woman of thirty, smirked impudently through her paint. This, Esther knew, would be Salome. However notorious, she was indeed a beautiful woman. Even her awareness of her beauty did not mar it. The curtains of the third litter were closed. Esther hoped she might hear a name whispered by someone in the crowd, but the occupant remained unidentified. There came now a score or more of camel-born men and women, most of them in their twenties and thirties, household servants, no doubt. The majority of them were handsome. They were evidently in a carnival mood, exchanging banter that made them laugh. Whatever might be said of the Tetrarch, it was plain that his retainers were well cared for and had no quarrel with their employment. Trailing the camels, at a considerable distance, came a long pack train laden with baggage. Losing interest now, Esther was about to turn away when there was a sudden stir among her neighbors. A brilliantly uniformed cavalryman, leading his horse, had paused beside her. The people, with amazement and apprehension in their stares, drew hastily aside to make room. Your name, please, demanded the soldier crisply but respectfully. Esther's knees trembled. She felt sick and weak. Before she was able to stammer a reply, a hand was laid gently on her arm. I will answer for this young woman, said David, calmly. She is a member of my family. Who wants to know her name, Centurion? His Highness, sir, retorted the soldier. And who are you? I am David, of the House of Zadok. You may bear my compliments to His Highness and assure him that this young woman is not in need of his solicitude. The Sadducee had spoken with such haughty self-confidence that the Roman seemed at a loss for an appropriate response. Well, he barked. We will see about that. You will wait here until I return. Mounting his horse, he galloped forward. The crowd stood stunned, silent, gaping at Esther. Come, said David, quietly. There is nothing more to see. We will go home. But. The man, whispered Esther. 
Are we not to wait? He will not return. David laid a protecting hand on her shoulder and gently propelled her through the bewildered pack. Hannah was pale with fright when they rejoined her. David smiled reassuringly as he walked between them. Have no fear, Hannah, he said. No harm will come of this. Our tetrarch is ever interested in a pretty face. He likes to have good-looking people about him. In this instance he has made a mistake, and probably knows it by now. It is not to his advantage to accumulate any more enemies. You need not give it another thought. I do thank you, sir, for coming to my rescue. Esther's voice was still shaken. It was my pleasure to serve you. David bowed. I bid you both good day. With lengthened steps, he strode majestically away and proceeded toward his home. The women faced each other with inquiring eyes, puzzled over Esther's predicament. You had better come back with me, advised Hannah. Search for your uncle another day. The people will recognize you and think it peculiar to see you alone on the highway after what David said. About my being a member of his household? I wonder why he did say it, he might have had to prove it. Evidently he had no fear of that, Esther. David is a man of great influence, greater, perhaps, than I had realized. Even so, he took the risk of offending the ruler. Why should he put himself in jeopardy, for me? I mean nothing to him. Hannah's eyes were averted as she remarked, in a vague undertone, that it wasn't always easy to understand David. At that, Esther came to a stop, laid a hand on Hannah's arm, and asked abruptly, How much have you told him, about me? There wasn't much to tell, was there? countered Hannah, with a reproachful little smile. Look. He is waiting for us, beside our fence. He has thought of something more he wants to say. He will be wanting to talk to you alone, I think, said Esther, turning about. I shall go now, and try to overtake Simon. And before Hannah had time to protest, she had hurried away. As he set off for Tiberius after breakfast, the big fisherman was confused and unhappy. The mysterious girl's account of herself and her errand in Galilee, a much amended story, was anything but satisfactory. It was plain to see that Hannah was worried. He had been a fool to bring the waif home with him. There was nothing to do today. The crews were off duty, supposedly at the synagogue, but more likely to be found loafing at the wine shops. However, there were always some odd jobs to be done on shipboard. He would net a basket of fish from the live box at the wharf and deliver them to the palace. The rest of the empty day he could spend alone, tinkering at trivial chores on the Abigail. A quarter mile down the road a procession was coming, led by a large contingent of cavalry, the sunshine flashing from their polished spears and the burnished bosses of the shields. Still farther away a rising cloud of yellow dust, suspended over the rear of the parade, meant that a long train of heavily laden pack asses was already scraping its hooves, though a laborious three-day journey lay ahead. Simon knew what it was all about, Antipas was setting forth, as was his custom, on the annual excursion to Rome. The party would travel to Caesarea and embark. Galilee would see no more of its tetrarch until the flowers bloomed again. Not that it mattered. He meant nothing to Galilee. The people's welfare did not concern him. He was more a Roman than a Jew. Nobody would care if he went to his precious Rome and stayed there. But he would be back, as usual. Returning, he would hold court for a month at the Galilean embassy in Jerusalem, at the time of the Passover fast and festivities, and then, with much pomp, he would come home to Tiberias, accompanied by a horde of other rich idlers, and sit half-naked in the sun, and swill his expensive wines, and splash in his celebrated pool, until it was time to go to Rome again. But Galilee would be no better off under another ruler, provincial governors were all alike. Indeed, Antipas might be preferable to a more ambitious ruler, he was much too lazy to stir up trouble among the people. Perhaps the best ruler you could have, after all, was a drunken loafer who would let the province govern itself. Ordinarily, when Simon sighted the Tetrarch's garish cavalcade making off toward Caesarea, he indifferently sneered and spat on the ground. Today, he was cross, anyhow, the pageant made him hot with indignation. This renegade, Romanized Jew had so little respect for the cherished traditions of Galilee that he thought nothing of setting out on his pleasure trip while the people were on their way to the synagogue. The insolence of it. Fine way, indeed, to observe the Day of Atonement. It was little he cared about the feelings of the people. Antipas ought to be in the synagogue today, at least going through the motions of honoring the religion of Israel. He was a disgrace to the province. Simon wondered how many of the servants, and which ones, would be left behind, this time. He hoped Leah and Anna would remain at the palace. He always enjoyed their banter. 
Yes, and that impudent minx Claudia, too. It was impossible to have any respect for her, she was an outrageous flirt, and, besides, she was a Roman, but she was witty. And the Greek girl, Helen, who never had anything to say, but always smiled shyly as if she understood. Maybe she did. Sometimes he playfully winked at her, and she would show the tips of very pretty teeth. Helen often lingered for a while in Simon's thoughts, after he had discharged his errands at the service entrance, but he always put her out of his mind with a poof exclamation mark for however winsome, she was a heathen. But, heathen or not, there was something very attractive about this Helen, her physical frailty, perhaps. Simon often asked himself why he had so much interest in fragile women when he was so contemptuous of any physical weakness in men. Somberly dressed pedestrians along the road were withdrawing to the weeds and brambles where they waited, gaping. Some sat down on the low stone fences. Simon plodded doggedly on, resolved that he would not leave the highway until it was necessary, nor was he going to do Antipas the honor of staring at his damp parade. Entering the little hamlet of Magdala, he turned off into a lane to wait until the thing was over and the dust had settled. He eased himself down on the dry grass in the shade of an old olive tree with his back to the highway. The metallic clatter of the approaching cavalry was insisting that he should turn and look, but he scowled and closed his eyes. Everything was going wrong for Simon, lately, everything. It had all stemmed from this mad carpenter who had taken it into his head that the people would be better off if, if, they weren't quite so well off, that's what it came to, all nothing, and be happy. And why did anyone in his right senses listen to it? Because they had heard a rumor that the fellow could cure diseases. Well, supposing he could, was that what we wanted, a man who went about defying nature? Before the carpenter had added this confusion to one's thoughts, life made some sense. To be sure, it had its difficulties, but you learn to accept them. Simon glanced back at his own complacency and wished he might recover it. He had never been one to bother himself about riddles. Such dizzying old problems as what are we here for? What is the good of it? What is it all about? Had never cost him a moment's anxiety. As a lad he had been forced to assume a man's responsibilities, requiring him to work early and late while other children were at play, but it had never occurred to him to complain that the world was mistreating him or that Jehovah had singled him out for target practice. A lot of people were forever whimpering that God had hidden his face from them, when probably nothing much was the matter except that their cistern was low or a few of their chickens had died of the pip. That's what you got for being so tangled up with religion, you were always in a dither about God. The new calf was a heifer and God was on your side, your donkey went lame and God was angry at you. Better not worry so much about God, who is probably not worrying much about you. Simon's religion, what little there was of it, had been quite simple. He assumed that there must be a great mind in charge of the stars and the sky and other large undertakings, but he couldn't believe that God ever stooped to such trivial engagements as willfully breaking the windless chain at the Abram's well because the old man had walked a little too far on the Sabbath. Simon's God was a neat and trustworthy housekeeper, who put the sun out in the morning and took it in at night with a regularity you could count on, and he arranged that the seasons should come along in a dependable procession. Nothing ever got out of kilter. Pursuant to this elementary creed, the big fisherman had not considered his childhood drudgeries as a visitation of God's displeasure. Indeed, he had taken pride in his ability to endure hard knocks and prosper in the face of obstacles. Never in his life had Simon looked up and cried why? not even when poor little Abigail died. It didn't occur to him that perhaps God was paying him off for his misdeeds. He knew he had made plenty of mistakes, mostly by letting his temper get the best of him, to other men's serious discomfort, and he had missed many a religious fast that he might have observed, but he couldn't think that God had decided to take an interest in his small indiscretions. And when the elderly Rabbi Ben Sholem, visiting them the day Abigail died, had implied as much, Simon had retorted, bluntly. I don't believe that God would do a mean thing like that. Sounds from the highway indicated that the company of cavalry was passing now, the jingle of expensive harness, the clipped beats of well-shod hoofs, the creak of new leather, the sharp bark of a military command, the crack of a whip. Simon listened to it, hated it, and returned to his reveries. And next morning after the burial, he had gone back to work, quiet and sad, but spending no time in useless brooding, for life was like that, people sickened and died even young people like Abigail, even little babies who had had no chance to live at all. But why ask questions about it when you knew that nobody could give you an answer, not even the rabbi, who should know if anyone did? Now everything was in disorder. Now you couldn't count on anything. Johnny was not a liar, 
and that business about the little boy's foot, last night, was very peculiar, to say the least. Of course there was a possibility that the carpenter had planned a hoax to deceive the people, but what could he expect to get out of it? He would be exposed, probably thrown into prison. There was nothing in it for him. He charged no money for his supposed healings, apparently had no money and didn't want any, owned nothing, saw no value in anything, but birds and flowers. That didn't sound as if he hoped to fill his pockets by fraudulent practices. It was quiet on the road now. But, Simon well knew, it was not because the Tetrarch's pompous parade had passed. No, this was just the gap in the procession. Presently Antipas himself would ride by on his mincing stallion. None of this belonged to Galilee, a Roman ruler on an Arabian horse. Surely poor little Galilee had enough to confuse it utterly without having the carpenter on its hands. Assuming that this Nazarene was entirely honest, that he really could change water into wine and heal cripples, where did that leave you? The man must get his power from heaven. If so, God did trouble himself about a silly yokel with a short arm and a small boy with a crooked foot. If you admitted that he did things like that, maybe it was true that the Abram's water bucket was lost in the bottom of their well. Because old Abram's had absent-mindedly walked too far on God's dull and doleful Sabbath day. There was another interval of silence, and then the rhythmic lisp of sandal straps. They would be carrying the hussy Herodias. Simon had seen her once, in the palace garden. She had stared brazenly at him for a moment before shrugging a shoulder and tossing her head and turning away. Herodias was a hard one, anybody could see that, the most important woman in Galilee, the enormity of it. What had poor, pious little Galilee ever done to deserve such a humiliation? Perhaps God would wreck the Tetrarch's ship, this time, if he had determined to take a hand in the cure of afflictions. There was silence again on the road. Now we had this mysterious Idamine girl to deal with. It was clear that Hannah didn't know what to make of her. Suppose she couldn't find her uncle, then what? Hannah wouldn't want to turn her out. Simon felt lonely, couldn't expect to be entirely comfortable anywhere, not on the fleet, where his men, some of them, anyway, would resentfully remember his quarrel, nor could he feel at ease in his own home with that deceitful Idamine at the table. What a fool he had been to take the dirty beggar home with him. There were more whispers of sandal straps. That would be Salome's tall slaves bearing her costly litter. Simon had often seen Salome on the road, always with a detachment of mounted guards. She was a graceful rider, very pretty, too. It was common talk that she had no more chastity than a cat. It was also rumored that her mother hated her because the Tetrarch showed her too much attention. You couldn't believe everything you heard, but where there was so much smoke there must be some fire. You couldn't blame the Galileans for believing any evil tale about this young woman. They hated her, why, indeed, shouldn't a. Eh? Simon shook away the contemptuous thoughts about Salome, and, for better comfort, shifted his position against the tree. He absently plucked a dry seed pod and slowly tore it apart. How wretchedly he had handled all that business with Johnny. It was Johnny's fault, of course, but he needn't have been so rough on the boy. After all, he had only reported what he imagined he had seen and heard, and they had all urged him to tell it. He said he had seen it with his own eyes, in broad daylight had been standing beside the fellow, and a woman had seen it and fainted, and the man had made funny little squeaks, though you couldn't tell whether he was laughing or crying. Simon tried unsuccessfully, a couple of times, to make a funny little squeak like that, for this detail had impressed him deeply. Now there was much clamor on the highway. The air was full of dust and the raucous shouts of the donkey boys and the thud of blows on the bony rumps of overburdened beasts. The Romans were cruel to animals, seemed to enjoy beating anything or anybody who couldn't fight back. And they ruled the world. If God was going to concern himself with the behavior of mankind, here would be a good place to lend a hand. Maybe we could have another flood, like the one that had drowned everybody but Noah and his family. Simon grew drowsy waiting for the donkeys to pass and the dust to clear. Noah had spent forty days in the big boat, along with all the animals, landed on a muddy mountaintop, nothing living but a grapevine and Noah had made some wine, and got drunk. Well, you couldn't blame him much. Of course, if Johnny had really seen what he reported, he wouldn't care whether he had a job or not. He would follow along after this carpenter, and be content to live on bark and berries. Well, we would have to wait, and see. The boys might come creeping back in a day or two. They had to eat, didn't they? Nobody could nurse a grievance very long on an empty stomach. Simon came to his feet, stretched his long arms and yawned mightily. Yes, they would be coming back. Their silly mother would see to that. 
Naomi would raise all hell until they returned to their jobs. The fleet rocked gently in the cove. A dory was tethered to the prow of the Abigail. That would be one of the boys doing his trick as watchman. The rest of them were on holiday, supposedly attending to their religious duties, though Simon surmised that they would be strolling idly about on the quiet streets of Capernaum, consorting with drunken legionaries from the neighboring fort and guzzling raw new wine. That was about all a religious holiday came to. The older folk would be huddled together in the synagogue, praying for their wayward whelps, who would show up an hour late in the morning with white tongues and red eyes. Simon had no patience with drunkenness and was frequently heard to say that any wine at all was far too much wine. It had been a long time since he had tasted a fermented drink. Pausing at his own wharf, he drew in the floating live box and filled the basket with perch. The palace would not be needing so many now that the number of residents had been greatly reduced but the few who remain would see to it that they had enough to eat. Lysias, the steward who, during the family's absence, was always left behind in charge of the establishment, made no effort to economize and apparently gave but little attention to such trivial expenditures as the daily order of fish. Simon rarely saw the shrewd, stocky, swarthy Greek steward while the tetrarch was in residence, but was always grimly amused at the swagger Lysias affected once his master had departed. Evidently the fellow had a high opinion of his charms. Simon gathered that the servant girls were more than a bit afraid of him. Slipping his hairy arm under the handle of the dripping basket, the big fisherman trudged up the winding driveway to the rear courtyard, noting that all operations on the new stables had been suspended. That would be because of the religious holiday. Not that the Day of Atonement would mean anything to the stonemasons and sculptors, who were all Greeks, but the hod carriers and other unskilled workmen were Galileans. Their religion forbade them to do carving but it was quite permissible for them to carry the hewn stones. Simon snorted, contemptuous of this hypocrisy. Nearing the kitchen entrance he heard gay, bantering conversation. The servants were celebrating the family's departure. At sight of him, the girls poured through the doorway, all talking at once, and fluttered about him with hilarious greetings. Morza, the tall, dark Arimathean, who had never before accorded him better regard than a nod and a sniff, relieved him of the basket and patted him on his arm. She was pungent with wine. The Roman, Claudia, seemed a little drunk. Simon tried to be jovial, but the pretense was not easy. Doesn't the big fisherman feel well today? Morza contrived a condescending smile. Well enough, retorted Simon unpleasantly. Do I look frail? You look sour, said Leah, as if you'd eaten something. His own fish, maybe. No? Claudia gave a shrill giggle. Helen stood by demurely studying Simon's glum indifference to the raillery which she couldn't understand very well. He gave her a brief smile. The big fisherman is in love. Shrieked Morza. It has taken his appetite. She tossed a teasing glance toward the Greek girl, who smiled childishly and shook her black curls, though whether she did not comprehend or, comprehending, was showing a maidenly embarrassment, Simon could not tell. But it was an attractive little smile, whatever it meant, and his heavy frown cleared as he gave her a friendly look. See what I told you. Taunted Morza. That's his ailment, he is lovesick. I think you're right, for once, drawled Leah. And he's always pretending to be so tough, and strong, and manly, no use for women, just a big man's man. And now he cannot eat, for love. He should be put in the dungeon along with the other Salomel who does not eat. No? Claudia laughed gaily at her own drollery. She's talking about our new prisoner, explained Anna with unexpected seriousness. The legionaries brought him in the day before yesterday. They said he had been living on grasshoppers and other roasted bugs, in the desert. Well, you should be able to find some bugs for him, remarked Simon, relieved at this turn in the conversation. It is late in the season for the larger bugs, he added, but there should be plenty of the smaller ones in his bedding. Not at all, protested Anna. His cell is clean and comfortable. His Highness gave orders about that. He wants the man treated kindly, he thinks the poor fellow is crazy, but innocent of any crime. What is he charged with? inquired Simon unconcernedly. He is some sort of wandering prophet, said Anna. Would you like to see him? He is a Galilean. And he is permitted to have visitors, though no one has come, so far. Perhaps his friends are afraid to venture that close to a prison, observed Leah. I'm sure I would be. Simon had straightened to his full height. He hitched manfully at his belt and spat vehemently on the ground. I don't visit prophets. He growled. I hadn't supposed I looked that foolish. Well, as for me, 
Anna enigmatically arched her eyebrows to signify that she knew more than she intended to divulge. I don't believe the man is crazy. Maybe he really is a prophet. And how do you happen to know so much about this, this bug eater? Grinned Simon. Are you his keeper? I'm supposed to feed him. He will not eat, but he will talk. He talks all the time. You should hear him. BRRR. It frightens me. He says that a great one has been sent, from heaven, to free the slaves and throw the mighty from their high seats. Anna's frown showed genuine anxiety. The whole world is to be shaken. She added soberly. As I live, it is true, what Anna's saying, confirmed Claudia excitedly. I was with her when he said it. The whole world is to be shaken. Until its ears rattle. She added, for good measure. You made that up, sneered Leah. A prophet wouldn't say anything that funny. But it isn't funny. Declared Claudia, grinning. Not if it's true. And Anna thinks it is, don't you, Anna? She gave the sober-faced Jewess a thumb jab in the ribs. You do, too. She went on, when Anna impatiently flinched and shook her head. You were scared and you made off at once to your, what you call, synagogue. No? Your tiresome old god is much too hard on you poor Jews. We Romans now, we have many, many gods. All kinds of gods. One takes one's pick of them, and if he does not please, poof. She airily kissed a rosette of fingertips and blew a negligent farewell to the incompetent deity. If the half-drunken Claudia had expected a laugh, she was disappointed. Anna and Leah gave her a withering look. Morza scowled, she was not very religious, but she was superstitious and disapproved of sacrilege. Helen, who didn't know what it was all about and probably wouldn't have cared if she had known, turned to gaze complacently at the faraway Blue Mountains. Simon, who through Claudia's silly speech had remained staring at Anna's apprehensive face, took a step toward her. You say, this fellow said that a great one is coming? He demanded, so sternly that Anna blinked. He said the great one has come, replied Anna. He is here, now. That's what he said. Put in Claudia, helpfully. I heard him. Shut up. Rasped Leah, as if to a noisy terrier. Where? Demanded Simon, searching Anna's eyes. I know what you're thinking, replied Anna, after some hesitation. There has been all this talk, about a carpenter, who does strange things. She had lowered her voice to the tone of a confidence. That, apparently the carpenter is not our man. The carpenter is said to heal diseases. This great one isn't here to heal anybody, he's here to punish the rulers, and the rich. I wonder if his highness knows what sort of blabbing our prisoner can do, remarked Morza. Perhaps he wouldn't have wanted the fellow handled so gently if he had heard some of his talk. But, argued Simon, undiverted by Morza's comment, if this great one is down on the rich, maybe he will aid the poor, why don't you ask the bug eater about that, Anna? Ask him yourself if you're so interested, snapped Anna, tiring of the big fisherman's queries. Interested? He retorted angrily. And why should I be interested? Your prophet is a crazy dunce who deserves to be locked up. And as for the carpenter, he will soon turn out to be a fraud. They're both lunatics. Anybody who wants to believe in such nonsense is welcome to it. Simon's voice was vibrant with indignation as he went on, I don't believe in any of this rubbish. All religion is rubbish. I don't believe in any of it. Not in any of it, I tell you. His puzzled audience gaped at him for a long moment as he stood glowering. At length Leah broke the silence by remarking in a disgusted drawl, Well, who said you did? I'll wager you do, yelled Claudia, or you wouldn't be so hot and cross about it. The taunt rekindled Simon's anger and he muttered that all religious prattle should be prohibited, by law. A suggestion that inspired Leah to remark, with a bitter, private smile, that he would probably go to hell when he died. And he will not like that. Laughed Claudia. He detests big crowds, I heard him say so. No? You are a fool, Claudia, said Anna, stifling a yawn. Perhaps, but I am a happy fool. You Jewish fools are much too sober and sad. No? What you need, on your holiday, is good cheer. Laughter. Singing. You should have a cup of wine to warm your cold bellies. Claudia was whirling into a reckless dance. I myself shall bring you wine. She trilled, as she made off, pleased to have had such a happy thought. You needn't bring any to me, called Leah. Nor me, said Anna. Then, I shall bring some to the big fisherman. Shouted Claudia, gaily. Go, and stop her, Morza, said Leah. She will listen to you. And see that she doesn't take any more herself. She's had too much already. 
If she gets any worse, Lysias will whip her. No fear of that, sniffed Morza, without moving. Lysias has been warming his cold belly, too. I must go, mumbled Simon. I have work to do. If you'll empty my basket. Claudia was returning now, staggering under the weight of a massive tray laden with a huge pitcher and wine cups. She breathlessly put her burden down on the ledge of the sundial and gave the company a bright smile. If Lysias catches you out here with that silver service, warned Leah. Never mind my basket, muttered Simon, moving off. I'll pick it up later. But, how rude, protested Claudia. Here I have gone to the trouble to bring you wine, in his highness's beautiful silver, and you run away. And the big fisherman is said to be so strong and brave. Poof. She faced him with cool contempt. Very well, hurry off to your synagogue, big fisherman. And say your prayers. Simon flushed with anger. Claudia, noting that her insult had bitten him in a sensitive spot, poured a cupful of wine and held it out to him, with a wheedling smile. I shouldn't have teased you, it wasn't fair. We all know you are so very big, and brave, and manly. I wonder whether he is, sniffed Leah negligently. Stung by the indignities, Simon impetuously grabbed the cup and drained it. The heavy wine warmed his throat and spread a pleasant glow through his vitals. Now that he had vindicated himself, he would furnish additional proof that he was no pious weakling. He handed back the cup and Claudia, giggling happily, refilled it. Better not lay it on too fast, big fellow, advised Anna, as Simon tipped back his head. That's enough now, Claudia, growled Morza. You don't want to get him into trouble. You can see he doesn't know how to drink wine. He'll be tight as a drum presently. Simon wiped his bearded lips with the back of his big hand, sighed contentedly, grinned foolishly, and made a deep bow which amused them all except Helen, whose tremulous smile showed anxiety. They were relieved to see him go. With long, springing, military strides, the big fisherman made off toward the driveway, dizzy but exultant. He had never felt better in his life. He triumphantly swung his shaggy head from side to side, accenting his confident swagger with swinging arms and squared shoulders. What the Italian trollop had said was true, the Jews did take themselves too seriously, they made the business of living a sad and sorry undertaking. As for himself, Simon was now resolved to be more light-hearted in the future. Any Jew so concerned over the world's wickedness that he would withdraw alone to the desert, and eat bugs, was entitled to all the pleasure he could find in it, Simon would have no part in such foolishness. Nor would he give another thought to the penniless carpenter. The well-kept driveway was rougher than usual, doubtless cut up by the hoofs of the Tetrarch's pack train, and Simon found himself slipping and stumbling over the loose gravel. He laughed aloud as he tried to mend his lurching gait and hummed a little tune. He wanted to sing. It had been a long time since he had loosed his big, deep, roaring voice. An old chant came back to him out of his early childhood. In the well-remembered, low-pitched monotone of the synagogue canter, he began the plaintive recitative. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge. He broke off abruptly and muttered a savage imprecation as he realized the meaning of the ancient atonement day hymn that, as a little boy, he had learned by rote, learned so thoroughly that the words had no significance at all, just an august procession of sonorous words intricately woven into a haunting tune. Simon cursed himself bitterly. Was he never to be delivered, then, from these dear broodings that flowed in the milk and the blood of the Jew? Was he, by nature, beyond the reach of any happiness? In a mood to sing and to sing gaily. The only song he knew was a whimpering cry of guilt. But now it occurred to Simon that he did know another song, a ribald sailor's ditty. Sometimes his men guardedly hummed it deep in their throats, knowing better than to articulate the dirty words, for the big fisherman, eloquently profane as he was, hated obscenities. Scornful now of all the self-flogging hymns wailed into his childhood by sanctimonious old Jonas, he sang the sailor's song as loudly as he could yell defiantly bellowing the filthiest words as if he wanted God himself to hear, and be hurt. At the end of it, he laughed hysterically, laughed until his eyes were so wet he couldn't see the road, and found his sleeve caught in the shrubbery. It sobered him a little. The sound of his idiotic laughter resounded in his whirling head. He shambled back onto the road, hoarsely muttering that he was a fool, a damned, drunken fool. He was nearing the highway now and its quietness warned him to cease his racket. There was a complete absence of the customary clank and clatter of vehicular traffic. 
Any man who pushed a barrow or drove a donkey cart today would do so at the expense of his reputation for decency. The few pedestrians moved slowly, out of respect for the day. Meeting them, Simon bowed gravely, as if he too were mindful of the occasion. His recent sensation of reckless joy was completely dimmed out now. At the wharf he stumbled awkwardly into a dory, sat down heavily, and began pulling toward the fleet. The vigorous exercise immediately fatigued him. His arms were heavy and the oars sliced splashes of water. Into the boat. Had he caught one of his boys pounding the lake as if flailing a threshing floor, the big fisherman would have paid him off and kicked him out. He was weak with nausea and dripping with sweat when, at length, he pulled up under the prow of the Abigail. That appeared at the rail and tossed the master a rope, calling out cheerily that it was a fine day. Apparently the boy had not yet noticed that anything was wrong with his hero. Simon wished the youngster was less attentive and thought of contriving an immediate errand for him in some other part of the ship, but decided to brazen it out the best he could. With a great effort he heaved himself aboard, produced a weak imitation of a smile, and said, with labored precision. I'll relieve you now, my boy. Perhaps you would like to go to the synagogue. Hell, no. Scoffed Thad, expectant of an approving grin. But Simon's face was sober and he made no comment. Walking slowly aft, he sat down on the sun-warmed tiller seat and dully occupied himself with a pretense of mending some frayed odds and ends of old rat lines. After a while Thad strolled back and volunteered to help, but Simon shook his head absently. When an hour had passed, the loyal young fellow, showing some concern now, returned with a plate of smoked fish and a couple of hard biscuits in one hand and a mug of sweet cider in the other. The skipper nodded his appreciation, gestured to Thad to put the plate down on the seat beside him, and reached out a hand for the mug. He raised it almost to his lips, sniffed it, blinked rapidly a few times, and shuddered. Not feeling very well today, my boy, mumbled Simon truthfully. Thad murmured something that sounded like sympathy and moved quietly away. It was evident that the master did not want to be disturbed. Doubtless, reflected Simon, as he gazed at the retreating figure, the boy had guessed why. And that was too bad, but at least. Thad would know now what the trouble was, and not be fretting for fear he had somehow got himself into the boss's disfavor. Simon continued thinking about young Thad. He was a good boy, a good sailor, a good fisherman, but a sore trial to his parents. It was said that they felt they had lost their son and that it was Simon's fault. Well, maybe it was true, viewed from the angle of their fanatical piety. The youngster was completely devoted to him, even to the length of imitating the master's little tricks of speech and manner until the crew joked about it. Bending forward, with his aching head in his hands, Simon retched disgustedly. Thad's parents were right, he was a bad influence. He wondered what Thad would say if he called to him and said, See here, boy, why don't you wash your dirty face and comb your hair and go to the synagogue today? It would please your mother. Even if it didn't do you any good, it would be worth something to make your parents happy. But no, he couldn't do that, he had already bewildered young Thad with his extraordinary behavior. It was enough disillusionment for one day. Glancing up dully, he saw Thad vaulting over the starboard rail onto the deck of the Sarah. Something had attracted his attention. He was leaning far forward now at the taffrail, shading his eyes with both hands. Presently he turned about with a broad grin and called to Simon excitedly, damned if they haven't got her moving. Simon's curiosity brought him lumbering to his feet. He sluggishly climbed aboard the Sarah and followed Thad's pointing finger. A full half mile away, the discarded little fishing smack that had been beached, at least three years ago, by poor old Japheth when he was no longer able to work, was making sail, a few hundred yards offshore. Somebody's going to get wet, rumbled Simon. That old bucket must leak at every seam. He chuckled disdainfully, remembering the sign that Japheth had nailed on her prow when abandoning her, to sell a rent under which announcement some clown had scrawled, or rot. He turned to Thad. Who, do you suppose, has been fool enough to float her? Why, don't you know, sir? I thought you must have heard. The Zebedee boys have leased her. Thad's bright enthusiasm over the amazing project was quickly dimmed by the big fisherman's surly scowl. They're fools. Growled Simon. That old vessel is not seaworthy. Even if she stays afloat, she's unmanageable. First little puff of wind, over she goes. Yes, sir, agreed that obediently. But Johnny is pretty good with the sticks. He'll ride out a gale if anyone can. How much of a crew have they, or do you know? Queried Simon. I suppose they have their old man with them. No, sir, they picked up three or four boys in Capernaum, 
but they didn't want to take Zebedee away from us. Thad risked a tongue-in-cheek grin, but Simon, not being in a jocular mood, only frowned bitterly and spat in the water as he swung about and returned to his seat on the Abigail. Thad, bored and unhappy, tagged along. You may go now, my boy, said Simon. I'll stand watch. But how about tonight, sir? I expect to remain here. I don't like to leave you alone, sir. Simon made no reply to that, and Thad lingered until the master called out impatiently, Go. Do as I tell you. I prefer to be alone. Crestfallen, the dismayed youngster slipped quietly away under this unearned rebuff and dropped into one of the rocking dories. When he was safely gone, Simon, sick and wretched in body and spirit, plodded feebly forward to the little cabin, eased himself down on the bare bunk that nobody before had ever had occasion to use, and reeled dizzily off into a troubled sleep. Chapter 7 once out of Hannah's sight, Esther abruptly slowed her scamper to match the aimless amble of the dissolving holiday crowd, and sauntered casually alongside the northbound groups of chattering women. It was a relief to find herself unnoticed by her fellow pedestrians, whose low-pitched voices seemed completely preoccupied with a review of the Tetrarch's cavalcade, or, at least, Esther surmised that this was the subject under discussion, though it was difficult to make out exactly what they were saying. The Galilean inflection of Aramaic had a tendency to slur a half dozen words into one, and when spoken rapidly took on a singular cadence that tipped every sentence up on end, making it sound like a query. Inconspicuous in Abigail's simple country dress, Esther strolled along at the verge of the highway, busy with her own accumulation of problems. She had had no intention of trying to overtake Simon and make believe she was searching for her fictitious Uncle Joseph. She was simply killing time until the eminent David having concluded his conversation with Hannah, should have returned home. Then she would feel safe to retrace her steps to Bethsaida. This deeply learned and widely traveled lawyer's almost reverential respect for her had been most disturbing. It was obvious that the shrewd old man had done some expert guessing about her identity. Her identity. The thought produced a pensive, momentary smile. David wondered who she was. Well, who was she? Of late she had been required to change her identity so often that she was a bit bewildered about it herself. It was amazing, reflected Esther, what one could do to one's own mind if some emergency demanded the practice of a deceit that involved self-deception also. To masquerade successfully as a boy was a serious and hazardous business. It wasn't enough to pretend she was a boy. To cut off her long hair and put on a man's clothing was the smallest part of it. The deception had required diligent, earnest, relentless concentration. Even when alone and unobserved, she had hardened her face. Lengthened her stride, swaggered, scowled, growled and spat. Every little feminine trick of posture or gesture was critically examined and corrected. She practiced walking with her feet wide apart, was mindful to keep her fingers away from her throat and make them into fists, kept her elbows away from her ribs, and swung her arms like a soldier. John, the baptizer, had discovered her secret, that had been her own fault. The strong breeze on the hilltop that morning had molded her clothing tightly to her form. But for this carelessness of hers, the hermit might never have suspected. She had been mucky throughout the whole adventure. When, however, it had become quite impossible to deceive Hannah, she had accomplished her reconversion to her own sex with a minimum of effort. She had dressed in Abigail's clothes from the skin out, tucking her own underclothing deep in the bottom of the old chest. Now she was Esther. But, curiously enough, the abandonment of her studied role as a boy had suddenly affected her memory of all the experiences she had had while playing that part. No, she hadn't forgotten them completely, but they were faded, distorted, as if viewed dimly through a clouded glass. It was a queer sensation, being Esther. Nor was that all that had happened to her mind now that she had taken on a new personality. This Esther had to account for herself. It wasn't sufficient to stop being a camel boy, fugitive from a caravan. It was imperative that Esther should contrive, and at very short notice, too, a new explanation for her presence in Galilee. So she had invented an uncle for whom she was searching. Aware that she mustn't take the risk of impromptu replies to the inevitable queries about this relative, she had elaborately created an Uncle Joseph whom almost anyone should be able to recognize from her detailed description. Uncle Joseph became as real to her as rain. He had a short, grizzled beard. His nearsightedness gave him the appearance of peering impudently into your face, though he really wasn't that sort of person, at all, rather shy and reticent, indeed. Uncle Joseph was bald and slightly stooped and walked with a limp. Yes, he had broken his leg when a boy and it had lamed him, not badly enough to interfere with his work. 
He had a friendly smile. Though he never had much to say. All that, and plenty more, had Esther contrived about Uncle Joseph. At the outskirts of unkempt little Magdala, she paused to take a leisurely look at the lake, shimmering in the summer afternoon, turned slowly about, and began to saunter back toward Bethsaida. No, it hadn't been difficult to become Esther, the orphan niece of Joseph, the lame, nearsighted stonecutter of Edumia, but the trouble was that in becoming Esther you were losing your hold on Farah. To be Esther you had to leave Farah far behind you, Farah, and everything that pertained to Farah. She half closed her eyes and a little shudder swept over her. Farah and all that belonged to the Farah personality had dimmed to the vagueness of a dream. Arabia. Her mother. Ion. And Voldy. Voldy. She tried to recover the sensation of galloping alongside him on a narrow mountain trail, tried to feel the tight grip of her knees hugging Sadie's hot, rippling withers, tried to smile up into Voldy's laughing eyes, and, failing of it, found herself blinded by sudden tears, tried, with a whimpering little sob, to feel again the caress of Ion's gentle fingers combing her hair. But it was all unreal now, as unreal as if it had happened to someone else and she was reading about it, or making it up. Esther was very lonely and lost and homesick for Farah, and frightened. She quickened her steps, she must get back to Hannah. Hannah was real. It was the first time in her life that she had given any serious thought to the permanent effects of self-deception. Apparently you could deceive other people without suffering much damage, but once you entered upon a determined effort to lie to yourself, about yourself, you were in danger of losing your own personality. A strict adherence to the truth had never seemed important. Lies were of no significance, unless, of course, they injured someone else. Certainly Arabia had never been scrupulous about truth-telling, nor had the Jews distinguished themselves for any sensitiveness on this subject. How indeed could one do any business at all if required to stick to the truth? Esther recalled that there was a Jewish commandment, written in their ancient law, making it a punishable crime to bear false testimony against a neighbor, but that felony had very little relation, if any to the casual untruth invented to implement a sale or save one from an embarrassing predicament. Today it had begun to appear that not only was the truth a form of property, but, what was still more important, it was possible to commit suicide by a long-continued course of self-deception. Hannah was overjoyed at Esther's return and deeply touched when the girl impulsively put her arm around her in a surprising display of sincere affection. I have good news for you, dear, she exclaimed. Master David has invited us to come and see his garden this afternoon, if we will. To her relief and satisfaction, for Hannah had expected some reluctance, Esther promptly consented to go, indeed, she seemed pleased to go. An hour earlier she might have invented excuses. Upon their arrival in David's extensive grounds and after greetings had been exchanged, Deborah, a tall, gaunt spinster of fifty or more, abruptly suggested to Hannah that they stroll in the garden and see what was left of the autumn flowers, though her crisp tone hinted that it was much too late in the season and that the idea had certainly not originated with herself. This laconic invitation, so pointedly addressed to Hannah, confirmed Esther's surmise that David had planned a private interview. His uneasy frown indicated that his forthright sister might have displayed a little more tact in this connivance, and Esther, unwilling to be thought too dumb to understand his annoyance flashed a mischievous smile into his eyes. He accepted it with pursed lips and a shrug, and a slow, begrudged grin. My sister Deborah, he drawled, has always believed, with Aristotle, that a straight line is the shortest journey between two points. And the safest, added Esther, suddenly sober, as if renouncing all devious ways. He searched her eyes to make sure of her sincerity, and smiled his appreciation of her evident decision to disarm. They had been slowly following the women at a widening distance. Now David cupped his hand lightly under her elbow and they angled off into the well-kept grove containing a wide variety of trees, most of which Esther had never seen. For something to say, she remarked that it seemed strange to find them growing here. My father, replied David, often traveled in foreign lands. He was greatly interested in trees. Not many of these are native to Galilee. He halted to give her time to look about, and asked, in a tone too craftily casual, do you recognize any of them, as of Edumia? She frowned impatiently. I know nothing whatsoever about Edumia, sir. The unbridled asperity in her low-pitched voice reproached him for trying to trap her. Wasn't he going to play the game fairly? Somewhat taken aback by the girl's irritation, David made the additional mistake of murmuring apologetically that he had been misinformed. I thought you were an Idumene, he said. You did not! exclaimed Esther hotly. Then, 
In a husky tone of entreaty, she asked, Why can't we be honest with each other? That's why you asked me to come here, Master David. You hoped I might confide in you. You are making it difficult. I am much in need of your counsel, and your friendship. I am lonely, and lost. He pointed to a rustic seat beside the winding path and they sat down. Forgive me, my child, he said softly. Now, you tell me as much, or as little, as you want me to know. I shall respect your confidence. It may shorten my story, sir, if you tell me how much you already know of it. David complied. Some eighteen years ago, while a student in Athens, chiefly concerned with contemporary political movements, he had been obliged to inform himself about the unprecedented alliance of the Jews and Arabians, who hoped their united strength might discourage a Roman invasion. A royal wedding had been arranged to confirm this pact. Antipas had married the Arabian princess, and shamefully mistreated her. There was a child, a little girl. I never learned her name, David was saying. It wouldn't be Esther? She ventured, without looking up. Not likely. He pretended to be debating the matter. Esther is definitely Jewish, and by the time this baby was born her Arabian mother would hardly have wanted any more reminders of her unhappy life in Jewry. That is true, sir. My name is Farah. After a lengthy pause she added, but perhaps you had better continue to call me Esther. David nodded his approval of that decision. She was much safer in Galilee with a Jewish name, he said. By the way, he continued, do you want to tell me what brings you here? Surely you have no thought of restoring relations with your father. She shook her head slowly, and, after some deliberation, said, I shall tell you, everything, Master David. And she did. It was a long story, but David did not often break into it with queries or comments. When she had told him about Hyone's insistence that she learn Greek, his eyes lighted and he interrupted her to say, Excellent. It has been a long time since I have conversed in that beautiful language. It will please me, too, she replied, and David smiled happily at her evident relief in abandoning her imperfect Aramaic for the more musical tongue in which she felt at home. From there on, she proceeded with more self-confidence, David watching her lips with delight. The effortless shift to Greek had given the girl a new freedom that added much to her charm. As she came to the end of her story, however, the old lawyer made a long face and shook his head. No, no, my child. He protested. What you have set out to do is utterly impossible. You are very brave, but this is something that no amount of courage can accomplish. Would you counsel me then to break my vow? There was disappointment and reproach in her query. I hope you will not ask me to assist in sending you to certain death. He muttered. Esther's eyes widened. David didn't want to be asked to assist. Perhaps that meant that he could, if he wished. Please remember, Master David, she said entreatingly, I have burned all my bridges to Arabia, I have no home in Churi, I have sworn to avenge my mother, and that I intend to do. If I should lose my life, well, is it not better for me to die with honor than to live to no purpose at all, unwanted anywhere, an embarrassment to those I love? The old man sat for a long time with half-closed eyes, stroking his gray beard. After a while he surprised her by what seemed an abrupt change in their conversation. My longtime friend and client, Jairus, informs me that the Tetrarch has recently acquired the entire private library of a bankrupt Corinthian. The scrolls, Greek classics, for the most part, have been long neglected, their owner having spent his recent years in a Roman prison. Esther had come to attention and was listening with wide eyes and parted lips. Perhaps the Tetrarch will want someone to mend the broken scrolls, she said and put his library in order. Perhaps. We shall see, said David. I shall inquire of Lysias, the steward. Deborah and Hannah were approaching. Let me see you again, said David, the day after tomorrow. Simon had not been home for two whole days now and Hannah was beside herself with anxiety. At breakfast on the first morning of his absence she had given his taciturn brother an opportunity to explain, but Andrew, whose only distinction was a talent for minding his own business, had not gone farther than to say that Simon had slept on shipboard. But on the morning of the third day the desperate woman decided to learn the meaning of it even at the risk of the rebuff. Having brought in their breakfast, she seated herself opposite Andrew and stared at him until he reluctantly and briefly lifted his eyes. I cannot bear this any longer. She exclaimed. Andrew, you must tell me now what has happened to him. Andrew, finishing his cakes and honey, waited until he had swallowed the last mouthful. Glancing in her general direction, he made what was, for him, quite an elaborate reply. I wish I knew, 
he said. Have I offended him, Andrew? You would know if you had. Did Esther have anything to do with it? Better ask her. I did. Andrew grinned a little, but exhibited no curiosity about the result of this inquiry, his silence proclaiming that it was none of his business. Hannah broke down now and cried. It distressed Andrew. He had never seen her in tears since the day Abigail died. Pushing back his chair, he faced her directly with sympathy in his eyes. I do not know what troubles him. The fleet goes out every day, same as always. The fishing has been good, and the weather. There has been no trouble among the men. My brother attends to his duties. He has little to say to anyone. His mind is not in his work. He is worried about something. And you don't know what? Persisted Hannah, when Andrew seemed to have ended his surprisingly long speech. No, he has not said and I have not asked him. Why don't you? It is not my habit to ask people what they are thinking about. But Simon is your brother. Simon's brother acknowledged this relationship with a slow nod, and rose to go. At this, Hannah began weeping again piteously, and Andrew resumed his seat, fumbling awkwardly with his knitted cap. At length he spoke. As you know, he has been very fond of old Zebedee's boy John, almost as if the youngster was his son. A few days ago Johnny went out into the country to hear this carpenter who, they say, has been performing miraculous deeds. You have probably heard strange tales about this man. He is said to have been healing the sick. Pish! commented Hannah, drying her eyes. Of course, agreed Andrew. Well, Johnny came back and said, in the presence of all of us, that he had seen the carpenter heal a paralyzed arm. But you didn't believe it, I hope. Protested Hannah. Me? No, I did not believe it, but Simon has not been himself since Johnny told the story. But, surely, Simon wouldn't take any interest in a thing like that. Hannah's swollen eyes were wide with astonishment. Simon, of all people. Maybe not, said Andrew. Perhaps he has been fretting about Johnny. The boy has quit the fleet. He and his brother James have rented an old boat and are fishing for themselves. And Simon hasn't talked about it? Not to me. But, what are we going to do, Andrew? We? We aren't going to do anything. You may do whatever you like. I intend to keep out of it. My brother is an adult and of sound mind, far as I know. If he wants any advice from me, he will ask for it. Andrew got up to go, resolutely this time, and pulled on his fisherman's cap. Hannah pursued him through the open door and out onto the stoop. He can sleep comfortably on that ship, she said. In his present state, rejoined Andrew, he might not sleep comfortably anywhere. He started down the path. Don't fret about it, he flung back. Simon is big enough to look out for himself, without anyone's help. Hannah kept tagging along as far as the gate. Easy enough to say, don't fret. But that's all I have to do now that Esther's gone. She left yesterday, to work at the palace. Andrew absently rattled the gate latch and frowned. I thought she was decent, he muttered. Couldn't she work at the palace and be decent? Perhaps, for the present, conceded Andrew, now that the Tetrarch and his family are gone. They took most of the servants with them. Maybe that's why Esther got a job, surmised Hannah. I hope she doesn't fall into trouble there. I didn't know it was such a wicked place, Andrew. Simon delivers fish at the palace every day. Surely he wouldn't go there if... My brother is not a rabbi or a policeman. He is a fisherman. Why should he concern himself with the Tetrarch's behavior, so long as he likes fish? Andrew grinned with knowledge he would not be sharing with Hannah, and went on. If Simon had to look into the private lives of his customers before selling them fish, he might soon be out of the fish business. Rather than have anything to do with such nasty people, snapped Hannah, I should do just that, go out of the fish business. Chuckling a little at this impractical remark, Andrew inquired dryly, as he closed the gate behind him, what other business would you go into? And without waiting for a reply, he set off at a brisk walk for he was starting later than usual and did not want to add the annoyance of his tardiness to his moody brother's frets. Having given some last-minute instructions to young Samuel, who had been doing his turn as night watchman, Simon prepared to leave, though dawn was barely breaking. I expect to be gone all day, he said. You will tell Andrew, when he comes, to take over until I return. Tell him to see to it that the palace delivery is made this afternoon, half the usual order, now that the family is gone. As he climbed into a dory, he had called back to Samuel, and tell Thad, or somebody, to go to my house and fetch another blanket for my bunk. He had the Cana Highway almost to himself for a couple of hours. 
Nobody was awake in Bethsaida when he passed through. The long, winding hill beyond was deserted. At the broad summit he paused to survey the landscape gaily dressed in autumn colors. In the area of the great white rock, which dominated the high plateau, the frost-touched grass had been trampled flat by innumerable feet. The descending road began to veer toward the west. It had been many years since Simon had traversed this neighborhood of small farms and vineyards. He had never been lured by the soil. It was a common jest that men who followed the sea were always chattering about the ease and security of life in the country, declaring that they would someday rent a couple of acres and raise their own food. And often they seemed to be quite in earnest about it. This had always amused Simon, who couldn't imagine a less interesting tool than a hoe. But today the serenity of the countryside made a bid for his turbulent spirit. Harvest was past, but the farmers were busy with the less urgent affairs of autumn, snugging themselves in for the winter, carrying well-laden baskets of root vegetables from the kitchen garden to the sod-roofed cellar, the old women gathering herbs and tying them into bunches to be hung up and dried. On the other side of the highway, a little farther on, three half-grown youngsters were lazily roping wheat sheaves to the backs of as many shaggy pack asses. Simon waved a hand to them, but they only stared back. That's the way it was in the country. Their ideas came slowly. Doubtless, if he stood there and waved at these boys for half an hour, reflected Simon, they might respond to his salute. It was a dull life, no mistake about that. He wondered how the country people took to the carpenter's belief that food was less important than flowers. At the far corner of the next farm, a larger one, father and the boys were on their threshing floor, beating a knee-deep carpet of barley sheaves. The mother of the family wielded a much-mended winnowing fan. The two girls were sweeping the clean grain onto a hempen mat. Simon paused here, turned off the highway, and approached them with a friendly greeting. They were early to work, he said. The women rested, sitting on the ground, and the boys, one of them as tall as his father, leaned on the long handles of their flails. We wanted to get as much done as we could, said the gray thatched farmer, strolling toward Simon. Not much work being done in these parts just now, everybody scurrying off to listen to this fellow from Nazareth. Where is he today? inquired Simon. I should like to see him. There's no telling, exactly, said the farmer. He moves around. Yesterday he was about six miles from here, said the oldest boy, over beyond Hamat. Were you there? asked Simon. The family went over in the afternoon, said the farmer. I heard him talk, about a week ago, over here on the hill. Didn't think much of it. He was saying we should love our enemies. I don't hold with that kind of talk though I'm not saying he isn't a good speaker. You can hardly take your eyes off him. Big crowd yesterday? Simon asked the young man. Bigger every day. Bragged the youth, as if he were part of the show. Nothing ever like it in this country. Tell me about it, won't you? Said Simon, squatting on his heels. At this they gathered about him, and sat, apparently eager to talk. It was plain on their faces that the subject was already well worn, but by no means worn out. They all contributed to the conversation. Very strange doings. Very strange talk. They were agreed on that. As for the particulars, the testimony failed, in some respects, to add up. The trouble is, explained the woman, the crowd is so big you can't get close enough to see rightly what's going on. I saw him cure an old man who couldn't hear, put in the youngest boy. He danced up and down, he was so glad. But you didn't know whether the old man was deaf or not, cautioned his father. He might have been putting it on. He claimed he was deaf, and now he could hear, declared the lad doggedly. All old people have more or less trouble with their hearing, commented his mother. And sometimes they can hear better than other times, added his little sister. Fathers like that. Never mind, mumbled her mother. But the sick woman on the cot, said the dull boy. She really was sick. She wasn't putting it on, I'm sure of that. Yes, confirmed his brother. She got up and walked away after Jesus spoke to her. But not very lively, demurred their mother. She leaned on her son's arm, pretty heavily too. That's the way it would be, thought the older girl, if she hadn't walked for a long time. Where do all these people come from? Simon wanted to know. Everywhere, seems like, said the farmer. A wool buyer was telling me, last week, that he saw whole families he knew from as far away as Ramon Shunem and Nine. Brought their tents along and a couple of milch goats. Plenty of people from Nazareth too, I suppose, said Simon, if that's where he lives. No, funny thing about that, replied the farmer. Very few from Nazareth, they say. If he's such a great one, you'd think. 
Maybe his own folks got used to seeing him do strange things, suggested the youngest boy. Home folks never give much heed when their neighbors do something extra good, like fine wood carving, or rug weaving, or beautiful singing, said the mother. They think that because they know a person and grew up with him, he can't be very much. That's a fact, declared her husband. Lots of country folks sneer at what's going on around them and praise what's going on in Bethsaida, and the people in Bethsaida laugh at their own town, and envy the people in Cana, and... Simon laughed a little and said he supposed the people in Cana thought everything was livelier in Jericho, and that Jericho wanted to see the more interesting sights in Jerusalem. I'd like to see Jerusalem myself, murmured the tall boy. Now you take our girl Judith here. Her mother laid a brown hand on her elder daughter's arm. Judith, apparently suspecting what was coming, lowered her eyes, smiled shyly, and shook her head a little, as her mother went on. She plays the harp better than you'll hear it anywhere. And a poor old harp it is, too, that's been in my family for three generations. But do you suppose the people around here think anything of her playing? Not at all, you have to go to the city to hear a harp played. I should like to hear you play, Judith, said Simon, at which the girl's cheeks flushed prettily. No time for that today, said her father, turning about toward the threshing floor. I told her to take her old harp along, and play for the people when the carpenter isn't speaking, said her mother. Simon politely approved of this as a good idea. They reluctantly ambled back to their tasks. He waved a farewell and resumed his westward journey. So, the people of Nazareth hadn't been very much impressed. This wasn't a good sign. There must be something shaky about this business, reflected Simon. The family he had just met was not of one mind in respect to these strange occurrences. It was still a matter of debate with them whether the carpenter of Nazareth was a healer or a fraud. Maybe some light would be shed on that problem today. Simon hoped so. He hoped the Nazarene would turn out to be merely a glib talker with a talent for making sick people feel encouraged, for surely the world was a much more reliable institution if nobody was playing tricks with it, not even for the benefit of a few. And, as he trudged along, moodily intent on the road, Simon wondered whether the girl Judith, with the big, solemn eyes and the wistful smile, was really a harpist. Not very likely, he thought. For the past hour the highway had been receiving more and more traffic from the tributary roads and lanes, all manner of traffic, high-wheeled market wagons filled with people of all ages, elderly couples in donkey carts, here and there a garden barrow occupied by a frail and feeble old woman or a pale and wizened lad, pushed by an earnest-faced young farmer. Occasionally a cop joined the procession bearing the prone figure of an emaciated, half-grown girl or a crippled old man with pain in his eyes. Clumps of people on foot, by the dozen, by the score, overtook and passed the sick ones. Every path, every open gate, every crossroad fed them into the highway. Simon had found himself wishing that the carpenter would be soon exposed as an ordinary man who had nothing much to work with but a winning voice, a confident manner, and the ability to make people listen to him, and trust him. But as he surveyed these sorry crews of hopeful burden bearers, he began to wish, with all his heart, that something could be done for them. If the carpenter was a fraud, this conglomeration of misery was indeed a tragic spectacle. Maybe the carpenter didn't realize what a responsibility he had taken on. If he didn't, it was high time he found out. It was a pitiful sight. Why couldn't this Nazarene have stayed in his carpenter shop? What was the good of stirring up hope that couldn't have any outcome but a cruel disappointment? These wretched ones had learned to bear their gulling loads. Most of them had done all their crying and calluses had formed to ease the pain of their yokes. Now they would lay their burdens down at this carpenter's feet. What monstrous cruelty if, after so great hope, they must strap on their heavy packs again and plod wearily home, broken-hearted. A half-mile east of Hamat the highway divided, the road to the right proceeding to the village and on toward Cana, the left fork bearing southward through the province of Samaria and onward to Jerusalem. In the triangle at the parting of the ways a small encampment was breaking up. The service tents were already down and being loaded onto the pack train. The master tent, a beautiful thing of white and blue, was in process of dismantling. Half a dozen fine horses, expensively caparisoned, were restlessly waiting their riders, who now emerged from the sacking tent. Full of curiosity, Simon slowed his pace and candidly stared. The leader of the party was a mere youngster, certainly not more than eighteen, and his companions were youthful, too, though not so young as he. They were extravagantly dressed. Simon drew off to the side of the highway sat on the ledge of the stone-walled well, and studied this pageantry at his leisure. That it was a company of nobles he had no doubt. 
Presently, to his surprise, he saw the young master of the group point toward him, and give an order to a servant, who made off at once to the well. Simon's brow furrowed as he saw the man coming. He was quite sure he was within his rights to rest at the well. Do you live in this neighborhood, sir? The servant, a tall bearded man of Simon's age, had bowed respectfully, before asking the question in a quality of Aramaic that was spoken in Judea. Simon shook his head and replied, Bethsaida. But that is not far away, continued the servant. Would you perhaps know anything of this carpenter who has stirred up so much excitement? His arm swept the congested highway. Not much, said Simon. I saw and heard him a few days ago, and I am hoping to see him again today. Would you object to having a word with my master, sir? Who is your master? Joseph, the prince of Arimathea, said the servant proudly. Simon rose now and followed. It was little enough he knew about the small but fertile principality of Arimathea, up north beyond Ramah, which had been ceded to the fabulous Hyrcanus and his descendants many generations ago, in consideration of some long-forgotten favor to northern Jews. Whenever Arimathea was mentioned the word suggested wealth. Riches in Arimathean was a trite phrase which the Galileans used without examining it more closely than many another simile, such as tricky as an Arab or wise as a serpent. The beautiful tent was down now and the swarming servants were folding it with care. The vanguard of the pack train was moving off down the Jerusalem road. The young prince was standing by his white horse in evidently playful conversation with his friends. He was a handsome youth with a ready smile and a gracious manner. Simon was favorably impressed and doffed his forebodings about the interview. Courteously requesting him to wait a moment, the servant approached his master and made a brief report in low tones, after which he beckoned to Simon who advanced rather diffidently and removed his cap. My friend, said the prince, looking up at the big Galilean who towered over the lot of them, we are curious about this great multitude and the man they are said to be seeking. They tell us that he speaks to great crowds and heals many sick ones. Noting your extraordinary height, it occurred to us that you might have been able to hear and see what has been going on. I would that I had more to tell you, sire, said Simon. I heard the man speak. He has a strange voice. The people hang on his words as a sailor overboard and the storm clings to a rope. Good. Approved the prince to his companions. The fellow has some imagination. Turning to Simon, he said, perhaps you are a sailor yourself. A fisherman, sire. Simon smiled briefly, and went on, no matter what he is saying, the people hardly breathe for fear of missing something, yet they are simple words. Such as what? Asked the prince, interested now. He wants people to be kind to one another, that's about all, said Simon. Everyone is to be kind and helpful, all the way up and down from the pauper to the... He hesitated, and the prince, frowning a little, crisply provided the obvious word. It was evident that he was annoyed. His voice was challenging as he went on. So, this fellow is trying to make the people restless. Everybody is to be generous, eh? The pauper is as good as the prince, eh? Is that it? Not if I heard rightly. Sire. There was a stiffening dignity in Simon's voice now. His frown deepened. He didn't like the arrogant tone of this spoiled youngster. After all, he hadn't arranged this interview, nor was he on trial. Quite the contrary, he continued courageously, the carpenter wants peace among the people. If a man is badly used by his oppressors, let him find his happiness inside himself. A good thought. There was a touch of mockery in the prince's voice, though he had mended his temper somewhat. And how does a man go about it, to find happiness inside himself? He leaves off fretting about the things he does not have, explains Simon, and he gives less heed to caring for the few things he does have. Thus he is freed from worry lest thieves should make off with his small possessions. And after the fellow says that, sneered the prince, he probably passes his cap through the crowd, inviting them to pay him for advising them to have nothing. They all chuckled a little at this cynical jibe, all but Simon who remarked quietly, he has no cap, sire. There was a moment of silent embarrassment here, Simon having inadvertently flavored the talk with a bit of disconcerting sincerity. How about these strange deeds? Demanded the prince. One hears differing opinions, sire, said Simon. Some claim to have seen miracles performed, others try to explain them, still others doubt them. Our servant says you are now on your way to hear him again. Does that mean that you yourself believe him honest? Surely you would not make the journey if you considered him an out and out mountebank. I am hoping to find out, sire, murmured Simon. Observing that the prince's friends were growing restless, he added respectfully, May I go now? 
The prince shrugged and made a negligent gesture as if to say it was of no concern to him whether the big, burly fisherman ambled off at once or remained here for the rest of his life. He laid a jeweled hand on the pommel of his saddle. Just a moment, he said. One thing more. We are advised that a homemade, self-appointed prophet has recently been gathered in by our good friend, your tetrarch, for predicting the advent of an avenger who is to upset thrones, strip the wealthy, free the slaves, and put all the riffraff on horseback. Do the people hereabouts think that this wonder worker is out on such an errand? It is quite impossible, sire, declared Simon. Surely no one who had heard him speak could have that opinion. So far as I have learned, the carpenter has no quarrel with the rich, though I think he pities them. Pities them, exclaimed the prince, while the others grinned incredulously. What impertinence! Who does this wandering beggar think he is, to be pitying his betters? Simon ventured no immediate comment on this smug remark, but his lip curled to match a frown that had a good deal of scorn in it. The prince was quick to notice this irritation, and prodded it. If you do not object to the question, my massive friend, how do you yourself feel toward the rich? You are obviously not a man of property. Tell me truly, do you too pity the rich? The rotant was stirring Simon to anger. No, sire, he answered, staring fearlessly into the young man's eyes, I do not pity the rich. I envy them, as they expect me to do. I peer through their high fences and lament that I do not have their great possessions, for this pleases them. Simon's voice rose and rasped as he continued recklessly, whenever we poor cease envying the rich, we will be punished for robbing them of their highest satisfaction. The prince had mounted now. He rose in his stirrups to shout, that is the most impudent thing that was ever said in our presence. Well, growled Simon sullenly, you asked for it. In our country, fisherman, you would get thirty-nine lashes for that. I, sire, and in my country too, retorted Simon, and because he now had nothing to lose by further frankness he added, the great ones are the same everywhere, I am told. They face the truth with a bullwhip. Be off with you, shouted the prince, raising his riding crop. No, no, Joseph, muttered the mounted friend at his side. The prince lashed his horse. They bounded away. Flushed with rage, Simon watched them galloping down the road. Never had he felt such bitter contempt for a fellow creature. Quite a courageous youngster, this prince, when surrounded by his fine friends and a score of armed guards. Had he been alone, he would have been meek as a lamb. Simon wished he could have had the prince all to himself for a few minutes. No, he would not have hurt the boy badly. He would have been satisfied. To take the insolent brat by his beautifully curled hair, and fold him over the ledge of the old well, and spank him, a thorough spanking, a spanking he should have had earlier. Simon was sore. It had never been his habit to covet other men's property or privileges. He had nothing against the rich. Until now. Now he despised them. All of them. They were all alike. To hell with them. All of them. He had trudged toward the Hamad Highway now and had joined the pilgrimage. Looking across the field to the Jerusalem road, he observed that the prince's party had halted for a parley. After a rather lengthy colloquy, they wheeled about, galloped back to the junction, and came bearing down upon the crowded highway. The people screamed and rushed to the sides of the road for safety as the gay riders plowed a wide furrow through them. Everybody was for saving his own skin in this frantic route. Old people were trampled. Carts were upset. Children were crying. Shouting with laughter, the princely cavalcade swept on. Simon stood still and watched the shameless scene his every muscle taut with impotent rage, his big fists clenched. Men on horses. He shouted aloud. Brave men on horses. The somnolent village of Hamad had swollen to a city of five thousand and was adding to its population. Every grass-grown path was as a sleepy stream that had suddenly become a river at flood. The huge crowd had congregated on a harvested field some distance north of the main highway. On the outskirts of the densely packed multitude, Vendors pursued a busy trade with huge baskets of smoked fish, wheaten and barley rolls, sweetmeats and sun-cured figs swarming with flies, for which they found ready customers among the stragglers who were too far away from the point of interest to see what was happening. The prince and his party had ridden up close against the rear of the throng, apparently impatient at having been detained from proceeding through to the front where the carpenter stood. The whole affair was a lark, a country circus, and the management should have been pleased to announce, we are honored to have with us today His Highness. Joseph, the Prince of Arimathea. Clear the way for His Highness and his retinue. We welcome you, sire. The carpenter continued speaking in a quiet voice, inaudible at this distance. 
Laughing loudly, the princely party urged their horses forward until the foam from their champed bits flecked the shoulders of men and women who were cupping their ears to listen. Make way! shouted the mounted guards. Way, for the Prince of Arimathea. The people turned their heads and scowled angrily, but did not budge. Hi! You! Fisherman! yelled one of the prince's friends, as Simon moved into the pack. Clear a road for the prince. But Simon did not reply, nor did he turn about to face them. Finding it impossible to hear anything, he circled the throng and discovered a spot nearer to the front where an amazingly large colony of cots and carts bearing the sick awaited the end of the carpenter's address. A shaggy young farmer, standing by a bed on which an emaciated old woman lay shielding her sunken eyes against the sun with a bony hand, glanced up at Simon and grinned a rustic greeting. Your mother, maybe? whispered Simon. Grandmother, replied the young farmer. Came to be healed? She hopes so. Don't you think there's anything in it? There'd better be, muttered the farmer truculently, pointing to the quarter acre of sick and crippled. If he's a fake, he'll be stoned. Has he been speaking long? asked Simon. Long enough. Granny is tired waiting. What's her trouble? The farmer guarded his voice as he replied, old age. Think the carpenter can cure old age? No, but Granny does. She's a little weak in the head. Simon edged gradually into the rim of the crowd. By listening intently he could hear snatches of the carpenter's talk. But it was difficult. What with the confusion of the people pushing in from the rear, the moans of the sick, and the crying of the babies, Simon had to be content with broken phrases. But it was a haunting voice, a magic voice that stilled and soothed and comforted you even though you couldn't hear all the words. From what Simon could make of it, a man could have a secret life with God. Once he determined to find happiness within himself, he reached out for a strength greater than his own. Like a babe, creeping, he longed to rise and walk. Lifts his small hand. Is gripped by a stronger hand. Having learned to walk with God. He wants to talk with God. Too often, men try to talk with God. Only in the temple. Talk with him alone. His voice more clear when you are alone with him. A private league with God. A secret life with God. An understanding with him. You and God alone. In your closet. Closed door. He will listen. He will bless you. Some short-statured person was digging a sharp elbow into Simon's back. He turned about and looked down into the contorted face of a woman with a little girl of five in her arms. The child was blind. Please. Entreated the woman in a whisper. Help me to get closer. You are big and strong. You must help me. Stay where you are, behind me, said Simon. When the time comes, I'll do what I can. The carpenter was talking about doing things for others. That, too was better done in secret. When you make gifts. No trumpet. A secret. So secret your own left hand does not know. Only God will see. Only God. Will know but he will bless you. There was a general stirring in the great congregation when the carpenter had stopped speaking. Now, according to his custom, he would receive the sick ones. The crowd pushed and shoved for a better. View. The people were not very considerate of one another. The weak and timid were elbowed out of the way. Even among the very ill ones on their beds, the rivalry of the bearers was rude beyond belief. Simon wished he was up there in front to improve their manners. He expected and hoped that Jesus would rebuke the importunate. But, after all, they couldn't be much blamed, he thought. People couldn't be polite when it was a matter of life or death for a loved one. The little woman behind him was growing desperate. She was crying hysterically. Bidding her follow him closely, Simon began edging his way forward but it was quite impossible for her to make any use of his intervention. Other people crowded in behind the big man and pushed her roughly aside. There seemed only one practical thing to do now. Simon would have to carry the child himself. Turning, he held out his long arms, and the woman, tearfully grateful, relinquished her burden. It was an arduous journey forward through the solid mass of seemingly immovable people. Simon entreated, pushed, scolded, shouldered, begged, shouted, as he pressed on. This child is blind. He announced, in his big, booming voice. Let me through. Please let me pass. And now, now, at last, he stood face to face with the strange man of Nazareth, close enough to have touched him. By comparison with Simon's height and bulk, the carpenter was of slight physique, but something about him, emanating from him, made him a commanding figure. Simon sensed it, and felt inferior. In point of years, the man was his junior. Every other way considered, Simon felt himself a mere awkward, 
overgrown boy. He looked down into a pair of tranquil, steady, earnestly inquiring eyes. They held him fast, they brightened with a friendly smile, almost as if two longtime companions were meeting after a separation. The carpenter's face was pale. Tiny beads of perspiration showed on his forehead, for he was tired and the day was hot. It was such a gentle gesture that it seemed like a caress when Jesus laid his hand lightly upon the little girl's eyes. The child had been frightened by all the confusion and had been holding herself frigidly, hugging her arms to her breast as if to ward off a blow. At the touch of Jesus' hand, she relaxed and drew a babyish sigh of relief and reassurance. Simon's eyes suddenly swam blindingly as Jesus' forearm rested on his own. It was a strange sensation. He knew now what it was that had suddenly soothed the child and freed her of her fears. Jesus was praying. He had closed his eyes and was praying in a soft voice barely above a whisper. His prayer was made to his father, and it was as if they two were closeted together in some secret place. In a tone of intimate companionship and confidence he asked his father to give this little one her sight, for it was through no fault of hers that she could not see. Then, and there was a note of sadness and longing in his voice, he prayed that all men everywhere, groping in the shadows, might be led into the bright sunshine of his father's love. Then, and this stirred Simon deeply, he prayed for all those who, now and in days to come, would lead the blind into the presence of the eternal light. Simon thought he couldn't bear it, when it happened. He gasped involuntarily and stifled a sob. The incredible thing had happened. It was impossible, but it had actually happened. Jesus had gently moved his hand from the child's eyes and his fingertips touched the damp little ringlets on her forehead. Now she had slowly raised her wondering eyes to his, and smiled. Then, turning her head, she gazed bewilderedly into Simon's face, and, seeing his tears, her own little eyes overflowed. Jesus was turning aside now to speak to a man on crutches. Simon tarried, trying hard to speak some word of gratitude. Glancing toward him, Jesus nodded his head and smiled companionably, as if to say he understood. A low murmur of astonishment swept the crowd as Simon turned about with the child hugged tightly in his arms. She was crying softly now, for she was frightened. Her mother, shrilly calling, she is my child. Oh, let me go to my baby. Finally made herself heard, and was pulled, pushed, half carried by the excited people around her. She was much too overwrought to thank Simon, even with a smile, when he gently placed the little girl in her hungry arms. Suffocated by his emotion and still half blinded by his tears, Simon was forcing his way through the throng, now standing transfixed, breathless, and on tiptoe, in anticipation of another marvel, when a hand clutched his sleeve. He looked down into the sober, white face of the Prince of Arimathea. Tell me, fisherman, demanded the prince huskily, was that child really blind? I, sire, said Simon, and now she can see. The prince held tightly to the big fisherman's sleeve, his wide, baffled eyes questing more information, but Simon tugged away and pressed on toward the outer air. Circling the preoccupied multitude, he made for the rear, and the highway. He walked as a man in a dream, as one suddenly transported into a different world. A strange assurance of security possessed him, and a curious sense of peace that was quite beyond his understanding. Chapter 8 Lysias was flattered and bewildered to have so gracious a note from that haughty old Sadducee, David ben Zadok. A bright young Jewess, well versed in the classics, orphaned and in need of employment, wrote David, might be available to make repairs on the dilapidated Corinthian library recently acquired by His Highness the Tetrarch. The letter was written in Greek, which still further pleased the steward with implications that he was a person of some culture. But just why this crusty old lawyer, who had made no bones about his contempt for the Tetrarch, should show any concern about the reconditioning of these valuable but unsightly scrolls was not clear. One thing was sure, the old man hadn't bothered to offer the suggestion from any love of Antipas. Maybe he wanted an excuse to have a peek at that library himself, he was known to be something of an antiquarian. Lysias gently fingered the old scar on his ear, an involuntary aid to deep meditation, and reflected that there must be more in this situation than met the eye. But, no matter what might be the crafty Sadducee's motive in proposing a remedy for these dreadful scrolls, it would be a great relief to the steward if, upon his master's return from Rome in the spring, he might be shown this costly collection in better dress, for it had been Lysias himself who had recommended and negotiated the purchase, and the Tetrarch had been noisily dissatisfied. Much embarrassed by the shabbiness of the old books, Lysias had tried to impress his highness with the importance of their great antiquity. 
Digging deep into the most ill-conditioned of the wicker hampers, he had brought up a mildewed scroll and held it toward Antipas, who wrinkled his nose and put his hands behind him. This scroll, sire, Lysias had announced in a tone of reverence, was written by Aristotle. It is titled, The Directions and Names of the Winds. I do not mean, sire, continued Lysias, that this is a scrivener's reproduction of the book. This is the original, done by the hand of the master himself. Well, whoever did it, grumbled Antipas, it stinks. And I don't want it put anywhere where I have to look at it. Then, noting the steward's chagrin, the tetrarch had added, I dare say some people would be proud to have a mummified cat of Aristotle's, with a gold collar set with emeralds, perched on the mantel. Turning away, he had sauntered toward the balcony window, where, pausing, he had laughed aloud. And after they'd had Aristotle's cat on their mantel for a score of years, he called back to Lysias, some learned expert, with great knowledge of dead cats, would come along and say, Hell! That cat never belonged to Aristotle. Much more recent. Besides, Aristotle hated cats. But he never so much as kicked this cat, it isn't half a century old. What is my lord's pleasure, then, in regard to the scrolls? Lysias had inquired, meekly. Box them up again. Keep them in a dry place where they will suffer no further decay. Some day, perhaps, we will have them repaired. Lysias was going to feel more comfortable when the Corinthian scrolls were restored. Quite apart from his responsibility for their extravagant purchase, he had a sentimental interest in them, for he too was a Corinthian, and the same Roman raid that had despoiled his home and enslaved him at twenty had likewise brought disaster to their neighbors of the house of Timotheus, a wealthy ship owner and generous patron of the arts. The Timotheus family and their rich possessions had been ruthlessly disposed of. Timotheus himself had been put to death, his uncommonly beautiful wife had committed suicide, their two elder sons, Leander and Philetus, schoolmates of Lysias, had been taken to serve as scribes and accountants in the office of the prefect of Achaia. A younger son, Demetrius, who had already won some local renown as an athlete, was carried off to Rome in chains, too savagely rebellious to be of much use to anybody looking for a servant. Lysias had often wondered what became of the handsome, reckless Demetrius, beaten to death, perhaps, for insubordination. The Roman looters hadn't known what to do with the books. There was an enormous quantity of these scrolls, and not a man among the invaders knew enough about literature to identify the extremely valuable writings and give them special care. The books had been stored in a damp cellar and much of the writing on the rotted papyrus was presently indecipherable, but, regardless of their physical condition, Many of these scrolls were historic treasures. Think of it. To own a book written by Aristotle. In his own handwriting. Of course, reflected Lysias, you couldn't expect Antipas to have much reverence for the old scrolls. Antipas was a Roman, and Rome had no veneration for the past. Let the dreamy Greeks attend to the rotted scrolls, and the tombs and the epitaphs. The old Sadducee's note was answered forthwith, Lysias obsequiously thanking the eminent David ben Zadok for the great kindness tendered his master the Tetrarch. And he would be glad to see the young person about the scrolls at her early convenience. Lysias had spoken the truth. He was glad at the prospect of having some more attractive company than the kitchen afforded. The Tetrarch's palace could be a very lonely institution when the family was abroad. By experience the steward had learned that the less he mingled with the servants the better account he could give of his stewardship upon his lord's return. On occasions he had shown himself friendly with the gardeners and vine growers, only to encourage their laziness and disobedience. As for the kitchen crew, he had discovered that any playfulness in that department would certainly be paid off in impudence and disrespect. The new employee would rate a higher classification on account of her learning. The servants themselves would understand that without being told. Lysias would invite this girl to have her meals with him. He hoped she would be comely, though that was almost too much to expect if she was as old David said, well versed in the classics. Pretty girls didn't know anything. Indeed, the really beautiful ones were forthright fools, all but Salome, of course. Salome was a deep one. Lysias worshipped her. And he was afraid of her, too. Once, when Salome had had too much wine, she had encouraged Lysias to kiss her. She had managed the kiss and it had left Lysias dizzy and weak in the knees. Then she had savagely slapped him on the mouth with the back of her hand. The huge jewels in her rings had bloodied his lips. Salome had laughed. She enjoyed rough play. She wasn't punishing him for offending her. Quite to the contrary, she had been delighted with his caresses. But the sight of pain and the scent of warm blood gave her a queer little thrill, she said, while repairing his wounds. 
Sometimes the Tetrarch too was confined to his rooms for a few days while the cuts on his face were healing. On these occasions, only old Glaucus, the ex-butler, was permitted to minister to his highness. Lysias surmised that Glaucus was the repository for many a secret, his suspicion being based mostly on the animal-like ferocity of Herodias' hatred for him. Also, there was a telltale quality to the old fellow's impudence. Herodias couldn't be blamed for despising him. Shamelessly trading on the stranglehold he apparently had on the Tetrarch, Glaucus could be found on warm autumn afternoons in the most comfortable chair in the sunniest corner of the patio, with a tankard of wine at his elbow and a fat, elderly terrier asleep at his feet, as if he had every right to all the luxuries that the establishment afforded. This type of impertinence could mean only one thing, according to Lysias, Glaucus knew something about Antipas and Herodias guessed what it was. And it was making a haggard, sharp-tongued, short-tempered old shrew of her. Sometimes a whole week would pass in which Herodias and Salome frankly avoided one another, though they both took pains to be polite in the presence of the servants. Some day, reflected Lysias, as he sanded and sealed his letter to David, some day there was going to be quite a lot of trouble here at the palace, plenty, and plenty more, of trouble. There would be an eruption of the volcano Herodias, and somebody would get hurt. Life at the palace was not only endurable, it was pleasant and interesting. Esther's relationships were quickly and comfortably defined. Lysias was disappointed but not disgruntled when she declined his special hospitality by explaining that it would make her unhappy if favors were extended to her which made the others envious. She also imputed to him a wealth of high-minded gallantry that was quite too nebulous for assessment, but made such a favorable impression that Lysias spent a whole afternoon conducting her through the palace, ordered the furniture unshrouded in the great banquet hall, and invited her to sit in His Highness's tall, gold-plated, throne-like chair, where she projected a brief, unspoken query to the King of Arabia, do you still think it's impossible? Her appearance in the kitchen, ready to make friends but not over-eager to the point of condescension, instantly gave her top rating. Claudia stated the situation neatly when she declared, after Esther, having carried her own dishes, had returned to her work, I like her. If she was only a little better than me, we would probably hate each other, no? but she is so very much better than me that we don't need to hate each other. Work on the Corinthian scrolls was fascinating, like a game to play. Esther was not wholly unfamiliar with the task. The old books that Zendi had picked up in Petra had required repairs. You carefully unrolled the long, narrow strip of papyrus, detached it, whole or in pieces, from the spools, weighted it down on the library floor, and, wherever it was broken, pasted it together. If the text had been damaged badly, you copied as much as was legible and inserted the patch, with an editor's note explaining how much was missing. Then you sanded and scraped the moldy old spools down to the bare wood and redecorated them in black and gold. Sometimes the girls came up from the kitchen and helped hold the strips of papyrus in place for splicing. Lysias frequently drifted into express approval. On the morning of Esther's third day at the palace, Claudia remarked, after the breakfast things had been cleared away, that she must now go out to the prison and feed my wild man. Wild man? echoed Esther. Are you not afraid? No, no, no. That was what you call a joke. He is not wild, he just looks wild, with shaggy hair, and bony, like a starved cat. It is because he does not eat. And he is very sad. I fear he will die if he does not eat. Why is he in prison? inquired Esther. Ah, uh, I don't know. Claudia waved a shapely arm salute to her own disinterest in the matter. He talked too much, maybe, no? He is a prophet, assisted Anna, without conviction. He says the world is coming to an end. And for that he is locked up? Asked Hester, apparently unconcerned. There was more to it than that, explained Morza. He sees the rulers overthrown, and the empire smashed, and the poor maid rich, and... That's right, put in Claudia. That's what he says. I've heard him. All hell's going to break loose. How would you like to take him his breakfast, Esther? Then you could hear him for yourself. And perhaps he will eat for you, you are so very pretty. You need not be afraid of him. He will not harm you. Esther pretended reluctance, hoped he was well guarded. Guarded? Laughed Claudia. A tough legionary from the fort was in charge of him for a day, but he hasn't been seen since. He is on a big spree, no doubt. But the prisoner is well locked in and there are no others in the jail to help him escape. Assuming Esther's consent to feed the prisoner, Claudia had been preparing the breakfast tray, making an appetizing arrangement of a plate of red apples, a dish of berries, 
a smoked perch and several small barley loaves. Here you are, she said, and here is the key to the prison door. You open the front door and there is a small corridor. The cell is the first one. There is a barred window in the door. You pass the food through the bars. Don't try to make love to him. It's no good. He is cold. For once, called Morza, from the pantry, Claudia speaks the truth. It's no use to make love to the man. It has been tried, by experts. A startling hush. Broken on Morza's malicious comment, presumably offered by the sober Jewess, Anna. Her Highness, explained Claudia naively, is restless and lonely. You never saw her, no? And when Esther had shaken her head, Claudia sighed and remarked in a confidential half-whisper, Her Highness does not like to grow old. But, who does? Come, let me show you the way. Beyond the circular carriage court a narrow path led through a trellised arbor toward a sturdy stone structure some two hundred yards distant. Having given minute directions, Claudia returned to the house and Esther proceeded on her errand. Her heart quickened as she reached the low wall that bounded the prison area. She wondered whether John, the baptizer, would recognize her. There were broad stone seats inset in the wall, doubtless for the convenience of sentries. Depositing the tray on one of the seats nearest the entrance, Esther inserted the huge key and was trying unsuccessfully to turn it in the obstinate lock when a resonant voice deep in the prison startled her with a suggestion, the key is crooked. Bear down on it, and a little to the left. There was no mistaking the identity of that haunting voice. Laboring with a protesting key, she pressed her weight hard against the massive door and it grudgingly opened. Over here, my daughter, called the voice. You are a stranger here. They faced each other at the barred window and peered through the gloom. It's you. She murmured. Did we not have an appointment to meet here? It's so dark. You will be ill. I do miss the sunshine, that is true. You wouldn't try to run away if I gave you your breakfast outside? That might get you into trouble. But, there's no one at the palace who would know or care, provided you made no attempt to escape. Recovering the rusty key from the main door, Esther opened the cell and John came out shielding his cavernous eyes against the unaccustomed light. They sat down on the broad stone seat, with a tray between them. Tell me, where have you been? He ate hungrily, but listened intently while she talked of her experiences as a solitary tramp on the way to Tiberias. And have you seen him of whom I told you? asked John eagerly. No, but I have heard of him. On the day I arrived, a young fisherman who befriended me told his shipmates about a strange carpenter who healed diseases and spoke words of comfort to the people, gently admonishing them to bear their own and others' burdens. Gently? I could hardly believe, sir, that this carpenter was the one of whom you spoke. She hesitated here, wishing she had not ventured so far upon a subject of which she knew so little. Perhaps I misunderstood the young fisherman, or perhaps I had misunderstood you. I had thought of him as a frowning man with a stern voice, on an errand of vengeance. Apparently that is a mistake. Tell me more, daughter. He demanded earnestly. With that, Esther reviewed all she could remember of the report made by the dreamy young fisherman. The carpenter had spoken with a strangely soothing voice, seemingly not of this world. No, there had been no talk of divine retribution, no threats of doom, indeed, no scolding at all. The man had urged the people to find their happiness within themselves, seeing they would never be free of their enslavement to foreign masters. And, no talk at all about the mighty being thrown from their seats and the exaltation of the poor? Esther shook her head. After an uncertain moment, she said, I shall go and hear him for myself. I'm sure I can get permission to leave the palace for a day or two. If the man is not too far away. Do that. Entreated John. Find out what manner of man he is. Then, come and tell me. He rose and marched toward his cell. Esther turned the big key. It hurts me to do this, she said softly. It was noon when she reached the cottage in Bethsaida. With a cry of happy surprise, Hannah ran to meet her at the gate. They embraced each other with tenderness. You came home. Exulted Hannah. I hope they have not mistreated you. No, they had not mistreated her, and she would be going back to her work tomorrow. But now, she was on a special errand the strangest of errands. Over the dining table, for Hannah had insisted on preparing their luncheon, Esther told the story of the hermit and his gruesome predictions, and his queries about the carpenter. Everyone seems to be excited about him, said Hannah. Last night the neighbors were saying that he was leaving Hamad and heading this way. I wonder you have not gone out to hear him yourself, Hannah, said Esther. Hannah seemed confused and did not at once reply. I might have done so, dear. But, 
Poor Simon, who for some reason has been living on his ship, might decide to come home, and I ought to be here. I should be much embarrassed, and I fear he would be very angry, if he came home to find that I had been away listening to this carpenter. That would be very offensive to Simon. Let us go, this afternoon, Hannah, begged Esther. We would be home before supper time. Simon is not likely to return earlier. Presently they were in the stream of pedestrian traffic on the highway. All that Saida, it seemed, was on the march southward, the elderly stabbing their canes into the dusty road as they pegged along intent upon their singular quest, the younger men and women overtaking and passing them, sick people of all ages borne on litters, sightless people being led much too fast for their comfort. There was very little talk. Apparently no words were suitable to this strange pilgrimage. The urge to hurry was contagious. Esther and Hannah immediately caught it and lengthened their steps. Hurry. The voiceless crowd said, hurry. Something is happening that never happened before and may never happen again. We must not miss this marvel. Hurry. Esther and Hannah glanced into the strained faces of their companions, and then briefly sought each other's sober eyes, but exchanged no comments. Their throats were dry with the fast travel, the choking dust, the half-frightened anticipation. Yes, this carpenter, whether he was John's carpenter or not, was bringing sleepy little Galilee to life, was turning stolid little Galilee upside down, was driving conservative little Galilee stark, staring mad. No need to inquire the way. A mile south of Bethsaida a freshly made highway veered off sharply toward the west, traversed a grove, riddled a vineyard, toppled a stone fence, muddied a creek, and fanned out into an open pasture swarming with thousands of people. On a knoll, surrounded by a pressing throng, stood the man they had come to see. Apparently he had but now arrived, for he was not yet speaking. He was waiting, with folded hands and a faraway look in his eyes as if in calm contemplation of the distant mountains. There was no expression of surprise or gratification that so great a multitude had done him honor. Now he had slowly raised his arms. The people grew more quiet. He lowered his arms in a gesture that requested them to sit down. Nobody was willing to obey, for all wanted to see everything that might happen. The gesture was calmly repeated, and the people closest to the front sat down. Then, like a long, incoming tidal wave, the impulse swept the throng until all were seated. The carpenter held up an outspread hand and there was silence, a peculiar silence, not a mere cessation of sound and confusion, but a vital, unifying silence that made them kin. They did not shrink from the accidental touch of a neighbor's elbow, though the stranger had a ragged sleeve. When he began to speak, Esther instantly remembered what young Johnny had said about this man's voice. He spoke effortlessly, but his words were clearly reaching to the outskirts of the great assembly. The uncanny thing about the voice was that it was speaking to you. To you alone. There was a tone of quiet entreaty in it. Come, let us talk it over together. He was speaking about the blessed life, the abundant life. How few had been far visioned enough to claim that perfect life for their own. A life freed of fear and foreboding, freed of frets and suspicions, freed of the sweating greed for perishable things. This was the life he offered, a life of enduring peace in the midst of the world's clamors and confusions. Esther's senses yielded to it. All about her she could see and feel the people relax as she herself was relaxing in obedience to the voice. She had never realized before that her body and mind had been continually at tension. The carpenter's peace invited her spirit. He was defining the terms of it now. Anyone could possess it. It was to be had for the asking, but one must seek for it, work for it, and, if need be, suffer for it. It was like living water, drawn from a never-flowing spring. Once you had tasted of it, you would never again be satisfied without it. It might cost you many a sacrifice, but it would be worth the price. Esther, dreamily content, felt that any price would be reasonable. Maybe she wouldn't feel this way tomorrow, but it seemed reasonable and attainable now, here, today, under the spell of the quiet voice. Personal peace, the carpenter was saying, gave you personal power, not the kind of power that the world had to offer you for ambitious striving but the peace power of the Father's kingdom. If you must let everything go to possess that peace power, let it go. If an oppressor demands your cloak, give up your cloak, and your coat, too, but keep your peace power. Do not insist upon justice. There had been much too much talk about justice, and not nearly enough talk about mercy. There is an old saying among us, he went on, an old saying that our fathers believed and practiced, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Esther had been brought up on that ancient adage. Whatever injury another person does to you, 
Simple Justice recommended that you repay it in kind. But the carpenter was saying that we must have done with that eye for an eye justice, in the interest of mercy and peace. Henceforth, if you would possess the blessed life, you must do unto others what you would like to have them do unto you. The blessed life sounded very attractive. Esther was sensing an intimation of its richness. She sighed, shut her eyes, and involuntarily shook her head, for she had an eye for an eye vow to keep. The carpenter had ended his speaking now and to the obvious surprise of the multitude he sat down on the grassy knoll, apparently very weary. The crowd shifted its posture a little, straightened its spine, recrossed its cramped legs, but remained seated. Loosed from her deep reverie, Esther turned inquiring eyes toward Hannah, who drew a long breath and shook her head mystifiedly. Esther, she whispered, there never was anyone like him, never, never before, in this world. There's something very queer about all this, agreed Esther. Hannah leaned closer and was about to speak again when a stir and a murmur in the densely packed crowd fronting the knoll brought them to attention. Two little children, a boy of six and a girl of four, had run up the slope and seated themselves on either side of the fatigued carpenter. Perhaps he had beckoned to them. But no, for now their mothers were hurrying forward to bring them back. The carpenter was shaking his head, apparently insisting that they let the children remain with him. Now. More little children broke loose from their parents and were clambering up the bank. They huddled closely about him. More and more children joined the party. They sat, blinking and squinting against the sun, seemingly intent upon what he was saying to them, in a low tone and inaudible to the multitude. From throughout the great assembly, scores of children, tugged by some irresistible invitation, were rushing forward, stumbling heedlessly over grown-up legs. One thin-faced little fellow was limping painfully up the slope leaning his frail body against a crutch. The carpenter, still speaking, had motioned to the children to open a path for the lame boy, and they edged over to give him room. Now a spontaneous O. Oh, went up from the people close enough to see clearly what was happening. Without pausing in his gentle speech, the carpenter had reached out his hand for the crutch. The boy had hesitated before giving it up, but now he stood on both feet, erect and confident. He took a few experimental steps. Now, Apparently overcome by the amazing thing that had happened to him, he knelt down, pressed his face hard against the carpenter's knee, and cried. And so did everybody else. Raising his voice to embrace the multitude, the carpenter spoke. These children come to me because, in their innocence, they are of the Father's kingdom. And if you, too, would be of this kingdom, you must enter it with the heart of a child. He then spoke a final word to the little ones alone and they arose. The boy who had been lame marched down the slope with shining eyes. Intent upon his reunion with his parents, who had pressed forward to meet him, the crowd was not immediately aware of the carpenter's retreat down the further side of the knoll. The people remained seated, thinking that after he had rested, for he seemed quite spent with weariness, he might return and speak again. But it soon became evident that the day's events had ended. In groups the multitude began to scramble to their feet. There was almost no conversation as the great crowd broke up and strolled back toward the highway. Hannah and Esther, hand in hand, too deeply moved for any talk, trudged slowly along with the other awe-stricken people who had had a brief, mystifying glimpse into a kingdom that was not of this world. Far in advance of them, striding along alone, with slumped shoulders and bent head, was Simon. The women's eyes met diffidently. Nothing was said for a long moment. Then Hannah murmured, Now we know what ails him. It's this Jesus. A tall, handsome, self-assured young sentry was pacing back and forth in front of the prison when Esther appeared, next morning, with John's breakfast tray. He came briskly to attention as she approached, saluted gracefully, and made a candid inventory of her, with brightly approving eyes. You have come to feed the prisoner? He inquired unnecessarily, and when Esther had smiled an affirmative, he said, he is a lucky fellow. Yes, isn't he? drawled Esther. Such a nice place to spend these lovely autumn days. Let me have that tray, said the sentry, putting down his spear and extending his hands. I'll give it to him, and while he is eating we will get acquainted. My name is Algerius. And my name is Esther. She smiled, but held on to the tray. And the girl in the kitchen is Claudia, who is expecting you to come and have some honey cakes while I'm giving your prisoner his breakfast. I don't know about that, demurred the sentry taking off his heavy helmet and mopping his brow. If my captain were to hear of this, I should be flogged. And besides, his voice lowered conspiratorially, I'd much rather stay here and talk to you. What about? She demanded, suddenly cool. 
Algerius readjusted his helmet and picked up his spear. You say her name is Claudia? Yes, and you needn't hurry back. I will be responsible for the prisoner. Here's the key then. I have one. Sure you aren't afraid? Of the prisoner? No. He is very respectful. She put the tray down on the low stone wall. And I am not, grumbled the lingering sentry, with a grin. You could be, I think, with a little more practice, and quite a lot of encouragement. Having given the sentry time to be well on his way, she unlocked the door and invited John to come out into the sunshine. I heard you tell the sentry your name, daughter, he said, when they had sat down together. Would you like to call me Esther? She handed him a goblet of grape juice which he sniffed suspiciously. It is not fermented, she said. I pressed it only a few moments ago. Claudia told me you could not drink wine. I am a Nazarite. He touched the goblet with his lips experimentally, and then sipped it with relish. Do the people of Nazareth not drink wine? I do not mean that I am of Nazareth. I am a Nazarite, which is a different thing altogether. There is a monastic order among us known as the Nazarites. We take a vow, or, as in my own case, it is taken for us at our birth, chastity, poverty, abstinence. Esther offered him the plate of wheat and bread. He put down the goblet and broke one of the small loaves. That doesn't seem quite fair, she ventured, to have had a vow imposed upon you when you were only a baby. I have never regretted it, he said. It is a good life. A shy, unexpected smile lighted his deep eyes. And my name is John. It would please me, after so long away from home, to hear my name spoken by a friend. What a lonely life you have had. Not until recently. I have spent many years in solitude, pursuant to my Nazarite vow, but they had been spent under the open sky. I was not unhappy. But here, in this dark prison, I am quite desolate, friendless, and strangely beset with forebodings. He turned toward her with anxious eyes. Tell me, daughter, were you able to see him? She had hoped to postpone this query as long as possible, for she was unprepared to answer it to his satisfaction. Yes, sir, John. I saw and heard him yesterday afternoon. There was the greatest multitude I ever saw. It was gathered about him, in a pasture, not far from Bethsaida. I was amazed to see so many people. I wondered where they all came from. It was. He had been studying her face intently, as she laboriously put off the moment when she must tell him what manner of man she had seen. Divining her difficulty, he broke in upon her hesitations. You were disappointed, I think. No, John. I was not disappointed, but I fear you will be. This man does not seem to be an avenger. He speaks with the most gentle, entreating voice I ever heard, a soothing voice that makes you very quiet, inside. He did not talk about punishment in store for wrongdoers, nor did he say that the mighty would be dragged from their seats, nor that those of low degree would be exalted. But he spoke peace and courage to the poor. She paused for a long moment. And little children crowded about him, and he cured a small boy of his lameness. John stared hard at his prison door and drew a deep sigh. Begin at the beginning then, he said huskily, and tell me everything. So Esther began at the beginning and told him everything she could remember, the wistful, hurrying pilgrimage on the road, the great mass of people in the field, the placid voice that reached far and tugged hard at your heart, the silent, breathless, yearning multitude, the uncanny sensation of peace. I can feel a little of it yet, she went on dreamily. While he spoke. This peculiar peace laid hold on me so fully that I wished, above all things, that I might possess it forever. Conscious that John had come out of his moody reverie, and was giving her better attention, she turned toward him and continued, I think that everyone in the vast crowd must have felt the same way. I found myself hoping that he would not stop, for while he spoke my heart grew still, and all the things that ever have troubled me were forgotten. Apparently his voice wrought a strange spell on the minds of the people, reflected John. Surely you should know, sir, said Esther, for when I heard you speaking to a great crowd, everyone listened intently to your voice. But the carpenter's voice was different, I think. She nodded her head slowly, and groped for the words that might define that difference without hurting him. Your voice, John, stunned me, and made me afraid of the days to come. The carpenter's voice stilled me, and gave me peace. I feel a little of it today, but it is leaving me, and I am sorry. Again she was silent for a time. Do you know, she went on, suddenly confident, I believe that if one could really get acquainted with him, and stay close beside him for a while, one might learn how to keep it. Perhaps there are others who feel the same way, wondered John. 
Does he seem to have any close friends about him? She didn't know. She had not noticed any special companions with him, on the knoll or when he departed. Why don't you try to meet him face to face, Esther? suggested John. If he is so gentle and kindly disposed, might he not be willing to talk with you? But what right would I have to intrude upon him when he is already so overburdened and weary? Go to him with a message, from me, said John, in a tone of command. Say to him that I have given my life to foretell the coming of the anointed one. Ask him if he knows anything about that, about me. Ask him, in my name, if he is the one I foretold or are we to expect another. Esther gave a little smile and shook her head. I'm afraid I couldn't do that, John. He isn't the sort of person one walks up to with such a query. But I must know. Can't you see that my very life depends on my knowing? Will you not try? Let me think about it, she said soberly. That's a very large assignment, for a girl. I agree, conceded John. It is indeed a large assignment, for a girl, or for anybody, for a rabbi, or the high priest, or the tetrarch himself. But you have already undertaken a very serious and dangerous errand which shows the courage that is in you. Do this, for me. He challenged her silent indecision with urgent eyes, and waited. I will try, she whispered. It was on the same morning, but much earlier, the morning of the 26th day of Tishri, a day to be remembered, that Simon rose from his uncomfortable narrow bunk on shipboard, resolved that he would go again today into the country and hear Jesus speak. And he was resolved also that if circumstances permitted he would try to stand close enough to the carpenter to be of some aid in keeping the selfish, jostling multitude from wearing the man out with their thoughtless importunities. He had slept hardly at all, last night, for thinking about this, imagining himself standing protectingly at Jesus' side, keeping the crowd back, admonishing the cot-bearers to take their time and remain in line, and not push in ahead of others who had got there first. Surely someone should be doing this for Jesus, and why not he? For he was tall and strong, and the people might listen to his demand that they keep in order. He was quite alone on the ship, having sent young Thad home at nightfall. He had wanted to be alone, for his thoughts were incommunicable and he did not want the boy to be bewildered and distressed by his moody silence. A grayish-blue light was showing faintly in the east, presaging dawn. The autumn mist hung low on the water, obscuring the beach. Simon walked forward, lowered a bucket, and carried the water into the little galley where he washed his face. Then he broke one of the barley loaves that Hannah had sent him and emerged from the galley, munching the bread dutifully but without relish, for he was wholly preoccupied with his thoughts about the day's possible adventures. Strolling aft, he climbed over the side of the Abigail, boarded the Sarah, and sauntered across to her starboard taffrail, where he stood scanning the faraway eastern mountains. The whole range would show pink presently. His eyes drifted about to the northwesterly shore. If the fog lifted a little, he might be able to see whether Japheth's old boat was still afloat. He thought he heard a voice on the shore, and turned about, narrowing his eyes in an effort to pierce the fog, but he could see nothing. Hello? He called, funneling his lips with his hands. Hello? Came the voice and Simon wondered if it might be an echo, but, no, it didn't sound like his voice. His heart was beating strangely. He waited and listened, cupping his ear with his hand. The dawn was coming now, coming fast, leaping over the mountains, pouring down upon the sea. Leaning far across the rail, Simon peered hard into the dissolving mist that enveloped the shore. He made out a dim figure standing on the beach, close to the water's edge. The stranger waved his upraised arm, and Simon, after a moment of indecision, put up his hand and waved it. The fog was lifting. Again the stranger waved his hand, and called, Simon. There was no mistaking that voice. For there was no other voice like it in the world, or ever had been. Coming. Shouted Simon, hoarse with excitement. His throat was dry and his big hands trembled as he vaulted over the rail and dropped into a rocking dory. He was an experienced oarsman, but no one observing would have thought so from the awkwardness of his nervous flailings and splashings. It seemed a long voyage, but eventually he arrived, very much out of breath, and dragged the dory up on the sand. Limp with emotion, his face twitching, he found himself staring mystifiedly into the calm, friendly eyes of Jesus. He dropped to his knees. He felt the wonder-working hands on his bent shoulders and experienced the same sensation that had thrilled him when their bare arms had touched, at Hamat. Now Jesus was speaking, quietly but insistently. Simon, son of Jonas, I have need of you. But I am a very sinful man, Master, confessed Simon thickly. I have come to save sinners, my son, said Jesus. 
How can I help you, master? I am only a fisherman. Simon's voice was barely audible now, for his pent-up emotion was choking him. You are to remain a fisherman always, Simon, said Jesus. But, from this day forward you will fish for men. Humbly and penitently, Simon bowed himself far forward, his eyes overflowing. Now the invigorating hands were laid gently upon his shaggy head. It gave him a strange feeling of exaltation. Come, said Jesus softly. Arise, Simon, and follow me. And Simon arose, and followed Jesus. But instead of leading the big fisherman to the highway, and south through Bethsaida and on into the country near Hamat, as Simon had expected, Jesus walked northward, keeping close to the shore. He had asked Simon to follow him, and Simon was obeying, trudging along through the sand, a few cubits behind him, and making no effort to come abreast, though Jesus was walking slowly. In this manner they proceeded for half a mile, in silence. It seemed strange to the big fisherman that he could so complacently consent to follow the carpenter without asking him where they were going. It had been his intention to go out into the country today and volunteer his services as a strong-armed bodyguard to help keep the jostling people from harassing Jesus with their importunities. He could do that, he thought, without making any alterations in his own beliefs or behavior. Now, it seemed, he was expected to join cause with Jesus, and fish for men, had anyone, the servant girl Anna, for example. Had Anna asked him, a week ago, whether he had a notion of following Jesus, he would have sworn a surly oath and spat on the ground. Now he was following Jesus, and with a curious sense of peace, for the mysterious calmness that had briefly possessed him, yesterday afternoon, had returned. Japheth's old boat was lazily rocking at anchor, some three hundred yards offshore, a dory bobbing at her stern. Doubtless the Zebedee boys were aboard preparing to sail early to a fishing ground. Jesus stepped slow to a stop here. He turned about, silently regarded Simon with an inquiring smile, and then shifted his gaze seaward. For a long moment Simon stood beside him, indecisively stroking his chin. Then he moved toward one of the beach dories, pushed it into the water, climbed in, shipped the oars, and began to pull steadily toward the storm-battered fishing smack. Facing astern, he kept his eyes fixed on Jesus, who remained standing on the shore. After a while, as Simon neared the old boat where James and John were awaiting him at the rail, Jesus waved a hand, turned about, and moved southward toward the highway. Chapter 9 After a fortnight's diligent search for Farah, everyone but Boldy gave it up. With tireless persistence, but waning hope, the loyal young fellow had continued his quest, investigating every square cubit of terrain which she might have covered in a reckless midnight ride. He had even gone to the length of having himself lowered over precipices to the unexplored depths of bramble choke chasms into which she might have fallen, and had vigorously queried shepherds in pasture lands so far remote that the possibility of their having any information for him was inconceivable. He had pestered the grief-stricken Ion with questions until she fled at the sight of him. The plight of the once so well-balanced and self-contained Ion was indeed pitiable. Upon the death of Arnon and the disappearance of Farah, King Zendi had taken their helpless servants into his own household where the older of them fitted at once into the well-remembered routines of a king's establishment. But the inconsolable Greek slave seemed dazed. Everyone thought that she was going mad. According to report, Ione sat all day alone in a far corner of the female servants' quarters, occasionally breaking into hysterical weeping, and, when anyone approached her, would shrink back terrified as if expecting a blow. Advised of her appalling condition, Voldy had left off hoping that she might be able to furnish a clue. Of course there were many who recalled the fantastic vow that Farah had taken when hardly more than a child, but it seemed beyond all reason that she would have set off alone on a mission so palpably impossible. To clear the air of these speculations, and, more particularly, to dissuade the now frantic Voldy from his half-formed decision to seek for her in faraway Galilee, the king and his counselors held a conference in which the matter was fully discussed. And when it was ready to adjourn, Voldy was invited in to learn the outcome of their parley. Disheartened and ill, for his fatigue and sleepless anxiety had worn him thin, he listened dejectedly while King Zendi reported their unanimous opinion. It was their firm belief, solemnly declared Zendi, that no young woman in her right mind, as far as it had seemed to be, would attempt a solitary expedition into a hostile country with the intention of assassinating its well-fortified king and it was the considered judgment of the council that any effort to seek for her in that region would be an act of sheer lunacy. Were the stronghold of Tetrarch Antipas situated twenty miles beyond the Jordan, continued Sendi, a thousand experienced cavalrymen might risk making an attack, but that a seventeen-year-old girl would travel, unattended, 
over 70 leagues of bandit-infested territory, to wreak vengeance upon a king in his fortress, was too preposterous to be believed even by a courageous young man whose loyalty and love and sorrow had driven him to desperation. After Zendi had spoken there was a long silence which suggested that Boldy might defend his foolish idea if he desired, but he did not speak. Old Duma cleared his throat to add a word. Even if she had been mad enough to attempt it, she would have come to grief long before now. Boldy suddenly raised his head. Do you mean, sir, that she may have been imprisoned? Or worse, muttered Duma. At that, Boldy rose from his place, fell on his knees before the king, and cried, I can no longer bear this anxiety, sire. I entreat you. Let me go and search for her in Jewry. Old Mishma, seated beside the king, whispered a suggestion. Zendi motioned Voldy to arise and told him to wait outside. It was a full hour before they called him back. The councillors had risen from their seats and seemed restless to be off. At the request of your honored grandfather, Voldy, we are permitting you to go. We will give you a certificate of your Arabian citizenship. Requesting safe passage through all Jewry. You realize that this document does not have the value which would be accorded it in Macedonia, Petra, Cyprus, or Rome. If you get into trouble over there in Judea or Galilee, it will be your own affair. We wish you well, my son, but if you do not return, no one will search for you. While Zendi was speaking, Voldy's grateful eyes drifted to his grandfather's sober face. What a grand old man was Mishma. When the king had finished, Voldy bowed deeply. Zendi laid a hand on his shoulder and wished him a safe journey. I shouldn't let you do it, he added. If his majesty were in my place, ventured Voldy. He would take the chance, I think. What weapons will you carry? inquired Zendi. Only a dagger, sire. Very good. It is better not to bear conspicuous arms. And try to avoid controversies, however trivial. And don't draw your dagger unless you intend to use it. Another thing, you should be well provided with money. Voldy's heart skipped a beat. He hadn't thought much about money. He had never carried money with him, never had had occasion to use money. Old Mishma instantly lifted that weight. He shall have ample funds, my lord. Voldy impetuously reached for his grandfather's hand, and gripped it. Zandi stepped down from the dais, and was moving away. Arabia should be proud of you both, he said. At Mishma's request, Voldy rode home with him. It had been a long time since he had seen his grandfather in the saddle, and his heart swelled with admiration as he watched the effortless skill with which the old man handled the impatient bay stallion. Mishma's posture in the saddle was a score of years younger than his deep-lined face. They had little to say until they reached the old councillor's gate, there they drew their horses together. Shall we say goodbye, sire? Presently. Come in. Dismounting, they entered the luxurious living quarters of Mishma's home. He disappeared into the adjacent bedroom and returned with a newly made money belt. It was heavy with gold, so heavy that when Voldy took it he nearly dropped it. It is the amount you would have inherited my boy. Was it not dangerous, sire, to have so much gold in your possession? True, but I have not had it many days. Then, you had prepared it, for me? I thought, at least a fortnight ago, that you would follow her. It is a great grief to me, Boldy. But I cannot detain you. It was a memorable moment. Their voices were low. They were both deeply stirred. I shall not expect to see you again. I am old. Mishma's words were barely audible. He was talking mostly to himself. I had dreamed of you as a counselor. We must give that up now. Whether you find her or not, we have already lost that opportunity. But, I cannot find it in my heart to rebuke you. As I grow older my ideas of values change. The girl is courageous. Not much wonder if you love her enough to throw your life away for her. You may not find her. I doubt whether you will. If she is lost, do not hurry to return. You will have sufficient funds for a considerable amount of foreign travel. If you find her, you will marry her. Do not bring her back here. You would both be unhappy, Mishma rose heavily and laid his hands on Voldy's shoulders. Go now, my brave boy, and comfort your mother. After the painful scene in his own home, where Kitra, having made a valorous effort to control her feelings, finally gave way to a complete emotional breakdown, Voldy galloped away to pay his final respects to the king and receive his worthless passport. At the last minute it occurred to him to say farewell to Ione, but the servants couldn't find her. Mounting his tall black gelding he rode away at a brisk trot toward the trail that descended to the valley of Ain. A few hundred yards ahead, a woman stepped out of the wild shrubbery and waved an arm. 
It was Ion, thin and haggard, but surprisingly animated. There was no accounting for the caprices of an ailing mind. Ion, who had sunk to the depths of melancholy, now seemed almost happy. Voldy reined in his horse, and stopped beside her. Good, Voldy. She cried excitedly. Go and find her. Here is a little gift for you. She handed up a parcel. It was about the shape and size of a baby's pillow, and soft to the touch. A scarf that she had knitted for him, perhaps, encased in an envelope of fine linen securely stitched on all sides. Am I to open it now, Ion? Asked Baldy. No, no. You've no time for that. It's just a little present. She turned away, waving her hand and smiling. May all the gods attend you, Baldy. She shouted as he put the spurs to Darik and rode on. But Ion's strange behavior stirred his curiosity. A few days ago she was unapproachable, depressed, fear-harried, and clearly out of her head. Now that she had learned of his intention to search for Farah in Galilee, she was exultant. Perhaps she knew more than she had told about the events of that night when Farah had disappeared. He tried to reason it out. Ion had been sworn to secrecy. That was what had driven her crazy. In spite of all the opinions to the contrary, Farah had unquestionably started for Galilee, intending to keep her vow. Voldy was on the right track, there could be no doubt of that. It made him impatient to press on. But when he considered the many possible misfortunes she might have encountered, he despaired of finding her alive, unharmed. That night he stopped for food and shelter at an unpromising caravansary situated on a small oasis at the southernmost tip of the Dead Sea. After an abominable supper prepared by a sullen, wizened old woman, he inquired of the testy innkeeper, presumably her husband, whether a well-favored young Arabian woman had ridden past that way on a bay filly, or perhaps rested there, some two weeks ago. And when the surly old fellow, with a frown and protruding lips, had shaken his head, Voldy prodded hard at his memory. Was he sure? Of course he was sure. Would he be likely, he growled, to forget such a strange and pleasant sight? A young woman traveling alone in this country? No, sir, you could depend on him to remember seeing a well-favored young woman. He chuckled slyly, and his withered old spouse scowled at him, which made him laugh unpleasantly. Then Voldy tried to probe the old woman's recollection, but she hadn't seen a pretty young woman, alone, on a horse, here or anywhere else, ever in her life, which seemed to dispose of her as a witness. Though it was still early in the evening, there was little to do but retire. They lighted a candle for him and pointed out the wretched hovel where he was to lodge. Shouldering his saddlebags, he groped his way into the filthy and meagerly furnished hut. Quite weary but not ready to sleep, he sat down on the edge of the dirty cot, and for lack of any other occupation decided to see what Ion had given him. Taking the parcel from his pack, he attacked the fine stitches with the point of his dagger. It was a tedious and exasperating task, for Ion had done her work well. At length he laid the cover back and his eyes widened with astonishment. The linen sheath contained a long, heavy braid of hair. Whose, but Farah's? Voldy took it up and held it against his cheek. He pressed his lips to it. His eyes were misty. Gradually the implications of Ion's gift dawned upon him, and he muttered an ejaculation of sudden understanding. Farah was impersonating a young man. This was Ion's way of telling him that he should not make inquiries about a girl. He was to look for a man. How dared Farah take such a risk? But here was the incontrovertible evidence that she had done so. Poor Ion wasn't as crazy as they thought. Voldy was exultant, but not for long. His apprehension soon cooled his joy. How could Farah hope to preserve so difficult an incognito? Sooner or later she must be discovered, and be worse off for her disguise. He went to sleep, after hours of wakefulness, with the tender trophy on his pillow. Awake at dawn, he found his taciturn host pottering about in the stable yard. Let me ask you this question, said Voldy sternly. Did you see a young man, an Arabian, in these parts about a fortnight ago, riding a bay filly? That I did, sir, replied the old man, a handsome young fellow he was, and very well dressed, too. He stopped here, slept in the same room you had last night. Uh, what a room, growled Voldy. The old man chuckled shamelessly. That other young Arab didn't like the room, either. You should have heard him. Upon my word, sir, that young fellow could swear like a drunken sailor. I never heard such a mouthful of curses. Some of them were new words that I didn't know. Voldy looked puzzled for a minute, and then laughed. A pretty rough youngster, was he? He was indeed, sir. He must be very rich, used to having his own way. 
He ordered us about as if we were slaves, though I must say he was not stingy. Why didn't you tell me about him last night when I asked you? The old fellow's jaw sagged and a look of comprehension came into his crafty eyes. But you inquired about a young woman. He countered. Might this young man you're asking for be the young woman you thought you wanted to know about last night? He threw back his grizzled head and cackled shrilly. We thought there was something queer about him. He. He. Well, I still say that nobody ever cursed like that on this oasis, and many's the camel driver we've put up. Voldy broke out into loud laughter several times on his way to end Getty, but he had his sober moments too. Farah was indeed playing for high stakes. She might deceive the grumpy old pair at the filthy caravansary, but it was a long way to Galilee. At Tengedi the young Arabian, of a fortnight ago, was promptly remembered. A proud, haughty young fellow? queried the innkeeper, and when Voldy had nodded, he went on, do I remember him? Rich, he was. Rode a frisky bay mare with enough silver on her bridle and enough jewels on his riding whip to have bought everything in my house. Did you find him just a bit, disagreeable? Pressed Baldy. Just a bit. Grinned the innkeeper sourly. He swore at me in three languages, Aramaic, Arabian, and Greek. He swore at the servants in Latin. Nothing pleased him. Voldy tried to be serious, but he couldn't restrain a chuckle. That's the fellow I'm looking for, he said. He's a tough one, and no mistake. Did you notice which way he went when he left? The old salt trail. Said he was headed for the port, and if he wasn't robbed before he got there, they probably cleaned him out in Gaza. Any man's a fool to ride through that pest hole alone, even in broad daylight. Did you warn him of that? No, I didn't. Snapped the innkeeper. He was so damn sure of himself. It wasn't any of my business if he got into trouble. I think my friend would be able to take care of himself, bragged Voldy, with much more confidence than he felt. He certainly could with his mouth, rejoined the innkeeper. Yes, and with his dagger too. Retorted Voldy, wishing he spoke the truth. As he rode on, early the next morning, on the busy highway, his mind was troubled. So many misadventures might have confronted Farah. These lean, lazy, ragged fellows who led the camels in the long caravans, what might they not do to annoy and provoke a solitary rider who had taken no pains to conceal his wealth and rating? And the hawk-nosed, beady-eyed caravan directors who looked Voldy over with such candid impudence, what would Farah's disguise amount to if they insisted on questioning her closely? Apparently she had felt that to be convincing in her new role she must be noisy and arrogant. Voldy hoped she wasn't overdoing it. She might meet someone who wouldn't be favorably impressed by her swagger and profanity. The poor dear wouldn't last very long in a fight. At Old Hebron he made inquiries at the two inns, but nobody remembered seeing a well-to-do young Arabian on a bay filly. After a couple of hours spent in asking questions, Voldy decided that Farah must have ridden directly on through the historic town without pausing. He fed and watered his horse, lunched briefly at the principal inn, and proceeded on his journey. It was a more fertile country now, and the donkey carts were coming into the highway laden with melons, grapes, grain, and green forage. A few miles west of Hebron, near a crossroad, Voldy saw a rider approaching who stirred his interest, for the beautiful bay mare he rode far too good for the unkempt, loudish fellow astride, bore a striking resemblance to Farah's Sadie. Slowing to a walk, as the distance between them lessened, Voldy's suspicions were confirmed. The stocky, shaggy fellow with the ragged tunic and the uncombed beard couldn't have afforded a mount of such value. His dark brown skin identified him as an Edomine, which was not to his credit. He was riding bareback. The disgraceful old bridle was a patchwork of straps and hempen cords, no fit equipment for a thoroughbred. As they neared each other, the shifty-eyed Idamin, now aware that he was being carefully scrutinized, dug his heels savagely into the filly's ribs, apparently determined to pass quickly. Voldy instantly wheeled Darik across the road, blocking Sadie to an abrupt stop. What do you mean by that? yelled the loud in the thick guttural of half-civilized Edumia. How did you come by this filly? demanded Voldy. Who wants to know? retorted the Idamin. I do, fellow. shouted Voldy. She belongs to a friend of mine. Here, Sadie. He held out his hand. Sadie's nostrils fluttered. She tipped up her ears and took an inquiring step forward, her rider jerking the reins to restrain her. This mare belongs to me. Growled the enraged Idamin. I bought her many months ago. Hands off that bridle now, or it will be the worse for you. No, the mare has been stolen. She does not belong to you. I see you have disposed of the saddle and bridle. 
Perhaps you can tell me what became of the young Arabian who owns her. What are you going to do about it, youngster? Sneered the Idamine, uncoiling a well-worn bullwhip. Will you let me pass, or won't you? Not until you answer my question, said Voldy. The Idamine replied by drawing back his arm and lashing hard at Voldy's face with a long whip. Voldy had defensively thrown up an arm, but the thong bit sharply into his neck. Again the whip descended, raising the welt across the geldings with hers. He reared, and backed away. Neither the Arabian nor the Idamine seemed anxious to dismount and fight on the public highway. Already two market carts had drawn up to view the altercation. A camel train was bearing down on them from the west. Apparently apprehensive of trouble, the Idamine now wheeled the filly about, lashing cruelly at her flanks. Tearing loose from Voldy's grip, she bolted. At the crossing, her rider tugged her to the left, onto an unfrequented road, little more than a lane, with Voldy in pursuit at full gallop. Both horses were experienced racers. More than half a mile had been covered before Darik was abreast of Sidi. The country road had narrowed now, with dense thickets on either side. As Darik drew into the lead by a neck, the horses so close together that their shoulders grazed, Voldy, turning about, saw the Idamine leaning far forward with an upraised dagger poised for a stab in his back. He met the threat by striking the burly fellow full in the face with his riding whip. Urging his horse, he shouldered Sadie into the briars where, after a brief struggle to free herself, she stopped and stood quivering. The Idamine made no effort to go further. He dismounted now, as did Voldy. It was plain that he would be a very unsportsmanlike antagonist, as he had already proved. They threw off their coats, drew their daggers, and faced each other only a little way apart. The Idamine gingerly fingered the red welt on his cheek, and grinned. I am glad you followed, youngster, he snarled. This is a safer place for what I intend to do to you. Crouching, like an angry bull, he began advancing, weaving slowly to and fro, slipping his ragged sandals forward with short, calculated steps. Voldy remained standing erect, making no effort to assume a defensive posture. The stocky Idamine straightened and folded his arms, with an expression of bewilderment. Are you going to stand there, and let me kill you, without raising a finger? I thought you Arabians were fighters. Voldy seemed not to hear the taunt. He was staring, wide-eyed, down the road, past the Idamine's shoulder. Look! He shouted in amazement. His swarthy foe instantly jerked his head about to see what might be coming down on him from behind, and Voldy leapt on him, firmly clutching the wrist of his dagger hand. The Idamine drew back his free. Armin struck hard, sinking his big fist into the needle-sharp point of the Arabian's dagger. Now he had twisted his right hand loose, and raising his weapon, drove it toward Voldy's heart, but the dexterous Arabian dagger parried the thrust with a blade that opened a long, deep gash in the Idamine's forearm. The blood was dripping from the fingers of both his hands. Again he struck, desperately, but his arm was too badly injured to deliver an effective blow. Voldy caught at the bleeding wrist and twisted the dagger out of his hand. Then he clutched the weary Idamine's beard, jerked his head back, and pressed the flat of his blade against the bared throat. Where did you get that filly? shouted Voldy. Answer me quickly, or I'll kill you. The Idamine gritted his teeth and tried to tug loose, smearing his beard with his dripping hands. The Arabian's dagger point moved slightly, pricking the dirty neck. With that, the battle was over. The big fellow's knees buckled and he slumped to the ground, where he lay noisily sick. Voldy opened one of his saddle bags, tore up a towel, and bound it tightly above the spurting wound in the Idamine's arm. I have no interest in saving your life, horse thief, he said, as he tied the bandage, but I don't want you to die until you have told me where this filly was when you stole her. Weakly the Idamine confessed. It was a strange story, so strange that it could hardly have been invented. But why would Farah be a member of a great crowd? in a pasture field beside the Jordan, assembled to hear an itinerant prophet. It didn't sound like anything that Farah would be likely to do. No, mumbled the nauseated Idamine, he hadn't seen the man who owned the mare. He had followed the crowd, and at nightfall had found the filly tethered quite a little way apart from the other animals. No, he had seen nothing of a silver-mounted bridle or saddle. He had waited. Until the camp was asleep and had led the mare away, after a struggle with her that threatened discovery. Very well, said Voldy quietly. When you think you are through vomiting, we will be on our way to the spot where you found the filly. I can't do it, muttered the Idamine, I am too weak. You should have thought of that before you tried to stab me in the back, horse thief. Come on. Get up, 
or I'll slit your bandage and you can lie here and bleed to death. It was a tedious journey back to Hebron, and the riders drew many inquisitive stares from the people they passed on the highway. At the first public watering trough, the Idomeen was helped down to do a partial job of washing off the clotted blood. Fortunately for both of them, they encountered no patrols. East of Hebron they turned off the highway toward the north. It was late in the afternoon before they reached the pasture on the bank of the Jordan. The dead grass still showed the hard trampling of a huge multitude. There, pointed the ailing horse thief. That's where the mare had been staked out. Dismounting, Voldy walked about, surveying the landscape. What, he wondered, would Far be likely to do when she discovered that Sadie was gone? Did she have enough gold with her to buy another horse? Doubtless, for she was on a long journey and would not have started without funds. It was beyond belief that she would proceed on foot. Her contemplated trip would be hazardous enough without that added risk. No, he decided, Farah would have acquired a mount, of some sort. And now, what should he do with Sadie? She was not his property. He could not sell her into better hands, nor could he conveniently take her along with him. His journey involved enough danger. It would be difficult to explain a led horse this far away from home territory. After some debate with himself, he mounted and drew up facing the slumped Idomeen. He patted Farah's filly on her velvet muzzle. Goodbye, Sadie, he said, completely ignoring her rascally rider. I am sorry to leave you, but it can't be helped. Without a word to the bewildered Idomeen, he galloped away, wondering where, when, and whether, he would overtake Farah. Having had enough excitement for one day, Voldy put back to old Hebron for the night. Early the next morning he was on his way west again, past the crossroads where yesterday he had encountered the thieving Idomeen on through sleepy little Adaraim, whose bloody history, had he known it, might have stirred his interest. Frequently he paused to ask farmers, in their carts and at work in their fields, whether they remembered seeing a young Arabian pass that way, a little more than a fortnight ago. Not only was there no information to be had, but the surly replies indicated that their concern for traveling Arabians was lacking in enthusiasm. Indeed, they seemed very uncivil until Voldy speculated on the probable attitude of an Arabian shepherd if asked by a well-mounted Jew whether he had seen another Jew on the road some time ago. The shepherd would have seared him with comprehensive curses involving not only the Jew himself, but his parents, his uncle, his grandfather, and his heirs and assigns forever. A very pretty world, it was. These occasional detainments, while brief, added up to a considerable delay in the travel schedule he had planned, and it was late in the day when he arrived at the squalid old town of Lachish with 15 miles more to go before reaching Gaza. The moon was too young to be of much service for night riding. He drew up in the stable yard of the only inn, finding it almost empty, a bad sign. He had already learned that where one found plenty of room there was always an easily discoverable reason. A couple of laddish ostlers ambled forward to meet him, but he decided to attend personally to the comfort of his horse. While intent upon his task of rubbing down the faithful gelding, an operation that involved some quiet conversation between them to which Darik contributed an occasional nod and a playful nibble, Voldy became aware of a silent onlooker standing behind him. Turning, he met the amused eyes of a quite good-looking, well-dressed man of forty, obviously a Roman. Voldy straightened and they exchanged amiable greetings. You ate an Arabian, I think, said the Roman. Yes, sir. My name is Voldy. Mine is Mencius. The caravan I am accompanying is camped up the road a mile. My horse is lame, or pretending. I had hoped to find a horse leech here, but there is none, and these stable boys hardly know the time of day. Want me to take a look at him, sir? Asked Baldi. That would be very kind, Mencius said, if it isn't asking too much. You Arabians seem to know everything about horses. Not everything, protested Baldi. But we do know that they get tired on a long journey and go lame and the more intelligent they are, the worse they limp. Right. Chuckled Mencius. And sometimes they forget which leg it is and give themselves away. However, my horse may be telling the truth. They sauntered across to the other side of the compound, where a sleek white stallion was placidly munching his forage. Voldy stood silently watching him for so long that Mencius was moved to inquire whether he should lead the horse about for inspection. Not yet, said Voldy absently, studying the animal's posture. Presently the stallion raised his right forefoot and set it down gingerly. Voldy immediately approached, patted the horse's withers, ran his hand down the leg to the fetlock, and gently lifted the foot for inspection. Mencius hovered close. Badly shod, said Voldy. 
the left wall of the hoof has been pared deeper than the right, throwing the pastern joint off balance. He called to one of the roustabouts and inquired whether there was a farrier in the neighborhood. The oaf nodded. I'm afraid no farrier we're likely to find in this place will do us much good, observed Mencius. That's true, but his tools may, said Voldy. If we can get into his shop, I'll reset the shoe myself. Do you mean to say you know how to shoe a horse? Mencius' astonishment was so sincere that Boldy laughed. On the way to the farrier's shop he went on to explain how every Arabian boy was a horse doctor by instinct. I never let a farrier touch my Darik's feet, he said, and we have some skillful farriers, too. Again Boldy laughed boyishly as he noted the puzzled expression on the Roman's face, and added, our farriers are much better paid than our scribes. Perhaps that's why Arabia rides more gracefully than she reads. Mencius smiled a little at this drollery but apparently wasn't quite sure whether he approved of the handsome young Arab's careless lack of interest in education, he had taken an instant liking to Voldy and didn't want to think of him as a shameless illiterate. Mencius, without meaning to be, was a bit of a snob when it came to the question of education. Stripping off his tunic and handing it to Mencius, who couldn't help noting the fineness of its texture and workmanship, Voldy, with the consent of the bewildered farrier, sorted out a few rusty tools, dexterously removed and readjusted the badly balanced shoe, gripping the stallion's foreleg hard between his knees while driving the nails, to lessen the jar on the sensitive pastern joint. Hearing a subdued conversation, in Greek, he glanced up briefly to observe that Mencius had been joined by another Urbane Roman, his junior and apparently his subordinate. Mencius was doing the talking, and it was obvious that Boldy was not expected to understand it. See how cleverly he does that, Pincus, Mencius was saying. Loves horses, wants to spare them any unnecessary discomfort. Horses. That's all he lives for. It's an odd thing about these Arabs, they're mentally keen, but they don't know anything but horses. Voldy was through with the nailing now, but, not wanting to disturb the Romans' disquisition on the Arabian mind, he held onto the stallion's leg, rubbing it gently, and listening. You take this fine-looking boy, Pincus, obviously well-to-do, undoubtedly from one of their better families, gracious. Right, I'll wager you five hundred sesterces he can't write his own name. I wouldn't mind taking you up on that, Your Excellency, said Pincus. But how are you going to find out? Why don't you ask him? suggested Voldy, with a grin. The awkward incident, which might so easily have given serious offense, really speeded their friendship. Mencius, experienced in diplomacy, humbly admitted that any attempt at apology would only add to their trouble, which prompted Voldy to say, You were right. Sir, about Arabia. I should not have listened, but, well, sir, I couldn't get away. My knowing Greek was accidental, not intentional, I assure you. Pincus, who had been trying hard to maintain his composure, gave way to a whoop of laughter. The whole episode had been too ridiculous to be viewed soberly. Voldy, too, thought it was funny. Mencius recovered slowly from his embarrassment. It was with the dignity of refinement and respect that he formally presented Pincus as the manager of the caravan with which he was traveling. When the younger Roman had gone, with instructions to take his caravan on to Gaza tomorrow and wait there at the port, Mencius and Voldy talked. They had supper together. It was late in the evening when they parted. Their acquaintance had ripened quickly into friendship. They both felt it. Mencius, perhaps without realizing it, had opened some gates for the untraveled young Arabian. Voldy, utterly fascinated, had encouraged the Roman to talk of his far voyages. The better to explain the nature of his journeys, Mencius confided without reserve that he was an agent of the emperor, engaged in various errands, of investigation, mostly, an organization, too. He had been on this present roundabout trip for many months, sailing from Brindisi to Crete in charge of a fleet of ten empire ships, he had hustled the procrastinating Cretans into their mines for iron which he had sent to Rome. He had kept one of the ships and had sailed to Cyprus, where he had organized a caravan to bring copper from the mines of the interior, and, when his fleet had returned, in ballast, from Rome, he had accompanied the copper to Caesarea, where it was to be used in building the extensive docks. You should spend a few days in Caesarea, Voldy, seeing you are intending to ride up the coast, advised Mencius. The empire is doing great things there. A two-mile-long stone breakwater, magnificent harbor destined to be one of the greatest ports on our sea. I had not realized that the Jews had so much to export, remarked Boldy. Nor have they, agreed Mancius, lowering his voice, but the day will come when the empire will develop Jewry. Then there will be trade, in plenty. 
meaning that Rome intends a complete subjugation of Judea? Well, Mencius debated how best to say it, when you've seen the new wharves at Caesarea, I think you will come to that conclusion. However, I surmise that any calamity to the Jews would not inconvenience you Arabians very much. I don't know, sir, said Voldy vaguely. We were persuaded to think so, many years ago, and made a brief alliance, which we regretted. Mencius nodded, and shrugged. Of course, I remember. Herod got scared. Married that cat Antipas to your sweet little princess, broke her heart, sent her home. I had a glimpse of her, once. Beautiful. It has always been a mystery to me, Voldy, why you Arabs didn't raise more hell about that. Voldy flushed a little and muttered that the Arabs were sometimes a bit tardy about paying their debts. After a pause, he added, it's a long story, Mencius. I'd like to hear it, declared Mencius with an unexpected enthusiasm that proved somewhat disconcerting to the Arabian, who dismissed the matter with a careless flick of his hands. Tell me more about your trip, he said. You unloaded the copper at Caesarea, and... No, I did not unload the copper. As I told you, I had taken my stallion, Brutus, with me. How the big fellow hated those voyages. I left the fleet in the hands of its commander, Fulvius, and rode south to Gaza. There, according to previous arrangement, I found my young fellow, Pincus, with a camel train ready to start for Angeti. We had dropped Pincus off at Gaza on our northbound trip to Caesarea. I wanted to see how much of a working force we had in the salt fields and whether our resources there were adequate. And now you're headed back to Rome? asked Baldi. No, not quite yet. We load the salt and see it on its way. That will take a week, probably. Then I am riding back to Caesarea to join my friend Antonius, who will be sailing the Augusta to Rome. I've had enough of these cargo ships, I'm going home in style. The Augusta is the Emperor's pleasure barge, and a beautiful ship she is, too. When they separated, near midnight, they felt as if they had been friends for years. Mencius was leaving at dawn, anticipating that he might have to lead his horse most of the day. They parted reluctantly. Each man laid his right hand on the other's left shoulder in a comradely farewell. If ever you find yourself in Rome, Boldy. Mencius was saying. Unlikely, sir, but you may be sure I should try to find you. By the way, how would I do that? Inquire at the Praetorium. They will direct you. Ask for Proconsul Nicator Mencius. And when you come to Arabia, Mencius, our home is yours. Go to the king's encampment for directions. Am I correct in surmising, Boldy, that your family is prominent in Arabia? My grandfather, Mishma, replied Boldy, is King Zendi's chief counselor. It was noon before Boldy resumed his journey. Far would unquestionably have ridden through Lachish, and since it was clear that she had not tarried in Hebron, it was almost certain that she must have stopped here. He had had no opportunity to speak to the innkeeper on this subject, for Mencius had been standing by, but this morning Boldy pressed his inquiries. The innkeeper wanted to be obliging, though he professed to have no knowledge of the young Arabian who had passed this way. Certainly he had not stopped for accommodation at his house. It was possible, of course, he admitted, that the young man might have paused to ask questions at a private home and had been offered lodging for the night. That happened occasionally. He even volunteered to accompany his generous guest on a tour of the homes where travelers had been welcomed. But no helpful information was arrived at, though much valuable time was consumed. Voldy's heart was heavy as he gave up the quest in Lachish and rode on. It was a monotonous journey. A mile west he came upon evidences of the recent encampment of Pincus Caravan. Three miles farther on he came to the tumble-down village of Melissa, where, without any hope at all, he stopped to ask the usual questions, to which the replies were bucolic stares, scowls, and a spitting on the ground. The sun was setting when a stone guidepost advised him that Gaza was still eight miles distant. Twilight came on rapidly. A quarter moon helped a little, but it would be a long way to Gaza. And Voldy had no relish for arriving in the night, seeing you could easily have your throat cut there in the daytime. As he plodded along in the thickening gloom, he saw, on the highway some two hundred yards ahead, a group of dim figures engaged in combat. There was an unmistakable sound of clashing swords, together with brief barks of warning and savage encouragements. For an instant Voldy was undecided whether to ride into this melee which might turn out to be a fight between rival groups of ruffians. He drew the gelding to a stop. Now he saw a white horse being tugged off the highway, and the reason for the commotion was clear. Spurring Darik to a gallop, 
he found himself within a few yards of a desperate fight in which Mencius was valiantly but hopelessly defending himself against three. Flinging himself out of the saddle, he rushed into the fray. One of the stalwart robbers turned to meet him with a broadsword raised high. Voldy did not wait for it to descend on him, but leapt for it. Gripping the man's wrist with his left hand, he held the sword suspended for the instant required to drive his dagger deep into the shoulder of the sword arm. With a scream of pain and rage, the bandit tried to strike. This time the dagger caught him in the left breast. It had found its mark. As the body sagged, Voldy flung it aside and dashed on into the battle which Mencius was plainly losing, for one of his two remaining assailants had moved to the rear of him and was preparing to strike. Behind you, Mencius. He shouted. I'll take this fellow. As Mencius wheeled about to parry the blow, the robber who had been facing him shifted his attention to the newcomer. Apparently satisfied that his fellow bandit would deal successfully with the wearied Roman, he seemed disposed to take his time, and enjoy the slaughter of this youthful intruder. What have you there, youngster, only a dagger? What do you expect to do with it? Immediately Voldy showed him what he expected to do with the dagger. The savage thrust, with his full weight behind it, was so swift, so recklessly ruthless, that the older man had no chance to assume a defensive position. The young Arabian had come at him with a rush that upset his calculations. The big fellow, who had planned to enjoy the murder, was left no time to indulge in this luxury. It was only an eight-inch dagger blade against a three-foot broadsword, but it was a bold and busy little dagger that laid open the sword arm, pierced the hand that moved instinctively to clutch the wound, and drew a deep semicircular furrow from forehead to chin, all this in one bewildering moment. Voldy stepped back quickly to avoid the last determined effort at defense, but the tip of the descending broadsword slashed his upper arm. He could feel the warm blood soaking his sleeve. He decided that the robber must pay hard for that cut, but as he moved in to finish him off the big fellow crumpled. Meantime, Mencius had driven his antagonist off the highway and had him backed up against the low stone fence, where he dropped his sword and shouted for mercy, a favor that the Roman was pleased to bestow, for he was thoroughly spent and wounded. Voldy looked at the bleeding hand and was happy to see that the cut was superficial. If you hadn't turned up exactly when you did, Voldy, they would have killed me. Mencius, still breathing heavily, leaned against his friend for support. Have they got your money? asked Voldy. Yes, and my horse. Here, you! shouted Voldy to the weary robber who had slumped down on the wall. If you have the Roman's wallet, hand it over. If not, go through your friend's pockets and find it. And be quick. Heaving himself to his feet, the bandit obeyed. Mencius' money was found in the blood-soaked tunic of the first robber Boldy had encountered. The recumbent man did not protest when they relieved him of the wallet. He lay very still. Mencius picked up his limp hand. The rascal's dead, Boldy. He muttered. Boldy was stooping over to peer into the gray face. Mencius interposed an arm and pushed him away. You don't want too clear a remembrance of him, Boldy, he explained. It's easy to see you never killed the man before. You mean, he may haunt me? Well, you haven't seen the last of him. They come back in the night, and waken you. Sometimes they bring small children along and weeping women. But, Mencius, stammered Voldy. The fellow had no right to live. True, but it makes no difference. They return. But come, let's see what is going on here. The ambulatory robber had half fled half-dragged his injured friend to the roadside and across the stone fence into the pasture where the horses were tethered. The shadowy figure who had taken charge of the white stallion had abandoned him and was running through the field to join his companions. Brutus had made no attempt to leave, and was quickly taken in hand. Give me a lift, Mencius, said Voldy, after an unsuccessful effort to mount. You've been hurt, Voldy, exclaimed Mencius. Why didn't you tell me? Your sleeve is wet with blood. I know. Perhaps we had better bind it up. We will stop at the fort of Minoa, said Mencius, as he applied a bandage to Voldy's dripping wound. I know the commandant, an old friend of mine, Legate Vitellius. I used always to stop there on these trips, but, not lately. The fort's badly run down, dirty, no discipline. Poor old Vitellius is a wine-bibber, never dead drunk, never cold sober, just stupid, all the day long. It was midnight before they reached the huge, ugly, shabby, high-walled rectangle with the faded Roman banners suspended over the gates. Sleepy sentries admitted them without much questioning. Legate Vitellius, shaky and dull but sober enough to be affable, was summoned from his bed, 
heard the traveler's story, routed out the regimental surgeon, and had the wounds cleansed and dressed. Voldy and Mencius shared a commodious chamber. Neither seemed ready to sleep. The excitement of their encounter was still with them. I feel as if I had known you always, Voldy, murmured Mencius. You saved my life tonight. I am deep in your debt. What can I ever do to repay your kindness, my friend? Somewhat to his own surprise, Voldy impulsively raised up on his elbows, and said, I need your counsel. I am in a serious dilemma. I want to confide in you. Propping himself up on his pillows, Mencius gave full attention as Voldy told his almost incredible story, of Farah's childhood vow and her disappearance and his own desperate search for her. I don't know, Voldy, muttered Mencius, shaking his head, when the tale had been told. I doubt whether she could make such a journey without being apprehended. But she's surely worth looking for, and if love and courage can find her, you will succeed. Before they slept, Voldy had promised to wait in Gaza until Mencius had dispatched his fleet, and together they would ride to Caesarea. But I must exact a promise of you, Voldy, if you are going with me to Caesarea. Mencius' tone was serious. Of course. Promised Voldy. Anything. That Augustus' errand in Caesarea is to pick up a royal family, on a pleasure excursion to Rome. You are to show no interest in any member of this royal household. But, why should I? exclaimed Voldy. The man is the ruler of Galilee. Antipas. Correct. Mind you keep your promise. Good night. Chapter 10 Voldy had never met anyone with so wide a range of interests as his companionable new friend from Rome. Proconsul Nicator Mencius knew something about everything classic and contemporary. The Arabians were not very much concerned about history, not even about their own. Here and there in the high mountains massive sepulchres of their national heroes bore extravagant, weather-beaten epitaphs, but almost nobody tried to decipher them, for, in the opinion of Ishmael's tough posterity, it was as effeminate to be able to read as not to be able to write. Literacy was left to the professional scriveners whose unenvied occupation was practiced mostly by men with crippled feet or weak chests. There was no written history at all. Vagabond minstrels, rating no better than jugglers, toured the country, attending the auctions, fairs, and festal events, where they chanted the ancient legends and mumbled interminable epic poems extolling the prowess of Arabia's distinguished kings and champions, but there was nothing resembling a comprehensive, sensible, sequential story of the Arabian people, and as for the average Arab's knowledge of the world outside, it was practically non-existent. The Arab knew that he should hate and despise the Jews. That prejudice he had had in his milk. He never paused to examine it. It was as natural and necessary as breathing and heartbeats. He likewise loathed the Romans, though his attitude toward them was of distrust and suspicion rather than the forthright contempt he felt for the children of Israel. As for other foreign nations, Egypt, Greece, Persia, Macedonia, Pamphylia, Cyprus, Crete, they were but outlandish names that were rarely on his tongue or in his thoughts. He knew nothing about them, and cared less. As the grandson of a counselor, Voldy had been taught to read and write the language of his own people, but it was not much of an accomplishment, for there was almost no Arabian literature, nor did many occasions arise when it was of advantage to know how to write. At far as gentle insistence, and because it gave him a reasonable excuse for spending longer evenings in her company, he had studied Greek under the competent supervision of Ione, and, spurred by their encouragement, he had done very well with the language. As for the contents of those venerable scrolls which they employed as textbooks, he had very little interest in them. He was too polite to say so, but privately he considered Aeschylus a morbid old owl, Pindar a windy dreamer, Herodotus a tiresome bore, and Homer a shameless liar. Mencius was now introducing Voldy to a new world. He did not parade his knowledge. Indeed, he seemed honestly apologetic because he knew so little. But in the opinion of his young friend from Arabia, the Roman's wealth of information concerning past and present world affairs was related to Voldy's meager store as everything was related to nothing. This morning, as they rode slowly toward Gaza, now only two miles distant, lagging far enough behind the shuffle-footed caravan to avoid the worst of its dust, Mencius found plenty of entertainment for himself and enlightenment for Voldy by calling attention to certain historic landmarks along the old highway. See that huge? tumbled pile of hewn stone over there in the field? Mencius pointed with his riding whip. That was the great fort where the Philistines made their last stand against Alexander. When was that? Voldy took no pride in his query. Of course you know about the various victories of Alexander, all over the world, said Mencius. Vaguely, 
mumbled Boldy, hoping he would not be required to bound or define the word. Well, as you undoubtedly recall, he died about 300 years ago, and this was one of his later conquests. The Philistines made a gallant defense. It ended, over there. They drew their horses to a stop and surveyed the ruins. Those rocks do not appear to have been there so long, commented Boldy. Granite does not deteriorate as rapidly as the people who quarry it, observed Mencius, half to himself. To look about on the lousy cutthroats who now inhabit this region, one wouldn't suspect that they are descendants of the brave fellows who built that fort and defended it until the last brave man was dead. It's a wonder they haven't hauled that rock pile away to use in other buildings, reflected Boldy. Oh, they will, sometime, soliloquized Mencius. It is in the nature of nations, he went on dreamily, to rise, and toil, and suffer, and prosper, and fatten, and fall. After a long pause he continued, then they lie prone in the dust until some strong man appears among them, and commands the old stones and the old bones to rise again. All that these rascally beggars need to put them on their feet is a great leader. He will come, some day. It always happens, in time. Destiny is in no hurry. Mencius, you have the mind of a prophet, said Boldy soberly. Or are you just guessing? They spoke to their horses and rode on a little way before Mencius replied. No, Voldy, I am not a prophet, nor am I guessing. The earth is a vast theater with many stages on which companies of actors present the same old play, a tragedy in five acts. Sometimes the company puts it through to the end at breathtaking speed, if the man who enacts the principal role is very audacious and impetuous. You take Alexander, for example. That was a one-man show. He conquered the whole world, and when he died his empire, as a military power, vanished overnight. There wasn't enough left of his army to give police protection to his own town. I had thought that the Greeks held him in high honor, remarked Boldy. So they do, declared Mencius, and very properly, too. They lost their rating as conquerors, but they gained something much more valuable. The world's respect. Everywhere they went, they carried their culture. They became known as the wise ones of the earth. Moreover, their wide acquaintance with the other nations opened their own eyes to the fact of their superiority as intellectuals. It made the Greeks conscious of their cultural supremacy and more eager than ever to develop their talents. After a pause, he added, militarily, of course, Alexander's whirlwind in campaigns accomplished little. His was a very brief dynasty. It usually takes much longer, then, for the actors to finish the old play, surmised Boldy, anxious to hear more of this unfamiliar talk. Anywhere from three or four generations to half a dozen centuries, said Mencius. Consider the case of these Philistines, they had been smashed before, eleven centuries ago. The end of that play was quite dramatic. You've heard of Samson, I suppose. Voldy shook his head and grinned, and Mencius, having found his polite supposition incorrect, proceeded to tell the story. The Philistines had had everything their own way for a handful of centuries. Then a powerful leader had developed in neighboring Jewry. It takes only one strong man, you know, to do the trick, continued Mencius. If he is bold enough, successful enough, his people will follow him and fight for him. But he had better stay in the saddle. That's the only trouble with a one-man show. The great man becomes so infatuated with his personal conquests that he neglects to build up a few successors to take over in the event of something happening to him. The Philistines were quite unprepared to compete with a man of Samson's stature. They had grown rich, soft overconfident, and, of course, corrupt. Samson bore down on them with the courage and voice of a mad bull. There are plenty of legends about him, most of them lies, no doubt, but immensely entertaining. One old story has it that he single-handedly slaughtered 300 Philistine braves with the jawbone of an ass. A non-weapon, commented Voldy. Yes, but not altogether inappropriate. The big fellow was a noisy braggarding buffoon, without a trace of dignity or common sense. It delighted him to make monkeys of the haughty Philistines, he loved to play pranks on them. His roars of laughter could be heard for a mile. What sort of pranks? Voldy wanted to know. Oh, theatrical displays of his physical strength. One night he lifted the city gates of Gaza off their hinges and carried them away on his shoulders. Then, when he had all Philistia beaten and shamed, he made the customary mistake of successful warriors, rested on his oars, enjoyed his fame and strutted about the city with his head held high. Presently he became enamored of a beautiful and designing woman. Of Philistia? inquired Boldy. Mencius nodded, and scowled. 
It's strange, he went on bitterly, how many strong men have been taken in by women. It hasn't been so very long since our brave Marcus Antonius, with the applause of the empire in his ears, traded his fame for the smiles of that scheming little Egyptian slut Cleopatra. A great man he was, until he threw himself away. I gather that your admiration for Cleopatra is under control, drawled Voldy, for something to say. Mencius growled, and went on with Samson. This Philistine girl, Delilah, soon had the big clown eating out of her hand. When the time was ripe she betrayed him to her fellow countrymen and they took him into camp. His cohorts made no effort to rescue him. So, that was the end of the fifth act? Asked Baldi. By no means. Declared Mencius. It was only the end of the fourth act. The Philistines went much too far in their vengeful celebration of victory over Samson. That, too, is customary. They made a thorough job of it, roped him and bore him away, burned out his eyes, harnessed him like a donkey and made him grind corn in the king's mill. Day after day after week after month the hapless fellow plodded round and round hauling the heavy beam, until his big, bare feet wore a path three cubits wide and two cubits deep. Tiresome occupation, for a hero, observed Voldy. One day, pursued Mencius, and this was the last act of the play, the sumptuously furnished balcony of Philistia's Praetorium, or whatever they called their capital, was crammed with banqueting royalty, generals, counselors, and wealthy taxpayers, celebrating a religious festival, in honor of Dagon, I believe, or one of their silly gods. Were they so religious, the Philistines? Broke in Voldy. Just on feast days. I think that's true of all religions, so far as the top layer is concerned. The influential people like to set a good example. It makes the common people more confident of their gods. And more contented with their rags and hunger, assisted Voldy. Up to a certain pitch of starvation, yes, agreed Mencius, but that is another story. The paunchy Philistines were hugely enjoying themselves at the banquet table, when some ingenious fool suggested that they parade poor old Samson in the plaza where everybody could see him, and have a good laugh. So, the flunkies in the mill haltered him and a small boy led him forth. Suddenly the blind giant felt a surge of his former strength, wrapped his long, bony arms round a couple of the marble pillars supporting the balcony and pulled the whole house down. Incredible! shouted Boldy. You don't believe that, surely. Mencius remained sober-faced and was tardy with his rejoinder. Maybe not all of it, Boldy, not the fantastic details. But the fact remains that blind old Samson wrecked Philistia so completely that she took orders from other nations for six hundred years. Mencius appeared to have ended his speech. They rode on in silence for some time. That was indeed a strange story, mused Boldy at length. No, not so strange, but a bit terrifying. Sometimes, Voldy, I wonder if the Roman Empire may not finish her play in much the same manner. We Romans may be nearing the end of the fourth act. Mencius was talking to himself now, and Voldy had to listen sharply. We have gone about, almost everywhere, capturing and roping and blinding other nations' giants and making them grind our corn. Some day, unless history is not to be trusted, they will pull our house down. I hope it doesn't happen in my lifetime. Meaning that your enslaved provincials are growing restless? Slaves are always restless, Boldy. At present hours are helpless. But, there will come a day in a strong man. Then we will play the final act. To predict how long that might take or where the strong man is to come from is a job for a better profit than I. The noon sunshine bounced off the tarnished cupola of a distant tower. Mencius pointed down the descending highway toward the city. Well, there she is, my friend, the famous old stronghold of Philistia. Waiting for a strong man to appear, and put her in order again, said Voldy, after the manner of reciting a lesson. Not consciously waiting, amended Mencius. Gossa is too stupid to be aware that she is waiting for anything. Only when the strong man shows up will she know that she has been waiting. And, meantime, while she waits for destiny to clean her up, we will not drink her stinking water or her wretched wine nor will we touch her polluted food. We will ride straight on through to the docks. The fleet will be there. We will find plenty to eat and drink on shipboard. And it will be clean food and sound wine, I suppose, seeing it is provided by the Romans, remarked Boldy, with a slow wink that made his friend grin. Yes, declared Mencius proudly. It will be clean and sound. You see, we Romans are still playing our fourth act, and doing a good job of it. Suddenly, to Voldy's amazement, Mencius shed his quiet complacency and assumed a new role. 
The tail end of the long caravan was immediately ahead. You are to keep close behind me now, barked Mencius, over his shoulder, as he spurred Brutus to a sharp trot. With his spine stiffened to an arrogant posture, he rode past the camel train, looking neither to the right nor left. Arriving at the docks, with Voldy trailing him, Mencius flung himself off his horse and shouted a laconic order to Pincus. Then he marched with stiff-legged hauteur to the wharf where the flagship of the fleet awaited him, Voldy trudging along behind, feeling much like a convict on his way to prison. Sailors and stevedores obsequiously saluted, but Mencius gave them no attention. Reaching the ship's waist, the haughty Mencius marched aboard, passing between a double line of sailors and petty officers without seeing them, and stood stiffly before the grain commander, whose pose was as icily formal. Voldy was not introduced. Bowing, the commander wheeled about and walked briskly aft, with Mencius striding beside him, and Boldy, at a disadvantage and a bit offended, tagging behind them. When they had entered the commander's spacious cabin and the door had been closed, the mood of the Romans instantly changed. They whacked each other on the shoulder playfully. Fulvius, my lad, shouted Mencius. It's a treat to see you again. High time you turned up, you lazy tramp, rumbled the commander. I've been rotting in this pest hole for a week. Serves you right. You have been spoiled with luxury. Mencius peeled off his tunic and tossed it onto Fulvius' bunk. Now I want you to greet an Arabian friend of mine. Voldy, meet my good Fulvius. The commander, with candid lack of interest, pursed his lips and nodded. Perhaps I should have added, Fulvius, continued Mencius, that Voldy saved my life, at the risk of his own, in a bloody battle with highwaymen. At that Fulvius' eyes brightened, and he smiled amiably. Welcome to my ship, Boldy, he said. In gay spirits, Mencius became more rhetorical in his further introduction of his friends. Here's where two of the finest and bravest have found each other, he exclaimed. Here's where the high mountains and the deep sea clasp hands. Here's where a gallant Arabian who knows all about horses and daggers meets a Roman who knows all about ships and storms. Here's where. If you're going to compose an ode, Mencius, broke in Fulvius, let's have some wine to wash it down. Odes are hard enough to bear, in any case. He opened the door a little way and growled with all the irascibility of an old dog, presumably addressing a slave. They sat down, and presently the wine arrived. Was it really much of a fight? inquired Fulvius, eager for some gory details. I was having it out with three bandits, alone and in the dark, explained Mencius. Suddenly, Voldy appeared and joined in the battle. They would have finished me promptly but for this foolhardy fellow. Fulvius beamed toward Voldy and drawled, Well, even if you do stick your nose into other people's business, you shall have a drink. For three whole hours, over their dinner, the talk had been a recital of the Romans' recent experiences, spiced with persiflage, and at length Mencius and Boldy were shown to their bunks in an adjacent cabin. What are you thinking about so seriously? inquired Mencius, tugging off a boot. You, replied Voldy, with a brief chuckle. You astonished me today, Mencius. You play so many parts, and all of them so very well. Perhaps you are referring to our public formalities, as compared with our unconventional behavior in private? Asked Mencius, amused. I shouldn't have known you for the same man, said Voldy. It's only good usage among us, said Mencius. It's the Roman way of enforcing discipline. We officers have to be high-handed with our subordinates, and, in their presence, severely dignified in our attitude toward one another. It's a serious and dangerous business, Boldy, keeping slaves and mercenaries in control. Ever try the other way, ventured Boldy, getting acquainted with your men and showing them that you trust them? No, I never tried that, personally, admitted Mancius, but it has been tried and it doesn't work. Give the average man an inch and he'll take a mile. Let the commanding officer show himself to be friendly and he is immediately suspected of being soft, if not scared. Our officials in Arabia do not strut and bark said Voldy. Of course not, agreed Mencius. Why should they? Your king Zendi can eat with shepherds if he wants to, and they love him for it. But you're all Arabians, one big family. Look what we have to deal with, Voldy. In my caravan there are rascally Philistines, sullen Parthians, slit-eared Macedonians, and all manner of scheming ruffians. And on this ship, why, if good old Fulvius relaxed his vigilance for a moment, the riffraff of a dozen nations would stick him in the back and toss him overboard. That's why we're cold and haughty and severe. It's the Roman method of government, all the way down the line from the emperor to the overseer of my caravan. 
After a reflective moment, Voldy said, What if all the riffraff in the empire are organized? Slaves are hard to organize, Voldy. The Parthians would insist on having a Parthian as the great emancipator. The cutthroats of Sicily would follow only a Sicilian. It would take a very strong man to unite the empire's provincials. Like Alexander, maybe? wondered Voldy. Much more powerful than Alexander. He would have to appeal to something that all these polyglots possess in common. I'm sure I don't know what that would be. Mencius leaned over toward the table and snuffed out the lamp. Let's go to sleep, Voldy, he said drowsily. It's too big a problem to settle tonight. After a quiet moment, he asked, Have you your dagger in bed with you? No, said Voldy. Better get it, advised Mencius. Is that a Roman custom? asked Voldy, suppressing a chuckle. He is an impoverished and forsaken Roman, replied Mencius soberly, who dares go to sleep without a dagger strapped to his wrist. Now they were riding north on the broad and busy coast highway, their horses frisky after a three-day rest at the port, eventful days for Voldy, who had never seen a ship before and knew nothing of the ways of seafaring men. Seemingly endless files of slaves, each with a huge cake of dead sea salt on his shoulder, had plodded up the gangways and down the ladders into the dark holds of eleven sturdy ships. There was no haste, nor was there any rest for these empty-faced toilers. Overseers stood, small distances apart, along the wharf, occasionally flicking their bull whips expertly, as if to keep in practice, but not often letting the lash bite into a slave's bare hide. It was enough for the burdened men to know that the whips were in experienced hands. As each ship was loaded and the hatches battened down, she would move slowly away from her temporary berth and find a mooring half a mile away in the quiet harbor, and another vessel would be warped into the vacancy at the dock. Voldy spent most of his time alone at the stern of the flagship, listening dreamily to the lap of the waves against the barnacled piles and the screams of careening gulls, more enjoyable entertainment than might be had where the work was in progress. Indeed, Voldy was glad to find any distraction from the sight and sound of that slave labor. With his belligerent Arabian background, he was anything but thin-skinned, but this monotonous scuff, 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 scuff of spiritless sandals had taken on an ominous significance. Some day, according to Mencius' confidential forecast, this hopeless, helpless scuffing of enslaved sandals would suddenly attain a swifter tempo. It would spontaneously break into a run. It would be accompanied by savage shouts for vengeance. And the Empire's fifth act would open with a clash of angry metal. For two hours, on that first day, Voldy had stood leaning against a forward capstan, watching and listening, until he became oppressed by an hallucination that the steady scuff, 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 scuff was, even now, this instant, accelerating to a threatening scuff, 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 scuff. That would raise the curtain for the final events of the old tragedy. He tried to comfort himself with the thought that, after all, the well-merited collapse of the Roman Empire need be of no concern to Arabia. But, on sober reflection, Voldy decided that the wreck of the empire would be everybody's business, Arabia's too. Bewildered and moody, he had moved away from the pattern and symbols of this threat, finding a measure of serenity in the blue sky and bluer sea. This sky and the sea had witnessed many an enactment of the inevitably recurrent drama and would doubtless witness many more repetitions of it in the ages to come. Nations would come and go, rise and fall, but the same sky would look down upon these mutations with calm detachment. The tide would roll in twice a day, no matter if all the nations in the world destroyed one another, and themselves. It was comforting to let one's eyes rest upon something that would endure, forever and ever. At high noon on the third day, the last laden vessel was ready to put out to sea. Mencius and Voldy stood together on the wharf as the flagship drew in her frowsy hawsers and drifted from the dock. Commander Fulvius, with a letter in his pocket for personal delivery to Mencius' wife explaining his delay cupped his mouth to shout into a brisk seaward breeze, What shall I say if she asks me when to expect you? Tell her you don't know, yelled Mencius. More canvas was slowly creeping up the foremast, sailors tugging in unison at the ropes. Pulley squealed. Fulvius and Mencius, facing each other soberly, stood at attention, thrusting forward stiff right arms in a farewell salute. Voldy, less formally, waved a hand. A much-mended sail was crawling up the mizzenmast. Out in the bay the other ships were winching up their anchors. The fleet was on its way to Rome. In less than an hour Voldy and Mencius were riding through an increasingly fertile and well-kept country, strikingly different from the unproductive and ill-conditioned lands eastward of Gaza. The vineyards showed good care. The houses and barns were larger. The cattle in the pastures were sleek and fat. 
Mencius swept the rich landscape with a panoramic gesture and discoursed of its value. This is what Alexander wanted when he laid siege to Philistia. It has always been coveted by somebody, for it is truly a garden spot. The owners of these farms and vineyards are temporarily unmolested, but it will not be for long. Voldy, if a man hopes to live at peace in this world he must pitch his tent in a desert so bare that even a bug would starve on it. How do you account for the peace that these prosperous people are enjoying at present? inquired Voldy. That is an interesting and amusing story, replied Mencius. For some time there has flourished in Jerusalem a politically powerful family, the Maccabees. They are rich as Midas and shrewd as Satan. Many years ago they took pains to ingratiate themselves with Herod, backed him solidly in his reign, flattered him with gifts and compliments. Remembering that the war-battered little town of Ascalon was Herod's birthplace, they volunteered to rebuild it in splendor. You will see, presently, what they made of it. The king, much gratified, donated a beautiful consulate. Then the Maccabees, with Herod's consent, encouraged a colony of wealthy fugitives from Athens to move in and redeem the neglected countryside. Now that it has been put in order, remarked Voldy, it's a wonder you Romans haven't. That's the amusing part of the story, broke in Mencius. Tiberius would like to have it, but, if he were to take it, he would instantly find himself at war with the Maccabees. He isn't quite ready for that, and the Maccabees know that he knows it. As the matter stands, the emperor considers himself better off by levying heavy taxes on the Maccabees than risking a costly war with them. That will come, later. In our time? You will think so when you see what is going on at the harbor in Caesarea. Don't the Jews realize what is in store for them? Of course. But they are riven by sex and parties. It's the old story of internal feuds and factions stubbornly refusing to cooperate with one another even in the emergency of saving their own skins. Mencius was silently thoughtful for a while. You may recall my saying, a few days ago, that the strength of a nation always depends upon the leadership of the one powerful man who has it in him to bind all the discordant elements together, and induce them to follow him. Let him be popular enough and they will share his glory or his shame. Well, the Jews have no such man among them. Each fanatical party has its chieftain, but no one of them can command the loyalty of the whole country. For ages the Jews have been expecting a great leader to appear and deliver them from their enemies. Their prophets have spoken of this fabulous person as the Messiah. Now and again, the various sects have burst into revolutionary flames incited by a Messiah, but no one of these leaders has lasted very long, not even in the esteem of his own party. They have always ended up in some drab little martyrdom. And within the space of a generation or two nobody remembered what became of the great man's ashes. Apparently the real Messiah, when he comes, if he comes, will have a big job on his hands, surmised Voldy. According to the Jewish prophets, he is to be something of a divine person. That might be greatly to his advantage. Mencius' tone was so ironical that Voldy laughed outright. I gather that you are not very religious, Mencius, he remarked dryly. As for the traditional host of deities, no, I have no interest in them, much less any faith in them. If they serve any useful purpose, it is only to frighten small children into behaving themselves. A heavily laden caravan was bearing down on them from the north, and they drew aside into a cypress-shaded lane to let the long procession pass. Mencius guessed that it was a cargo of grain for embarkation at Gaza, but Voldy refused to be diverted from the serious discussion they had begun. Surely, Mencius, you do believe in the existence of some higher power, he said soberly. Oh yes, admitted Mencius. It is obvious that a great mind, or a group of great minds, created the world. Inconceivable that it could have created itself. Whether any high power is still in control of the world is, in my opinion, doubtful. Humanity's antics do not indicate that any sensible overseer is in command. Sometimes, however, I find myself privately worshipping a god whom I think of as the torchbearer. Voldy's eyes widened with fresh interest. He urged Mencius to explain what he meant by a torchbearer. He has been going about for ages, Voldy, said Mencius slowly measuring his words. Up and down, across the world, in every era, in every country, patiently searching for men with lamps in their hands, larger lamps than those of their neighbors or their fathers. And this light-giving God touches the wicks of these unusually capacious lamps with his divine torch. Go on, please, insisted Voldy, when Mencius, having seemed to have made an end of his strange discourse, was counting the sullen, nodding camels as they passed. That's about as far as I've gone into it confessed Mencius vaguely. My favorite god, 
the torchbearer, wants the world to have more light, for men to see by, so he keeps on looking for lamps. It must be a very disappointing quest. I marvel at his perseverance. Only a few men, widely separated by leagues and centuries, have borne lamps worthy of the divine fire, and such light as they have kindled has brightened the way for a mere handful of adventurers. As for the multitudes, they still stumble along in the old darkness. Sometimes the torchbearer lights a large lamp that attracts smaller lamps. Plato brings his lamp to Aristotle, and there is an unprecedented brightness on the path, for a few, for a while, for a little while. But, the mass of the people, they will keep on groping through the dark, mused Boldy. Is that what you believe? I'd much rather not, of course, sighed Mencius. It would please me to hope that the torchbearer might some day come upon the one great man, with the one powerful lamp that would illumine the highway for us all. But history does not encourage that hope. The camel train had passed now and the dust was clearing. They rode, in thoughtful silence, onto the highway. Mencius pointed to a graceful tower in the distance. Ascalon. His tone was almost reverential. Now you will see what the Maccabee money made of its squalid, dilapidated little town. The Maccabees must be a great-hearted family, remarked Boldy. That depends on one's point of view, drawled Mencius. According to general opinion the Maccabees are tyrants. Wealthy patrons of the arts, he added, are not necessarily great-hearted. The finest architecture and sculpture in the world may be found in Rome, but plenty of people could testify that we Romans are not benevolent. Two days later, at sundown, the travelers arrived in the amazing city of Caesarea. If Voldy had been bewildered by the transitions from dirty and degraded Gaza, of the Philistines, to the marble splendor of beautiful Ascalon, of the Greeks, and to the frowsiness of decayed Joppa, of the Judeans, he was now even more astonished by the feverish confusions of this rapidly rising metropolis, which, according to Mencius, would one day be the focal point from which the empire would move toward the utter subjugation of all Jewry. Heretofore the emperors had insisted only upon tribute and cash. The Jews were sheep to be shorn annually but not converted into mutton. Presently the Romans would want more than Israel's fleece. They would march in and take everything, Mencius had declared, and when Voldy had inquired whether this threat was a secret, his friend had replied airily, Secret? Not at all. The Jews know the invasion is sure to come. Preparations for it are going on right under their noses. Too tired that night for sightseeing, they had ridden through the congested streets to the principal inn, the Agrippa recently built by the Romans to accommodate 300 guests. It was situated in the very heart of the city and crowded to capacity, but Mencius had a friend in the management and a room was found for them. After an excellent supper, they strolled through the spacious, newly furnished foyer, where scores of opulently dressed Romans of self-assured and distinguished bearing stood in conversing groups or lounged in the richly upholstered chairs and divans. This unfamiliar view of flamboyant wealth dazzled Voli's senses. He wasn't quite sure whether he was infatuated or infuriated. Every man in sight was extravagantly garbed and groomed. The air was heavy with pomades. Jewels flashed on well-kept hands. It was true then, the Romans were not only men of the world, they were the important, the impressive men of the world. It belonged to them, there could be no doubt of that. Voldy's memory, which he suspected of something like disloyalty, rolled back for a glimpse of King Sendi and his council, carelessly clad in their unadorned burnouses, grave, hard-muscled men who despised ostentation. How their thin, haughty nostrils would have flared in contempt of this gaudy show. But, wasn't it costing Arabia a pretty penny to maintain that attitude of scorn for prosperous people? Voldy wondered whether proud poverty wasn't, in the long run, more expensive property than ropes of pearls. Suddenly a tall, handsome, close-cropped Roman, on the left breast of whose scarlet tunic the imperial black eagle was appliqued, detached himself from a small party of friends and came forward beaming a welcome. Nick. You're here at last. The gods be praised for your safe arrival. I was getting anxious. They clapped their hands on each other's shoulders. Why anxious, Tony? I'm not late. This was the day. No, you're not late. But my distinguished passengers showed up this afternoon, hours before I expected them, and who knows when they might decide to sail. The wishes of Her Highness are never predictable. I hope you've attended to all your business, and are ready to be off at a moment's notice. Mencius nodded, and, reaching for Voldy's arm, drew him forward. Tony, he said, I want you to meet a young Arabian friend of mine. Voldy, greet my long time ago schoolmate, Antonius Lucan, 
commander of the Emperor's ship the Augusta. Voldy bowed briefly. The commander's eyes narrowed a little. He lifted his forearm perfunctorily and mumbled that any friend of proconsul Nicator Mencius was his friend also, after which he turned toward his old crony with a quizzical arching of his grizzled brows, plainly inquiring how we happened to have an Arabian on our hands at this particular moment. Mencius was prompt to reply. Voldy had come upon him in the night, on the road alone, badly outnumbered by robbers, and had joined the fray. The reckless Arabian had saved his life, no less. In response to this speech, the commander of the Augusta bowed to Voldy in recognition of invaluable services rendered to a comrade, and Mencius supplemented his story of the fight with, It's amazing, this young fellow's skill with a dagger. I think his parents must have given him a knife to play with when he was a baby. Voldy gave a deprecating grin, shrugged slightly, and seemed eager for a change of topic. He was conscious of the old sailor's uneasiness about him. The tension was somewhat relaxed, at this juncture, by the appearance of another urbane, middle-aged Roman, more conservatively dressed than any of the others, who paused to greet Mencius with quiet affability, after nodding to Tony. What brings you here this time, Mencius? He inquired lazily. More copper? At present the fellow's not a peddler, Atreus, drawled Tony. He's a tourist, absolutely empty-handed, sailing home with me on the Augusta. We're taking His Highness Antipas and his family on their annual excursion. Atreus, taking pains to be extravagantly disrespectful, sniffed audibly and wrinkled his nose. I wish somebody would explain to me, he declaimed, how the ruler of poor little Galilee rates a free voyage, every season, on the Emperor's pleasure barge. PSSD. Warn Tony. I mustn't be seen listening complacently to such talk. Then, lowering his voice, he remarked, you may be sure the Tetrarch will eventually pay his passage. And he is abundantly able to do it, when Tiberius bills him for it. Mencius broke in now to introduce Voldy with appropriate explanations of the circumstances accounting for their friendship. Then, to Voldy, should you get into any trouble while in Caesarea, our excellent Atreus, who is the best known lawyer in the city, will befriend you, I know. Atreus, who had been gnawing at his bearded underlip and staring into Voldy's face with undisguised curiosity, chuckled gruffly. Arabian, eh? and handy with a blade. Doesn't ask what the fight's about, so long as he can get in there, and gut somebody. He laughed with evident relish and poked Tony in the ribs with his thumb. Hell of a time for an Arabian gladiator to turn up, I must say. What part of Arabia do you hail from, my son? The southern mountains, sir, replied Voldy stiffly. Anywhere near the king's domain? Not very far, sir, a few miles. Your king's MD seems a popular man. Yes. Sir. I dare say you know him, ventured Adrius. The others were growing restless. The commander was absently patting his beringed left fist with his right palm. Mencius shifted his weight and frowned. Voldy's grandfather, Mishma, is the king's chief counselor, Atreus. Ah? Uh? So. Atreus grinned. Well, if there is anything we can do for you while you are in Caesarea, Voldy, we will be happy to serve you. See you later, Tony. You'll be glad to be home again, Mencius. Wish I were going with you. You will be arriving in time for Saturnalia. With the departure of Atreus, conversation lagged, and Boldy, surmising that the two Romans might wish to have some private talk, excused himself and sauntered through the lobbies to the loggia which half circled a pool where a beautifully wrought fountain played. He sat down on a deeply upholstered divan and reviewed the recent conversation. This Atreus might be a good man to know. For some little time after Voldy had strolled away from them, Mencius and Tony found it difficult to sustain an interest in their talk about the forthcoming voyage. Finally Tony blurted out, What's this boy doing in Caesarea, Mencius? He is on his way north. Sightseeing, or business? A little of both, I think. Meaning that you aren't going to tell me. Tony's voice showed annoyance. He confided to me the nature of his errand, admitted Mencius. It is nothing to cause you anxiety. He is looking for a fugitive. I shall be obliged if this much information contents you, Tony. I gave him my word. Very well, conceded Tony grumpily. But I'll expect you to see to it that your bloodletting Arab keeps his distance from my ship. If anybody sticks a knife into the Tetrarch while he is not in my custody, I shall make no protest, but, by Jove, he's not going to be assassinated on the Augusta. It's a wonder the fellow makes these voyages, observed Mencius. He can't rot up there in Galilee all the year round. 
He'd go crazy. Nothing ever happens. He has no friends among his subjects. They all despise him. However, he may be in for more excitement than he wants presently. His chief scrivener was telling me, this afternoon, that something like a revolution is brewing. In sleepy, stupid little Galilee? scoffed Mencius. You are jesting. According to this scribbler, Pamphilios, it's not an uprising against the government, at least not yet. It seems that a young carpenter has been haranguing great crowds. So far, he has said nothing to inflame the people. On the contrary, he has been urging them to be law-abiding and content with their poverty. And how could such soft words collect a crowd? wondered Mencius. Pamphilios says the man has been healing the sick by laying his hands upon them, said Tony. That, of course, is nonsense. Pamphilios admits he has no first-hand knowledge of it. But, the rumor is in the air and all Galilee is buzzing with these stories. Bad time for the Tetrarch to absent himself, remarked Mencius. That's what Pamphilios thinks, assented Tony. But Antipas couldn't be talked out of his customary excursion. Half the year, in Tiberias, he lives on his anticipation of the other half in Rome. The scrivener says that a deputation of priests waited on his highness a few days ago, pleading with him to silence the carpenter, but Antipas made short work of them, told them they had better make their synagogues a little more attractive and useful, and maybe the people wouldn't be congregating in pasture fields to listen to this carpenter. Not a bad suggestion, put in Mancius, with a chuckle. Any suggestion would be good enough, in the Tetrarch's opinion, so long as he wasn't hindered from going to Rome. He wouldn't miss the pageants and games of Saturnalia, not even if the Sea of Galilee went dry. Mencius was soberly meditative for a while. Ever hear of the Jewish Messiah, Tony? He asked irrelevantly. Tony shook his head and scowled, muttered that he had given up trying to understand the Jews. Mencius explained briefly, but his friend was uninterested. The Jews had always been too religious for their own good, he said. I'm surprised that you have so much concern for such rubbish, continued Tony impatiently. You read too much. You think too much. You know too much. It wouldn't surprise me to hear, someday, that you'd gone off to live in a cave in the mountains, having it out with the gods, and the fleas. I'll admit, said Mencius, a man can live a much happier life by not using his mind at all. I'm going to bed now. I have been all day in the saddle. Doubtless you will be turning in, too. Not quite yet growled Tony. I've an errand to do first. I must go down to the docks and notify my mate to be on the alert for an Arabian stowaway. You are putting yourself to unnecessary bother, said Mencius. I shall be satisfied if your new friend gives me no more bother than that, said Tony. After Voldy had sat alone, staring absently at the fountain for a quarter of an hour, he was joined on the divan by the lawyer, who hoped he was not intruding. Expect to be with us for a while? inquired Atreus casually. I am leaving in the morning, sir, replied Voldy. It had occurred to him that if he showed an inclination to be frank, his explanations might be more readily believed. I have an errand in Galilee, he went on. I have. Then sent to look for a young Arabian who ran away from home and is believed to have gone up into the neighborhood of the Sea of Galilee. I am to persuade him to return, if I find him. Know anything about the city of Tiberias? Not much. It's the seat of the Tetrarch. There is a Roman fort hard by. You will make inquiries at the fort? Not at first, not until I have to. I'd much rather find my fugitive friend without calling so much attention to him. I shall not needlessly embarrass him. Do you know that country, sir? A little. If I may venture a suggestion, Boldy, there is a discreet man of my acquaintance living in the small town of Bethsaida, only a short distance from Tiberias. He is a lawyer, in retirement now a man of broad sympathies and much prudence. You might give him your confidence. Voldy was glad to accept the advice. He brought out a small slate tablet from his pocket and wrote the Bethsedin's name and the directions for finding him. Atreus negligently allowed his eyes to follow the red chalk as the Arabian wrote. You've lived in Greece? He inquired when Voldy had pocketed the tablet. No, sir, I have never been in Greece. Don't many Arabians understand Greek? Probably not. Voldy rose, thanked Atreus for his kindness, and remarked that he must find Mencius before retiring. It would please me to learn how your mission succeeds, said Atreus, as they parted, and please convey my greetings to my friend, and former colleague, David Benzadik. At the first intimation of Don Voldy slipped out quietly so as not to waken Mencius, 
to whom he had said farewell at midnight after a lengthy but inconclusive discussion of the probability of his finding Farah in Galilee. Mencius had then gone promptly to sleep, apparently undisturbed by the relentless racket of heavy traffic in the street below, where enormous wagons, laden with building materials, ground their iron shod wheels into the cobblestones, and drivers screamed and lashed at their straining oxen. The hideous clamor had not annoyed Mencius. He was quite accustomed to it, he said. That was the way it sounded all night, every night in Rome. The emperor, wanting to keep the streets free of construction traffic in the daytime, had decreed that all heavy hauling must be done between sunset and sunrise. Caesarea, being now a Roman city, observed this rule. But Mencius didn't care. He was more than a bit homesick and the infernal didn't seem to suit him. Not so with Voldy, who had had no experience in big, bustling cities. The unceasing noise had kept him wide awake, and the dilemma confronting him had grown to appalling dimensions in the darkness. At the well-kept stables, where he found Darik sleek and shining from the diligent grooming he had received, another attestation to the proficiency of Roman discipline, Voldy was not much surprised to encounter an armed legionary waiting courteously to escort him out of the city, for Mencius had confided that Commander Antonius Lucan of the Augusta would feel more comfortable after being informed that the grudge-bearing young Arabian had ridden through Caesarea's east gate and had disappeared on the open road toward Galilee. In half an hour he was alone on that road after having received the legionaries' deferential wishes for a safe and pleasant journey, though they were both fully aware of the reason why the honor of a Roman escort had been conferred upon a young citizen of Arabia. Voldy looked back over his shoulder, waved a hand, and laughed quietly over the little drama in which he had been invited to play. In spite of their reputation for insufferable egoism and bloody-handed ruthlessness, reflected Voldy, the Romans were, in many respects, to be admired. They were superbly organized. They were effective. They were cruel, yes, but not because they loved cruelty. They preferred your friendship to your enmity. They would rather lead than drive. They could even set a watch over your movements and do it so graciously that you wanted to wave a friendly farewell to your keeper when he was done with you. The road, angling to the northeast, was not so busy as the coast highway. It was therefore narrower. With a long day's journey ahead of him, Voldy encouraged Darik to settle down to a comfortable canter. They were in level country now, the broad plain of Estrelon, where the landscape was too monotonous to divert a stranger's attention from his own problems. One fact brought a crumb of comfort, the Tetrarch was still alive. Of course, he didn't deserve to be alive, but at least Farah had not got herself into trouble by killing him. And it was unlikely that she had attempted to kill him, for surely Commander Antonius Lucan would have known of it, and having known of it, would have told of it. Came now a plodding donkey train, bearing small, greasy-looking casks, probably containing sesame and olive oil bound for Caesarea, in charge of shabby, shaggy, sullen men who frowned and spat as they passed. But what would Farah be likely to do now that her mission had failed of accomplishment? Assuming that she had arrived in the vicinity of Tiberius to await an opportunity for settling with her rascally father, would she await his return from Rome? Here came a lone traveler, ambling along on an infirm, sore-eyed camel, followed, at a hundred yards by a humpbacked old man with a scowl on his wrinkled face and an axe on his bony shoulder. Voldy greeted each of them in turn with a cheery good morning. Neither replied. Was that because he was riding a good horse and they were envious? Or was it because he was an Arabian? Or because he was a stranger, any stranger? Or because they were by nature impolite? He had to admit, though, as he rode on, that the Arabians would have shown no more courtesy to a traveling Jew. Perhaps Farah would decide to return to Arabia now that she had failed. But, having risked so much, to come so far, would she not persevere and wait for the Tetrarch's return? There really wasn't much in Arabia for her to go back to since her mother was gone. Himself, of course, but. She may have put him out of her mind. Having left him without a word of farewell, she might assume that he would have given her up, and turned his attention elsewhere. Now a family on foot, single file, was overtaken. Reluctantly they sidled off the road and stood stolidly in the dusty weeds waiting for the rider to pass. Father, leading the procession, wore an impressive black beard and a ragged black robe, but bore no burden. Mother had a sleepy baby in the crook of one arm and a big basket of wheat in the other. The boy towed a white milch coat. The half-grown girl carried a bulging bag of apples on her back. Voldy rode by slowly, yielding room. He nodded amiably. Father and the goat raised their chins and sneered with expressions so similar that Voldy grinned. Mother, imitating her lord, made an ugly face. The boy stared, without malice. 
The girl lifted pretty eyes and smiled shyly. It was the older people's fault, thought Boldy, that the different races despised one another. He wondered whether the world might be more harmonious if all the old people were abolished, say, everyone over twenty. Luckily for himself, such a commendable decree would leave him to help establish the new order in which strangers meeting on the road would be more ready to smile than spit. But, they would all have to remain at twenty, and never grow old. Perhaps the project was impracticable. Well, it wouldn't be long now before he might know something more about Farah. An Arabian boy in his teens would be noticed in a small fishing village, where everybody knew everybody else. Someone would remember having seen this young Arab. Voldy wondered what success Farah might have had, posing as a boy. Risky business that was. At a crossroads in sight of a village that the signpost said was Megiddo, four legionaries, their spears and shields leaning against the stone fence, were sprawled on the ground intent upon a dice game. Voldy expected them to challenge him. In that event he was going to say that the Tetrarch had bought the black gelding while in Caesarea and he was delivering it at Tiberius. But the soldiers barely glanced up as he passed. Apparently the discipline of the troops had been eased somewhat since the Tetrarch's departure. Or perhaps the attention of the officers had been diverted by the large assemblies that Mencius had spoken of, lately congregating in the vicinity of the Sea of Galilee. A carpenter had been addressing the people and was reputed to be healing all manner of diseases. This latter feat being clearly an incredible rumor, it was not likely that the carpenter would last very long as a popular leader, Mencius had said. There was nothing inflammatory about it or the Tetrarch would not have left the country. Voldy wondered how much interest Farah might have in such a movement. He could not conceive of her showing any curiosity about a thing like that, except for the fact that she had turned aside at Hebron to listen to another itinerant prophet. It had seemed quite unlike Far to be attracted by a performance of that nature. A bad lunch, smoked fish and stale barley bread, was sullenly tossed onto a dirty table at Megiddo's only inn. Voldy nibbled at the unappetizing food and paid the pockmarked woman with a shekel. She threw down a handful of unfamiliar copper coins. He kept one of them, meaning to examine it later, and went out to water his horse at the public trough. A group of small boys, in soiled tatters, gathered about. A woman screamed from a nearby doorway and the oldest boy ambled off in that direction, turning to spit before leaving. There was another female screech from somewhere in the neighborhood and all the lads scurried away but two. The smaller boy's eyes were brimming with pus. Voldy reached in his pocket and brought up the copper he had been given in change at the inn. He offered it to the sore-eyed boy, who did not reach for it. He's blind, explained his brother. Give it to me. Voldy handed him the coin. Yeah. Yeah. Screamed the boy flinging the copper down. Bad money. No good. Yeah. Yeah. He set off, dragging his little brother, doubtless to report the incident. Voldy mounted and rode on. A small group of indignant men and women was collecting about the outraged boy who had been offered a worthless coin. They reviled the Arabian as he passed. Megiddo was not an attractive village. Was it typical of Galilean communities? Voldy hoped not. Poor Farah. As the afternoon wore on, the country became more fertile, but it was plain to see that the inhabitants had not made the most of it. It was indeed a backward land. One day the Romans would come in and prosper. The Galileans would be virtually enslaved, but have more to eat, no doubt, than now. At sundown Nazareth was sighted. At a distance, with the late afternoon glow on the squat dome of the synagogue and the houses whitely gleaming, the town promised to be picturesque. On closer acquaintance it was a disappointment. The residences were small, shabby, and forlorn. As usual, the principal street widened at the center of the village, describing a circle around the inevitable community well. Apparently most of the mercantile business was concentrated here. Little bazaars and shops elbowed one another for standing room. Beyond the circle was the inn. The proprietor made it obvious to Voldy that he was unwelcome, but grumblingly consented to give him lodging when he heard the clink of substantial money. After toying disgustedly with the worst food that had ever been set before him, Voldy strolled out onto the deserted street. Everyone was at supper. He came upon a farrier's shop and found a graying man of fifty or more at his forge, mending a broken cistern wheel, probably a matter of some urgency. Always interested in farrier's shops, he paused in the open doorway. The man looked up from his work and nodded amiably. It was a pleasant surprise to be greeted in this friendly manner, and Voldy sauntered in. Stranger in these parts? The farrier gave the bellows rope another tug and pointed to a seat on an old tool chest. Yes, I am an Arabian. Voldy thought it better to have this awkward subject disposed of without delay. 
We don't see many, said the farrier. Are you staying with us a while, sir? Tonight only. I am on my way from Caesarea to Tiberias. The Tetrarch came through here a couple of days ago. Quite a procession. Going to Rome. Perhaps you know about it. Voldy said he did. Ever been in Tiberias? Asked the farrier. No. I suppose you have been there many a time. Never. But I mean to go, tomorrow. That's why I'm working late. Big doings over there, these days? Perhaps you've had wind a bit along the way. Our prophet, Jesus, has been talking to great multitudes. Your prophet? Meaning that you believe in him? Have you heard him? I've known him since he was a baby. This is his home. The farrier put his hammer down on the anvil and leaned comfortably against his workbench, relishing the stranger's evident interest in him. Is it true that he performs miracles? Asked Baldy. I've heard a rumor to that effect. That's what I want to know, said the farrier soberly. It wouldn't surprise me much, though he never did anything strange here in Nazareth. He is a carpenter, a good one too. He pointed through the open window behind Voldy, who turned to look. That's the shop, over there, across the road. It's his father's. And it was his father's before him. Jesus has worked there ever since he was a youngster, until a few months ago. Anything queer about him? Encouraged Voldy. He was a dreamy little fellow, remembered the farrier, averting his eyes. The other children liked him though. As a lad he used to tell them stories. What kind of stories? Wondered Voldy. I never heard any of them myself. He seemed shy of grown-up people and didn't talk much when they were around. But my eldest brother Laban's boy, Ephraim, my namesake, said the stories were mostly about some faraway country where there was no winter and no darkness, and the rivers never dried or overflowed, and nobody was ever sick, and nobody died, and nobody wept. And everyone loved the king. Voldy waited in silence for the farrier to continue. It seemed strange for a small boy to have such fancies, soliloquized Ephraim. According to my nephew, Jesus always talked about this distant land as if it was real, almost as if he had been there. The country was at peace. There were no soldiers, no forts, no prisons, no almshouses. Everyone had some work to do, but not for money. There wasn't any money. No one was rich, no one was poor. And flowers grew everywhere and always, but nobody gathered them. The child made much over flowers. From the time he was able to toddle, the little chap would carry water from the village well to his garden. We all thought he wouldn't amount to much, being so interested in flowers. But, as he grew up he turned out to be a skillful carpenter, better than Joseph, his father. But he never gathered up a crowd, and talked? Asked Baldy. No. As I say, he was not a one to talk much, except to the smaller children, and, after he came into his teens, he was very quiet and walked alone most of the time. I think that was because, as he grew up, the older children laughed among themselves at the stories he had told. Once it was spread about that a half-grown boy, tormenting him about this faraway land, rudely accused him of being a liar, and Jesus replied that he had told them the truth, that there was such a country, that he knew more things about it than he had told them. And then the people thought he was crazy, I suppose, remarked Boldy. Well, we couldn't help feeling that he was different, and perhaps he guessed how we felt about him for he spent most of his time alone, except when he was working in the shop. What did his family think about him? They didn't know quite what to make of him. He used to go for long walks by himself, in the hills. His mother worried about him. Shortly. Before he left Nazareth, he was gone for a couple of months, and when he came back you would have thought he was walking in his sleep. He had something on his mind, and it waited him. Nobody seemed to know where he had been. Maybe his folks did. But it was plain that he was much stirred up, inside. On the morning of the day he left Nazareth, for good, I fear, he attended the service in the synagogue, for it was the Sabbath day. He sat with the family, as usual. Sometimes our good old Rabbi Ben Naboth would ask some man in the congregation to read the scripture lesson, some one of the old men who were known for their piety. On this day the rabbi called for Jesus to come forward. It was unusual to invite one so young. The place grew very quiet. You thought it would be something out of the ordinary? Asked Baldy. Wouldn't you, countered Ephraim, considering how out of the ordinary Jesus was? Well, he walked forward and took up the scroll containing the writing of the prophet Esaias. I suppose you've heard of our famed prophet Esaias? He interrupted himself to say. No, admitted Baldy. I have little knowledge of your great ones, since our father Abraham. 
They both grinned. Nearly as I can recall the words, continued Ephraim, what Jesus read when something like this, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has appointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to release men in bondage and open the eyes of the blind. I am to raise up those who have been beaten down, and I am to announce that the Lord will make this a blessed year. Then Jesus rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the rabbi, and said, This prophecy is now to be fulfilled. Then he returned to his seat. All eyes were fixed on him. Even the rabbi seemed bewildered, and it was some little time before he went on with the devotions. After the meeting, the congregation gathered about Jesus, as he came out, and asked him what he meant, and was someone coming, here, now, to Nazareth, to open the prison and free the slaves and give sight to the blind? It hadn't occurred to any of you that Jesus might be referring to himself as the promised healer? No, you see, he had grown up with us. It was beyond our thought that one of our own neighbors might be gifted to do such things. What did Jesus say then? He declared that it was to be his mission to spread the good news. And the people were silent and unbelieving, and slanted their eyes at one another with sulky faces. One old man shouted crossly, You think you are going to open the eyes of the blind, here, in Nazareth? I'll wager they all listened to his reply, said Voldy. They did indeed, and it made them angry. Jesus said, Not here, not in Nazareth. A prophet has no value in his own community. At that, the people drifted away, grumbling, many of them turning to scowl or laugh scornfully. And, after that, they mistreated him? No, he gave them no opportunity to mistreat him. He left Nazareth at once, not even tarrying to have dinner with his family. After the meeting at the synagogue he wandered away, and he hasn't been back. Perhaps, surmised Voldy, if he is really doing great things for people elsewhere, the people of your town will beseech him to return. Ephraim shook his head and renewed his forge fire. No, he replied. It wouldn't be like Nazareth, to do that. Not even to have your blind ones see? Asked Baldi. No, not even to have our blind ones see. Ephraim was now resuming his interrupted work with diligence. Baldi felt that the interview was over, and rose to go. At the door he turned to say with a smile. What will your fellow townsmen think of you for making a journey to see Jesus? Will they be annoyed? Ephraim tapped his anvil a couple of times, chuckling to himself. They can't be too much annoyed, he said. I'm the only farrier in Nazareth. Perhaps if there were two, I shouldn't have risked my neighbor's displeasure. Voldy bade him farewell and returned to the inhospitable inn. Shortly after midnight he was awakened by a violent thunderstorm followed by a heavy rainfall that continued throughout the night and until mid-forenoon of the next day. When finally it cleared, he set off at the best speed he could make on a slippery road, hoping to arrive in Bethsaida before darkness fell.